Welcome to the best of January 2021. This month we shared many stories ranging many different topics. From elevator problems to different dimensions and so much more. This month never had a dull moment for scary stories and I feel this is one of my best big compilations yet. If you enjoy this video, be sure to drop a like rating. Also, if you are new and you aren't already subscribed, please consider. I'm not going to ask anyone to subscribe just for the sake of it. However, if you enjoy this video and you want to see more content just like this in the future, subscribing is a good way to ensure you can do just that. I'm pushing for 100,000 subscribers and we are getting pretty close. I do plan to do something big once we reach it, even though I'm not sure what yet. Enjoy the video, I'll have some new stuff out here in a few days, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I have a close friend who's a psychiatrist. She mostly just teaches these days. From a textbook that she wrote, no less. But back when she was still practicing, this friend's specialty was the treatment of specific phobias. You know, patients with an irrational fear of heights or needles or spiders. Fun stuff like that. That's why I lovingly refer to her as Dr. Scary, a nickname which she absolutely adores no matter what that lying bitch tells you. One night when we were both especially turnt, I asked Dr. Scary if she ever encountered a patient with a phobia that managed to scare even her. We were seated directly beside each other on the wooden bench swing suspended from her back porch. But Dr. Scary didn't look at me when she replied. Her gaze remained fixed on the shadowy expanse of her well-manicured backyard as she scoffed and slowly nodded. And then she said, the elevator people. When this particular patient, a 39-year-old medical supply salesman who we'll call Simon, first showed up at Dr. Scary's office, he had listed fear of elevators as the reason why. Needless to say, but if that was an accurate summation of Simon's issue, we wouldn't be here. It all started almost a year prior. While Simon was at a conference in Las Vegas, he was there with his sales manager, scoping out the latest innovations in pacemaker technology and hoping to find a distributor willing to haggle. The trip really was all business, too. Simon had never been much for gambling, and the live shows gave him a headache. The conference might as well have been in boys for all he cared. Simon noted that the initial elevator ride up to his hotel room that night had been perfectly uneventful. Though his flight into McCarran had been delayed, of course, Simon had barely made it to the hotel with enough time for a quick shower and change of clothes before the meet and greet in the lounge at 8pm. It was 5 after when he finally re-emerged from the room in a flurry, tie still untied and his blazer draped over one arm. As Simon hurried over to the bank of elevators at the other end of the hall, he got a text from his sales manager, who sounded annoyed and was currently waiting for him down in the lobby. Simon hit the button to call for an elevator as he began to frantically tap out a response text, explaining the flight delay. There was a mechanical ding as the middle elevator's metal doors slid open in his periphery. Simon started inside the elevator as he finished his text and hit send. He looked up to smile politely at the other passengers on board, and that is when Simon went rigid, his half-formed smile freezing in place as a tingling surge of fear temporarily overrode control of his body. To his right, a naked and skeletally thin old man stood grinning back at Simon. The man was completely hairless. His malformed bald head was the shape of a used pencil eraser. He didn't have eyebrows or facial hair or even pubic hair to hide a fraction of the small yet noticeably erect junk jutting out from between his shriveled legs like the head of some hungry, flesh-colored turtle. To Simon's left stood a woman in a tattered gray dress. She appeared to be hairless as well and had a similarly deranged grin stretched across the front of her similarly bald and oddly shaped head. She sported a pronounced hunchback and had glimmering feline eyes. Simon bewildered gaze 
darted from the naked man to the female hunchback, then down to the bald child peeking out from behind her. The woman shoved the child back out of sight as the naked man attempted to grab Simon by his face. Seeing those grimy fingers darting toward him was enough to finally snap Simon out of his shock, and he just barely managed to evade the naked man's grasp with a single leaping jump back out of the elevator. He hadn't moved like that since college, and every joint and tendon in Simon's legs was currently screaming at him. Fortunately, at that moment, adrenaline was making it impossible for Simon to register much of anything aside from the elevator door sliding closed in what felt like slow motion. Just as the lunging naked man was about to reach between them, the dumbstruck Simon was still standing there, quietly panting and staring at those same closed elevator doors a full minute later when an attractive blonde woman approached from the other end of the hallway. She gave Simon a wave as she neared, but he didn't even seem to register her presence. The woman's expression went from confused to annoyed, as she noticed that the button to call the elevator still needed to be pushed. Simon shook off his days and managed to take the next elevator all the way down to the lobby without further incident. If you didn't count several awkward glances from the attractive woman who rode down with him, he was only fashionably late for the rendezvous with his sales manager, who was already busy talking up several of the reps waiting in line for the meet and greet. The open bar and inane conversation helped Simon put what had just happened to him out of his mind for the moment and, to his surprise, it actually turned out to be a rather lucrative evening, so much so that, about an hour in, Simon's manager gave him a pat on the back and announced that he was going to officially clock out for the night to, quote, start focusing on who I'm a fuck. Still feeling a bit jet-lagged and generally exhausted from his earlier encounter, Simon decided to take this opportunity to get some much-needed rest before tomorrow when the real work needed to get done. As he exited the hotel lounge and made his way back across the lobby, Simon spotted a pair of Vegas newlyweds forcefully making out while they waited for an elevator. A wave of relief washed over him when Simon realized he wouldn't have to ride back up to his room alone. An elevator arrived a few moments later, and Simon hit the button for the 10th floor as he entered. The couple followed him on, and the young guy leaned away from his better half just long enough to poke the button labeled 3. Simon's stomach began to churn as he realized he was going to have to ride for seven whole floors by himself. When the car stopped to let the couple out, he was tempted to exit with them and take the stairs the rest of the way, but the lovebirds had seen him hit the button for ten already. Following them off now, without looking like a weirdo, would be rather difficult. Simon just barely managed to suppress his urge to sprint out of there and took a deep breath as the elevator door slowly slid shut with him still in close behind them. The elevator resumed its ascent, and almost immediately, the overhead lights began to flicker. This prompted a tired eye roll from Simon as he muttered, You've got to be fucking kidding me. And that's when the lights switched off completely. He could feel the car continue its climb as he reflexively spun around and presses back to the cold steel of the elevator's inner doors. Somewhere just past the oppressive darkness now enveloping him, Simon could hear movement, he held his breath in an attempt to better discern the sound's location. As Simon's eyes began to adjust to the darkness, he glimpsed what at first appeared to be the silhouette of a massive spider crawling toward him. But this was only a trick of perspective. What he was actually seeing was merely a hand reaching out to grab Simon by his face. There was another ding as the doors he was leaning against finally slid open, sending Simon spilling out onto the hotel's gaudy patterned carpet. Landing face up, and looking into an open elevator that currently appeared to be both well lit and noticeably empty. It was that moment right there when his fear of the elevator people truly took root. Since the inciting incident was tangentially related to his job, Dr. Scary's first instinct had been to examine Simon's work life. He claimed he couldn't have been happier on that end. He liked the job and made good money doing it. Simon even liked the people he worked for, despite the fact that his sales manager was five years younger than him and a womanizing prick. He was a young, womanizing prick who knew the market and stayed out of Simon's way. At that point, the only negative aspect of his job stemmed from his recent inability to easily move about tall buildings. That may not sound like much of an issue to those of you who don't live and or work in large cities, but Simon did both. Granted, 
Being in sales meant he spent most of each workday away from his own office, but the majority of that time was usually spent visiting other people's offices in different, often taller buildings. As is typically the case with phobia patients, in the beginning Simon tried to solve the problem by developing various workarounds for his sudden yet crippling fear of riding in elevators alone. He started scheduling a lot more lunches with prospective buyers. He offered to take clients golfing, anything that would get them to meet him down on ground level. He even volunteered to train the new intern because it gave Simon someone he could drag along with him on cold calls. But there were still the annual conferences, which were always out of town and often involved staying in hotels. And there was also the mortgage on his high-rise condo apartment, which his husband, Ronald, absolutely adored. Simon had confided in Ronald about his fear of the elevator people pretty much as soon as it became an issue. The whole thing had been rather difficult to hide from him, given the circumstances. Of course, Ronald was totally understanding, and most nights, he was able to meet Simon down in the lobby when he got home from work so they could ride the elevator up together. Of course, no system devised by humans was ever truly perfect. Eventually, there came a day when Ronald had to suddenly go out of town to assist his cousin with an extended family emergency, which resulted in Simon having to sprint up 15 flights of stairs to narrowly avoid crapping himself because he had scheduled three different lunches with clients earlier that day, and two of them were at the same Mexican restaurant. It was actually this very bathroom mishap, which finally convinced Simon that he was going to need professional help for his phobia, if he wanted any chance at living a normal life. Though, in a rare and rather humbling turn of events, Simon's case was the first one in a long while that had Dr. Scary feeling holy and truly stumped as to how she should proceed. She had asked about Simon's relationship with Ronald. He was the greatest thing that ever happened to him. Simon's parents, both still alive and super accepting of their successful gay son. And the likelihood that this was all stemming from a traumatic childhood event, Simon simply failed to mention. Apparently, not very. I grew up in Connecticut. Dr. Scary must have looked disappointed by this answer because Simon followed it up with, Not a big fan of the Constitution State? I'm just worried he might be schizophrenic. It was now Simon's turn to look disappointed as he took a moment to consider this. Then he said, Isn't that a hereditary condition? Typically, but not always. There may be no documented cases in your family history. There are, Simon replied with a nod. My aunt and my grandmother. Dr. Scary held up her hands in a slow down gesture and said, Okay, back up. For starters, symptoms of schizophrenia typically start to present in men by their early 20s. Plus, that was pure speculation. It's just as likely we simply haven't located the right stressor yet. There's still plenty of stuff we can try. Like what? Are you familiar with the concept of exposure therapy? Dr. Scary didn't typically like attempting such a drastic treatment this early into the process, but she clearly wasn't getting anywhere just talking with Simon. Dr. Adoradora thought that if she could watch him react to the source of his phobia in real time, it might tell her something that Simon couldn't. So she decided to make their next session a house call. It was just past 1pm when Dr. Scary arrived at Simon's high-rise condo complex. At that time on a weekday, his husband Ronald, like most of the building's tenants, was still at work. This, of course, had been intentional. They required an empty elevator for the exposure therapy, and Simon didn't need to feel any more self-conscious about this than he already done. It doesn't have to be all 15. One would be fantastic. Ride one floor down by yourself and look. Dr. Scary gestured at the smartphone in Simon's hand. She turned her own around to show him that the two phones were currently FaceTiming each other as she continued. I'm going to be with you here the whole way. Dr. Scary gently grabbed Simon's arm and guided up into his phone's camera was aimed at his face. Right there. Perfect. Now, we're going to get started, okay? Simon didn't respond, but it was clear from his expression that he wasn't exactly psyched about exposure therapy. No phobia patient ever was. But then finally, Simon glanced at her as he lifted his shoulders in a nearly 
imperceptible shrug before returning his gaze to the elevator's closed outer doors. Okay, Dr. Scary repeated. She then casually hit the button to call for an elevator as she turned to head inside Simon's condo. She leaned her back against the door to shut it behind her as Dr. Scary held up her smartphone to address Simon through the screen. His uneasy expression had transformed into something more primival by this point. He looked like a wild animal, sensing an approaching storm. Dr. Scary tried to comfort Simon by saying, Remember, I'm right here. Simon's eyes stayed trained on the elevator doors as he eventually replied, No, you're not. There's nothing you could do anyway. Tears began to stream down his cheeks. Dr. Scary attempted to say something in protest, but was suddenly cut off by the familiar ding of an arriving elevator. She heard the metal door slide open, and then Simon let out a sudden, thunderous gasp. Oh, fuck no. God, no. He frantically muttered as he started to back away. What? What are you seeing? Look. He screamed and then turned his phone around so Dr. Scary could see inside the elevator. The interior wasn't well lit, and it was hard to make out most of the details through Simon's forward-facing phone camera. But Dr. Scary swore that she saw two figures inside the elevator. They were both bald. The one on the right was skeletally thin and appeared to be naked. The figure on the left was shorter and had a pronounced hunchback. And just before Simon finally dropped his phone and sprinted inside the condo, Dr. Scary glimpsed a much smaller figure behind the first two, lying motionless against the back wall of the elevator. She said this smaller figure resembled something somebody had crumpled up and tossed aside. Like the balled up piece of paper you find next to a trash can. But instead of paper, its pale skin and broken limbs were covered in bite marks. Bite marks? Dr. Scary nodded and replied, Big, red, bite marks. I waited for her to continue, but she remained silent for several moments. Then finally Dr. Scary turned and, for the first time since starting her story, she looked at me. Her mouth was twisted into a somber, humorless smile as she said. After that, Simon stopped showing up for his sessions. He killed himself a few months later. Caught off guard, I reeled back and replied, Good God, woman, when was all this? Dr. Scary's sad smile got a little sadder and she said, right before I closed down my practice. Another long and much more awkward silence followed. Then, as if she could sense the one question I was still too afraid to ask, Dr. Scary added, I never saw them again after that, though I'll be honest. For a while, I was genuinely scared I might, but what happened that day was merely a prime example of the power of suggestion. Simon's fear of the elevator people made him feel so real in that moment. It's actually not surprising I saw what I'd done. I thought this over and then shrugged as I said. Makes sense. Though, of course, there were the dreams. You had dreams about the elevator people? Dr. Scary slowly nodded while avoiding my eye contact. She exhaled a sigh and then said, It actually still happens occasionally. It's the weirdest thing, too. Most of the time I'll be dreaming about nothing, especially terrifying, you know? Like visiting my sister who somehow now lives at the summer camp we used to go to as kids. Mundane shit like that. Then, out of nowhere I'll get hit with this. She tensed her fingers into a claw-like gesture as she motioned at her chest and said, Overwhelming sense of hopelessness. That's how I know they're close. Dr. Scary glanced over at me again and I saw that her eyes were now brimming with tears, yet her tone remained almost unnervingly, even as she continued. And that's when I'll realize I'm standing at a bank of elevators, and I can hear one approaching from below, and that creeping hopeless dread is now so palpable, I can literally taste it in my mouth, like dirty copper. I turn and try to run, but my legs feel like they're encased in cement, and I can hear the elevator doors opening behind me. I don't want to look, but I know it won't matter. The worst part, though? In the dreams, they know my name. I put a hand on Dr. Scary's shoulder in an attempt to comfort her, and she suddenly turned to glare at me. 
a morbid grin where her somber expression had just been as she nearly shouted. Do you want to know what they tell me? I opened my mouth, but before I could stutter out a coherent response, Dr. Scary started blinking and her creepy grin reverted to a confused frown. She said my name like a question and asked if I was okay. I lied and told her I was fine and thanked her for sharing such a fascinating story. And yet at first, I thought there was no way I was ever going to tell it to anyone. Sure, it was creepy enough to have potential, but in the end, it just left me feeling sad for my friend. So, I put the whole thing out of my mind, and for a while, that was that. Though yes, much like Simon, I too technically live and work in a major city, but my place is a duplex, and my job is at a bar. So I don't typically encounter a lot of elevators in my own day-to-day -day life. But then my dentist retired, and the new guy my insurance switched me to just so happened to work out of one of the CBD's taller high-rises. And even then... I managed to get all the way across the building's otherwise vacant lobby and hit the button to call for an elevator before Dr. Scary's story finally came rushing back to me in vivid detail. It was the first time I had even really thought about the elevator people since that night. I remember the look on her face as she described what she saw during Simon's exposure therapy session. The way she had grinned and when she said, Do you want to know what they tell me? I was outside in the courtyard bordering the front of the high rise and trying to steady my hand long enough to light a cigarette before I was even fully aware that I had left the building. It was just about then that I decided two things almost simultaneously. One, 12 flights of stairs would definitely count as my cardio for the day. Two, if I had to worry about this shit now, taking the rest of you with me. I was about 13 years old when my family went to stay at a resort called The Plastic Flower for the Summer. From the very start, it was a bizarre experience. I remember it like it was a dream. Waking up to my mom saying, time to go dear. Out the window of our city apartment I could see a taxi parked on the street. It looked old fashioned, like a drawing of a taxi in an Adams Family comic strip, all pointy and black. My family were the type to always take us kids on weird, extravagant adventures with no warning. I was used to being woken up in the middle of the night for a sudden trip to the Bahamas, or taken out of school to go to a fashion show in Paris. I already had a small travel bag for occasions such as this. My family walked out of the apartment to the waiting taxi. The windows were blacked out so we couldn't see the driver. I looked around at us all. My mother, Yasmin, and her brothers Abe and Casper along with my twin brother Darius, were all walking out the front door with their suitcases. I felt the usual exasperation in my chest. Where's old mother? My son. This was our name for our grandmother. She didn't want to come, said Uncle Abe as he knocked on the driver's window. The boot lifted open, and Uncle Casper helped stack our luggage inside. Then we all piled into the back seat, squashed up together. There was a screen that blocked the view of the driver. Where are we going? Darius asked. Our mother smiled gleefully, placing a hand to her heart. Oh, a uh, lovely resort in the countryside, she said. I got a pamphlet in the mail and it reminded me of Mallory Towers, this beautiful old house by the beach. Just gorgeous. It's called the Plastic Flower. There will be other children for you to play with too, my dears. My mom often talked to us like we were toddlers instead of teenagers. The last thing I remembered before I fell asleep again was the vehicle driving through the archway at the end of our street and suddenly realizing the driver was following another identical black taxi. Old mother, a bespectacled woman with her black hair always in a bun, had made a fortune developing a world-renowned fashion house, the most elite of society clamoring to wear her clothes. After old father died, she turned away from the spotlight and locked herself up in her apartment with her triplets and grandchildren. My Uncle Abe, a small man with slicked black hair who wore loud gold suits, had taken over most of the duties of the fashion house as old mother was getting on in years. My Uncle Casper, who was large and muscular, 
was a drag queen known as Cassandra, and my mother, petite and doughy-eyed, ran the nightclub he performed in. My mom didn't know who our father was, telling Darius and I when we were ten that we were conceived during an orgy. Darius was lanky, had his hair dyed fire engine red, and liked to wear goth makeup and clothes. Well, I was stockier, and tended to present myself in a more casual type of hoodies and shorts. I woke in the taxi, feeling cramped and stiff. My family was waking up around me. We were driving down a dirt road through a forest, lush, green with wildflowers dotting the roadside. We were approaching a house on a grassy hill, only one story with white walls and a terracotta roof. At the bottom of the hill was the seaside, the waves lapping serenely at the white sand. I was a bit surprised. This place seemed a bit too ordinary for my family's tastes, but I immediately preferred it to the grand hotels and resorts we usually stayed in. It was very cozy looking. The taxi pulled up to an area of gravel in front of the front door. We all got out as the boot of the car cracked open. Uncle Casper got all the bags as Mom and Uncle Abe walked ahead towards the house. Darius and I helped Uncle Casper with the luggage before we made our way inside. When we walked in, Darius and I immediately stopped, looked around with complete amusement. We were in a foyer, the ceiling stretching above us, all latticed and intricately detailed. There was an arched door made of oak in front of us, and we could hear faint laughter and chattering behind it. On either side of the oak door were two circular holes covered with black vinyl flaps and a set of gold tracks that connected them. To our left and right were long corridors, the floors all decoratively tiled, the windows letting in light. It's too big, said Darius. The foyer alone looked larger than the whole building from the outside. The adults ignored us, smiling around at the place as Uncle Casper put down the bags. Ah, oh, looks just divine, doesn't it? Said Uncle Abe. There was movement at the corridor to the left, and Darius and I looked around. Another girl was there. She was squat and sulky looking, and was around our age, but dressed much younger in a pinafore dress, white stockings, Mary Jane shoes, and a bow in her bobbed black hair. I noticed the dress was from my family's fashion label. She must have been rich. We were both a bit too shy to introduce ourselves, so we just awkwardly ignored each other. Ahead of us, the triplets had found an old-fashioned television up against the wall. It turned itself on at their approach. It's so retro, Uncle Casper said delightedly. Total vintage vibes. I know, isn't it just the cutest? My mother replied. Hush, said Uncle Abe, flapping his hand at his siblings. We're going to miss what it's saying. We watched as a rainbow grew across the black static-filled screen and swirled around like a snake's tail. Then a woman grew from the end of the rainbow in a long, dark pink dress with heavy sleeves. She had strawberry blonde hair and an alarming smile on her paper white face, mouth fixed, lips stretched and teeth shining. A sliver of unease went through me. Something must have been wrong with the television. Her eyes looked like silver coins engraved with two crosses. Welcome, the lady in the rainbow said in a soft, sweet and smooth voice. That reminded me of strawberry ice cream. Here at the Plastic Flower, you can do whatever your heart desires. My associates and I will always be around to help you with whatever you need. In a glitter of rainbow light, two men appeared on either side of her. They looked similar to each other with thick, red, frowning mouths, paper white skin, and the same silver crossed eyes as the lady in the rainbow. The one on the left was tall thin with a wild black cloud of hair, wearing a top hat and a ruffled black suit. The one on the right was short and overweight with three tufts of blonde hair on his head, wearing dirty shorts and a singlet with his beer gut hanging out. Just give us a call and we'll be there, said the lady in the rainbow. Feel free to swim in our lovely beach, explore our forests, or shop till you drop in our shopping center. Enjoy your stay. You'll never want to leave. The TV flickered, and the woman shrunk back into a rainbow. Reversing over the black screen, 
the two men disappearing with a sparkle. Darius and I exchanged confused looks. A shopping center? How could a shopping center fit in this place? How oh, lovely, my mother said to us. You've made a little friend already. She smiled at the strange girl beside us. What's your name, dear? Lucy Moon. The girl replied and the triplet's faces brightened. Any relation to Moon Jewelry? Asked Uncle Abe and Lucy nodded. Tell your parents hello when you see them, said Uncle Abe. We always have our models and their products. Absolutely divine. Lucy's face shifted and she looked between my mother and uncle's slowly recognizing who we were. Well, have fun, said Mom. We're going to go check out the shopping center. You can amuse yourselves, dears. The triplets walked for the oak door, disappearing into the darkness behind it. They'd left their bags behind for us to look after. Lucy looked us up and down. Darius was silent, but I decided to try to be friendly and sent her a little wave. Hi, I said to her. This is my twin Darius, and my name is Salam, but everyone calls me Sally. Lucy stared at us with shrewd, narrow eyes. If your parents are so rich and famous, why do they let you look like that? She asked, and then pointed to Darius. You look like a Tim Burton drawing of a raccoon, and you? You've got a bowl cut and a $5 outfit. We just stared at her shocked into silence by her rudeness. Old mother believed in teaching her grandkids the value of money. She said she'd been too hands-off with the triplets, throwing nannies and gifts at them, and now they were shallow and materialistic. We did chores to earn pocket money, were grounded to get jobs after school, and always bought our own stuff, including clothes. I wasn't very interested in fashion and just got whatever was on the clearance rack. The triplets disapproved of all this and their spontaneous holidays where old mother wasn't invited was their childish rebellion against her. My parents wouldn't let me out of the house looking like you two, Lucy's son. They've got pride, but I guess that's because we're not Navu Rish like your trashy family. With that, she walked off on us. I wanted to point out that at least I was dressed my age and not like an overgrown toddler but she was already off around the corner. Charming, said Darius, and I bit a smile back. I could see down the corridor, tags hanging off the door handles, each one displaying the names of our family. I went over and picked up my tag, turning it around to see a door pass attached. I opened up my door to see a cozy room with a plush bed covered in colorful cushions and a large wardrobe to hang my clothes. Darius and I started hefting the bags over to each of our family's rooms. Then we just stood around the corridor trying to think of what to do to entertain ourselves. A door opened somewhere around the corner, and Lucy came skulking out, carrying a towel and dressed in a swimsuit, no doubt heading for the beach. She sneered at us, and we ignored her. I don't know what to do, said Darius. Maybe I'll just take a nap or something. Suddenly there was a magnified sound that filled up the corridor like it was coming through an intercom, making us all jump. It was a horrible slobbering as though someone was choking on their own spit. Then there was angry muffled murmuring and the clunk of someone grabbing at the speaker. What do you like? An awful high-pitched voice shouted. What do you like? Answer. Answer. Again there was a knocking sound and a commotion of huffing and snarling as the speaker was wrestled free. Ah, so sorry. The familiar voice of the lady in the rainbow sun. Please tell us what activity you'd like to participate in, and we'd happily oblige you. We three kids just exchanged looks. What the hell was all that other noise about? I could feel the unease that had just been a seed in my chest when I first got here start to blossom larger, spreading its poison tendrils through my body. I uh, said Darius finally. I could watch a movie. A door at the end of the corridor opened, and the smell of buttered popcorn wafted over us from the darkness. Anything you want, the woman's son. Darius hesitated then moved for the door. I want to go swimming at the beach, said Lucy at once. Of course, 
There's a path out the back of this building that will lead the way, said the voice. Behind us in the foyer, the front doors creaked open, a sea breeze blowing down the corridor. Lucy ran off. And last, but certainly not least, What is it that you desire? Said the voice to me. I guess I'm a bit hungry. I murmured under my breath. Her soothing voice not doing anything for my nerves. What is your most favorite of food? She asked me. It shall be provided to you. My mind instantly jumped to having tea in Old Mother's parlor. She made delicious scones with jam and cream, little sandwiches, sugar biscuits, and the nicest tea I'd ever had. Tea and scones with sugar biscuits, please, I said. As you wish, said the strawberry ice cream voice. A door down the other end of the corridor opened. I walked towards it. Inside, I took a seat at a table with a three-tiered platter and a chintz tea set. Through a big bay window overlooking the beach, I could see Lucy running gleefully across the sand, splashing in the water. I poured myself a cup of tea and picked up a scone, along with the little saucers of cream and jam. Taking a bite, I watched the waves crashing on the sand outside the window. The tea and finger food was delicious, made to perfection. Not as nice as old mothers, obviously, but of course we all tend to prefer the food we grew up on. I remember being in the parlor in our city apartment, in comfortable armchairs. Old mother refilling our cups with piping hot tea. When I was your age, she'd say as we sipped from our cups. My mother had me running around at the tea shop, serving the customers. I was supposed to run the place when she died, be a nice plump woman in an apron and hairnet with flour on my nose. I horrified her when I got into the whorish fashion instead. I enjoyed listening to her stories. I'm not much good at anything else but listening to people. I like hearing people talk about themselves, especially old mother. I didn't get to spend much alone time with the adults in my family. The triplets just took us on expensive holidays. I think we were more like handbag chihuahuas to them. Cute accessories to take around. Show off and coo at, but not emotionally connect with. Lucy had stopped running around and was now standing stock still, staring at something in the distance. I looked over and saw one of the men from the welcome video, the shorter, fatter one, over by the path that led to the beach. He was boggling at Lucy, slack-jawed, drool running down his chin. There hadn't been a problem with the television. His eyes were silver coins with cross engravings. Lucy walked backwards into the ocean, swimming further and further out, not taking her eyes off the man. He was completely still for a few moments and then turned around. I felt a jolt of terror in my chest. Could he see me through the window? The man didn't spot me. He just wandered off down the beach path towards the forest, arms dangling loosely by his sides. My heart was still thumping, my skin cold and clammy. What was that? Was he some kind of pervert? I looked out at the ocean, Lucy's dark head bobbing in the water. She swam back towards the shore, picking up her towel and bolted for the house again. When she made it inside, I heard her cry out in a frightened voice. Mom? Dad? She ran down the corridor, disappearing away into the depths of the house. The whole experience had put me off of the food. I got up and hurried out. I peered up and down the corridor, feeling my stomach shake. When I saw the coast was clear, I bolted for my room. I pulled out my old stuffed toy crocodile that I'd had since I was a toddler. Inside the toy's head hidden among the fluff was a switchblade. Old Mother had gifted us the weapons to me and Darius at a young age. The celebrity world is full of rich perverts who get away with all kinds of depravity. She said, You can't depend on your mother or uncles to protect you. Anyone tries anything, you go straight for the eyes. After a while of watching the door, I found myself growing tired, still carrying my plush crocodile. I climbed into my pajamas and dressing gown, 
sitting on my bed. I didn't want to fall asleep, but my eyelids were heavy, my body fighting against me. I'd take a quick nap, and by the time I woke up, the triplets were sure to be back. Gripping my secret weapon, I dropped off to sleep. I dreamed of a black void with a pink light glowing in the distance. There was a creaking sound. My eyes flew open, my stomach dropping and my skin going cold. Moonlight was shining through the window, illuminating a figure bent over at the foot of my bed. The tall, thin man with the black hair and the ruffled suit and top hat was going through my bag. He pulled out my brush and untangled some of the hair from the bristles. He spotted me, and his silver coin eyes glinted. My brother eat the hair. He said in the high-pitched voice that I had heard over the intercom earlier, I not eat hair. Disgusting. He shoved the black hair into his pocket. I prefer the special blood. He said, Do you bleed yet? Put the cotton thingies in the bin so I can have them. Nice to chew on. I screamed, making the man jump and shrink back. Mom? I wailed with terror. The man's face furrowed with confusion, putting his hands up to his ears. Why are you screaming? He said, I just make a conversation. I jumped out of bed and ran for the door, still wailing at the top of my lungs. Tears pouring down my face, I bolted down the corridor towards the foyer. Sitting by the big oak door was Darius and Lucy, both in their pajamas too. They looked up at me as I ran over. There's a man in my room. I gasped out, fear and adrenaline coursing through my body. This place is fucked, said Darius, eyes flickering around. I was in the cinema and I felt something picking at my head. I turned around and it was that fat guy. He was putting my hair in his mouth. I shivered as I sat down beside him. It was nighttime and the adults hadn't returned. Through the big arched door, we could hear faint laughter and chattering. I bet it's like the end of society happening in there, said Darius. What are you talking about? I asked. Darius sent me a condescending smile. It's a really underground film. Barely anyone knows about it. He replied and I rolled my eyes. Darius was fine most of the time, but he had a pretentious, hipster side of him that annoyed the crap out of me. Lucy was eyeing the toy crocodile I was carrying with a look of contempt on her face. You still have stuffed animals? She said. That's so babyish. I couldn't believe she'd make fun of something so trivial when we were all being terrorized by creepy men in a strange house with all of our parents missing. Her priorities were completely warped. Have you seen mom or the uncles at all? I asked Darius who shook his head. My parents will be back soon, Lucy said, looking down her nose at us. Maybe yours don't care about you, but mine do. We ignored her. I felt a sick jolt go through me, my heart panging painfully in my throat. Something was moving out of the vinyl flaps to the right of us and onto the wall. For a moment, I had no clue what it was as we moved back all at once. It looked like a shadow of a humongous creature. We heard a clanking, clattering sound coming from the same direction. The vinyl flaps were pushed open as a cart with a man inside came rattling across the tracks towards us. The man, old and frail with wild gray hair, dark wrinkled skin and black sunglasses, peered at us for a moment as if he was struggling to make a sound. Where's the dragon? He yelled. Where'd the dragon go? We looked up at the shadow on the wall. I realized it was a painting of a curling, writhing, traditional Japanese dragon with a gaping maw and a huge mane. It was moving towards the other vinyl entrance to the left. The old man gestured at us with a gnarled hand. Get in the trolley quick, he said. This is a dangerous place. I can get you back home again. We stared at him, more frightened than ever. Stranger danger blared in my mind. I felt completely unsafe at this resort and wanted to go home, but I'd be the dumbest kid around to just jump in this man's trolley. Quickly, said the old man as the cart traveled across the tracks towards the second set of vinyl flaps. The dragon had disappeared inside it. My parents told me to never go anywhere with strangers, said Lucy. 
They'll be back any second now, and they'll call the police on you for being a creep. There was a rough coughing sound from behind us, and we jumped around. In the doorway was the overweight, blonde man with coins for eyes. He was making a gagging, choking sound, slobber dribbling down his chin. Sticking his fingers clumsily into his mouth, he started pulling out clumps of matted saliva-soaked hair, black and fire engine red from the depths of his throat with horrible heaving gasps. Darius screamed in horror as I staggered back and Lucy let out a cry. Come on already, cried the old man, his cart beginning to slide through the vinyl flaps. Between the two, I knew who seemed more terrifying. We all ran to clamber inside the cart. As we rolled across the tracks, I watched the gagging man in the doorway, our combined hair oozing down his front as he watched us leave. The cart was rolling down a hallway that seemed never-ending, the track stretching out over a red velvet floor. The ceiling was looming above us, and on the walls were huge oil paintings in gilded frames. The paintings depicted the three people we'd seen in the introduction video over and over again. The strawberry blonde woman dancing around, or posing happily with her fixed smile. The tall skinny man glaring out at us, and the short overweight man blank faced and drooling. In the light, we could see the dragon shape more clearly. It was a moving painting on the wall, all in shades of red with a mane and black snarling lips. The old man jumped out of the trolley with surprising speed and pounced at the painting. We stared as he took a little container out of his pocket, pulling out a wad of melted substance I didn't recognize. He shoved the substance into the painted dragon's mouth. The painting froze on the spot. Then after a few seconds... The man pulled the substance out again. I realized it was melted wax that he'd shoved into a keyhole in the dragon's mouth. Now he had an imprint of the key shape. As soon as he took the wax imprint out, the dragon quivered and then went dancing up the wall, disappearing into the darkness. The old man went back to sit with us in the trolley. My name's Lennox, said the old man, and we didn't reply, just huddled together like scared kittens. You can call me Baba, though, he said. I stared up at the oil paintings we were passing. One was of the whole trio together. The two men on either side of the woman, their arms around each other. The men looked as dour as ever. The woman's face disturbingly gleeful. We don't know their names, said Baba Lennox, noticing where I was looking. We call the brothers Rawhead and Bloody Bones. That's a song, Darius said at once. You probably haven't heard of them. The band's called Sucks, Sucks, and the Banshees. Baba Lennox blinked at him. No, they were named after the old nursery rhyme, he said. Rawhead and Bloody Bones steal naughty children from their homes, takes them to their dirty den, and then they're never seen again. Rawhead's the fat one who eats hair. Bloody Bones is the one who... Well, the one who... He shivered uncomfortably as Darius peered at him with confusion. Bloody Bones came into my room and asked if I was on my period yet because he wanted to chew on the dirty tampons. I said. Darius let out a horrified groan and Lucy shuddered. Steal naughty children? Lucy's son. What do you mean by that? Have we been... Have we been... Kidnapped, I thought, feeling a sick chill go through me. Baba Lennox shrugged uncertainly. I have no idea what's happening in the Plastic Flower Resort. I just know that this whole place is goddamn deranged, he said. We huddled in together even more. I could hear my own harsh breathing in my throat, and I squeezed my fusty, old, toy crocodile tighter. We were passing a painting of the woman, looming nearly to the ceiling, her arms outstretched in a rainbow over her head, her silver coin eyes staring off into the distance. The woman we call Regina. That's a song too, Darius interrupted. By the Sugar Cubes, that was Jork's band before she went solo and got famous. No, Papa Lennox's son, starting to look irritated with him. We named her that because Regina means queen, and she seems to be the leader of the whole place. Darius went quiet, 
and I squeezed his arm. I knew he tended to info dump whenever he was nervous. How do you plan on getting us out of here? Lucy demanded. The car was beginning to turn and I could see we were heading for a dip that led downwards into a dark tunnel. Baba Lennox held onto the sides as we began to roll down. There were no paintings or carpets here, just darkness, the rush of wind and clattering mechanical sounds all around us. Follow the dragon, said Baba Lennox's voice through the pitch blackness. One day the door in the dragon's mouth was open so I walked in. He said, there was a hallway and I saw it let outside. I almost made it when the brothers caught me and everything went black. I woke up in my resort bed again. I tried escaping first through the forest and then down the dirt road and I always got chased down by one of the brothers in a black taxi, dragging me back. There's no going home. We're trapped here like animals and I don't know why. We need to escape before we end up finding out in the worst way possible what they're keeping us here for. Down below us we saw a flashing rainbow sign. As the cart grew closer, I could see it read, Welcome friends to the Plastic Flower Shopping Center. Stay a while. You need to remember whatever you do to follow the dragon, said Baba Lennox. Follow the dragon. If we get separated, don't forget it. We were fast approaching the neon sign. With a crash, we went through another set of vinyl flaps, the cart rattling over the golden tracks. As we got out, I was immediately hit by a complete sensory overload. The shopping center was shadowy. The marble floors reflected dozens of multicolored neon lights from glistening storefronts with shiny trinkets in the front windows. The halls bustling with the dark shapes of chattering, laughing people, constant music blasting over the speakers. The smell of cooking foods, an array of different spices and sugars, all mixed up together in my nose. My head hurt instantly, not knowing where to look, too much to try to process all at once. It was an utter attack to the senses. Hanging from the ceiling was a huge screen, flashing rainbow colors. On it was Regina, dancing to the music thrumming from the speakers. Occasionally the screen would split into dozens of little Reginas, or change with a star or wipe transition. Dance, get down. Have fun, come on. Regina's voice was singing along to the music. I could hear the vibrations thumping in my head. Every now and again, she would say, We hope you enjoy your stay at the Plastic Flower. Feel free to ask for help anytime you do, please. I was reminded of an 80s aerobic video. I'll just be a second, said Baba Lennox. I'm getting the keys cut. We followed him out of the trolley standing awkwardly together, watching the cart travel slowly towards another set of flaps in the wall, no doubt to go back up towards the main house again. I watched as the man tottered over towards a news agency in between a hair salon and a beautician's. Despite moving so fast before, now Baba Lennox was walking like he was a frail old man. I realized it was an act so not to draw attention. I saw there was a stall in the middle of the floor. Bottles glistening with black, gray, and white liquid, specked with glitter behind the glass on the shelves. An old woman was standing in the center of the shelves, smiling at me. She was skeletal with long dyed red hair and bright red lipstick, wearing a long lacy black dress. She beckoned at me with a gnarled finger. I tried to ignore her, but I couldn't tear my eyes away from the bottles. The liquid inside was gently fizzing and hissing changing shades and swirling all deep, dark, and fascinating. I couldn't help it. I was drawn over. What are they? I asked, peering through the glass. Potions, honey. That can give you any type of ability you desire, said the woman in a rough voice like she ate cigarettes for every meal. Handmade by my lovely self, the lady, Kalptra. My heart fluttered. Half of me didn't believe her. She must have been some snake oil or MLM type, trying to sell me useless crap. The other half of me was enthralled. I was a nobody with nothing interesting about me. 
bland as a slice of bread. Not like Darius with his goth fashion and vast knowledge of music and films. Just one potion, and I could be less boring, less dull. But it was just liquid. Nothing I could drink could make me smarter, or funnier, or interesting. It was a scam. I noticed behind me. Darius was drawn over to the hair salon and Lucy gasped and walked away down the hall. I wondered what it was that had caught her interest. Don't cost much. The Lady Calyptra rasped with a hint of desperation in her voice. All I need in payment is a bit of blood. Just a drop. A flash of memory like a shot of disgusting medicine in my mind. A bloody bones at the foot of my bed. Asking whether I bled yet. Cringing, I turned away from the woman. I went over to Lucy as the Lady Calyptra let out a curse of frustration. Built into the wall was a long towering tank full of dark water. Lucy was standing transfixed. A look of childlike glee on her face. Look. She breathed at me with delight. I stared inside. A beautiful hazel-eyed woman was swimming gracefully through the water. Her long green scaled fish tail wiggling. Her blonde hair billowing behind her. She smiled and waved at us. Lucy clasped her hands under her chin. You know, some people become professional mermaid models. I said. That'd be your kind of thing, wouldn't it? You like the beach and all that. Lucy's face changed, the childlike awe falling away until she was sullen and nasty looking again. I am expected to run my family's esteemed jewelry business as an adult, not waste my time on the beach taking mermaid photos like some kind of idiot. She snapped at me. I sent her an exasperated look. Just trying to make conversation, jeez. I shot at her before walking off. I went over to see what my twin was up to. Darius was looking through hair products as a blonde teenage girl beside him read the back of a can of hairspray. Another teenage girl with dyed pink space buns was napping in one of the swivel chairs next to a mirror. Darius picked up something with interest. It was a Russian nesting doll, painted in swirling blues with a little blue-eyed, blonde-haired face peeling up at us. He unscrewed it, taking all the smaller dolls out, lining them up next to each other. Where do you pay? He asked the blonde teen. It's free, she said. I guess it comes with the entry payment or something. I don't know. Darius and I exchanged confused looks before he put the doll back together and slipped it in his pajama pant pocket with a shrug. The blonde girl turned to me. You pissed off the Lady Kelpatra, she said. She's not lying, you know. Those potions really are magic. I must have looked disbelieving because the blonde girl puffed up with indignation. I'll prove it, she said. She waved her hand over her head. And suddenly out of thin air, a black and white kitten appeared, falling down into the teenager's hands with a meow. She grinned, giving it a scratch behind the ears. Darius and I boggled at her. She threw the cat into the air, and it disappeared with a pop again. That's my cat from back home, she said. I can teleport any animal you want right here, as long as I've seen it before. Just a photo on your phone will do it. She peered out the window into the beauticians. Inside were another pair of teenage girls. One of them was writing on a mirror with lipstick, the same name over and over again. Nalani Nakamura. Nalani Nakamura. She does that because you forget stuff down here, said the blonde girl. She doesn't want to forget her name. Then she grinned. Look at this. She said and waved her hand again. From the ceiling of the beauticians, a spider fell into one of the girl's hair. She screamed, dropping her nail polish to the floor with a shatter. Bernice, fucking stop it. She yelled, shaking the spider from her hair and glaring over towards the blonde girl who laughed like a hyena. Don't worry, Bernice said when she saw our disapproving looks. That's my cousin Ricky. She's a bitch. At least I'm not a psycho like you. Ricky yelled back. Bernice rolled her eyes. Totally get a potion from the lady, she said, turning to us. It's wicked. 
She pointed at the sleeping girl in the chair. That's my girlfriend, Persephone. She's son. And like, actual lesbian girlfriends, by the way. Not like how old ladies call their pals girlfriends. Persephone's got dream-weaving powers. Like a teenage Freddy Krueger. Can jump into your dreams and bring anything from a dream into the real world. I stared at the sleeping girl. The Yanni's in my chest like a gnawing ant. Could she wake up? Was she permanently dead to the world? I looked back over at the Lady Calpatra's store. She was sending me a look that made my skin crawl, hungry and sharp. I shifted uncomfortably. I don't know how the hell Bernice had magical powers. This was all insane. Maybe I would wake up back home any moment now. It felt too real to be a dream. But all this lady person wanted was a drop of blood for a real-life magic potion. I'd be stupid to turn her down. I started moving towards the stall again, and the Lady Kelpatra grinned from ear to ear. Done. I heard a voice say and turned. Baba Lennox was hobbling towards us, gesturing at Lucy to come over. The sliver of unease tickled unpleasantly at the back of my neck. I'd forgotten about him completely. As we gathered around him, he opened his palm, showing us a shiny silver key. What is that? The Lady Kelpatra yelled it suddenly and Baba Lennox snapped his hand shut. You think you're clever, Lennox, but you ain't slick, she said with a nasty grin. I seen you racing after the dragon door. Now you got a key in your hand. You stole it, didn't you? You stole the key to the dragon door. What's even in the dragon door? I wonder what the bosses of this place would think of you, skulking around where you're not allowed. Baba Lennox gopped at her. I noticed the music had gone quiet and I looked up. On the giant screen, Regina had gone still, her face losing its constant smile and becoming blank and staring. Stole a key? She called out, voice booming around us and bouncing off the walls. Stole a key? Baba Lennox moved as fast as lightning. He grabbed our arms and started running with us towards the gold tracks again. Although there wasn't any cart to climb into, I was closest to him and he stuffed the key in my hand. Don't forget the dragon. He hissed as we reached the vinyl flaps. If they get me, you need to escape here on your own. Tell the authorities about this place. We do not tolerate thievery in our establishment, Regina called. My dear customers, please help us capture the troublemaker who has stolen our staff's property. You shall be rewarded. Lucy was looking around behind us. She let out a horrified wheeze. I turned. There was a horrible stench in the air that reminded me of rotten leaves and stagnant water. Her head. Lucy whimpered. Her head. In the tank, the mermaid was still swimming around, but her head had gone. Just a wriggling torso, arms, and tail. I blinked, thinking my eyes were playing tricks on me. I saw that in the beauticians and the hair salon, the teenage girls had all run to hide. It came off, Lucy wailed. There was a deafening crash of water and glass, and the tank water poured out onto the floor in a flood. Emerging from the tank was the mermaid's head suspended in the air, her mouth hanging open. Her eyes rolled back to show the whites. Her hair was starting to grow, tendrils whipping out longer and longer with a sound like a videotape being rewound. A reward, eh? The Lady Kelpatra said with a cackle. Don't mind if I do. Something was happening to the old lady's face. Her skin and dress was rippling, shivering. Then she burst into a cloud of moths, gray, white, and black. What the fuck is going on? Screeched Darius as Baba Lennox tried to clamber up the tracks, dragging us along. Then Baba Lennox screamed as the moths swarmed on him. They flapped around his face, attaching to his neck and face. Blood began to streak down his chin. Hide, he yelled at us. And I grabbed Lucy's and Darius's arms, pulling them across the tracks for the opposite set of vinyl flaps. There was a soggy slapping sound and I turned to see the mermaid's head was levitating slowly through the air in our direction. Tons of soaking hair floating around her and dragging across the floor. 
Everything went dark as we managed to clamber inside the tunnel entrance, hiding in the shadows, huddled together. For a few long moments, we just sat there, holding our breath and shaking. Baba Lennox's cries were growing faint as though he was being dragged away. I wondered if the moths had carried him off or the mermaid's prehensile hair. No. I heard Regina's frustrated voice from outside on the screen. He's not the one with the key. Dear customers, the thieves are still loose. Please, we must work together to capture the criminals befouling our lovely establishment. Remember you will be rewarded. I could feel the jagged edge of the key sticking into the flesh in my hand. I pulled my old toy crocodile out of my dressing gown pocket. Unscrewing the head, I put the key inside, nestled next to my switchblade. No one will see it in there. I whispered to the others. No one knows that we're the ones who haven't. We just need to stay low and act normal and search this place top to bottom for the dragon door without anyone noticing. Okay? I felt Darius and Lucy nod beside me, trembling with fear. There was a bump against us and we muffled screams. It was only the cart that had completed this round and was trying to roll across the tracks again. With the cart behind us, Hopefully we looked like fresh arrivals and not people hiding in the tunnel. We wandered out into the shopping center together. All three of us stood like stunned rabbits. A blonde teenager was spraying her hair in a salon. Another girl sleeping in a swivel chair. At a beautician's, a third teen was painting her nails while one wrote in lipstick on the mirror. I looked at Darius with confusion. How'd we get here again? I asked. My brain felt slow and muggy, not working properly. My twin just blinked at me. I don't know, said Darius slowly. Were we just with someone before? I can't remember. I replied and looked at the girl beside us. She had her name embroidered on her nightgown. Lucy. I probably got a limo here. I don't know about you lot. She said in an uppity fashion. I shook my head. What are we even here for? I said, I've got no idea. Darius replied. Our minds were completely blank. I couldn't even recall what happened five minutes ago. My short-term memory was a white, foggy haze. There was a tickling at the side of my neck and I brushed at it. A gray moth fell to the ground along with droplets of blood. It fluttered on the ground and then took flight again. The collar of my pajama shirt was dotted with red. I blinked lazily at the insect, flapping away from us. I looked at my two companions with confusion. Was I supposed to buy something? Was someone's birthday coming up? I had no idea why I was at the shops for. I should have written a list. The triplets probably just dumped us here, said Darius, and I smiled bitterly. Lucy shot us a narrow look. My parents wouldn't have dumped me anywhere, she snapped. They'll be here to get me in any moment. Good for you, Darius replied in a testy voice. We were both getting thoroughly sick of her. I'm just going to browse, I said to my twin. We might run into the triplets and then we can go home. Darius nodded and we started heading down the corridor. All the other shoppers seemed to tower above us as we moved through the crowd and the three of us moved closer together. I felt my skin tingling with unease. My heart an uncomfortable lump in my throat. The giant screen hanging from the wall had something wrong with it. The dancing woman's eyes looked like silver coins as she twirled and kicked and swayed to the endless droning music. The floor was damp. Our bare feet growing slimy. In some of the water puddles, I could see tiny flowers beginning to bloom. I could smell food from somewhere. Meats and bread and sugar. My stomach growled and I followed the aroma towards a restaurant. Normally at any other shopping center, Darius and I were fine exploring on our own, but this time we stuck closely to each other's sides. Despite her rudeness, Lucy was sticking just as close to us. I didn't want to be left alone in this place. I was reminded of the first time the triplets had taken us to the cinema when we were young. How I'd felt small and scared in the cavernous rooms with huge screens. Everything too large and intimidating. 
The three of us nervously hovered around the entrance of the restaurant. It was a buffet. Deep dishes full of steaming food with ladies to help ourselves. Booth seats lined the room and everyone was full of people enjoying their meals. I couldn't remember when I had last eaten and my stomach growled louder. You can come in, you know. Someone called from the buffet. It was a large beefy man with frizzy hair and a red face. He had a friendly smile, but we still approached him like he was a dog who might snap at our heads. Get yourself some grub. All free, you know. He said as he ladled some food on his plate. My name's Andy. We shyly introduced ourselves as we turned to get ourselves plates. As I reached for cutlery, my plush toy in my pocket jostled in my pocket. I pulled the crocodile out and stared at it. I noticed Darius and Lucy staring as well. That's important for some reason, said Darius and Lucy, and I nodded. We need to find something, murmured Lucy. I felt like my brain was drowning in fog. Why were we here? Weren't we just shopping and having a good time? We didn't need to do anything important, did we? It didn't matter. I was hungry and wanted food. Putting my toy away, I saw there was a tag over each tray of food saying what country it was from. I put a pretzel with mustard and currywurst from Germany on my plate, along with Rogan Josh from India. Filling up a glass of orange juice, I looked around to try to find somewhere to sit. A young woman with bushy hair put her hand up at her table. I went over as Lucy and Darius got their own food. Didn't want you eating on the floor, said the young woman, motioning around at the full booths. My name's Taz, and it looks like you've already met my hubby Andy. I introduced myself as Andy, Darius, and Lucy came over to sit with us. Good choice, Andy said to me, looking at the German food. His plate had a giant hunk of meats on it. When he saw my curious look, he said, Oh, this is pork knuckle. German stuff. I used to have it at family reunions. I looked with interest at what everyone else was having. Lucy had a bowl of pho and a glass of some colorful looking dessert drink. What's that? I asked and she sneered at me. Che Tai. She said like I had asked what one plus one equaled. I don't know why I bothered with her. Darius was eating sushi. Taz had a big plate of what looked like a flat, holy pancake with colorful stews on top. My stepmom runs an Ethiopian restaurant that serves all this food. It's my favorite, Taz told me. You use the injera bread to scoop up the curries and stew. The first time I had it, I was looking for the knives and forks, but my stepmom says you eat it with your hands. I nodded, fascinated. The conversation dulled as we hoed into our food. It was all delicious, rich, and flavorsome. When I sipped the orange juice, I felt an odd aching in my chest feeling nostalgic for something I couldn't place. What's Lola after? said Andy to Taz. I saw her hairy head floating down the corridor. It scared the crap out of me. I faintly remembered a woman's decapitated head with the eyes rolled back surrounded by tons of wet blonde hair. It must have been an old nightmare I'd had or a snippet of a horror film I'd caught Terrius watching. Speaking of, I felt my twin perk up beside me. Lola's a really good song by this band you've probably not heard of called The Kinks. No one cares. Lucy snapped at him and Darius fell silent. I fought back the urge to kick her in the shin under the table. Resorting to glaring daggers at her instead, I pulled off a piece of the salty pretzel, dunking it in my curry, and taking a bite. This stuff's not as good as the family reunions, said Andy in a wistful tone as he nibbled on the pork knuckle. Taz nodded as she wiped the last bit of sauce on her plate up with her bread. Yeah, this just makes me want to go home, she said with a faraway look in her eye. Everyone was silent as we were hit by memories. The interior of our city apartment was a mishmash of tacky gold ornaments that the triplets bought and tasteful antiques that Old Mother preferred. Old Mother who made us huge breakfasts on weekends. Jam toast, croissants, pancakes, hot chocolate, and fresh squeezed orange juice. I looked down at my glass, realizing that this is 
what I was feeling nostalgic for. We were stuck here. None of us could get home. Baba Lennox had told us that the dragon door was the way out. Why are they keeping us here? I said looking around at the small group. Everyone's faces were clearer and sharper now. All of us breaking through the brain fog at once. Yeah, said Taz with a frown. And why do we forget everything? Darius let out a distressed moan. How are we supposed to remember next time the amnesia sets in? He said. Amnesia means forgetting things if you didn't know. Everyone shot him an annoyed look. Maybe we're like in a human monogre. Darius went on. Monogre is a fancy word for zoo. We know what it means. Lucy snapped back. We're all just little pets for their amusement, Darius said, undeterred by her rudeness. Or we're in limbo, and Regina, Rawhead, and Bloody Bones are grim reapers or something. Taz frowned. I found out about the plastic flower in a pamphlet in the mail, she said. I rang the number, and a taxi picked us up the next night. How do you book a trip to limbo? Darius was quiet. I remember that mom had said the same. Finding out about this place in a mailed pamphlet. Maybe it was a trick and if you ring the number, you agree on a mass suicide of you and whatever family you bring. Lucy immediately bristled like an angry cat. My parents wouldn't kill me. She said. Or they're harvesting us. Fattening us up to eat. Said Darius. On a roll now with ideas. And he patted his big stomach. I'd last them a few weeks. He grinned. Whatever's happening here. I don't want to stick around and find out. Said Taz. Does anyone remember how to get out of here? I looked down at my plush crocodile. Unscrewing the head. I opened it up and showed the group what I had inside. My switchblade and the shiny silver key. Around the table. Taz's eyes widened. Andy's mouth fell open and Darius and Lucy jerked in recognition. Someone screamed, the sound deafeningly loud, bouncing down the hall. We whipped around and saw Regina's giant face on the hanging screen. Her coin eyes pointed straight at me. The thief! The thief! She yelled. She has the key. She has it! Everyone in the restaurant exchanged baffled looks. They'd obviously all been affected by the forgetfulness, too. What's she talking about? They murmured. What key? A stench of swamp water, seaweed, salt and rotting plants hit us all at once. There was a whirling sound like a tape being unwound. Down the other end of the hall were huge coiled trunks of sopping blonde hair slithering towards us. Yes. I heard the deafening shout of Regina from the screen. Capture the criminal and receive a reward. The key must be returned. Fuck off, Lola. Andy shouted. Leave them alone. Then he bent down and whispered to us. Don't worry. I'll keep her at bay. I've taken a potion from the Lady Calpatra. Taz immediately ducked behind the table at his words. Run. She hissed. Scrambling to our feet, we made a run out of the restaurant. The heavy food in my belly made me feel slow and sluggish. A tendril of hair as thick as a... Burmese python whirled over our heads and we screamed, throwing ourselves to the floor. It punched a hole through the screen, ripping it apart with a cackle of electricity. Regina's face flapped grotesquely as the blonde tendrils swept the hall, smashing windows. All the patrons were running and screaming, trying to find shelter. We tried to get to our feet, but we heard a rumbling sound in the distance. Down the hall, covering the entire floor was a wave of billowing hair rising up like a tsunami about to crash down on us. Suddenly, Andy bounded in front of us on all fours. Something was happening to him. His clothes were dissolving away, being replaced by dark fur. His shoulders were bouncing up, and he was growing bigger, his hands changing into animal-like claws. He snarled and snapped as his mouth grew into a drooling maw full of black gums and sharp teeth, his nose stretching into a snout his eyes rolling in his skull. The Andy Wolf launched through the air, scrambling through the undulating waves of blonde locks. At the end of the hall, 
Hidden among the tendrils, I could see a woman's face with the eyes rolled back. The Andy Wolf was headed straight for it. Vines of hair wrapped around the Andy Wolf, lifting him up to the ceiling. The corridor was chaos. The tendrils were thrashing madly, slamming against the walls and ceilings as the Andy Wolf snapped and tore at them. Regina's ripped face filled up the remains of the hanging screen as she shouted, The key! Get the key! Down the hall, I spotted an elevator. A way to escape. I motioned at Lucy and Darius, pointing at it, while the Andy Wolf kept Lola distracted. We could make a run for it. We all charged. Suddenly, Lola threw the Andy Wolf at us like a bowling ball at pins. The huge weight of the animal smashed into me full force. My crocodile toy went flying, the key and knife clattering onto the floor of hair as the Andy Wolf knocked my head against the wall. The world went black around me. My head was throbbing in pain, like a knife being thrust into my forehead. I was surrounded by a void of nothing, just complete blackness wherever I looked. I moaned, holding on to my aching head. Through the darkness, I could see a faint, glowing pink shape. It was dancing and twirling through the void towards me. As it grew closer, I could see it was a teenage girl with dyed pink hair and space buns. Oh, hi, she said in a monotone voice, her face expressionless. Whose head have I ended up in? I just blinked at her with confusion. Not a lot of people are asleep right now, she said. You all right? I didn't know what to say. The girl took my hand. Let's see how you're doing, she said, and the blackness faded away around us. We were in the shopping center, and I could see my unconscious body sprawled across the floor. Lucy and Darius were at my side, yelling my name frantically as the Andy Wolf pawed at my side like a distressed puppy. The floor of blonde hair was retreating with an unwinding sound, dragging my toy crocodile and the key with it. Thank you so much said Regina's strawberry ice cream voice. You shall be promptly rewarded. I heard the pink-haired girl tut beside me. Bunch of freaks, the people that run this place, she said, and the shopping center disappeared around us. We were back in the black void, the teenager glowing pink through the darkness. Do you want a spot of help? She said, her voice and face still devoid of emotion. I can bring anything from your imagination into the real world. My girlfriend, Benice, says I'm like a friendly Freddy Krueger. And by a girlfriend, I don't mean how middle-aged straight ladies say it. We're total lesbians. Bring something from my imagination into reality. The first thought I had was of a Japanese dragon dancing across the wall like a living painting. Then it morphed into a memory of watching the Chinese New Year's dragon dance from the apartment window. The huge glittering swaths of fabric, glaring eyes and snarling mouth moving down the street, the puppeteers beneath, using poles to work its long, curling body. Very creative, said the strange pink-haired girl, and I realized through the void, the Chinese dragon from my memories was recreated, all in reds and oranges like a trail of fire. I saw a small smile beginning to grow across the pink-haired girl's face. This is gonna be fun, she said. I awoke to the rhythmic sound of banging drums and clattering bells. Lucy and Darius sighed in relief when they saw I was alright. I stared behind them, mouth hanging open. What is that? I heard Regina's voice shout. What is that? Lola's disembodied head slowly turned around. The Andy Wolf's body and face was shrinking, teeth disappearing into his mouth. The rhythmic music was getting louder. A giant's growling face with fiery eyes, giant teeth and a red spiky mane was dancing, rocking side to side down the corridor towards us. Its body was all rippling red and gold scales and beneath it was billowing rainbow smoke. The creature filled up the entire corridor, from floor to ceiling and wall to wall. The crashing cymbals and thundering drums was so loud, I thought it would burst my ears. Feeling it bellow in every corner of my brain, Lola's head was floating backwards, trying to get away from it. No one said anything, everyone just staring open-mouthed. It was nearly at us now. I saw Lucy turn, 
The blonde hair had stopped moving, limp and harmless on the floor, no longer dragging my toy and key away from us. Lucy bolted as the music thrummed, canceling out every other noise, making my teeth rattle and my eyes vibrate in my skull. Lucy was in the path of the giant creature, its leering mouth looming hungrily down at her. Scooping it all up, Lucy bounded back again. She pushed the key and toy into my hand, and I put the key inside the crocodile's head. The creature had reached us. It moved past, its body pushing us against the wall. Everything turned a rainbow haze as we were pressed against the wall, clutching at each other. The twin yellow beacons of its eyes glowed through the smoke ahead. My mind felt completely empty. No thoughts, just the crash of the music. I saw Darius raise his hand next to his mouth, flapping soundlessly, pointing down the corridor. If we moved across the hall, we'd reach the elevator in a few seconds. The glass door of the elevator grew closer as we moved through the technicolor smog. Slamming my hand against the button, the door slid open and we fell desperately inside. The door shut again, and after we pushed at the buttons, it moved down at a snail's pace, inch by inch. Through the glass door, we watched the continued chaos. Lola was hovering next to her smashed tank, where we'd first seen her. Her headless body suddenly sat up and threw its hands back, clapping them forward. All the spilled water across the shopping center floor lifted up and melted together until it created a massive snake-like shape. Lola's head floated to the front of it, and then there was a roaring rushing sound as the water snake threw itself towards the Chinese dragon. As soon as the water hit it, the dragon collapsed into a pile of soggy fabric. The water snake collapsed into a downfall of foul-smelling swamp water as the blonde head flew down the corridor and around a corner in a flurry of blonde twisting hair. The elevator rolled down into the darkness of the floor below. Through the clear elevator doors, we saw a circular room with a skylight where the sun shone in. There was a huge pile of something in the middle of the room, a figure moving inside it. What is that? Darius whispered and the figure froze, turning around. We shrunk away. It was Rawhead, sitting in a bird's nest of twigs and wadded up slimy hair of all different colors. The lift kept moving downwards into the darkness, leaving the figure and his disgusting creation behind. For a few seconds there was nothing but black. My mind felt empty and I wondered if I was falling into the brain fog again, or was just in a state of shock. I gripped my toy crocodile under my chin, hands crushed into the comforting felt. I didn't want to put it in my pocket again. The feel and smell reminded me of home. The elevator doors opened. Nervously, we shuffled out. This floor was quieter, darker as though abandoned. The neon lights were red, casting the place in a strange, ominous light. Everything was dead silent. I heard a rustling above me. We looked up. There was a flurry of moths fluttering around the ceiling. We watched as they flew down to the floor a few feet ahead, forming the shape of a person. It was a teenager with long dyed red hair, a black lacy dress, and red lipstick. She patted her plump stomach in a satisfied way. Good feed, she said. Then she spotted us, staring, smiling. She nodded and waved at us. Hello, she said. Come over to the second floor sometime. I got a stall there that might interest you kids. Just ask for the Lady Calpatra. With that, she wandered off again down the hall and away into the darkness. My heart was thumping in my chest as we huddled together in the empty corridor. I felt like at any moment something would jump out at us. I could hear faint laughter. At the end of the corridor was an indoor gated playground, with a set of monkey bars, a sand pit, and a jungle gym with a slide. Swinging on the bars was a kid younger than us, with freckles, long black hair, and a beanie. When he spotted us, his laughter stopped, his smile freezing. He dropped from the bars and hurried sheepishly through the gate. I wasn't playing on it, he said. That's so babyish. Yeah, right, Lucy replied. Flushing with embarrassment, he raced off with his head ducked down. 
My heart suddenly jumped into my chest with excitement. Look, I said, pointing down the corridor. Moving across the floor was a painted Japanese dragon, swirling and dancing across the tiles. It was headed through the playground gates, swirling around in the sand pit. You want to go on the playground? Lucy said to me like I was brain dead. I wanted to smack her in the teeth. The dragon tours over there, you complete fucking... I snarled back before Darius put a calming hand on my shoulder. Come on, he said. We'll be out of here in a second. The three of us headed across the floor towards the playground. Every store was shut and empty. The black shop windows, like staring eyes. I kept looking over my shoulder. It was so easy for us to be chased down and cornered like scared mice in here. I couldn't see any other escape route but the elevator we'd come through and the dancing dragon head. It only took a few minutes to get to the playground, but it felt like a lifetime. Our footsteps the only sound in the silence. Darius reached the gate first, undoing the latch. The dragon quivered in the sand pit and shot away up a rope ladder and into the jungle gym. Then the silence was broken all at once. All the lights turned on and an unwinding sound bounced off the walls. For a second, I thought of the horrible dismembered head with the eyes rolled back, poison fear shooting through my blood, but it wasn't Lola. A screen was rolling down from the ceiling. Regina's smiling face was revealed, fixed and frozen. From the end of the corridor, the elevator opened and hordes of excitedly chattering people moved down. Do you want an opportunity to dance on the big screen for every adoring patron at the Plastic Flower Resort? Cried Regina. That's right. We're having a May dance. The crowd cheered and clapped. Music started to blare through the hall. After the recent silence, it seemed extra loud like an ice pick smashing into my ears. I'll be the judge and pick out the best of you, said Regina. Three rounds of fun, fun, fun. Another cheer broke out, clapping and stamping of feet. Darius grabbed my arm. What is that? He said. The elevator was opening again. Waddling out was a swollen figure with shiny coin eyes and drool dripping down his chin. Rawhead. I hissed. He looked up, staring past the crowd and locking us in his silver gaze. Then all at once he bolted for us like a bullet from a gun. Lucy screamed and I felt my stomach turn to jelly. Jesus, screamed Darius as we made a run for it. We raced into the playground, across the sand pit and towards the rope ladder that would take us inside. We were plunged into a sea of bright, colorful plastic. I could see a hen, the end of the dragon's tail disappearing up a plastic tunnel. The slobbering sound was growing louder behind us. The pink plastic tunnel had foot and hand holes to climb. We raced for them and I felt something brush my foot. Turning around, I saw the white drooling face peering up at us. Mouth hanging open, saliva billowing down his front. Whimpering with terror, we clambered upwards. I couldn't fall. I couldn't fall. The handhold stretched out above our heads. I looked around again. Rawhead was struggling up the tunnel, swollen body dragging and sticking against the plastic. Finally, I could see the final step. We scrambled out of the tunnel, panting and heaving. We were in a little landing with a blue coil that led to a narrow hidden space behind the playground with a broken escalator leading upwards. There were numbered spinning blocks on poles and through them we could see the whole floor. A dark blue slide led down to the ground again. The dragon was nowhere to be seen. Where is it? Darius hissed desperately. Where is it? It must have been too fast for us, I realized with growing dread. We'd missed it. For a second I was baffled at why Rawhead had run after us in the first place before realizing that of course, Regina had set him loose like a rabid dog. After Andy had fought to protect us before, she wanted to use this May dance to distract people from trying to help us again. Bringing all these people down to an abandoned floor in the first place didn't seem very smart. It didn't matter though. Whether Regina had made a smart decision or not, we needed to move. Let's get out of here, I said moving towards the slide. Lucy grabbed my shoulder. 
Through the blocks, I could see someone emerging through the crowd and moving towards the playground. A tall, thin man with wild black hair, a top hat, and rumpled suit. Bloody Bones. Brother! Bloody Bones squawked as he jumped the fence. Where are they? Rawhead let out a gurgling moan from down in the tunnel. Bloody Bones screeched and we saw him clambering inside the bottom of the blue slide. The escalator. Get to the escalator. Darius wailed. A clammy hand wrapped around my ankle, jerking me back. I screamed, looking over to see Rawhead clambering up the last step, looking like a giant slug sweating and stuck in the tunnel, his hand on my foot. Darius grabbed my crocodile from my hand, unscrewed the head and grabbed the switchblade. He flung out with the knife, stabbing my attacker in the forehead. A thick, vicious liquid, like molasses, oozed down from his flabby face as he let out a groan. Sliding down the plastic tunnel again, we heard him thump all the way down to the bottom. There was still scrambling from the slide. We had to move. Come on! I yelled at Lucy, who was still staring out over the floor. Her eyes were wide and teary, her mouth hanging open. I stopped to look at what was grabbing her attention. Her eyes were fixed on the dancing crowd. Lucy was looking at a man and a woman, laughing and dancing together, the man twirling the woman around. Mom. Dad. Lucy's son. Tears billowing down her cheeks. Please. Down the dark indigo of the slide, I could see a talon-like hand reaching out for us. Lucy, get out of the way. I cried out, but it was too late. A pair of skinny arms shot out from the top of the slide and wrapped around Lucy's neck as Bloody Bones hauled them both backwards. They fell screaming down the playground slide together. Darius and I just clutched helplessly at each other. There was a high-pitched wail of despair. Peering through the rows of blocks, I could see down below, Bloody Bones, shaking Lucy upside down by the ankles. She was gripping her nightie so it wouldn't flip over her head and expose herself. Rawhead was standing beside them, the knife still buried to the hilt in between his eyes. He didn't seem to notice. I stared, heart thumping in my throat. Bloody Bones flipped Lucy right side up again. What you do with the key? He wailed. You no have it? It not here? Lucy stared desperately over at the dancing crowd. Her parents continued to completely ignore her. Where are your friends? Where they be, answer, answer, they have it, horrible stealing thieves. Bloody Bones was screeching into her face as she cringed and shuddered. He shook her so hard her head rattled on her neck like a rag doll. In the playground still? He demanded, turning around and I ducked down so he wouldn't see me. No, said Lucy. They got away, they're not there anymore. They ran into the May dance. Bloody Bones looked over at the crowd of dancing people, who weren't taking any notice of the commotion. Then he passed Lucy off to his brother as casually as though he were handing him a grocery bag. She'd covered for us, lied in the face of a terrifying monster to protect us. She was our savior. Come on, said Darius, and I turned to see he was already halfway down the coil. Watching the brothers walk off with Lucy tucked under their arm, I reluctantly followed him. We ran up the broken escalator, together. The escalator seemed endless, and my legs screamed at the strain of running up the steep incline for so long. Looking behind me, my stomach swooped, feeling a wave of vertigo. The bottom looked miles away. If I slipped, I'd break my neck. As we ran on, I slowly began to question why we were running in the first place. Was a shop going to close soon? Was there a sale on? Were we going to miss a bus? I could hear faint music in the patter of water. Finally, heaving for breath, we reached the top. We were in front of a large fountain and music was playing. Darius perked up at the sound of it. That's a Jimi Hendrix song. He sang. The wind cries merry. Someone was flying around the ceiling, diving through the spouting water. A small man with slicked black hair, wearing a loud gold suit, laughing as he flew around to the music. He seemed familiar, 
The neon lights made the water flash in different colors. He pushed his hand forward, manipulating the air to make the fountain pulse and warp in different, interesting shapes and motions. People were standing and sitting around the fountain, watching as they sipped from drinks and ate snacks. He flew and spun and danced in midair, making the water twirl with him with a flick of his hands. The song wasn't coming from the intercom. A man with spiky green hair was sitting in the doorway of a music store, with a record player attached to speakers, nodding and smiling along. There was a girl with us before, wasn't there? Darius asked. Or maybe I'm thinking of something else. I shrugged. There was a stall down the corridor, in between the music shop and a video arcade. I approached it, seeing it was serving boba tea. I looked at the fridges full of drinks and opened up one of the doors, picking the cookies and cream flavor. I got a straw from the counter and stuck it through the plastic top. Darius had taken a seat at a bench, watching the flying fountain men. I joined him, taking a sip. In the back of my mind, I felt an uncomfortable itch, as though I were forgetting something. I was probably supposed to buy something at the shops and couldn't remember what. Didn't matter. I had to remember it later. The drink was delicious, and I passed it to Darius to try. He took a sip and his eyes widened, making an appreciative sound. We shared the drink between us, passing it back and forth as we watched the people run around and play in the arcade. We'd never much been into video games ourselves. The flying fountain man suddenly screamed and flew off over our heads and down the corridor. We looked up, seeing everyone scatter in different directions, running for safety. Through the fountain, a head was emerging. Eyes rolled back, surrounded by tons of wet blonde hair. It was floating straight for us. We were frozen in place as the disembodied head grew closer the soggy slop of its hair dragging against the floor. It stopped in front of us, the stench of seaweed and foul water so strong I thought I'd choke on it. I'm sorry, she said in a high, girlish voice. I didn't mean to scare you. My name's Lola. I blinked. What? said Darius, completely flabbergasted. Sorry it looked like I was attacking you. I just wanted to take the key from you before Regina swooped, she explained. I thought you just found the key and picked it up out of curiosity and didn't know how dangerous it was. Carrying that key puts a target on your head, and I wanted to protect you. Throwing the dog was a mistake. Darius and I exchanged confused looks. Then the memory came back to me. Baba Lennox told us that the key unlocks the dragon door, which will get us out, I said, and Lola smiled her head nodding up and down. I can help if you ever run into the brothers and Regina again, she said. Do you have any kind of container? We felt around and Darius got his Russian nesting doll from his pocket, opening it up and pulling the smaller ones out. Perfect, said Lola. Suddenly her hair started making that uncanny swirling sound like a tape being rewound. The tendrils of hair started to wrap around her hanging head. Faster and faster until her face was covered. The wrapped head began rocking rapidly from side to side as the hair started squeezing and compressing her skull, making it smaller and smaller. Then when she had compacted herself to around the size of an apricot, she whizzed into the open Russian doll. Darius closed the top and then shook his head, looking dazed. I felt the same. Everything in the plastic flower was just utterly mad. You'd think I'd be used to it by now, but it still made my head hurt trying to keep up with it all. So she was alright all along, Darius said to me. Maybe the other scary freaks around here are alright too. Yeah, I bet the hair-munching, period-drinking brothers are actually a lovely pair. I replied. We stood up. I keep forgetting. I muttered. Find the dragon door. There's got to be a way to not get sucked into the brain fog. Darius threw up his hands. I don't know. He said. This is all just too goddamn crazy. I can't think straight. He looked at the Russian nesting doll and shuddered, throwing it into my hands. 
I don't care if she's nice. He said. Lola's creepy. So much for the horror film fan. Nonetheless, I tuck the Russian doll full of hair into my dressing gown pocket, along with my toy crocodile. In the distance, we could hear a whispering sound. Two pairs of silver eyes flashed ahead. We ducked under the counter of the boba cup store to hide. Stupid assholes. Stupid assholes. Bloody Bones was murmuring under his breath as he slunk down across the floor. Rawhead waddling next to him. Bloody Bones paused and stared into the arcade, which had gone dead quiet. Stupid assholes. He said again before continuing walking. Bloody Bones was strangely funny. Always so outraged at everything in a ridiculously over-the-top way that was terrifying, yet amusing. Felt like crying and laughing at the same time. Not like his brother Rawhead, who was just a grotesque nightmare. Sick of this. Sick of it. Bloody Bones was hissing to his brother. Why can't we just do it the old way? It better. It better. No. We have to do it her way. Her dumb, stupid way that is stupid. Rawhead just made a gargling sound. He started hacking and heaving as Bloody Bones ignored him, still grumbling to himself. The short, fat man spat up a wad of tangled hair, stuck together with gooey phlegm. Leaning down, he picked it up off the floor and popped it back in his mouth again, starting to chew wetly. When their footsteps seemed faint, we peered over the countertop. The brothers were gone. The sounds of the arcade started up again. They were all laughing and chattering, acting as though nothing had happened. I looked over at the music store. The green-haired man was standing in the doorway with a frown on his face. When he spotted us, he smiled. Yo, he said, waving at us. You're new. We moved closer. My name's Milo, he said, giving us a hand to shake. My kid's running around here somewhere. We call him Cherry because he drinks cherry coke by the gallon. He's got it in his veins instead of blood. He said it in a jokingly way, but... The plastic flower was so strange. Could have been true for all I know. So you must have a glass of Milo then, I said, and the man grinned. Sure do, sister, he said. Come in and have a look around. It's grouse in here. Inside the shop were rows upon rows of CDs, cassette tapes, and records with guitars and keyboards against the wall. Cherry stuck his head up from under the counter. He was younger than us about ten and freckled, with a beanie over his long hair. He waved, sipping from a can of cherry coke. Darius immediately bolted around the place, picking things up and making excited sounds. It was his idea of heaven. Milo ran a finger through the tops of the records. Want to listen to anything? He asked me. I shrugged. My brother's more into music than me, I said. I was reminded again of how fascinating everyone I met in this place was compared to myself. There wasn't really any story here that hadn't grabbed my interest because I just wasn't an interesting person. The only thing that had grabbed my attention was the lady Kelpatra's potions. That was only because it could change me from a dull blank space to someone worth paying attention to. What's your favorite? I asked Milo. Play that. The man grinned. Oh, there's too many. That's like choosing your favorite child, he said. I'm your only child, Jerry said from the counter, and Milo laughed. True that, he replied. I'm a DJ. I've been collecting all this stuff for years. I'm trying to find something I haven't listened to. Darius paused in his happy exploring. He looked around at the store, bursting to the seams with CDs, cassettes, and vinyls. You'd think he'd be delighted to find another person with the same interests as him, but instead, a sullen expression was growing across his face. Milo clearly knew more about music than Darius, and that was a terrible thing. He had to be the expert in the room, and now, he wasn't anymore. There was a muttering sound and footsteps in the corridor. My stomach did an unpleasant jump. Bloody Bones was lurching down the floor again, without his brother. Alone now. Was he going to be patrolling the corridor all day like a hungry watchdog? All day? What day is it? Is it night? How long had we been here for? Oh, you. 
Milo shouted and Bloody Bones whipped around, face twisted up in a feral snarl. I shrunk back with fear. What the hell was he doing trying to actually talk to him? What? What? He screeched back. Why the period blood, dude? Milo's son. Fucking weird. What's wrong with regular blood? Suddenly Bloody Bones was lunging towards us as Milo laughed and pressed a button on the wall. A plastic screen began to roll down over the entrance. Bloody Bones crashed against the barrier just as it closed shut, his breath leaving behind a fog of brownish residue. It tastes better, he screamed. You mock me? You dare? Nasty little thing? Make me sick. Darius and I backed away, clutching at each other. Great job, Dad, snapped Cherry. He's going to be yelling at us all day now. Milo laughed even harder. I know. It's hilarious, he said. Look at that little freak go. Bloody Bones started jabbing his finger at us and screaming, spraying the plastic with spin. I don't like you. I don't like any of you. Fuck all of you. Oh, what language? Milo replied in a fake posh voice like he was a horrified old lady. Bloody Bones let out a scream so high-pitched, I thought my eardrums would burst. Darius and I covered our ears cringing. You are shifty little vermins. Vile vermins. Make me vomit. He squawked. We give you everything and you steal. You steal. You steal, you stealers, you. You steal fizzy lifting drinks, said Milo. And Cherry burst out into laughter despite himself. The man just stared contemptuously at the spitting, hissing creature like it was a child throwing a temper tantrum. I'm sick of this fool, Milo said and flexed his palms. Outside the door, there was a whirling sound like a firework being unleashed. Cherry put his hands over his ears. A ball of fire exploded down the hall and we threw ourselves out onto the floor in terror. Bloody Bone screeched one last time and bolted with his arms over his head, whistling to himself. Milo went over and pressed the button to make the screen roll up again. The two of us just lay on the floor together. I started to think that maybe this was how the brain fog worked. We were being constantly bombarded with such bizarre events, combined with a sensory overload of sounds, sights, and smells that our mind just went blank, unable to process it all. Darius grabbed my arm. Look, he said in a hoarse voice. I turned to where he was staring. Dancing over the ceiling was the familiar painting of the Japanese dragon. Maybe before I would have felt a burst of excitement at the sight of it. Now I just felt numb. We got to our feet together and started walking for the door. Chase that dragon, little dudes, said Milo with a grin as Cherry waved. We just looked at them blankly as we staggered off. The sounds of the arcane, whirling, buzzing, ringing, and the manic laughter of the people inside rang in our ears. In front of us was a large screen hanging from the ceiling and a slightly familiar petite woman with dark hair and doe eyes was dancing across it. Figure blown up so she towered above us. Dance, dance, go on and get it, and move it and groove it, and lose your minds. She was singing as she kicked her legs in the air, screen going through every cheesy effect in the book, from a mirrored image, to multiple dancing copies, to a star wipe, and a love heart transition. Beyond the screen, the hall split, one side disappearing into darkness, the other opening up into an entrance to a cinema complex with a lolly bar and popcorn machine inside. My twin lifted up his arm, pointing wordlessly. Down the cinema corridor was a dancing red dragon, leaping and twisting down the walls. We went after it in silence. The corridor was wide with sticky carpet, the lit up numbers of each cinema glaring out at us. The dragon slithered through, one at the very end of the hall. As we entered the cinema, a man in the middle row looked around at us. I felt a strange stirring in my chest. He was wrinkled and frail looking with wild gray hair and round glasses. His shirt was dotted with red stains, and he had what looked like insect bites all over his cheeks, chin, and neck. He smiled and beckoned us over. We took seats on either side of him. Good day, he said, offering us a big carton full of popcorn. My name's Lennox. 
but you can call me Baba. On the cinema screen was a vast, rugged plain of grass, white rock, and sand. The sound of heavy breathing mixed up with walking feet crunching against the ground. In the distance was a house, small and wooden. The door opened and a tiny shape started jumping up and down and waving, calling out something I couldn't hear. I love this film, said Darius, grabbing a handful of popcorn. Very underrated. Not many people have heard of it, but it's really good. The man snorted with laughter, shaking his head. You haven't seen this, he said. Darius looked at him, affronted. I have, he protested. I'm a huge film buff. I've seen way more films than anyone my age. You haven't seen this, because it isn't a film. Baba Lennox's son is one of my memories. That struck Darius silent. I saw a flush rising on his cheeks, a mortified expression growing on his face. I turned back to the screen. The house was closer now and I could see the tiny figure was an excited toddler, babbling in a language I couldn't understand. I caught a few words. Baba. Baba. The film went black. Then it faded back in again, over a stovetop with a sizzling pan full of blueberry pancakes. A woman's voice was singing quietly in the background as the pan was jostled, flipping the pancakes around in the bubbling water. Then the scene abruptly changed to a young woman in a colorful dress and headscarf, who was helping the toddler eat their plates of cut-up pancakes doused in syrup. How do you choose a movie to watch? Asked Darius. At his words, a textbook popped up on the screen, as though it was listening to us. Would you like to rewatch the last film you viewed? The letters proclaimed. A movie poster of Pete's Dragon showed beneath the text. Baba Lennox let out another bark of laughter. Darius sunk into the scene. I wasn't watching that. It must have made a mistake. That's so babyish. I was like getting really into unknown underground stuff. Baba Lennox flapped a hand at him. You want to watch it? He said. Darius just murmured under his breath. Speak up, son, the man's son. After a brief silence, Darius muttered out, Yeah. Let's watch Pete's Dragon, then, said Baba Lennox, clapping his hands together at the screen. As the film began, I noticed something by the glowing green neon of the exit sign. A Japanese dragon was swirling up and down the wall and then over the door. It was like a painting had been enchanted and brought to life. It stirred something in my chest. I looked down at the toy crocodile squashed into my dressing gown pocket. Getting to my feet, I followed the dancing creature out of the emergency exit. Baba Lennox and Darius didn't even notice. Too enwrapped in the film, I left them both behind. Outside the door, I saw I was at the end of the split corridor. The door shut behind me, looking like it was part of the wall. Ahead was a blinking sign of a champagne glass with a cherry in it, over an entrance with red velvet curtains. On either side, sprawled across the ground were two teenagers. We had too much Riki, one of them said, and they both burst into giggles. Never drink and smoke. Fuck off, Nalani Nakamura, Riki replied with a dopey grin on her face. I saw the end of a red scaled tail flicking inside the curtained entrance. I walked over. I felt slow and faintly ill like I was walking through syrup. I found myself in a small foyer with a ticket booth and a small queue of people waiting to get into the venue. Payment. Someone squawked from the ticket booth. Payment. Payment. It was Bloody Bones, sticking his hand through the ticket booth slot, wiggling his fingers. The first person in line reached into their bag and plopped something into his outstretched palm. I realized it was an overflowing menstrual cup and I turned away, dry retching. A slurping sound filled my ears. When I turned back again, the tall thin man was wiping his mouth, blood smeared down his chin. Next in line, he called. I felt a sliver of panic in my chest. I couldn't get in. I had nothing to pay with. You, said Bloody Bones. You. I know you. You scoundrel. You shit. You. The ticket booth door opened. 
Standing before me was Rawhead with his drooling mouth hanging open and a sticky brown wound between his eyes. I can help. The memory of a voice whispered in my head, If you ever run into the brothers and Regina again. I took out the Russian nesting doll from my dressing gown pocket and unscrewed the top. It happened all at once. A horrible stench of seaweed and then soggy blonde hair exploded in every direction. I was knocked against the wall with the force of it as an unwinding sound roared through the room. I saw Bloody Bones screaming face as he was engulfed in it, choking and thrashing. I couldn't breathe. The wet hair was in my eyes, in my mouth, in my nose. Gagging, I felt myself sink into the floor pressed down by the damp weight. The tendrils curled around me. I was lifted up and placed gently in front of the door that led to the club. I could see two arms and legs flailing madly in the ticket booth, letting out high-pitched wails that were muffled by the tons of hair. Among the pile of tangled clumps, I could see two eyes, rolled up so the whites showed. Rawhead was making trilling sounds of bliss, a huge delighted smile on his face as he threw himself into the sea of blonde hair. He rolled around in it, kicking his fat legs like he was swimming in the ocean. He shoved a big handful of the yellow locks into his mouth, chomping down. I slipped into the club silently, leaving him to it. I found myself in a dark room full of small circular tables with a bar on the right side. A stage on the far side where someone was performing, and a huge wall of red curtain on the left with cushy sofas against them. The light shades had red scaled patterns, casting the area in deep maroon. People were helping themselves to drinks behind the bar, or sitting on the couches giggling and passing glass bongs and cigarettes to and fro. The whole place was hazy with smoke and was stiflingly warm. I blinked around, blearingly. The music was more bearable here compared to the rest of the plastic flower. Just a gentle thrum in the background. There was a smatter of applause and the person on stage curtsied. Their muscular build was straining the glittery, sequined dress they wore. The lights shining down on their heavily made up face, brushing a lock of hair from their towering black beehive out of their eyes. I'll be back in a sec, loves, they said in a deep masculine voice. They walked off the stage in their towering high heels and then stopped in front of me. They seemed familiar somehow. Hello, said the drag queen. How did you sneak in here? I just blinked up at her. My name's Cassandra, she said. She offered me a hand glittering with jewels. I shook it. My body felt heavy, my mind dull and tired. A petite woman with dark hair trotted over towards us. We peered at each other for a long, confused moment, like the drag queen who I'd already forgotten the name of. She was very familiar. I feel like I've seen you around, my dear, she said, and then smiled, shaking her head. She handed the drag queen a cocktail, and they clinked their glasses in a cheers. You should try the maid dance, Cass. It was super fun dancing on the big screen, she said, and the drag queen nodded. Something moved in the corner of my eye. A painting of a red Japanese dragon was swirling over the floor, rising up the curtains and across the wall, before disappearing out of sight. Dragons were important somehow. I couldn't remember why. It was interesting to see it move like that, as though it wasn't just a painting but a live creature. I wondered if it was some trick with a projector and lights. A woman and a drag queen were talking to each other in front of me, sipping cocktails. I tried to think if I'd been in their conversations or not. I don't think so. Leaving them behind, I walked over towards the corner of the room where the curtains met the walls. There was the first step of a curving black metal staircase. I walked up them. The handrail, warm under my palm. It was on a metal walkway so close to the ceiling if I was an adult I'd have to crawl. At the end, the dragon was dancing on the spot. I knew somehow the dancing dragon was important. I took my toy crocodile out of my pocket, staring at it. Were they connected somehow? I smelt the old felt. Remembered old mother giving the toy to me on my fourth birthday. The triplets looking unimpressed at how dollar store it looked, but it had become my firm favorite, lugging it around with me everywhere. When I'd gotten the switchblade, 
I cut off the head and hid the weapon inside. I opened up the head. My switchblade was gone, stuck in Rawhead's forehead. I smiled at the morbid rhyme I'd made. There was also a silver key. Baba Lennox had made this key. He'd made it for the Dragon Door. Made it to escape from here. The brain fog lifted all at once. The dragon could dance away at any moment. Heart pounding in my chest, I grabbed the key, ran down the hallway, pushing my fist through the dragon's snarling jaws. The painting froze as I heard a click. I turned the key. A black circle was growing in the dragon's mouth like it was opening wide to take a bite out of me. Inside the entrance was a narrow corridor, all in dark red velvet. I crawled inside, the red velvet surrounding me on all sides. At the end of the half, I could see a set of stairs leading up. I held my breath as I got to my feet, my head brushing the wall, walking forward. The whole place reeked of blood and saliva. I felt like I was walking into the dragon's stomach. To the side, I saw the velvet wall had become a curtain with light behind it. I looked through the crack. It was a circular room with a sunroof, letting in light. Up against the wall was a pile of dirty, sanitary products. Chewed up, tampons, soggy pads, and menstrual cups with tooth marks in the plastic. There was a pile of goopy hair and twigs all arranged in a nest on the floor. In the middle of the disgusting creation was something shiny and sharp. My switchblade. Someone was dancing around in front of a tall mirror. Their strawberry blonde hair and dark pink dress swirling around them. The mirror didn't show their reflection. It showed all three floors on the shopping center. People milling about, chattering, and shopping. I moved as slowly and quietly as I could towards the nest. A part of me was screaming to just run, leave the damn knife behind. But a old mother had given it to me. I couldn't leave it there. I picked it up with a wet, gluggy sound. The woman paused and then turned. I've got a live audience. She said. She stared at me with her fixed smile and silver coin eyes. Naughty, naughty, she said. You've snuck in here, haven't you? I backed away, clambering for the curtain. You're the cheeky thief who took the key, aren't you? She said and began to move. Her dress was so long I couldn't see her feet, and it made her look like a ghost gliding for me. I burst into the shadowy corridor again, my breath caught in my throat. What way had I come, and what way was I going? I couldn't see anything in the dark red shadows. I blindly shot to the right. There was a scrambling sound as the curtain ripped open behind me. I turned. Her face seemed giant, her smiling mouth wide and outstretched, filling up the small narrow hall. The stench of blood and spit was so strong, I thought I would suffocate on it. I could see light ahead of me and I ran desperately for it. I tumbled out of a circular hole onto the ground. I looked up and moaned. I was back where I'd started, on the walkway over the club. A white hand shot out of the dragon's mouth, taking the key out of the lock and tugging it free. The mouth was shrinking. I jammed my knife through the snarled mouth, twisting it. The blade snapped off, leaving the handle in my grip. The dragon froze in place, mouth half opened. Inside its maw I could see silver eyes peering out of a paper white face. Take care of her for me. She said her smile unchanging. Of course, of course. I heard a familiar squeak behind me. Looking up I saw the white face and red downturned mouth of bloody bones. I felt an arm around my neck. I was picked up and dragged over the railing towards the club floor below. Regina's face inside the dragon's moss suddenly changed. Her smile disappeared, expression coiling up with what looked like fear. Don't hurt it. She cried. Bye bye, said Bloody Bones, dropping me. I felt my stomach head disappeared as the walkway got smaller above me. Falling for the floor, I was thrown into darkness. Everything hurts, and I moaned with pain. I was in a familiar void. I wished I could stay there, floating in the darkness. A pink shape was glowing beside me, and I curled up towards the light. There was a hand gently stroking my head. Hello again, said the pink figure. 
I've been watching you since the Chinese dragon dance. Damn, you were nearly there. So close, yet so far. I felt tears of frustration burn down my cheeks. I tried to hold back the sobs, but they were bursting out of me. It's okay, she said. You just went in there without a plan is all. Rookie mistake. We've all done it. You know when you first play a video game and just blunder into the boss battle completely unprepared and get your arse handed to you? That's what you've done. I couldn't reply, just crying like a baby. The hand stroking my hair reminded me of old mother comforting me after a nightmare. I wish this was all just a nightmare I could wake up from. Now you just need to play to your strengths and to their weaknesses next time. She said. I don't have any strengths. I whimpered back. I'm useless. Come on now, she said. Beating yourself up ain't gonna get you anywhere. Just think, what are you good at? It can help you get out of here. I'm good at nothing, I replied, sniveling. Maybe I should just down every one of the Lady Calpatre's potions to fight them. The dream girl shook her head. No, no, she said. What happened whenever they got attacked? The hair tearing, Regina's screen, raw head getting stabbed, Milo shooting fireballs after bloody bones, the brothers drowning in hair. What happened to them afterwards? I sighed in defeat. They bounced back. I said, it was just a minor distraction before they came back again completely fine. The dream girl nodded. They are physically tough as shit, and we are physically weak as hell, she said. But what about their weaknesses? The darkness was fading around us as I slowly became conscious again. Haven't you noticed? The glowing pink figure said that the three of them are all fucking stupid. I was being dragged by my ankles across a tile floor. I groaned, my head and back pounding with pain. I was somewhere glowing red. A tall, thin man pulling me over the floor as if I were a sack of potatoes. Then he dumped me next to a stall all at once. I realized I was where the maid dance had happened. Where the brothers had chased me through the playground. Do you know anyone who bleeds? He said to me. You don't smell like the special blood. I can't find any special blood nowhere. I'm hungry. I just groaned again. He exhaled harshly, throwing his hands up. Useless, he muttered before storming off again. I slowly sat up, body screaming in agony. I felt like I'd broken something, my wrist pulsing with white hot pain. There was something dripping from my nose and I lifted my uninjured hand, my skin soaking through with red. Something moved out of the corner of my eye and I looked up. The ceiling was covered with fluttering moths. They all began to float down in front of me forming the shape of a person. A middle-aged woman with dyed red hair. A bit plump around the middle, but with scrawny limbs. Crow's feet around her eyes, and the skin of her face beginning to sag. Oh, poor thing. She rasped. You need a healing potion for that there wrist. She leaned in close and took my chin in her long-nailed hand. I could feel her cold breath on my face. Saw her eyes staring hungrily at the blood leaking from my nose. Just a drop is all I need for payment, she said. Just one little drop. Maybe before I would have been scared, but now I was just too exhausted and defeated to feel anything. You'd take a drop and then just leave me here? My son. Her face curled into a vicious glare, eyes flashing. I ain't no squanderer. How dare you accuse me of such... Then she dumped me back to the floor. She made a move to storm off, but hesitated, staring at the blood on my face. Please, she said, her raspy voice twisting into a horrible, grating whine. Please just give me some. I sighed. Go ahead. I said, and her face split into a huge, toothy grin. She yanked me up by the collar, and I hissed, feeling my broken wrist flare at the sudden movement. She rubbed her hand over my face until it was slick with my blood. Then she let me fall to the floor as she licked and slurped at her palm. A lot more than just a drop. I'll get you that healing potion. She said as she staggered off down the corridor, leaving me behind. Promise. 
I looked around at where I was. The stall Bloody Bones had dumped me in front of was a tea shop. Getting up on shaky feet, I wandered in, nursing my broken wrist. The walls were painted with Moroccan patterns. Little circular tables scattered around with dollies on the tabletops and comfortable cushions on the seats. Against the wall was a tea cart, and I walked over even though I knew it wouldn't be as good as old mother's. The four levels of the cart were laden with cups of tea, all steaming hot. There was a jug of milk and a sugar bowl on the top shelf. I picked up a sugar cube and dumped it into a cup. I didn't trust myself to pick up the heavy milk jug with my non-dominant hand, so just opted for black tea. Over at the playground, I saw a kid about my age with a black bobbed haircut and a nighty playing in the sand pen. She was building an elaborate sand sculpture of what looked like a mermaid. She was pretty decent at it. I noticed that her hair looked ragged, with chunks pulled out of it, and bald patches as though someone had taken huge bites out of her hair. I pushed the tea cart over to her. Hi, I said, and she turned to me with a narrow frown. Would you like a cup of tea? Can't you see I'm busy? She snapped back. With the side of her shovel, she started carving out the shapes of scales on the mermaid's sandy tail. I turned to leave her to it. I mean, she said in a flippant voice that hid a note of hopefulness. You can stay if you want. Oh no, I said motioning at my tea cart. I've got deliveries. I saw disappointment in her eyes, her mouth turning downwards. Whatever, she replied. Going back to her sand sculpture, shrugging, I turned to roll my tea cart down the hall towards the elevator. The only button was up, so I pressed it. The clear glass doors rolled open, and I went inside. I rose up into the ceiling, and for a second there was darkness. Then I saw something in front of me, a glaring red dragon face with a half-opened mouth. It was moving through the darkness in a jerking, clunky manner like a broken video. The elevator kept rising up and the creature disappeared beneath me. The upper floor appeared into my view, and with a ping the doors rolled open. I peered out and cautiously pushed my tea cart forward. I was in a hallway full of lush green moss and wildflowers growing across the floor. White dandelion fluff was gently falling from the ceiling like rain. Little love, little love, a harsh voice called. There was a stall in the middle of the hall and a young woman with dyed red hair was waving me over. Pushing the tea cart, I went over to her. For your wrist, little love, she said, passing me a small bottle, fizzing with dark liquid dotted with glitter flax. See, the Lady Kelpatra ain't no scammer. I stared at it suspiciously. Then I picked up one of the cups of tea and put it on the counter in front of her. Thanks, I said, taking a swig. It tasted like mint chocolate mixed with something herby and medicinal. I blinked. The blaring hotness in my wrist was just a dull ache now. I flexed my fingers, feeling a slight ping of pain. The skin only looked slightly swollen, not like I was wearing a puffed up glove like before. All of it, cried the Lady Kelpatra, and I obeyed, swigging it all down. In a blink of an eye, my wrist felt completely fine. You believe in them now, don't you? She said with a smirk. I nodded a little uneasily. Thanks again, I said, rolling the tea cart away. Any time. The Lady Kelpatra called back to me as she looked suspiciously at the teacup and then threw it unceremoniously over her shoulder. Built into the wall was a big tank full of water and at the bottom was a headless mermaid body and tall, just wiggling and thrashing about like it was having a fit. A pretty nightmarish display that would probably traumatize little children for life. I went into the hair salon. A blonde teenager lying on the floor next to a swivel chair where a pink-haired girl was sleeping in. Looking at her hair dye was a man with a spiky green hairdo. Looking at the girl in the spinning chair, a memory of a dream came to me. Of a black void with a glowing pink light. You've been a great help, I told the dream girl hoping somehow she could understand. The blonde teen looked up at me. I wish she'd wake up, she said. I miss her. I felt awkward, not knowing what to say. Would you like a cup of tea? I said and the blonde teenager shrugged. Thanks, 
she said, getting up to take a cup. My name's Bernice. We've probably met before and we forgot each other. That's how this place works. I nodded as she poured a bit of milk into her tea. That's why I don't really want to leave Persephone here. She said, what if I forget her? I was about to speak when the green-haired man sauntered over to us. Get Milo there by any chance? He said, and I looked at my tea cart. Of course, there hadn't been a cup of Milo before, but as soon as he'd asked, one had appeared. I handed it to him. He clicked his fingers, and a spark of fire hovered at his palm. Putting it underneath the cup, he heated up his drink. I like it scalding. Burn your lips off, he said, taking a sip. Now I gotta go find my little rug rat. Always running off on me. Sugar high. I feed him too much coke. That's the soft drink, mind you. Not the other kind. Don't call the cops on me now. With that, he strolled off to the stall. As he passed the Lady Kelpatra's store, he purposely knocked over one of the vials, smashing it to the floor. She cursed after him and he laughed, walking off. Will Persephone wakes up, give her a cup of tea from me, I told Bernice. She nodded and I began, rolling my tea cart down the corridor. I paused at the buffet restaurant. Anyone want tea? I called in. A few people looked up with interest and ambled over. You look familiar, said a large, red-faced man. A bushy-haired woman beside him laughed and patted him on the arm. You got a good memory for an old codger, she said as the man dumped sugar and milk into his tea. You know how to make a man feel loved? He replied before turning to me. Come in and have some grub. I shook my head. No thanks. I said and the man shrugged, turning around. Riki, Nalani Nakamura, get some tea in ya. It'll help with them hangovers. At one of the booth tables, two teenage girls, staring bleary-eyed into foil wrappers of greasy chips, just glared back at him. The man and woman picked up extra cups to bring over. After they'd left... I rolled my tea cart over towards the elevator at the end of the hall. Inside were three people. One a petite, dark-haired woman, the other a large, muscular man, and the third, a man in a gold suit. Oh, tea, said the woman, immediately reaching over to take a cup. Thank you, thank you. Casper, hey, but look, a little tea girl. This place has everything. Do you have food, too? We haven't eaten in forever, and we're simply starving. I shook my head and pointed down the corridor where the buffet was. Oh, thank you, thank you, said the gold-suited man before turning to the other two. Isn't she just the cutest? Adorable, the muscular man replied as the three walked out into the hall. I pressed the up button on the elevator. After a few moments, there was a ding and the doors rolled open. Down the end of the hall, I could see the faint shape of a fountain and heard the sounds of an arcade somewhere in the distance. To my right was a cinema complex. I rolled my tea cart out of the elevator and across the floor. In the cinema foyer, I could see the back of a fire engine redhead at the popcorn machine, filling a box full. Darius? I called uncertainly. My twin turned around. Sally! He said, cradling his popcorn box under his chin. We walked over to each other. Darius looked shell-shocked, and I felt just as shaken. I hadn't thought of him at all. He'd completely disappeared from my mind as soon as I'd left him in the cinema. This place is fucked, he said in a trembling voice. I forgot my own sister. And I forgot you too, I murmured back. I went through everything that had happened since I'd left him, about what had happened in the room inside the dragon's mouth. I don't know how we're supposed to get out of here. I said, I'm completely useless. Darius shot me a confused look. What? He said, what the hell are you talking about? I can't do anything. I replied, I'm just wandering around this place like a headless chicken hoping I can fumble my way out. I'm not smart enough to figure out a way to save us all. I'm not tough enough to face Regina and the brothers without pissing my pants like a wimp. Persephone said to use my skills, but what skills do I have? Darius just stared at me, more bemused than ever. Where's this no-confidence shit coming from? He said, you're a good person, better than me. Look, you're rolling a tea cart around giving out cups, and you kept trying to talk to Lucy even though she was a pain in the ass. 
I didn't try talking to her. All this time we've been here, you're the one saying hi to people, being nice. Being a good person isn't helpful, though, I said with exasperation. What, do I just nicely ask Regina to let us out, please? Darius sighed and ran a hand through his hair. I don't know, he said. Maybe we could just stay here until the authorities track us down. You know old mother would hire the best detectives to find us. Stared down at the tea cart. Unless the brain fog makes everyone in the real world forget about us all too. My son. Darius shivered. Don't say that. He said. Old mother wouldn't forget about us. I was reminded of Lucy. Staunchly insisting her parents would come and save her. I remembered her scream as she fell down the slide in Bloody Bone's arms. Had I seen her again since then? I couldn't recall. I think we're up shit creek, Sally, said Darius. The whole plan was to find the dragon door and walk out of here. You did that, and it didn't work. I wanted to tip over the tea cart and smash all the cups against the floor. So give up then? I replied. Darius just looked at me helplessly. I don't know what else to do. He said. We didn't say anything for a long moment. Then he reached over and took two cups. Come on, they're playing a Jurassic Park marathon. He wandered off. His teacups and carton of popcorn balanced under his chin. Maybe I should just follow him. Even if it was a prison, it was a pleasant enough one, full of hundreds of interesting things to do, with a huge downside of being terrorized by three terrifying monsters, of course. Thought of old mother, alone in her room, wondering why her family had run off on her. Or would she just forget? The brain fog never made me completely forget old mother, though. Just a sip of a drink or a smell of my crocodile toy would make me think of home again. I imagined it. Old mother with a faint blurred memory of us that would attack out of nowhere like a knife. I couldn't do it. I had to go home. I couldn't leave her alone. Something moved under my feet, interrupting me from my thoughts and I jumped out of the way, looking down. That damn dragon again. It wasn't moving in a smooth dancing way like it had done previously. It was traveling across the floor in stiff, awkward movements, jumping and jerking. The head quivered to and fro and something in its mouth glinted. My heart lurched with terror. Was a white hand going to reach out? A horrible smiling face leering up at me as it dragged me to my doom. The dragon made a hacking sound like a cat with a fur ball in its throat. Then it spat something out at me and I ducked. The silver blade clattered at the floor. If I hadn't gotten out of the way... It would have hit me right between the eyes. Unlike Rawhead, I don't think I could survive a knife embedded in my skull. With shaking hands, I picked the knife up off the ground. It was covered in brown grainy gunk that looked like molasses and had a motor oil smell. The dragon was frozen beneath me. The knife had messed with its locking mechanism, and now it stood with its mouth open for me to slip inside. All that trouble with the key when we could have just... Jimmy the damn dragon door open with my switchblade. Confusion surged in my chest. Could I step into the dragon if it was on the floor? Could I just fall through the corridor and crash into a pile of broken teacups and hot tea at the end? Might as well give it a go. I pushed the tea cart into the creature's gaping maw. My stomach lurched and my head span. I was standing upright in the red velvet hall. The tea cart in pristine condition. Not a single cup out of place. Looking around, I saw the ceiling yawn above me. It made me feel dizzy and I closed my eyes, shaking my head and turning back forward. Ahead of me a curtain twitched and a white hand stretched down. It shook one of its fingers in my direction. Naughty naughty, cried a strawberry ice cream voice. Trying to get out again, are we? No, I replied. I just wondered if you wanted a cup of tea. There was a pause and the hand disappeared into the curtain again. Regina stuck her head out, staring at me with a blank expression. Okay, she said. I rolled a tea card over to her and she peered at it with confusion. What do I do? She said. You take a cup and you put some sugar and milk in it if you want. I replied, motioning towards the top shelf with a milk jug and sugar cubes. She stuck her hand right into the jug and pulled out a palm full of milk that poured through her fingers. Oh no, not like that, I said. 
Do you want me to show you? Regina nodded, staring at the tea cart with interest. I got her a cup and put a sugar cube inside, picking up the milk jug and pouring a bit in. That makes more sense. Regina said as I passed her the cup. I got myself a cup too and then said, Can I sit? Regina nodded again. We sat down on the red velvet corridor cross-legged in front of each other. I didn't get you or the brothers' names, I said politely. Regina smiled at me, watching closely as I sipped from the cup. She mirrored the movement, and tea squirted out through her teeth. Naming everything is a peculiar human trait. We don't partake in it ourselves. I felt a shiver go through me. Not human. Of course it was obvious, with their strange silver eyes and bizarre manner. But still to have it confirm made cold fingers go up and down my spine. What are you if you're not human? I asked in a trembling voice. Regina took another sip, the tea running down her chin. Well, you'd call us reapers, she said. Flash of memory came to me. Darius had a booth table saying, Or we're in limbo and Regina, Rawhead, and Bloody Bones are grim reapers or something. A strange expression shifted in Regina's face. I used to reap human children, she said. Poor, sweet, innocent children. I took them to whatever lies beyond. Took them from their loving families. Took them so young when they had so much to live for. I remember one day, I was whistling a merry tune as I danced into the sea. I turned around and saw dozens of children had followed and were drowned around me. I slowly recognized her expression. Her face was full of guilt and shame. The brothers took adults to the beyond, she said. They always tormented you creatures, and I thought, no, no, no. They need to learn to be good and treat the humans with kindness. I just want to bring your poor souls happiness instead of misery. I just want to say sorry for all of you I've hurt. I remembered what else Darius had said. Maybe it was a trick, and if you ring the number, you agree on a mass suicide of you and whatever family you bring. I felt sick to my stomach. Are we dead? I said in a tiny voice. Regina's mouth fell open. Oh no, she said. No, no. You're just humans I picked at random. Maybe bringing you joy will make up for all the misery I've wrought on your kind. The porcelain cup was hot in my hands. I remembered again what Darius had said. Maybe the other scary freaks around here are all right, too. All this time, Regina was trying to be good in her own demented way. She wasn't human and didn't know how to make us happy. Didn't know that she was actually terrifying us, making us all scared out of our minds. I needed to make her understand. I didn't want to upset her. I stared into my teacup, trying to find the right words. But, but we'd all be happier being able to go back home, I said finally. I've met heaps of people here and lots of them say that they're scared. They feel like they're in danger. They feel like prisoners. If you're bringing us happiness, it's only temporary. You're still making us miserable. Regina's silver coins glinted. Her face a frozen mask. Her cup clutched in her hands. For a moment I thought she was going to throw the hot tea in my face or claw at me with her nails. Then I saw a vicious brown liquid leak from her eye like a teardrop. All I do is hurt, she whispered. Her hands were trembling, spilling tea all down the front of her dress. A part of me thought I should reach over and pat her hand comfortingly, but the stronger part felt like it'd be like patting a vicious snake. I think you're a good person, a, a good reaper, good thing, I said uncertainly. You can't spend all your time beating yourself up. You need to get on with your life, existence, whatever. I don't think you need to be so sorry. You were just doing your job. Kids die, you know. There has to be someone to take them to the other side. Regina threw her hands into the air and I shrunk back as the cup smashed on the wall. Tea flying everywhere. What was I doing? Trying to talk sense into this dangerous creature. A creature with the goddamn ability to reap my soul. Deliver me to the afterlife. I don't want to reap. She cried. The rusty brown liquid rolling down her face. I can't stand it, but what else do I do? I tried to catch my breath, 
Try not to whimper with fear. Can't you do other things? I son. I mean, you could come down to Earth and run a shopping center. Or be a dance instructor. You're really good at that. Regina just wailed. Around her, the walls of the velvet corridor began to shake. I felt the floor rumbling beneath me. Outside the dragon's mouth, I could hear confused and frightened shouts as if the whole shopping center was hit by an earthquake. What about the brothers? She son. I heard the sounds of crashing and smashing glass from outside in the shopping center. I can't take them to the mortal plane to torment the humans and I don't want them to go back to reaping again. Maybe that's what you need to do instead of reaping. Instead of forcing people to stay here. I set over the thunder of panicking footsteps, trying to run to safety. Maybe you need to teach the brothers to be good, but you can't do this anymore. It's not helping anyone. The ceiling was folding up like paper. Regina just sat cross-legged in front of me, blank-faced and staring as the walls disappeared around us, the floor shrinking and revealing grassy sand beneath. I could hear the crashing of waves, smell seawater on the air. We were sitting on the beach. I looked around. The house was gone, just a hill remaining with grass blowing in the wind. Dozens of people were dotted over the hilltop and across the beach, looking around in a confused daze. On the gravel where the taxi had dropped my family off what seemed so long ago was a big pile of luggage, bags, and suitcases all thrown together. Regina was staring at me, strawberry blonde hair trailing around her face in the breeze. You'd be a good reaper. She said, after death, humans need comfort, a sympathetic ear, someone gentle and understanding to lead them to the next life. I couldn't find any words to say, not able to process everything that had just happened. If you ever want to be a reaper, come and find me. She said as a smile slowly stretched her mouth wide. Some reapers are born and other reapers are created. It's a simple procedure, really. You need two special tokens inserted into your body to become one of us. I stared into the two silver coins above her, smiling mouth. I put a trembling hand up to my eyes. She smiled wider, all her teeth shining white. Oh, yes, she said. You'd have your human eyes removed. Then she stood up in one unnaturally smooth motion, gliding backwards across the sand. Friends, friends. She called, her voice booming loud like the intercom back in the plastic flower. There was a confused muttering from the people around the hill and beach as they turned to look at her. It's time, she said, throwing her hands in the air, tossing her head back. Time, dear mortals, to go on home. There was more bemusement from the crowd, everyone exchanging looks with one another. Then there seemed to be a collective shrug and everyone began to search for their luggage among the pile. The brothers walked up to Regina, flanking her sides. What are you doing? Bloody Bones demanded. Why are you letting them go? Regina clutched at her chest in a melodramatic way, breathing in heavily. Because it's the right thing to do, she proclaimed. The humans should be free. Bloody Bones' face worked with fury, and he grabbed her roughly by the shoulder. What about the unlimited special blood you promised? He screeched into her face. Special blood, you promised. Rawhead gurgled on Regina's other side, knots of hair stuck in his throat. I need to go back home to think, said Regina, gesturing at the ocean behind her. Maybe I'll be a dance teacher on the mortal plane. Maybe you two can become janitors. You'll get a lot of blood and hair that way. Bloody Bones was motionless. His arms fell loosely to his sides and he just gopped at her for a few long moments. His talon-like hands worked violently, and I thought he was going to slap her across the face. You're a fucking idiot, he said at last. Regina ignored him, turning to me with her unsettling fixed smile. It was her idea of a friendly look to make her beloved humans feel at ease, but she just couldn't pull it off. She twirled a finger around and I saw golden tracks being dragged over onto the dirt road, clicking together. Carts folded up from the tracks waiting for people to take their seats. They'll take you all back to the mortal plane again, she said to the crowd. Don't look back now. She turned from me, flexing her shoulders. 
Her hair was joining up with her dress and her nose was stretched into a snout. Whiskers grew from her cheeks as her teeth turned sharp in her mouth. She was growing taller, thinner, and longer, her arms and legs disappearing smoothly into her body. She started wriggling on the spot and then she took off into the blue sky above us. A dragon with an orange and pink mane, a white snarling face, and a rainbow underbelly. There was polite clapping from the watching crowd of people. Marvelous. Five stars, said Uncle Abe after her. I had a great time, called Uncle Casper, clapping his hands like a seal. I'll definitely be recommending this place, said my mom, squinting against the sun. The Regina dragon danced across the sky, rainbow scales alight, the stream of her mane like a burst of fire. Rawhead was gagging and flapping his huge meaty arms in the air. Bloody Bone's neck was twisting around, stretching like a string of chewed up bubble gum. Their noses began to grow and mold and morph into beaks. Yellow feathers were sprouting across Rawhead's skull. Bloody Bone's suit was transforming into ruffled black feathers. Their legs creaked and cracked as they hopped on the spot. Finally, they stood before us in their natural forms. Bloody Bones, a black vulture. Rawhead, a yellow-headed vulture. They took to the sky together, flying after the rainbow dragon. Lola, her head reattached to her body, slithered across the sand. She smiled at me and she didn't look so nightmarish anymore. Just a lovely woman with her eyes back in the right position sparkling hazel and her hair a regular length down her back, waving and blowing me a kiss. She flopped into the water as a burst of moths scattered across the sky. I watched as the creatures all began their journey to their mysterious home beyond the sea. The carts all rumbled and started to move across the tracks away from the hill and the beach. People began to put their luggage into them, climbing inside. I went over to the triplets, Uncle Casper gathering up the luggage. Darius wandered over to me. I took his hand in mine and we stood there silently. Ahead of us, putting her suitcase into a cart was Lucy, her chattering parents already having taken their seats, paying her no attention. She looked around and sent us a thin smile. A few carts in front of her was Baba Lennox who turned and grinned ear to ear to us, giving us a big thumbs up. Darius waved back. At the front of the line of carts was Persephone, Awake at last with Bernice, resting their heads on each other's shoulders with their arms around each other. Why can't we get the taxi again? Uncle Casper was saying with an annoyed look on his face as we climbed into a free cart. This trolley system isn't very good service. Yeah, I might just give it four stars actually, said Uncle Abe. Mom turned to us with a simpering smile. Did you have fun, dears? She said. Did you make lots of friends? Terius and I said nothing, not letting go of each other's hands. All I could think about was the tall, narrow city apartment with old mother waiting for us at the front door. I couldn't wait to see her again. I couldn't wait to get home. I'm an oceanographer. Ever since my family started bringing me to the beach when I was young, I was fascinated by the sea. But fascination turned into something else when I was hired to work in an underwater sea lab in the Baltic. My name is Will. I had recently graduated with a degree in marine biology, and I was looking to start my career. I had always thought that the only underwater research lab had been off the coast of Florida, the Aquarius Reef Base. But... Here I was staring at an application to work on another sea lab across the world. I chalked my lack of knowledge up to my own incompetence and applied for the job. It wasn't long before I got a reply. A sophisticated man with a German accent spoke with me about my education and all the other regular things that you would hear in a job interview. But at the end of the conversation, things started to get a little weird. Are you in any way afraid of any sea life like sharks for example? asked Bert Ram, the German interviewer. I have a healthy fear of ocean predators, I said, but I don't mind swimming with them. They mostly aren't interested in humans. 
Good to hear, he said. I completely agree. The job will involve some diving in some deeper waters, and this can make some people uneasy. To my surprise, I was hired. I boarded a plane and ended up in Rostock, a medium-sized German port city. I made my way over to the port itself, where I was to meet with the team and start traveling to my new home under the sea. I had read the documents they had sent over to familiarize myself with the underwater environment. I had noticed, however, that there were no bathrooms. and This seemed a little strange. I assumed that I probably would just go in the ocean. I had been peeing in the ocean since I was a kid, but I had never gone number two. I laughed to myself as I thought of how silly it was that I was dwelling on such a triviality. When I arrived on the dock, there was Bert Ram. I recognized him from the video conference we'd had before. He was taller than I had figured. Next to him stood another tall, skinny man. Ah, speak of the devil, Bert Ram said as I approached. His accent made me chuckle to myself, but his grammar and diction were very good nonetheless. Will, I would like you to meet Derek, our colleague. Derek also seemed very polite, and his English was excellent. We have a team of French, German, and English speakers. We mostly speak English, but you will have to forgive us if occasionally we start ranting in our native tongues together said Bert Ram. At that, Derek mumbled something in German, and they both laughed. We hitched a ride on another vessel out towards the east. After about an hour, I saw a little ship. This is the Hoffnung, said Bert Ram. Our humble ship. The ship was small and rusty. It looked like it had seen better days. Something seemed off. The facility underwater was much too advanced to be paired with such a beat-up looking ship. We geared up for the dive. As far as depth is concerned, the Baltic is pretty shallow, yet I was surprised to hear that we would be diving down to a depth of 65 meters. The deepest I'd ever gone was 30, and going 65 didn't help my growing anxiety. Don't worry, it is a one-way trip, so it isn't very dangerous. You don't have to worry about the bends. I remembered how cool it was that the underwater facility used ambient pressure and a moon pool. The entire facility was pressurized. It was still too deep for humans to live at, the pressure between seven and eight atmospheres. Though humans can free dive quite deep, they cannot live in such crushing pressures for extended periods of time. Three atmospheres was what the facility was pressurized to. Still, the time saved not having to go back and forth between sea level and seven atmospheres made this facility useful for studying the seabed. We have all heard how we know less about our oceans than outer space. This was what fascinated me so much about the sea. The beginning of the descent was uneventful. Things started to become darker as less light was able to penetrate the depths. When we reached 40 meters, I felt like I was entering another world. It was surreal. I had never been this deep before, and I remember my diving instructor mentioning how dangerous it was. People were said to fall into a trance. As we continued to descend into the misty depths, a building appeared. It was taller than I had expected, spanning at least three stories upward. Certainly this was not the facility that I had read about. Soon enough, however, I saw the moon pool. It was a particular thing to emerge from the ocean into an indoor swimming pool, and we all treaded water for a minute. Bert, Ram, and Derek turned and smiled at me. I couldn't help but smile back. It was just so badass. I felt like I was in some kind of sci-fi movie. The room we were in was pressurized higher than the rest of the facility, and we made our way into a desperization chamber after removing our gear. Watch your arm, said Derek as I clumsily walked into a loose panel. It grazed my skin a little. Sorry, said Bert Ram. I should have mentioned the loose panel. The facility is much larger than I read. I said, inquiring about the large structure I had seen. Yes, said Bert Ram. That document is out of date. The facility has expanded in several areas. Though we lowly scientists are to remain in our humble quarters. He and Derek laughed. I thought that this facility was entirely run by scientists. I said, the job application had been from the website of Geomar, a prestigious research institution in Germany. It started that way, but after funding was cut back, 
It looked like we were going to have to abandon the facility, said Bert Ram. But then they discovered the ore deposits down the hole. The hole? I asked. We entered the habitat I had familiarized myself with from the manual. There was a bunkhouse, a mess hall, and a couple other rooms for science and storage. Is this the new bloke? Asked a voice from around the corner. In walked a short man with a smile on his face. He had instant charisma. Don't let the kraut scare you, mate. Things are peachy down here. He shook my hand with a vigor that left my arm noodling. He was a middle-aged man, a little older than the rest of them. Name's Doug. I am from Newcastle. I nodded. This whole kraut thing, said Bert Ram. I just don't understand why you all think it is offensive. It just means cabbage. Your people's World War II put-downs weren't very good. I couldn't help but chuckle at their relationship when, suddenly, a loud explosion rang out. They all grabbed for something to brace themselves with. Is everyone all right? Came a shrill, worried voice from deeper into the facility. Amidst the flickering buttons and endless readouts, a French woman cautiously came into the room hugging the wall. Despite the fear the crash moments ago had instilled, she smiled politely to me. Welcome, Will. It is good to see you. She sighed somewhat nervously. Hi, I said smiling back. She was wearing a cap and bulky crewman coveralls, yet I could tell that she was really beautiful. The bastards are really pushing our luck with those explosions, said Doug. They're going to get us all killed. Why are there explosions? I asked. We didn't have the funding to keep this place running. We were forced to entice some other parties. I said it then and I'll say it now. It was a short-sighted decision, said Doug. Yes, but what choice did we have? Asked Bert Ram. The rest of the day was spent familiarizing myself with the facility. Everything was just like it said in the manual, except for an ominous looking door just after the depressurization chamber. That was new. Though the whole place looked like a futuristic spaceship, this door seemed to be even more so. It looked strong. At first there was constant traffic in and out, but after they completed their submarine docking station, a soul hasn't passed through that door in months. We occasionally speak with one of them on the radio, but we have less and less contact as they need us less. It is a little strange, but it is better than being shut down. Said Bert Ram as he noticed me looking at the door. Who exactly are they? I asked. At first it was underwater welders and construction workers who worked for a German mining company. All the usual stuff, but after several months the miners left, and apparently ownership of the facility changed hands again. Though I have heard nothing about who. Geomar has been vague about it all. No doubt they're up to some kind of exploitative act, probably attempting to weaponize something beautiful. That is why I get the feeling that we are no longer welcome in our own facility. They wouldn't want their secrets exposed by us pesky, good-intentioned scientists, said Bert Ram laughingly. Eventually I had to go to the restroom, and I finally inquired as to how this was done. They all laughed. It is a pleasure going number two during the day. The fish can get quite frisky, said Doug. Manon rolled her eyes, smiling. The fish sometimes eat your waist. She said, don't let Douglas scare you. They are just fish. There's a dome several meters out from the moon pool where you can hang out and do your business. But you won't catch me going out there in the dark, said Doug. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine the fish are much more frightening in the dark, I said. Actually, that is the weird part, said Bert Ram. There are no fish at night. Manon lashed the shirt she was holding at Bert Ram's arm punishingly, yet in a soft, motheringly way. I'm just saying, I don't go number two at night either, said Bert Ram. If it's an emergency, I dropped a log right in the moon pool and you should too, said Doug. Floaters be damned. That's disgusting, said Manon. Why do the fish only come at night? I asked. We aren't sure. Derek thinks it has something to do with their body chemistry. Their noradrenaline levels start to spike as the light stops shining through. They scatter in all directions, explained Manon. All except towards the hole, said Derek. What is the hole? 
I asked. It's the 20 meter wide hole in the bottom of the ocean out the moon pool to the east. It is hard to miss. We stay away from there, said Derek. I made a point to do my business during the daylight and was alarmed and amused by the amount of fish it attracted. I swam out to the dome and soon several fish began to investigate me. I looked around in the area and saw the massive hole to the east. I could see that the facility must have been built to study the hole. It was starting to get a little darker and I was ready to swim back to the moon pool when I noticed a small submersible ascending out of the hole. The submersible propelled itself towards the large three-story complex attached to our habitat. A hatch opened and the submersible ascended up into the hatch. My imagination ran wild as to what this mysterious other faction was up to behind that hatch. As weird as it all was, after several days I had fallen into a rhythm and everything became normal. I would gather samples and document the wildlife by day, and study my findings, as well as talk to my colleagues at night. Occasionally there would be an explosion, and, like clockwork, a submersible or two would ascend from the hole at sunset. Sunset became a time of caution, I noticed. The fish would remain until it was dark, but almost in a flash, they all knew to disappear as the last sun rays left. It was part of a fascinating cycle. I had seen things like this in nature before, like when bats all fly out of a cave at the same time, or birds migrating for winter, but this was different. There was a desperation about it. For the fish, it was more of a desperate scramble. I quickly understood why Doug wouldn't go number two at the dome after dark. I found out that none of them did. Every day I would walk by the mysterious door leading to the other facility, but the hallway beyond was always dark, and I could never see that far. It was unnerving. On top of that, there were no portholes or windows of any kind to look into from the outside, only the submersibles at sunrise and at sunset. One day I joked. Maybe one of us should try to swim up the hatch one time, I said. The mood in the room became very tense. It wasn't long before Manon burst into tears. I didn't understand. I'm sorry, I said. It's okay, mate. It's not your fault, said Doug as he went to console Manon. I tried to look at Bert Ram, who usually explained things to me when I was baffled, but his eyes remained fixed on his breakfast. I looked at Derek. It's time Will knows about Javier, said Derek. Nobody said a word. All that could be heard was Manon sobbing. Who's Javier? I asked. Javier was the marine biologist you replaced, said Derek. And he also had the idea to swim up the hatch. We were informed that he was dead over a week later. The bastards, said Doug. We began searching desperately, but after a couple hours... We knew that the air would have run out. We started searching for his body. Apparently the whole time, he was in the other facility. What? I asked, mortified. Aye, they said that there had been an accident and they weren't able to save him, said Doug. And they waited to tell you? I asked. He nodded. I never looked at the hatch the same way. Had Javier been trapped in there and run out of air? Surely there must have been some way he could have entered the facility, as it is how the submersibles went in and out. Over the coming days, things went back to normal. Or at least, as normal as living 60 meters underwater could be. I didn't dare broach the subject of Javier. I just kept my head down and did my work. There was plenty of plant life to catalog, not to mention all of the different species of fish and jellyfish. Occasionally a pod of sea mammals would pass through. As I was performing my nightly bathroom ritual before the dark set in, one night I noticed the submersible ascending from the holes as always. Only this time, it seemed to be having trouble moving through the water. It almost seemed to be stuttering. As I looked closer, I saw what looked like markings on the side of the vessel. As if it had been in some kind of accident down there. I shuddered to think what would have happened if the craft had been damaged more. There I tread in the outhouse dome, pondering what I just saw. It made me feel uneasy, but nothing like what I felt after what I saw next. My gaze fell back on the giant sinkhole. There at the very edge, I saw something that will horrify me for the rest of my life. 
and I saw a head looking back. The rest of the body was hidden down the hole, just the head, as if it was peering at me. Even with the water clouding the distance between us, I felt his stare burn into my soul. Here, 60 meters below in the middle of the ocean was a face, completely unencumbered by gear, no air tanks. What was he breathing? I must have been hallucinating, but the moment lasted for what seemed like a lifetime. Up until then, it was the longest moment in my life. His eyes locked on mine, just his head. As it got darker, I came out of my confused trance. I made a mad dash for the moon pool. I didn't dare look back. I leapt out of the moon pool and into the decompression chamber. I was terrified. I stared at the moon pool through the window, half expecting the head to emerge from the water. How could a man have been in the hole? He would have had to have held his breath for at least five minutes, as I hadn't seen anyone else as I swam to the dome. Although with training, a human being can hold their breath that long. Something was just off. I had goosebumps all over my body. I had heard of pressurized air playing tricks on people's minds. Perhaps I had nitrogen narcosis. I quickly went in and told the others. Elevated levels of nitrogen affect us all in different ways, said Manon as she examined me. It is possible that you hallucinated. I must have, I said. If anything like this happens again, come tell us right away, she said. I noticed Derek looking at me from across the habitat. He quickly looked away when I made eye contact. There was something about it that made me feel like he knew more. I decided to sleep it off, but had wild dreams about what I saw. I woke in a cold sweat. I felt more exhausted than before. The crew, for the most part, hadn't noticed that I was a little off. All except Derek. He approached me that night. You must be feeling a little rattled. He said, I was good friends with Javier. When he died, I sort of lost it a little bit. I couldn't sleep or eat. I even saw things, too. He became very serious. This place is dangerous. More so than the others understand, said Derek. He brought me over a laptop and opened up a folder with images. He then brought up a picture of the crew all happily posing. There they all were. Doug, Manon, Derek, and Bert Ram. Then my eyes came to the rest of the fifth person, and when they did, electricity ran through my body all at once as horror welled up from the depths of my soul into my throat. There stood the very same face that had stared at me from the hole, and all at once, I knew who that was, what Derek had seen, and what it meant. I could barely speak. I just muttered, That was the man I saw. I said, we have to tell the others. They are not going to believe it, or like it, he said. We headed into the common room where the others were gathered. Derek led, bluntly, in a dire tone. We both saw Javier, alive in the water, he said. Doug almost dropped what he was doing and turned around to look at us, then looked at Bert Ram, who was as bewithered as him. Then they both broke into laughter. Manon looked very upset. This is not funny, Derek. And Will? I didn't think you were like this. She said. Derek showed me a picture of Javier, and it was without a doubt the same face that looked at me. I said. I didn't care about impressing Manon anymore. Something was horribly wrong. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me because Javier had just died. I heard you can see people sometimes who have just died. Said Derek. So I didn't think much of it. But one thing is very clear. We need to leave, he said. It was empowering to be next to him. I would have never had the courage to say these things. There was a moment of silence. Okay. I'll put in the call for the ship to come pick up whoever wants to leave, I guess, but this is my life's work. I can't just leave because you think you saw a ghost. You understand? Said Doug, respectfully. I strongly urge you to reconsider said Derek. And we can't wait for the ship to get us. We need to take the Hofnung now. Suddenly this wasn't sounding like such a good idea. The Hofnung had seen better days. Bertram started to argue with Derek in German. Manon and Doug started jumping in, and I had no idea what was going on. 
At last, however, Derek won out with a loud exclamation that silenced the rest. He then turned to me. I know it seems like the Hofnung isn't seaworthy, but she is. She passed the required inspection. That was five years ago, Derek. Really? Said Doug. There is a reason we don't use her anymore. She's a floating platform, just in case something happens down here. Really, what is another day to wait for the ship? He said, If you had seen what we had seen, you would understand. Said Derek. I wasn't sure what to do. On the other hand, waiting another day for a proper ship to take us back seemed reasonable. Yet, what if that thing in the water came into the moon pool tonight? What if it came into the decompression chamber? Very well. I'm going to make the call to get picked up, said Derek. He left and came back moments later. There is a storm coming. They can't make it here for two days, he said. My stomach started to churn. That rusty old boat was starting to look more and more enticing. I was starting to feel better about everything. There were tests to be run and flora to be cataloged. Manon even helped me, which put me at ease. During the day, she started asking me questions. So you are sure that it was Javier that you saw? She asked. Yeah, I said. He must still be alive, but we watched each other for minutes. I don't know anyone who can hold their breath that long. Manon looked at me horrified. He was a good swimmer, she said. But five minutes? I know. I said, after I finally started to feel normal again, I started to feel tired, even though it was just the afternoon. Something about the pressure, or being cooped up, that was why I went to sleep early that night. Going to sleep early turned out to be a giant mistake. I woke up in the late evening around 10. I had to go to the bathroom something fierce. I instinctively went over to the decompression chamber. When I entered the moon pool, for the first time. I saw pitch black water. I stood there watching it ripple. Beyond was just the murky black depths. I remember Doug admitting he wouldn't go to the bathroom at night, and now I understood. I walked up to the edge and looked down. There was absolutely no way I was going to swim to the house dome. With little options left, I pulled down my trousers and attempted a squat right over the moon pool. Still squatting there. I couldn't help but look back every couple seconds to make sure something wasn't coming up to grab me. It felt silly, but it was a very vulnerable position to be in. After trying for a couple minutes, I stood back up. It's amazing what kinds of things the body will do when it knows it is not safe. I suddenly felt no urge to go to the bathroom at all. I slowly backed away from the edge of the moon pool, keeping my eyes on its dark, rippling depths. I thought I saw something move. I felt a deep fear. I had to get out of there. I went for the decompression chamber and, to my horror, I saw out of my peripheral a mass cresting out of the water. I threw myself into the chamber and, as fast as I could, tried to throw the door closed. A monstrous dark, grayish green tentacle moved with startling speed and just as I was shutting the door, wrapped around my leg, sinking several spines into me. I cried with pain as the creature began to drag me out of the chamber. I slammed the door on the tentacle, but it was thick and strong and continued to drag me. A second tentacle, just like the first, was starting to crest out of the moon pool. Just then I looked up. It was the same sheet metal panel that had grazed me when I first walked in. I ripped it off the wall with surprising ease. With all my might, for my life, I cleaved the tentacle. It didn't sever, but I cut it deeply, and it released me. Before the second tentacle could reach the chamber... I slammed the door with all my might. I looked at the tentacles, prodding and probing the sealed door. It was absolutely horrifying. I knew that they had every intent on dragging me down into the depths. They were terrifying, like a giant octopus with spiny thorns attached to hook its prey. After what seemed like hours, the decompression finished. I had already been screaming and the others had gathered at the door. I exited the chamber and turned to the others. We have to get the hell out of here. Now. I screamed. Calm down, said Manon. What happened? There's some kind of... I stopped. I didn't know what to say. I know this sounds crazy, but a massive predatory invertebrate 
grabbed me in the moon pool. Like a Pacific octopus? Doug asked curiously. They were not understanding the gravity of the situation. The tentacles weren't visible from this angle, and I dared not open the door to show them. Instead, I showed them my leg. It was bleeding, though, not profusely. The puncture wounds were still clearly visible. The others began to inspect my leg. Derek went into another room and came back with a couple knives. They were the only weapons we had available. At first light, all of us should make a break for the Hofnung, said Derek. But what about the storm? said Bertram. I would rather take my chances with the storm than be down here. At least I would die a natural death, said Derek. I don't think the others understood, but I knew exactly what he meant. The idea of drowning in the open waters somehow seemed like a tolerable alternative. It suddenly made sense. The explosions, the beaten up submersible. This animal was being studied by the other facility. One thing is certain, said Derek. The creature only seems to be around at night, and we seem to be safe in here. I'm swimming for the Hofnung in the morning. I strongly urge the rest of you to do the same. I nodded. The others looked among themselves, not knowing what to think. We all went to our bunks and tried to sleep. After hours of tossing and turning and staring at the entrance, half expecting a dark, gray tentacle slither around the corner, my wound felt better. Manon had bandaged it and applied disinfectant. I slowly started to nod off. When I awoke, I started my daily routine. I even got ready to go out and swim to the bathroom when I stopped dead in my tracks. I felt a deep sense of horror, as if I was just remembering what had happened to me in the moon pool just hours before. I suddenly felt no urge to go to the bathroom at all. I just stood there gazing at the pressure chamber. All of the others had risen and were mulling about. Have either of you seen Doug? said Manon. I'm waiting for his data, but I haven't seen him. Maybe he hasn't woken up yet. I said, He isn't in his bunk, said Manon. I'm starting to get worried. He probably went out for some samples, said Bertram. You're probably right, said Manon, and she started busying herself with her work. I finally worked up the courage to go out to the bathroom dome. The water was moving faster than usual, but nothing I couldn't swim against. I could see how being a poor swimmer would be very hazardous and understood now why they insisted on strong swimmers in the job application. Out of the dome, I looked around and realized that there wasn't a fish in sight. Usually during this time of day, the ocean was full of them, but now, it was barren. It was unnerving. I looked around the eerie depths, trying to make out what I could through the misty seawater. I noticed something strange. The hatch to the other part of the facility was open. That same hatch that Javier had swam up. Upon thinking about Javier, my eyes started back to the place where I had seen his eyes, staring at me from the hole. I shuddered and suddenly started to feel very vulnerable. I got done with my business and started back towards the moon pool. When I entered the habitat, I saw that Manon was coming my way with Bertram and Derek. There you are, she said. We're going out to look for Doug. You should have been back by now. The hatch is open, I said. They all looked at one another. We will have to think about that later, she said. Everyone, suit up, and make sure you are full of oxygen. The water was still moving fast due to the stormy conditions. It was difficult to fight against the current, but Doug should have come back by now, and there was a chance he was stuck and running low on air. We had to look for him. We checked down the slope in the opposite direction of the hole, but there was no sign of Doug. We finally came to the hole. We shined our lights down into the depths, nothing but darkness. After a while, our oxygen levels were getting low and we returned to the habitat. On our way back, we all saw the opened hatch. No doubt we were all thinking the same thing. Doug might have gone up the hatch for some reason. When we had shed our gear in the moon pool, Derek was the first to mention this. We need to get in touch with the other part of the habitat, he said. I'll try to radio them again. As I walked past the door that connected the two habitats, I peered down its corridor. Surely we could just override the locks and walk in there. It seemed like the right thing to do given the circumstances. I shined the light down the corridor through the glass. 
It was strange. Something at the very end of the corridor seemed to be floating. I squinted and tried to discern what it was that I was looking at. Hey guys, I said. I think something is moving in there. We all gathered at the glass of the door and peered into the darkness. There was something that seemed to be hovering. It was drifting closer. I knew what it was before my mind could register what I was seeing. It was a strange feeling. On the one hand, there was a pen, but on the other, it was drifting right in the middle of the air. The pen was floating because the chamber had filled with water. It won't break through, said Derek. This door is designed to withstand pressures far beyond this. It was always a possibility that one of the habitats would be compromised. His words did little to reassure me. I kept staring at that pen as it seemed to drift aimlessly. Ricocheted off one of the walls, gently. What happened to all the people? Asked Bertram. There was nothing but silence for a moment. Then Manon spoke. We have to go in there said Manon. That must be where Doug is. Maybe he's trapped. Derek and Bertram exchanged glances and started speaking in German. Manon interrupted them and they all started yelling at each other. I stood there puzzled until they switched back to English. I can't believe you two, said Manon. Doug would have done it to save you. Doug is dead, said Derek. Or worse. What do you mean or worse, said Manon. He has been out of air for a while now and we all know it, said Derek. Bertram and I are going for the Hofnung. We aren't waiting for the ship. Bertram stood there looking as guilty as he was terrified. Finally, they were starting to understand. We had to get the hell out of there. I opened my mouth to agree adamantly, but Manon spoke first. I'm going over there, she said defiantly. She looked at me and waited for me to speak. Okay, I said. I'll go with you to look for Doug. This is crazy, said Derek. I don't want to be on that sinking boat in a storm any minute longer than I have to. We can't wait for you. One hour, said Manon. That is all we need. Derek and Bertram started arguing in German again. We will wait one hour, said Bertram. Then we will head to the surface together. Suiting up went fast. We did our final checks and dove back into the moon pool. A hatch seemed to beckon me. I thought of Javier and how I had seen his head staring at me. Even now it gave me the chills, but I put it in the back of my mind. Soon, we could almost see up the shaft. I thought of how much had happened in my life since I had taken this job. How much I had learned and seen. It was hard to remember what my life used to be like. It seemed like so long ago that I had been sleeping in a nice bed and eating all the food that I wanted. Mostly, I thought about how much I had taken for granted. You don't realize how important it is to feel safe until you don't. We reached the entrance of the shaft. It became dark fast. Manon turned on her light and my heart sank. At the end of the shaft was a metal door, but it looked as though it had been warped. What could have done this? Luckily... Our diver's masks had radio communication built in. What could have done this? Said Manon. She looked over at me. She knew what I was thinking already. There's no creature ever discovered like the one you hallucinated will. I went to retort but snapped. There was no point in arguing. I wanted to live, not to be right. Let's hope not. I son. It took everything I had, but I managed to start kicking and swam up into the shaft. Manon soon followed after me. We traced the dark room with our lights. It seemed to have been some kind of submersible docking room. What once was a moon pool had been overtaken by water. All manner of clutter floated about. It was unnerving to be there in the darkness, 60 meters beneath the surface of the water, in a breached habitat that had gone silent. I swatted a tablet away from my head as we continued onward. The decompression chamber was wide open. Both of the large doors stood unsealed. I knew what had happened. That creature had tried to grab me. That giant octopus creature had gotten through the decompression chamber. I couldn't stop thinking about those tentacles that had grabbed me. They looked like they were as thick as a tree trunk as they disappeared into that black water. I'll never forget it. 
As we swam into the next room, it was large and quite long. It was full of all types of computers and lab equipment, but in the center of our room and to my horror, there it was. That same dark gray tentacle. It must have been 50 feet long. I instinctively swam away. This was horror movie 101. I had done everything I could to convince Manon that my story was true. If she didn't believe me now, it was on her. To my great relief, I saw her swimming fast behind me. She now understood that our lives were in imminent danger. As we rounded the corner in the room with the hatch, we saw Doug. It seemed like a miracle. There he was, floating there in his diving gear. We made it up towards the moon pool and started to get out of our gear. That's when I caught out of the corner of my eye. Doug's oxygen meter had been empty. Still, I didn't think much about it as we made our way to the decompression chamber. I wish I had. Doug, I have to say it is good to see your stupid face, said Manon. Why didn't you respond to my radio? Doug gave a slight smile. We looked everywhere for you, my son. He looked at me. He looked like he had some kind of debris in his eye. Still, he said nothing. He just stared at me. That is when I realized that Bertram and Derek were nowhere to be found. Derek? Bertram? I cried out. You don't think they would have left without us, do you? Asked Manon. Suddenly, I heard a loud crash a distance from the habitat. It was as loud as the explosions, but it was different. I could tell Manon thought the same thing as we looked at each other in horror. Putting it out of our mind, Manon and I desperately scrambled around the habitat. When we returned, we noticed Doug standing by the decompression chamber. He seemed to be examining it. You okay there, Doug? I asked. He turned to me and gave me that same hollow stare. I had seen that stare before. Somewhere. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. He soon returned to the decompression interface. He just stared at it. Any ideas on where Derek and Bertram are, Doug? I asked. More to make conversation than anything else. We stood there in silence for a moment. I dared not walk away. Manon had made her way over to us after searching for Derek. By the look on my face, she could tell that there was something wrong. Doug? She asked. After a moment of silence, Doug's hand rose and pressed one of the buttons. He pressed another button. He was starting to figure it out. I tried to block the panel, but he swatted me away with a speed that was uncharacteristic of Doug. He was trying to open the decompression chamber. I tried to push him away from the panel, but he headbutted me hard. I fell to the ground. I felt woozy. I tried to stand up, but fell over again. Manon! I cried out. Don't let him open the chamber. Manon stood there, horrified as I finally got to my feet. But it was too late. Doug managed to open the decompression chamber. Still, there was a fail-safe mechanism. Both doors couldn't be opened at once, unless overridden in an emergency. I had read about it in the manual before I came aboard. There was a way, but it was done underwater at the depth. The moon pool's integrity would fail, and the water would rush into the habitat. Doug stood there once more, thinking, thinking with that horrifying, hollow stare. My head was still spinning, but I managed to grab a hold of his arm and we both went tumbling over. I managed to dodge some swings at my head and scramble backwards. Doug refocused his attention back on the panel. Suddenly, a loud alarm sounded. It was over. The moon pool integrity had been compromised. Water immediately began to rush in. Manon and I looked at each other in horror. She rushed over to the cabinet. The water was already up to our knees and rising fast. Doug simply stared at us, void of emotion. The water poured forth, and in seconds I had taken a deep breath from the air at the top. I tried to think of something, anything, but before I could, Manon grabbed my hand. She had found a life raft. We swam for it. We both started towards the moon pool when all of a sudden I felt a strong hand grip my leg. It was Doug. I thrashed and kicked, but to no avail. I tried to fight Doug with all I had left, but he was too strong. And I was running out of oxygen. The edges of my eyes were starting to turn black and my lungs were crying out. This was it. Suddenly Manon drove a fixed blade deep into Doug's stomach. 
He momentarily let go and we scrambled out of the moon pool with Doug right behind us. To my horror, I saw Doug swimming down after us, blood pouring out. Manon screamed and pointed towards the hole. There was Javier, Bertram, and Derek swimming for us, all with that hollow, lifeless look in their eyes. All we had to do was clear the building above us, and we could pull the ripcord. We were so close. That is when I saw the Hoffnung. It was the ship that was supposed to be above us. But there it was. I could barely make it out through the murky water, but it was hard to miss something so big. The storm, or maybe the others, had sunk it. That was what that crashing sound had been. We cleared the structure, and just as the creatures were closing in on us, Manon ripped the cord. Holding on, we started to ascend fast. I watched as we left that horrible place behind. It disappeared into the misty ocean, underneath my feet. We hung there, blind and helpless, all the while thinking to ourselves, what if the others swam up after us? How long would it take them to reach us? My joints were hurting and I knew why. Decompression sickness was setting in. Still, we were alive. The more I strained to look, the more I started to make out several shadows. They were getting closer. I could start to make out the human bodies now. They were no more than several meters away, swimming for us. My joints were in agony and I felt so tired. I needed to sleep. Still, the sight of the surf is so close. It's glimmering majesty. Just a little further. We broke the surface gasping for air. The life raft was so close. We scrambled into it as I felt that fear of having my last leg grabbed. But it wasn't. We had made it. We quickly looked over the side. A chill ran down my spine as I saw, right beneath the surface, the faces of Javier, Derek, Doug, and Bertram. All of their eyes fixed on us. There they remained as if unable to break the surface. Doug was still bleeding profusely from his stomach and a cloud of red was gathering. We collapsed in the bed of the life raft, exhausted. We had made it. We could feel their hands scratching at us through the raft. It was unnerving, but the raft seemed to be holding. The sun was setting, and the sky was a beautiful pink color. That brings us to now. The last light has gone away now. The others are still scratching at the bottom of the raft. The sun is no longer holding it at bay. The creature will surely come for us tonight. A young woman stood in the doorway, hands cupped as though protecting a baby bird. She was waiting, it seemed, for an invitation. Hesitance like that is a common sight at the food bank. It's tough for people to ask for help, even when they really need it. It breaks my heart to see how many hang their heads trying to hide tears of shame when collecting a meager box of supplies to see them through. It's not their fault. The government should do more. Starting with knocking off all the poor people are lazy rhetoric. Especially now, but I digress. The girl was slim, gaunt even and barely out of her teens. The faded yellow dress she wore hung off her bones, several sizes too big. I doubt it did much to keep her warm in the damp January air. She looked around for a bit, and I did my best to give her space, busying myself by taking inventory. Lots of folk get spooked if you're too keen, and often the courage it takes to walk through the door is brittle. I try to feign indifference as a kindness. After a minute or so of steady observation, she appeared in front of the table as I was stacking bags of pasta. I glanced up with a practiced smile. Her eyes had a strange, still quality that caught me off guard. I don't remember ever having been looked at like that before. So coolly, or so thoroughly. Hiya. Suddenly my throat contracted and I sputtered, seized by a violent coughing fit. Sorry about that, I said patting my chest. Can I help? The girl hadn't moved, hadn't blinked, her face impassive and inscrutable as a statue. 
She simply stood, boring into me with her flat, gray eyes. I'm not very good at silence and to ease the discomfort. I fiddled with the string on my hoodie, trying to think of something to say. Thankfully, she spoke before I embarrassed myself by babbling. I have things to give, she said in a steady, measured tone. Great, I gushed. We are grateful for whatever you can spare. I gestured at the table of rice to my right and began to tell her which bits we were typically low on. Tea bags, mostly. Those stock cubes were always welcome. She raised a hand to stop me. And I did stop, compelled by her gesture. The way she moved was considered, commanding even. It was peculiar to see authority like that in someone so young. In many ways, she still looked like a child, playing dress up in her mother's clothes. I offer this. She placed a small brass tin about the size of my fist on the table between us. I wasn't sure what to say. It was tiny, but I didn't want to seem ungrateful. And after all, every little really does help. Thank you, I said, trying to keep the disappointment from my face. It is for everyone, she said, then turned away, walking back out into the cold, a flimsy cotton dress gently lapping at her calves. I regarded the tin with vague contempt. It looked like the one's old-fashioned pastilles came in, and I highly doubted that would be any use to us. Still, not looking a gift horse in the mouth is good advice, and I resolved not to be so dismissive. Perhaps it would be something we could divide between a few boxes, or find a use for it in one of the trickier dietary bundles. To say I was astonished when I twisted off the lid would be a phenomenal understatement. Inside the tin, on a layer of plush, sooty-looking fabric, sat a single suite wrapped in bright purple foil. What the... I muttered, tilting it slightly in my hand, bemused. I screwed the lid back on and strode across the room, eager to share my peculiar experience with the other volunteers. Mark, come see this. I called on my way over. Mark was the project lead who had recruited me, a perpetually cheerful man in glasses that always seemed to be trying to escape his face. He held them in place with a well-practiced forefinger, trotting to my side. What you got, D? I handed him the tin without a word. Alice's curiosity had peaked too, and she used the carton of UHT milk in her hand to nudge Mark slightly, angling for a better view. He frowned and turned the tin over, probably looking for an expiry date out of habit, and gave me an inquiring look. I just shrugged, telling him it was a donation from a walk-in, while Alice tutted and went back to her boxes grumbling softly about people taking the piss. Twisting the lid off, just like I had, Mark brought it up to his face and sniffed at the shiny wrapper like a bespectacled truffle pig. The absurdity of the whole thing tickled me, and I let out a snort when I laughed, about to ask him what he thought we should do with it. A family sheepishly entered the hall, their confusion and worry drawing my attention enough that I abandoned Mark to his investigation and headed over to greet the newcomers with a welcoming smile. I wish I hadn't left him like that. If I'd have stayed, it might have worked out differently. We would probably have had a quick giggle and then chuck the wretched thing. It would have been just a fun, odd little story to tell each other. An inside joke about the weird woman and her tin. Now it's so much more. When I left that afternoon, I'd pretty much forgotten it. The day had been busy and my mind was already on tomorrow's supermarket delivery. I was completely ignorant of what was coming, of what I had done. When I went in the next day, Mark's car was parked outside. This wasn't unusual. Part of what made him great at the job was his commitment, and he often was the first one in and the last one out. It was strange that he hadn't heard me open the door though. Normally I'm greeted by his terrible, if enthusiastic, singing or at least the sound of him babbling about in one room or another before setting up. I figured he must have been in the loo or something and set my stuff down, preparing for the day to start in earnest. After fiddling with my phone and tracking down the sign-in sheet, movement across the room caught my eye. I was hoping Mark had heard me come in and made me a cuppa. 
but there was no one there. He wasn't in the room, but something else was moving. A brassy glint danced on the floor, and a sharp whirring noise grew louder. The tin from the day before was spinning, as though someone had twirled it like a coin between the far tables. I frowned and watched it slow, eventually falling still with a hollow clink. Mark? I called. No reply came, and I felt silly for allowing a little prickle of fear to creep up my spine. He was probably just mucking about. I still don't know if the thought was genuine or a subconscious effort to soothe myself. Mark, stop playing silly buggers and put the kettle on. There was a shuffling sound from the direction of the kitchen, and I let out the breath I didn't know I'd been holding. Ten minutes went by, then fifteen, and twenty. Every so often I would find my eyes sliding back to the tin. I don't know what I expected from it, but my nerves were jangled, and I gave it a wide berth as I stomped to the kitchen, annoyed at Mark and myself in equal measure. It was empty, but the whole room was in disarray. Cupboard doors were open, coffee granules were spilled all over the countertop, sugar crunched underfoot. My irritation dissolved into worry and I shouted for him again. Mark, are you okay? Where are you? Another clang came from the hall and I headed back the way I came. There he was, finally. I was awash with relief. His back was turned and he was hunched as though looking for something. I assumed he had dropped his glasses like always and started to head over to help. Hey. I wanted to ask him what was going on. What had happened in the kitchen, but before I could get the words out, he stood and turned. My hand flew up to cover my mouth on instinct. The man in front of me was indisputably Mark. There could be no doubt. The clothes were the ones he'd been wearing the day before, but his face... There was something wrong with his face. At first, I thought he must have fallen and injured himself somehow. It was like I could only take in flashes of what I could see. Partial snapshots, like I couldn't process it all at once. His face looked raw, but it wasn't blood or bruising. The color was all wrong. His mouth was smeared with a deep plum stain, spreading out across his cheeks and chin. I reached a hand out to him, then faltered. The color wasn't on his skin. It was under it, and it was moving. I could see clearly now, thousands of tiny capillaries writhing around his lips, pulsing with every beat of his heart. My own hand hadn't moved, and I could feel the pressure of it, grinding flesh against teeth. It took all the strength I had to tear it away and speak. I'm going to call an ambulance. You'll be... The next part is a blur. I tried to reach my phone, worried he might be having an allergic reaction. I was scared. Not of him, but for him. I should never have turned my back. My head hit the back of a plastic chair as his weight slammed into me from behind. The impact turned my vision to static, and everything else was a tangle of limbs and agony. He grabbed me by the temples, kneeling on my thighs, fingers tangling in my hair, and lifted my head to his as I tried desperately to blink away the involuntary stream of tears. I could see him. Not clearly, but well enough as he loomed over me. The wine-colored threads had spread up the side of his nose, twisting the contours of his face into something monstrous. Their throbbing made me want to retch, and I clawed at his hands, struggling to free myself. Mark yanked my head back, making me yelp in pain and pulled me closer. Close enough I could see his dilated pupils and smell the copper tang of his breath. The veins in his face were twitching as though they were alive, some distending to the point of bursting. A few at the corner of his mouth split, spilling thin blackberry at core down his chin. He tilted my head back, pulling at my hair, silent and merciless. Alice burst through the door with armfuls of shopping, walking straight into the chaos. For a second, we were all caught in dumb shock. Mark and I startled by the noise, and Alice trying to make sense of what she saw. It was enough for me, though. Mark was distracted, and taking advantage, I grabbed the closest thing to hand, smashing it into his distorted mug with all the strength I could muster. The same revolting liquid that had erupted from his skin splattered all over me, and the floor behind, but I kept on hitting and screaming, 
until Alice pulled us apart. For the first time, she got a good look at his face and gasped in horror as he lolled on his back, barely conscious. I just panted, clutching the can of value grapefruit segments to my chest. While Alice called the paramedics, I caught my breath. The adrenaline combined with the taste of his blood in my mouth made my stomach churn, and I heaved myself up into a more comfortable position in case I needed to be sick. As I shifted my weight, I felt something cold against the heel of my left hand, and I flinched. I knew what it was without looking. Mark was still lying prone, seeping dark fluid from his wounds, and Alice was here now. Help was coming. I was safe, but still something about this tiny object frightened me. I thought about throwing it across the room. One fierce lob to get the wretched thing away, but I couldn't risk Alice picking it up. I didn't want her anywhere near it. Hesitantly, I closed my fingers around it without braving a glimpse, only to snatch my head back in surprise. The lid was off, and spread out neatly on the velveteen lining was a square of bright purple foil. Something inside me knew Mark had opened it, even before I touched it, even before I noticed the embossing inside the foil. He had peeled it apart so perfectly there wasn't even the slightest tear. He had even smoothed the creases. The only imperfection left was the word at its center. The rest of the day is basically blank. I was taken to the hospital. That much I know. I have some vague memories of tired voices, warm hands, and the hem of a yellow dress. Though mostly all I can recall is a muddle of noise and confusion. My injuries were superficial, barring a concussion. But they've kept me in for testing because the doctors don't know what's wrong with Mark. They did what they could, Alice said, but there is something very wrong. He's in a medically induced coma right now, and I can't help but hate myself for it. I did that. I hurt him. Not with the can, but when I left him with that tin, I handed him something evil and he was corrupted by it. It should have been me. When I woke up this afternoon, the nurse told me I'd had a visitor. I hadn't been expecting anyone and shrugged in response. You're very lucky to have such nice friends, she said, pulling the lid from my gift to show me a single, perfectly wrapped orb. I forced a smile as she chattered cheerily about how expensive and fancy it looked. I didn't have the strength to argue, or explain, or even cry. I couldn't bring myself to tell her that if she were to look very closely at the gleaming purple wrapper, she would find a word etched lightly in the center. A single word. A name. She'd only have put it down to my head injury, I was certain. Hours have passed since then, and I'm mindlessly tracing the new thread veins blossoming on my cheeks with my nails, trying hard to ignore the sunlight reflecting off the brass beside me. It won't be long now. I just wanted you to know, wanted someone to know, for Mark's sake, as well as mine, that we tried to be good people. He'd want me to reach as many as I can so you can keep yourselves safe. That's why I wrote this, so you can learn from our mistakes before it's too late. Learn from my mistake, please. Refuse whatever the girl in the yellow dress offers you. The skinny girl I thought was strange but harmless. The one I worried for. The bundle of thin bones and thinner clothes. The one who gave a little but cost us so much. Do not take anything from her. I'm begging you. Her name is on the foil. Her name is flooding my veins. Her name is killing me slowly. Her name is Pestilence. Some people ask me why I never use the street view function on Google Maps. They say things like, how will you know what the place looks like? Or, don't you want to see more than just bird's eye view of the place? I usually reply by saying it's always better to go outside and see things with your own eyes, which usually ends in them commending me for my confidence. Truth be told, the reason I say that is not because of confidence. On the contrary, it's because of fear. To understand where I am coming from, 
I need to tell you the story of how I first found out about Google Maps. I was in elementary school at the time and during computer class. Instead of doing the assigned project, my friend and I were fooling around on CoolMathGames.com. We were playing Fireboy and Water Girl when one of my friends started to speak. Hey, you guys heard of Google Maps? Yeah, my parents use it all the time. But did you know that you can actually see the places on the map? Like, you're actually there? To my 12-year-old brain, that sounded amazing. I let my friend pull up Google Maps on my computer, then he asked me for a place I wanted to see. Hmm, how about our school? School? Really? Yeah, I want to see how it looks. After typing in the address of our school, my friend dragged this little yellow stick man into the school address and opened up Street View. I was mesmerized by the pictures on the screen. It felt so surreal to be able to navigate and look around as if you were really there. I could see everything. From the broken swings at the playground to the concrete stairs that lead to the front door. Something about being able to see things without actually being there appealed to my young mind. Oh, did you know that you can see your house too? Here, let me show you my house. My friend typed in his address and pulled up the street view of his house. I visited this place many times before, and the house looked just as in real life. The yellow exterior, the white fences at the front, and the garden at the side. Google Maps gave a perfect recreation of my friend's abode. While we were sitting there snickering at my friend's house, the bell rang, and it was time to go home. After school, I did my usual routine of going home, searching the pantry for anything to eat, and going up to my room and playing on my computer. I didn't have any homework that night, and my parents said they were going to be home late, so I had the house all to myself. As a kid, I decided the best thing to do was play flash games as late into the evening as I could. Eventually, I got bored of playing flash games and wondered what I should do. It was just past 6pm, but it was dark outside already. I looked out of my bedroom window and saw all the houses in my neighborhood with lights shining through their windows. Suddenly, I remembered about the Google Maps thing my friend showed me at school that day. I eagerly opened up Google Maps and typed in my address. Then, I opened up Street View. The image of my home covered my screen. I had a fun time dragging the camera around and seeing everything. I even zoomed into the living room window, imagining that maybe I would see someone if I zoomed in enough. Of course, the window was too blurry after I zoomed in that much. I decided to zoom out again and take a look at my house as a whole. It was then that I noticed something odd. There was a man wearing a hoodie near my side gate. I tried zooming onto the man's face, but I could only see the back of his head. For context, the side of my childhood house has a gate that leads into the backyard. Right above that gate was my bedroom window. Being an imaginative child, and given it was dark outside, I rushed to my window and pulled back the curtains, expecting to see someone scary when I looked down. I sighed in relief. Of course, there was no one by the side gate. When I got back on my computer, I was greeted by a horrifying sight. The image of a man's crooked face with eyes bulging and a cartoonishly wide smile. I never zoomed out from the man's face before checking the window, so his face filled my whole screen. I instantly zoomed out. I wanted to close my browser, but I was afraid that if I did, the man would go away. Since I zoomed out, I got to see the man's full body. The best way to describe the man was tall, lanky, and crooked. He had a hoodie on, and his hands were in his hoodie pockets. His head was tilted to one side, and his eyes were staring directly at the screen. What really scared me was how his entire torso was facing the screen, as if he knew I was looking at him. The street view images were all taken during the day, so I reasoned to myself that even if there was a smiling man outside, that could not possibly be happening at this moment. After all, it was already dark out. I looked at the date the images were taken and saw it was taken months ago. I then looked again outside my window just to confirm no one was at the side gate. Thus, I was reassured there was no way the man was currently outside my house. When I looked back at the computer, my eyes widened. The man stood just as he did moments ago, except one of his hands were outside of his pockets. The hand was giving me a thumbs down. All this time... The man was still staring directly at the screen with his bulging eyes and absurdly wide smile. 
I darted downstairs and made sure all the doors and windows were locked. I closed all the curtains for all the windows, then locked myself in my room. When I looked back at my computer, I saw the man's face was no longer smiling. Now, it was laughing. I considered closing the browser, but I was deathly afraid of what would happen if I did so. Clearly, it seemed that the man was responding to what I was doing, so I was left staring at his image on my screen. After a few minutes of staring at the man and making sure I don't take my eyes off him, my computer got the blue screen of death. Panicking, I quickly unplugged my computer and plug it back in, trying to restart it. The screen came alive and showed the Windows XP boot up screen. There was nothing but silence throughout the entire house. I sat there, looking at the boot up screen, wanting nothing more than to get back on Google Maps to make sure the man was still there. Back then, PCs took a very long time to load. Suddenly I heard the doorknob to my front door start jiggling. I feared the worst. Was that the man? I looked back at my computer and it was still booting up. The jiggling stopped. Then I heard the familiar creaking sound of my front door opening. My heart was racing in my chest and my hands were trembling. I knew the door to my room was locked. But if the man could get through the front door, he could just as easily get through the door to my room. Then I heard my mom's voice calling out. We're home. All the tension I had suddenly disappeared and I raced downstairs to see my parents taking off their shoes at the front door. I frantically told them about what happened regarding the man and they did not believe me. I practically dragged them to my room and opened up Google Maps Street View for our house, expecting to see the familiar jagged smile. However, the man was not there. I zoomed in and out all over my house and could find no trace of the man. I kept insisting that he was there, but my parents never believed me. They said that even if the man was there, there was no way it could have happened in real time since the photos were taken months ago. The next day, I told my friends the story at lunchtime and, well, it scared them for a moment. They eventually forgot about the story. I never forgot about what happened that night. The memory of the man's crooked smile and bulging eyes come back to me whenever I consider opening up Street View on Google Maps. So now... Whenever someone asks me why I never use Street View, I simply tell them that I would rather see things with my own eyes than trust whatever image is on the screen. The Deepwater Horizon was one of the biggest man-made disasters in the world holding the infamous title for being the largest environmental disaster in the history of the U.S. Ever since its fatal explosion in the Gulf of Mexico, 41 miles offshore from civilization. What they don't tell you is that the Deepwater Horizon, caught in one of the worst disasters the world has ever seen, wasn't the only one like many others recorded in the documents and files known to the press and public, for highly classified and non-disclosure agreements that I've signed, I'm expected to not be revealing this publicly. Unfortunately for me, I do not have much time left in this world. Recently, I've been diagnosed with a stage 3 lung cancer from specialists and doctors alike. With the excessive heavy smoking that I had picked up as a stress reliever to get away from the memories and nightmares that had been plaguing me ever since that damned search and rescue operation to Watchtower 1. Speaking of which... Watchtower 1 wasn't the original name of the oil rig, as they had changed its name several times to avoid whistleblowers. As such, I, unfortunately, cannot disclose the true identity of the facility to avoid those who poke their noses into the operation that I had longed and yearned to forget. This is purely my recount and a guilt reliever to get the weighing matters off my chest before I leave this godforsaken world for good. You see... On November 4th, 2018, I joined the CDC, also known as the Centers for Disease Control, with the mindset and pretext that I would be of aid in curing diseases, giving medical attention and relaying medical supplies to those who are living in disease-ridden third world countries. For the first two years, that was the case, paving my way through college and earning my biomedicine degree after the army. Naturally, the CDC seemed like a good job offer to take up with it being the apex of healthcare professions after my graduation. 
When they had accepted my job application, I was thrilled, to say the least. Nonetheless, I would not be working for them as a standard health scientist, during which I was informed that a field in the CDC was lacking in manpower and workers, demanding that if I were to take up the job offer, I would be part of a security task force team specializing in crucial search and rescue missions and escort of personnel from the CDC and civilians alike. It wasn't the kind of work that I had in mind when I joined the CDC, but it was a high paying job for a beginner like me at that time. So I had just thought it seemed like a good job offer. With the encompassing fact that I had been training and serving in the military, so I was pretty well suited for the job. The third field assignment that I had received earlier came with skepticism, codenamed Operation Hammerdown, alongside with my team of five personnel in total, consisting of four security officers and me, was supposed to receive a distress call coming from an offshore deep water oil drilling rig, aka known as Watchtower 1 at Redacted in the Atlantic Ocean, approximately 39 miles off the coast of data expunged to rescue and secure two geneticists and the rest of the rig personnel who were on board the rig at the time of a seemingly aggressive encounter with unresponsive mutilated figures coming on board the platform from the vessel that has been seen to have fatal injuries covering the entirety of their bodies exhibiting rabid and hostile behavior in terms of jerky and shuffling motions towards the crew those who had tried to establish physical contact with the figures have been seen to also exhibit sudden violent and aggressive tendencies within a couple of minutes, and therefore have been quarantined and separated from the rest of the crew on board. The massive scientific research vessel had coincidentally crashed into the drilling rig during a hurricane-like storm in the sea at 2200, 10 p.m., and had gotten stuck and lodged into the pillars as documents and recorded information about the call states. The distress call came in at around 12 a.m. as the connection had abruptly halted from unknown reasons, possibly from the storm itself. Gearing up my issued equipment and loading a fresh magazine into the M4 carbine, I strapped and tightened the bulky black tinted gas mask around my face as I donned a heavy yellow rubber hazmat suit with an accompanying tactical vest at the outside Strapping considerable lengths of heavy-duty duct tape around my wrist and legs, and sealing them up to prevent air from entering and escaping, I exited the decontamination chamber drenched in the cleansing tap water and the heavy downpour of the rain. As the roar of the Black Hawk helicopter greeted me as it resonated throughout the slippery landing pad, with occasional thunder that boomed in the distance, the rest of the security team waved to me, all clad in the same yellow protective suits, sitting in their respective seats. Upon boarding the helicopter, the ground crew outside gave the helicopter one last exterior check before giving an all-clear thumbs up to the pilot and co-pilot, before shutting the metal door in a quick and swift slam, locking it into place. A torrent of raindrops the size of bullet pelt the top and sides of the helicopter vigorously. Sounds of their impact Sounds of their impact drowned out by the blade of the helicopter as it gradually hovered above the ground before taking off. Call signs, background static, and garbled voices chattered over the communications radio built into our hazmat suits as the shaky chopper ride to the oil rig was carried out mostly in silence, apart from the constant droning of the radio and the howl of the helicopter blades. I thought that our weapons would protect us, I thought that this mission was just a simple extraction operation. I was so fucking wrong. Rudely stirred from my short power nap by the shrill announcement of the pilot implying our arrival, the helicopter shuddered against the force of the unrelenting downpour of rain, stealing a glance at the electronic clock hanging on the wall of the helicopter. It read in brightly lit red numbers, 3.23 a.m. The exterior window of the helicopter is covered in a thick layer of water, as the world outside the helicopter is shrouded in a vast, thick, and black void, with nothing except the mesmerizing wave-stricken ocean for as far as the eye could see through the dense curtain of rain. Pilot. Vulture 2-2, two, two. 
platform coming into view. Feet dry in 20 seconds. The surrounding void of darkness engulfing the sea gradually became brighter and brighter as a massive behemoth of a structure seemingly rising out from the sea came into view outside the blurry water splattered window. Pilot. Uh, we have a non-visual status on personnel in the rig. Break. The words came over the radio, slow and drawn out as the helicopter circled around the brightly lit drilling rig, with a massive visible black reefer vessel half sunken and stuck into two of the oil platform pillars, causing it to slightly bend and tilt over to an unstable angle. My jaw hung agape as another unsettling image of the rig soon came into view, this time at the landing pen. The offshore helicopter, used to transport personnel from the shore to the rig, is seen sprawled flat on the landing pen, wrecked tail dangling over the edge, and the body of the rest of the helicopter torn to shreds with the chopper's blade hanging loosely at its sides. Scratches and damage could be seen visibly on the wrecked metal bird laying on the pen, as giant, violent waves slam against the concrete pillars of the rig, causing the lights of the infrastructure to flicker each time from the impact. Co-pilot. Copy that. Radio check. Stand by. Switch to secure channel over. The overhead door buzzer sounded as the interior of the helicopter lit up in a dazzling red light. Two of my squad mates, Corporal Jackson and Sergeant Volkers, stood from their seats with assault rifles strapped tightly to their vests as they simultaneously gripped the handles and heaved both of the adjacent doors open with grunts. Gusts of storm wind and rain whipped around in the interior, as I and the rest of the task force prepared ourselves for insertion. Pilot. Green light. Go, go, go. Thick black fiber ropes dropped down from the top of both helicopter doors, as Corporal Jackson and Sergeant Volkers were the first to grab onto the ropes and slide down. I followed suit after them as the rain violently pelted against my fogged up gas mask, obstructing most of my view. Swiftly sliding down the rope as my boots slammed onto the metal platform. I quickly drew the M4 assault rifle and switched the safety off. As I noticed my other two teammates who were already in position. Assault rifles trained on a rusty metal steel door a couple feet away. Sounds of sliding and boots hitting the wet ground can be heard behind me. As the other two squad members, Corporal Staples and Specialist Maxon rendezvoused with us. Assault rifles crackling and clicking into place as the whole team filled into combat stance. Weapons drawn at the ready. Co-pilot. Whiskey 3, this is Vulture 2-2 at Bingo Fuel. We're bugging out of here for refuel and resupply. Godspeed. Over. The helicopter hovered above us for a second before rising up and circling the rig for another minute. Before soon flying back into the distance. The sounds of turning blades quickly disappearing and masked by the incessant pitter-patter of rain and thunder. The surroundings around me were grimly lit by the overhead lights of the rig as a loud, stressed, groan of the infrastructure echoed throughout its walls and floors. Sarge raised his hands and motioned for us to toggle the flashlights on our guns to operational as he took the lead and walked towards the metal door, with the rest of the team still vigilant and following after him. Approaching the worn down and corroded metal door, we stepped inside and divided ourselves into two sections, each on either opposite sides of the door and pressed against the grime-coated wall, awaiting further instructions. Breathing heavily through the fogged-up mask, I could still make out the palpable lingering smell of decay and decades of rusting metal as the platform squeaked noisily under our weight. Sergeant Vokers motioned a countdown with his gloved hand melding the numbers Wells carrying his rifle in his other hand, as we mentally steeled ourselves for a breach into the facility. On my mark. Three, two, one, breach. The metal door flew forcefully open on its hinges with a slight dent in its body from Sergeant's leg kick as we noisily chambered through the doorway. Guns and eyes transfixed on the front as everybody piled into the small corridor, dimly lit with a constant flickering of the overhead lights. Room cleared. The small corridor, basked in a yellowish-green hue by the lighting, 
led to a metal grated flight of stairs leading downwards. As we cautiously stepped over the debris strewn flooring, the sounds of constant dripping of rainwater leaking from the metal walls fading into the background as I followed behind Sergeant Vokers, with the rest of the team trailing in a single file after us. Upon descending down the flight of stairs, we were instantly hit in the face with an unmistakably strong, sickly metallic smell of blood, strong and concentrated enough to permeate and filter through our gas masks, causing one of the team members trailing behind us, Specialist Maxon, to bend over and gag, as he uses his assault rifle as leverage to keep him from falling over. Jesus Christ, what in the world actually happened here? Specialist Maxon remarked through the radio. The distinctive sounds of his coughing mixed with the fuzz and the white static emitted from through the speakers. Clenching the weapon tight in my hands, I shone the flashlight attached to the barrel of the gun onto an unlit section of the corridor, with the beam of light falling upon a frame of a person dressed in a matching orange reflective taped jacket and pants, lying against the wall. I momentarily stopped in my tracks as I stared in shock at the scene that lay in front of me. Dread gripping tightly at my sides. Figure spotted, 11 o'clock, I briefly announced, stepping towards the figure. Weapon still drawn and aiming down at it with the barrel flashlight, advancing forward towards the person. I noticed that the surrounding walls and floors that he is lying in are coated in a sticky, crimson red liquid, and the sickly smell of blood growing more and more concentrated. The lingering and oppressive feeling of dread growing more and more densely in the pit of my stomach the closer I stepped. The sounds of my boots softly clanking against the floor. The rest of the team stuck behind. Guns trained on the body. Sir, are you alright? I kneeled down and gripped his shoulders as I gently shook him. The rifle clutched in my other hand. No response. As I slowly tried to lift up his face... I held one gloved hand around his chin for better support as I repeated my question. Sir, do you... Holy fucking shit. I recoiled backwards in disgust and terror, letting go from his chin as he limply slumped back forward, hordes of tiny wriggling maggots and brownish-red liquid dribbling out from his mouth and onto his lap as they wriggled about vigorously in protest to the beam of light that shone upon them. What the actual fuck? What happened to him? Corporal Staples said in disgust through the radio, his expression turning sour, eyes glued upon the dead body lying in the corridor. Sergeant Vokers exchanged glances with Specialist Maxon as he inspected the dead body, leaning in for a better look. Poor guy seems to have already died a long time ago, most likely one of the workers on board the rig. He son. Bending over and picked up a small identification card that slung loosely around the worker's neck, examining it. Let's get moving. We've got business to attend to. After a couple of minutes of making our way to the end of the dimly lit corridor, we came across another huge metal door, this time with an accompanying faded label, which read, Cafeteria. I tried the greasy handle as the huge door remained wedged and locked tight. Suddenly, a shrill... Feminine, ear-piercing scream and animalistic howls can be heard coming from the other side of the door. As soon as I try to jiggle the handle for the second time, I flinch by instinct as the whole team jolted. Weapons trained on the door. But as soon as the chilling screams and howls resonated throughout the corridor, it had stopped as quickly as it had started. Hello? Miss? Please respond. We are here to help you. I shouted through the metal holstering my weapon as I cupped my hands against the door to amplify my voice. My pleas for a verbal response came empty-handed, as the muffled sounds of shuffling feet and slow metal scraping against the floor could be heard from the other side. Shit, we've got to help her. She might be injured, Corporal Jackson said beside me, stepping forward as he lifted the barrel of his rifle and aimed in the direction of the metal handle. Breach. Four quick and loud gunshots rang out from the muzzle of his barrel. As it illuminated the cramped corridor surroundings around us in a dazzling bright yellow flash, as sparks fly from the handle itself, the heavy metal door swung wide open after two consecutive kicks, and we quickly fled into the pitch-black cafeteria through the doorway. 
breaths panting as the beams of light from our weapons shook around violently in our hurried states. As we fully composed ourselves and calmed down, the entire cafeteria became eerily quiet and silent, apart from the muffled thunder outside and our breathing through the masks. We scanned our flashlights around in the pitch black room in search for the source of the screams that came earlier. I was still breathing heavily through my mask, the steam from my breaths quickly blocking and limiting my view from the eye holes. The whole room was deathly silent for a full minute, with nobody saying a word with bated breaths. We stood in our positions and used the narrow beam of our flashlights to scan around and illuminate the surroundings. As the light fell over a scene of broken tables, twisted metal chairs, and shattered coffee mugs. Suddenly, a quick dozen flashes of motions were caught in the corner of my vision as I jerked around with my flashlight, trying to get a glimpse of whatever was in the same room as us. The beam of my flashlight shone around wildly as I shone the light from one spot to another where I had last seen the movements. Hello? Is anybody there? Specialist Maxon announced loudly into the room, but before he could finish his sentence, his entire body was abruptly caught by a darting figure lunging onto him from behind and propelling both of their bodies forward into the darkness, causing him to drop his M4 assault rifle onto the floor and killing the flashlight from the gun. Help me, I can't see, get it off me. His screams for help screeched in the pitch black distance, as suddenly, deafening sprays of gunfire erupted from my right, as another one of my fellow teammates, Corporal Jackson, opened fire blindly in the general direction of a sudden figure that had dashed past his beam of light. Contact! He quickly yelled, as Sergeant Vokers and Corporal Staples started wildly opening fire as well on several other figures that had quickly run past their lights, causing the entire cafeteria to momentarily light up in a blinding mixture of yellow and white flashes. Time seems to crawl to a halt as I blanked out in the heat of the moment, the gunfire flashes irradiating the attacking figures as I caught a glimpse of their misshapen, malformed bodies, similar to that of a burn victim, with brownish-red spittle flying out from their jaw that hung at an unnatural angle. What are we fighting? Corporal Staples yelled in panic whilst blindly shooting, as his entire body was abruptly grabbed onto and yanked forward into the darkness, his desperate screams for help muffled in the deafening background gunfire. Snap out of it! We've got to get the hell out of here. Sergeant Vokers yelled from the left as he started sprinting back towards the metal door with Corporal Jackson hot on his heels, turning around for the last time and firing back into the inhuman screeches and howls of the figures. There I stood, both feet frozen to the ground in shock and fear from the events that had unfolded right in front of my eyes as the gruff command from the sergeant snapped me out of my dazed trance. I considered helping my other two teammates for a second before silently uttering an apology and ran after Jackson and the sergeant back through the metal doorway. Howls and angry animalistic screams bounced off the corridor as the huge metal door vibrated and held under the bashes and attacks that came from the other side. I was on my knees, panting and breathless as I clutched the rifle, my hands trembling in terror. Sergeant Vokers held the door shut along with Corporal Jackson as the unrelenting bashes from the other side of the door kept up with their siege to break in. The three of us knew that what had to be done next was inevitable as the bashing and thumping of the door started to grow stronger and louder by the second. Sergeant Vokers was the first to break the silence between the three of us as he handed me his dog tag without saying a word. Lads, do me a favor. Find those geneticists and get the fuck out of this hellhole. I'll hold those fuckers off. Hurry. Corporal Jackson protested as he tried to change the sergeant's mind from his sacrifice attempt. The middle door inched forward in a desperate push to break in. As Sergeant Voker shook his head and slammed it back into place with a loud grunt. He produced two handheld fragmentation grenades from his vest as he clutched one in both hands. There's no time. Either you had wanted those two other deaths earlier to be in vain, or the whole goddamn team. Go now. That's an order. The howls in the background faded and mixed into the howling of the wind, as we passed the previous body lying against the wall in a running sprint and climbed the metal stairs. 
Reaching back onto the top side in mere minutes, slamming the metal door shut behind us, a distant rumble of explosion resonated and echoed throughout the rig as the entire platform started to gently shake seconds after the blast. Fuck. Corporal Jackson yelled furiously through the suit as he kicked the oxidized metal wall beside us, causing it to slightly dent in from the impact. Their fucking deaths could have been prevented. We might have come up with something else if it wasn't for my goddamn idea to breach in. No, no, you did the right thing in trying to save whoever that was behind the door. That was the original mission for the entire team. I tried to assure and emphasize with them, as the sudden loud clack of the onboard PA system reminded both of us that the mission wasn't over just yet. Hello? This is the rescue team. We're currently holed up and trapped in the control room. There's a couple of those... things trying to break in. Upon hearing the announcement from the system, Corporal Jackson and I glanced at each other, exchanging subtle nods before taking off jogging towards a metal doorway further down the platform, this time with a directory map nailed to its sides and faded description labels. I briefly scanned over and examined the directory with my gloved fingers, as it unconsciously trailed down and pointed to a small location in the map which has an accompanying label that reads, Control Room. Over there. Corporal Jackson exclaimed, catching my attention as he motioned his fingers to point in the direction of a woman clad in a white lab coat, waving at us from a window situated in a sizable second story tower. As we hastily made our way to the giant platform tower, the radio built into both of our suits suddenly burst to life, beeping in a quick and rhythmic manner. Whiskey 3, Whiskey 3, this is Vulture 2-2 on maximum fuel. We'll be on station for evac in ETA 10 minutes. Out. I sighed in sheer relief as Corporal Jackson grinned from the other side of his mask as we reached a smashed and warped metal door leading into the tower. I'll take the lead. Watch my six. He muttered as we ascended a spiraling grated stairwell with remnants of bloodstains and tiny pieces of decomposing flesh littering the metal, both floor and walls. The distinct sounds of banging, blood-curdling screaming and howling soon came into focus as we neared the top of the stairwell, as I tightened the grip of the handle of the rifle. As we rounded the corner in the spiraling stairwell wall, we could make out a couple of figures. Back turned towards us as they continued their relentless rampage on a metal door, with visible damage and denting on its exterior. The figures, clad in the same working orange uniforms and construction helmets, are seen aggressively and violently bashing their heads into the body of the door, as one is seen repeatedly running into it with his body at full force, crimson red blood spilling all over the place, and white tips of ribcage bones protruding from his back as he continued with the act as if nothing has happened, while screaming and howling frantically. Jesus Christ, what the fuck? Corporal Jackson whispered, as the figures abruptly stopped in their actions and spun around faster than we could react. As their dead, gazed over eyes stared right into us, dilated pupils twitching randomly. Nobody moved for a split second, and as the once human figures finally registered our presence with them, they started a mad dash towards us at full speed before we could even react to pull the trigger. In a split second, one of them was closing in on Corporal Jackson, her upper movements jerky and convulsing. I pulled the trigger without thinking in my shock-filled state, the 5.56mm rounds impacting and tearing through her decomposing shoulders and upper head as she was sent barreling through the air and tumbling past Corporal Jackson, rolling down the stairs. Corporal Jackson opened fire on the other figures as they were stopped in their tracks by the hail of bullets and tumbled to the floor, still spasming and gurgling out blood as they slowly succumbed to their fatal injuries. Panting and taking a breather, I cautiously stepped over the dead bodies laying on the floor, riddled with bloodied holes as a small pool of blood emerged from under them, as I gave the metal door several loud knocks. Open up, we're with the CDC. I called out, lowering my weapon as I motioned for Corporal Jackson over to me. Sounds of unlocking could be heard from the other side, as the door slowly inched open, leaving a tiny gap as an eye peeked out and examined me and Corporal Jackson before swinging wide open. 
revealing a dark-haired female scientist dressed in a blood-stained lab coat, her hair ruffled and disheveled. Behind her sat a rig worker, clad in the same dirty orange uniform and looking quite rather exhausted. Thank God you guys had finally arrived. We hunkered down here in the control room when the rig went into lockdown. My other partner went out and made the distress call at the comms room, but he hasn't returned since. Corporal Jackson shot me a pitiful glance, as we both knew that deep down, he was already done. You are the working geneticist scientist, right? I curiously inquired, as she confirmed the statement by nodding her head. The evac helicopter should be here anytime soon to get you guys out. We have... My words were quickly muffled out by a roar of colossal explosion resounding and bounding off the walls, as the entire control room shook violently throwing us off our feet. Mugs, keyboards, computer monitors clatter and smash to the floor around us as the lights suddenly went out. The room shakes once more as the facility fire alarms start blaring. The wailing of the shrill alarm echoes all throughout the vicinity as we laid on the debris-stricken floor, groaning and moaning in pain. Our radio screamed to life as a familiar voice blared through the speakers, vibrating from the intensity. Vulture 2-2 is at the station and in position. We have confirmation visuals of flames on the rig. Get your asses out of here before this place blows us up. The scientist groaned as the rig worker stumbled to his feet, holding onto the control panel before he lost balance and fell backwards onto the floor. What's happening? He yelped as he tried to hoist himself back up. This damn thing is sinking, probably from Sarge's grenades. Anyway, we've got to go. Now. Corporal Jackson shouted over the wall of the alarm as he climbed back onto his feet, grabbing his rifle and speaking into the radio. Shit. Vulture 2-2, this is Whiskey 3. On your feet, soldier. We are getting the hell out of here. He yelled as he gripped my right hand, hoisting me up in an instant. As he dashed through the door, I grabbed my rifle and helped the scientist up to her feet as the construction worker stood up and followed suit after us through the doorway. Upon exiting the tower, we were greeted with the sight and smell of what I could only describe as total anarchy. Metal catwalk bridges overhead us slung dangerously to their sides, as huge fiery flames licked every corner as far as I could see through the clouds of smoke. Another smaller explosion resonated beside us from a distance, sending parts and fragments of the catwalk hurtling down into us from above, as we covered and shielded our heads with our arms and hands. The lingering scent of copper and melted wires penetrated our gas masks and into our noses as we ran through the thick black smoke, following Corporal Jackson as he led us to a splitting intersection in the catwalk. A distinct and muffled roar of a helicopter could be heard from the sounds of chaos. This way. Go, go, keep moving. He called out whilst dodging the fires. As the massive derrick crane of the oil rig groaned loudly under stress, tilting inwards and coming crashing down into the control tower that we had been in earlier. Had we not left it earlier, we might have been squashed like bugs. The impact of its crash came with the result of the platform tilting even dangerously to one side, as we were once again thrown off our feet, this time thankfully holding onto the catwalk handrail. How far is it to the helicopter? The worker shouted in frustration as he ran in front of me mouth and nose covered with his arm to prevent inhalation. We're almost there. Move, move! Corporal Jackson shouted angrily as the whirring of the helicopter rotor blades came into focus. The smoke parted as I could see the military helicopter in all of its magnificent glory, hovering just over by the edge of the platform. Doors slung wide open as the pilot directed the bird closer to the edge, its sides scraping against the paint of the catwalk. Get to the chopper. The radio screamed as we ran towards the helicopter, with Corporal Jackson being the first on board, followed by the geneticist and the worker. I was about to board the helicopter when I was suddenly thrown backwards with the catwalk breaking apart and bending into two, as the massive rig tilted into an angle, which I was now meters away from the helicopter, as the pilot desperately tried to hold it together and stabilize. Come on, jump for it! Corporal Jackson shouted over the terrified screams of the scientist as the helicopter hovered unsteadily, the distance between me and the helicopter increasing by the second. I took a deep breath as I readied myself and sprinted to the edge of the catwalk before leaping with all of my might. 
I fell flat on my chest onto the helicopter floor, my gun clattering to the side as I began slipping on the wet surface of the metal and slid backwards to the edge of the helicopter, my whole body dangling from the edge. But right before I was about to fall off, a firm gloved hand gripped my arms tightly as Corporal Jackson pulled me back on board. Gotcha. He said as he hoisted me back up over the edge of the helicopter door, the sounds of the explosion still audible from behind me. We're all on board. Go. Copy that. Venture to base. The asset has been secured. Returning back to base. Out. The co-pilot announced our departure as the helicopter flew away from the rig, leaving behind the stricken oil rig as it commenced its final explosion in the last few seconds, sending out a blinding, bright light and a massive mushroom-shaped cloud of detritus and rubble as it broke away, slowly sinking into the stormy ocean. It has been 19 years since the dismissal of the offshore disaster as a freak accident. The government covering up the whole story is just a malfunctioning drilling system going awry on board. I left the CDC and my whole life back there behind for good. Given the NDA slip that has kept my mouth shut and prohibited me from even hinting at the existence of this story. My contract has ended already four days ago. And I had been debating whether to reveal the story or not from there ever since. Some things in the world are just not meant to be discovered. And we should just remain blissfully unaware of the hidden dangers that lurk in our very planet. I just hope in my heart that the poor souls on board the rig during the fateful night rest in peace under the sea. Alongside with Sergeant Vokers, Specialist Maxon, and Corporal Staples. That is all that I have for you. And whatever that you do, please, please, don't go searching for Watchtower 1. I've been having dreams about that summer. Persistent dreams. I can't fall asleep without seeing my dad's face. It's why I started seeing a therapist in the first place. Because of those dreams. Those fucking dreams. They always start when I first saw the theme park. Where in his office. I must have been sad because he claps me on the back and says, There's no reason to cry. No reason at all. His voice scratches at my ears. That I remember. There's little I remember of my father. Lee says that has something to do with trauma, but I don't think so. He was quiet when I was young and absent when I was older. That did more to cover him up than anything he did. But he did a lot of things. My dad owned the theme park. He built it. He bought some old farmer's property and built a roller coaster on it. I don't know whether it was the divorce that caused it or it caused the divorce. It's not like I can ask. He wasn't even planning on even selling tickets to the place at first. My dad was never particularly stable. My mom got full custody for the first few years after the divorce, and he moved halfway across the country as soon as the papers were filed. That's where he built it. They negotiated terms when I was about 11. I would stay with him during the summers, but I stayed at my old school. That always made sense to me. Summer was peak season. He built the roller coaster first. I remember that. He hired a bunch of contractors, painted it green, and then called it Nessie. That thing broke down three times a week, I swear to God. I can't believe they even let us keep it running. That thing was a death trap. Then came the carnival games. Those types of things with water guns and two small hoops. He hired a couple townies to do that. To man the stands, too. It's been a while. A long while. I'm sorry if I don't get everything right. It all blew up from there. We had more attractions when I was 17. There were bumper cars themed like a circus, with elephants and clowns and chipped paint. Those were always popular. His favorite was the Tunnel of Love. I don't think we ever got more than six people to ride on that a day. I guess I should say why I said we. My dad, even though he was very well off, was a cheap fuck. Or maybe he was trying to get closer to me. I don't know. I don't know a lot about my dad looking back. Whatever it was, 
He made me work there throughout the summer. He never left the park, I swear. He would just hand me the keys to his place and then say he'd get back when he could. Always came home at one in the morning and left at five. He always went back to the park, setting everything up, doing paperwork. I was 17 when it happened. I had already decided by then, by the time I left that place and turned 18, I would never look back. I hated that fucking theme park. I hated it so much. It was all he could talk about too. He always said the place had a history, even though he built it 10 years before. That summer, I was mainly running the bumper cars and the coaster, as my dad squirreled himself in an office at the edge of the property. I know everyone who worked there that summer. There weren't ever more than 20 in the best years, but that year we had 13. I was the only one from out of town. Everyone else was from the surrounding area. Townies, my dad called them, as if he hadn't been a history professor 11 years earlier. There were about five of us that always hung out and fucked around. There was Chuck, who went to the college nearby and needed extra cash. There was Landon, a year older than me, who was always the odd man out, with his black dyed hair and metal t-shirts, and who we knew nothing about. We always joked with increasingly unconvincing tales about his family life. There was Sarah, who worked there since I did, but legally, minors were almost certainly not allowed to be doing the stuff I was doing around the park. So she was 22, at least. Then there was Lucy. This was her first year at the park, and I was crushing on her hard. I could barely get a sentence finished around her. It was almost sad, really, how much I fell for this girl within the first week. Chuck and Sarah teased me mercilessly. I can't remember her voice. It's crazy what you forget. It's like a silent movie when I think about her. But I know she had a pretty voice. God, I don't know what she's doing now. I hope she's alright. I know we never talked after that summer. How could we, really? How could anyone? I'm getting ahead of myself again. Every time I try to tell this story, I just jump to the end. What else am I supposed to jump to? I shouldn't. I know. Lee says that doesn't help with the sessions. It just makes me relive the trauma without contextualizing it. It just sounds like a bunch of bullshit to me. I remember that summer a lot when I actually try to think about it. I can remember the way the paint peeled off of the sign. I can remember the way that one bumper car, Red 3, kept breaking down because a couple of kids always managed to slam it against the wall at full force. I can remember the day the first kid disappeared. It was bright and sunny. The place was overrun with locals. I was leaning against the control panel for the coaster. As some guy barfed up his cotton candy a couple feet left of me. She came up to me crying. God, she was crying. She wasn't worried or angry or scared. She was already distraught. Did she know? Somehow? Did she figure it out? She ran up to me and screamed about some lost kid. I called in on my walkie-talkie. Chuck made some joke about it, which she heard and started crying louder about. Not here, he says. Check with Andrew, who's manning the customer relations desk, which is our bullshit name for a help kiosk. Not here, he says. Check with Sarah on the bumper cars. See if they have any kids running around there. Not here, she says. I check around concessions. Not there. I check around walkie-talkies for another five minutes before we do a search. Takes an hour before we call the cops. My dad shut down the park early that day. To help the investigation, he said. I can remember how he said it, and I can smell the whiskey on his breath. The police searched for three hours, in the park and the woods around, as this mother's wailing the whole time. I can remember how that sounds. It's stuck in my head. I don't think I'll ever forget it. They called off the search at midnight, I heard. They say they'll fully search the woods in the morning. My dad came home on time that night. He slept soundly. The police do it again in the morning, with less effort, but they don't find him. Nobody ever saw that kid again. It's a sad thing, sure, but that's happened before. Sometimes people disappear. It's sad, but you keep on going. The next three weeks pass in a flash. 
I remember the energy of the place afterward. All of us were shaken up by it, but Lucy was definitely the worst off of all of us. She had never really done that sort of stuff before, and all this missing kid stuff messed with her bad. I remember Chuck making a joke about it, and then she left in a huff. It must have been 30 out. We were closing up for the night. It was the first time we really talked. We had made jokes or whatever, but that's when we actually started to trust each other. We started dating a week later. I don't remember how it started, but I knew I was happy. For a brief moment, I had a normal summer. The second kid disappeared not long after that. It was a dad this time. A single father, worried out of his mind. Thomas Earhart. I remember seeing the kid getting cotton candy and then running around. I saw a lot of kids around there, but I remember him. Red hair, glasses, teeth missing from his mouth. I don't know why I remember that kid. Memory is a strange thing and sometimes it picks up only the least important stuff. That time, it caught him. I was watching him. I know that. Something about him struck me. I guess it's a sort of intuition. He vanished into the crowd. Thomas Earhart. I remember his name even now. I remember the picture the cops showed me. That same kid smiling, happy, with a family. There were two sisters, two parents. They were so happy. God, they were so fucking happy. He was never seen again. He vanished into that crowd, screaming, laughing, and then we never saw him again. It was the same routine. We searched for an hour and then the police were called and then nothing. They took our statements and then found nothing. They always say I had the problem of not seeing it sooner, but the cops had the same information I did. They knew what I knew. They did nothing. I'm getting out of order. I jumped to the end, but I know I don't want to go there. Not yet. After Thomas disappeared, I was reassigned. I had been working on bumper cars for the past two weeks, but I got reassigned. My dad put Chuck on the bumper cars because he caught me smoking outside the back of the park. He always hated me smoking, called it morally abhorrent that it would tear up my lungs. They were his cigarettes. He reassigned me to the tunnel of love because he knew I hated it. I was overjoyed. Lucy was working just next door. Every second I wasn't watching the tunnel, I would let the controls go on autopilot and then flirt with her. Of course, when it didn't break down. That thing broke down every fucking day. Even when it couldn't have had more than a dozen people going on it a day. I guess I should explain the ride just a little bit. It was a dark ride. A slow meandering trot through the world of love. Whatever kishy bullshit that is. There was the disgusting river of water below the boats as the boat moved from room to room, so you could admire the scenery. It was never my thing. I don't think it was anyone's thing. It just was. My dad had to have put a lot of money into it. There were the dioramas, the little paintings on the walls, and a second track to put the boats on for maintenance. That second track was really just a tunnel into a storage area. A couple of dilapidated props, and some shit he had bought from a garage sale. And then there were the animatronics. I hated those animatronics. Big cartoon animals, pink and with hearts everywhere. There were teddy bears and chickens and all these animals with eyes that were too fucking big. They gave kids nightmares whenever they went on it. And couples, who were the only consistent group to go on it, never came back after they saw those things. I told my dad to take them out so many times, just let it be a dark ride, but he couldn't let that happen. My dad was a mess at home and in his office, but he obsessed over the tunnel. He couldn't do anything but think about that thing. That's why it reeked of cleaning supplies. He was cleaning it every single day, whenever it was closed, even as people dipped from one room to ride to another. This was his small world, and he wasn't going to let me ruin that. It was something compulsive. We knew that. He had been like that around certain rooms of the house before the divorce. I worked on that ride for the rest of the summer. It was supposed to be completely normal, even after those kids disappeared. We'd had something bad like that before, but never together. 
The police kept looking, but an officer on the premises wasn't a common sight anymore. They told us that they believed it was just a random occurrence, that these two got lost at the same time. Told us to keep a lookout. That was supposed to be it. I began thinking of getting out of there again. I told myself I'd work another year, maybe move out here, even though I hated the place, because Lucy and I were starting to seem somewhat serious. Even though it had only been a month and a half, we were kids. Everything seemed like it would last forever. The third kid disappeared at the end of June. A girl. Her name was Charlotte. I remember all of their names. The police swarmed the place then, and we had to shut down the place. My dad hated that. He was a cheap fuck, and losing a whole day, even to this, seemed like the loss of the century. That was the first time I saw Detective Green. I'll call him that because his name was kind of like that. Big guy, big, bald guy, probably around 300 pounds, six foot three. My dad was dwarfed by him. Detective Green told us that there was an active investigation. Landon, the weirdo, had a cousin on the force. He was the one who told me they thought it was somebody who did it. Three kids disappearing within two months wasn't a coincidence anymore. That made my stomach sink. Even though I hated the place, I still felt a little for my dad. He put his whole life in this place and if they shut it down, a week with the low overheads could kill the place. I know that probably wasn't what I should have first thought of. Those were kids. They vanished. Disappeared. I still think of Thomas first. Red hair, glasses, disappearing into the crowd. He seemed invincible, running around. And I couldn't imagine someone wanting to hurt that kid. I couldn't comprehend it. That any of these people, wandering throughout the park, could have done it. Hundreds of strangers. Hundreds of suspects. The whole thing scared me. Even though I wouldn't have admitted it. We were all pretty messed up about it. Lucy, especially. Everyone except Landon. Landon had always been weird. Loved true crime, horror movies, anything scary. He was a year or two older than me. He went to the university nearby, I think. We barely talked to him, I'll be honest. Because Landon always creeped us out. He was a friend, I guess, but I knew we talked shit about him a lot. We were kids. I feel awful about how we treated him. We knew better. At least, we should have. Landon was never weirded out by all these disappearances, even as much as we were. I'll never forget what he told me when talking about it one day. It was bound to happen sometime. I never liked talking to Landon. Police swarmed the place after they shut it down. We still work there some days, but they shut it down to any public presence. They didn't want to contaminate the evidence, or whatever, but they had no proof that the kids were anywhere on the property. The woods outside the park were just short of being a state park. The rangers were looking for those kids day and night. And having an officer in the park wouldn't have done anything. I wonder if Detective Green did that for a reason. I have no real clue what went on in that guy's head. Not even now. All I know is that he weirded me out. A lot of things weirded me out. Maybe it was just the circumstances, but Green would always look at me like I was a monster. We worked on the park. Just checking the rides. Making sure that everything was functional. That was the only concession my dad could wring out of the cops. If the park's rides broke down while closed, and we didn't get to them until reopening, we'd be fucked. That I was alright with. I needed that check. Moving out of my mom's house was never going to be cheap. It's funny. I was focused on the future. Those days, and now I can't stop thinking about the past. They promised they'd reopen the park after two weeks if they didn't find anything. They checked that place from head to toe. The roller coaster, the bumper cars, the back shed, the offices, even taking a glance around the tunnel of love. But they didn't find a thing. Not a shred. The police department shifted towards combing through the forest, but everyone in town knew they had fucked up. If they had focused on the forest in the first place, then those kids wouldn't have had more time to fall into the caverns or vanish into the woods. Three kids disappearing, around the same time, in a theme park. 
is a horrific coincidence, we said. We were trying to rationalize it because we couldn't believe that someone could have taken those kids. I remember all five of us hanging out, smoking outside of a convenience store, way past midnight. It was the hottest August night I can remember. My dad would have either been asleep or at work by then. Either way, he wouldn't have noticed I was gone. We were dumb kids. I remember that. We thought the world was going to be ours and that seemed so realistic. I thought I was going to make something of myself. That summer killed a lot of things in me. Lucy always made me feel like everything was going to be alright. That's why I liked her at first. She kept me at ease. We were smoking in the parking lot and talking about how the police fucked this up. Three kids. Three kids missing. I don't remember who said it, but someone got the idea we should go into the theme park, do some detective work ourselves. Maybe it was just because we were stoned out of our minds, but it seemed like a good idea. At least, to half of us. Landon thought it was stupid, ran off, and Sarah had no interest in sulking around that place any more at night than she did at day. That left Chuck, me, and Lucy. But she barely wanted to go. The place looked so much worse. In the day, it was charming and a bit rickety, but at night, all the wrong things stood out. The shadows of the coaster were silhouetted black against the dark blue sky. The only thing lit was the do not enter sign. A little hint of brightness among the night. The whole thing gave me creeps. I don't let myself show it. Chuck turned back as soon as we had come, leaving the two of us. Fuck this, he said. We should have followed him away. I fished a flashlight from my glove department and flicked it on, bathing the fence in the flickering light. I remember that too. I remember the way the light glittered off of the fence, shining in the night. We tried to push the gate open, but my dad had locked it with a chain. He didn't want anyone to get in. I navigated around the fence, searching for a hole in the place. Lucy told me to give up, but I kept urging her forward. The fucker doing this is too scared to get anyone besides kids. I was an asshole back then. It took me about 15 minutes before we found a hole in the mesh. I could barely fit through, even though I wasn't the tallest. Lucy followed in after me, clutching at my arm. She was shivering in the heat. We took to the bumper cars first. Their shadows were massive with the flashlight, drenching the walls in dark. All the magic, the bare hint of it my father had managed to accumulate, vanished in the harsh shadows and lights of the night. My teeth began to chatter when I remembered the girl, Charlotte. She had vanished around the bumper cars. We continued walking, but I stopped talking. Lucy was right about this, I realized then. I never should have gone there. We went to the darts next, then the concessions. Lucy saw a rat by the cotton candy and screamed to high heaven. We went to the roller coaster, but that had been shut down for repairs a week earlier. Everything was always breaking down. Everything. They were patchwork reconstruction, barely able to continue going. I don't think my dad spent more than a penny on that place looking back. It's like he wanted it all to end with an accident. We wandered throughout the whole park, ducking under cobwebs and searching into the corners my dad wouldn't want us to go. We looked through his office, this short, fat building that could see the rest of the park, hidden next to the log flume. The door was locked, but if you jiggled the window just right, you could get it to open. I'd done that a dozen times to steal rum from his cabinet. It was covered with papers head to toe. It looked like the place had been ripped apart. If the police really had been investigating thoroughly, maybe that was their work. Detective Green had probably read every single document in here. The place looked like a tornado had gone through. We got out of there quick. I didn't want to linger and leave a trace. My dad was methodical. My stomach twisted up as soon as we got back outside. As soon as I noticed it. Do you smell that? She had sun, and I can still see her there, standing in the night. The wind was blowing from the north end of the park. Bleach. I started walking towards the tunnel of love, not even thinking about what I was doing. 
Everything goes in slow motion as I looked back on it. It feels like it took an eternity to walk from my dad's office to the tunnel. I told myself that there was nothing to fear. Nothing had gone wrong. It didn't stop my stomach from twisting up further. I was never that good of a liar. Not even to myself. In the day, it had been maybe a bit rickety. But it looked like haunted in the middle of the night. The smell of bleach overtook me. Couldn't have been that long since it was sprayed. Minutes, even. It could have been minutes since my father put another spray of disinfectant in there, and I still think of that, all of these years later. What if he had seen me? What would he say? What would he do? We stalked inside, moving as slowly as we could. We were afraid because it hit us then. It made us realize what truly could have been happening. The place was horrifically dark, and it felt like my flashlight was barely peeking through it. I fumbled for the power switch right under the main console. It was a great, big lever and yanked it down, making the whole place a light. We were supposed to be stealthy, of course, but I didn't even think of it as I turned the switch on. We rarely pulled the full lights on in the tunnel. Usually, we'd do a lesser rig, a couple lights to instill a romantic atmosphere. The place would be lit in purples and pinks, bright Valentine's colors. It hit all the dirty parts. The holes in the wall, the dirty water. The place was drenched in that hideous light as soon as I pulled a lever. I had never seen it like this for so long. The wallpaper was old and faded, ripped apart at the edges, all of it covered in hearts and mold. Cupid looked rotten. The carts began moving through the unclean sludge of the water, filled with sick and stale water, missing its weekly cleaning turning brownish in the fluorescence. The river smelled like shit and piss. Everything else smelled like bleach. The walls, the floor, the air, everything. We had to cough to get through the stench. She asked me to head back then, to turn the lights off. She didn't want to venture any further, but I didn't let her. We have to find out, I said. But I don't think I really knew then what I could have found out. I don't think I ever had a chance. I got in one of the boats, careful not to get any of the water on me. Lucy followed, more out of duty than any want. The boats began to move, sluggishly through the muck. You could hear it creak, no cute music to hide it. I could hear Lucy start to breathe heavier as the boat moved further and further along the track, the scent growing ever stronger. I don't think my hair was even on end. I wasn't brave. I just didn't understand what was happening. I hadn't figured out what the smell under the bleach, under the shit, was. It was some mystery scent. Something I couldn't quite place. Deep and slightly fruity. I know it now. I know it like the back of my hand. Everything seemed a lot clearer, with fluorescence on full blast. The hearts and the cupids were scattered across the ceiling. I could see now that the cupids were little baby dolls he had attached cardboard wings to. We moved further. The music started up then, which I knew made both of us jump. The smell of bleach got stronger as we moved further and further. I clutched the flashlight. She was talking to me then, telling me we should turn back or something. I wasn't paying attention. All I did was stare forward as the boat moved slowly ever onwards. I wasn't thinking. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Even now, it's hard to put it all together. The images flash and swap, and all I know is that we're getting closer. As I write this, I can see us there, trapped in that fucking boat, waiting for it all to end. Because I know where it ends. I know what happens next. I've been having this nightmare for months, years maybe. I always dreamt about this moment, sitting in the boat, knowing what happens next. Sometimes Lucy's there, sometimes not. Sometimes it's my dad sitting in the seat next to me and no matter how loud I yell, he can never hear me. I always wake up before we get there. It feels like a century before we finally make it to the animatronics. I say that, but they didn't move. They were big dolls, standing still as preset music began to play. They seemed so different in the normal light than they did in the pink one. Their cartoony faces seemed closer to plastic. 
Their heads are plastic and the bodies are some sort of plush suit. I had never really looked at them closely. My dad had always said that it was too dangerous to step near them, to let the professionals have it. What if I had looked early enough? What if I had seen what he had done? They were plastic and fluff, but they reeked of the bleach and the scent beneath. I wanted to run, really. I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible because every bit of me told me that this was wrong. But instead, I stepped off the boat and onto the side of the ride, where the animatronics, the mannequins, stood so still. I wanted to vomit as I edged closer. Lucy was yelling now, telling me to get back in the boat, but I didn't listen. I moved to the mannequin. A pink bear whose eyes were a glittered blue and whose paint had been chipped off. And I pulled off the plastic head. The real one beneath it almost came off with it. The face had rotted like a pumpkin, melting and graying as the innards came pouring out. I could barely tell that it was a human face, but I could make out the barest pieces. The red hair, the glasses. I could make out Thomas. The boy I had seen on the posters and in the park who had vanished into the crowd. And then I vomited. The next few hours are a blur. I have no memory of leaving the tunnel, going through the park, or calling the police. It took them a day to arrest my dad. A month for them to try him. I went home to live with my mom after that and I never came back to that town. I never came back to that amusement park. I don't think I ever could have. All I can think about... When I look up that place or read about it or think of it, is what those families could have had. What those families could have had if my father hadn't taken it away from them. Every time I think of it, in the end, I get out of sync. I get back to the beginning of the dream, back when I was 11 years old, when my dad first took me to the park. But I wasn't sad. No, I wasn't. How could I be? With my father owning a theme park? I was so happy. Everything's stained with it now. I can't think of my dad without thinking of what he did. But I was so happy then. He took me across the park and... There's this one sentence that stuck with me then. There's no reason to cry. No reason at all. He clapped me on the back. Looked over the park. Still halfway in construction and smiled. I realize now he wasn't talking to me. He was looking dead on right out the window of his office, straight at the Tunnel of Love. This experience has haunted me for ten years. Even after all these years, I think about it. I wonder if anyone ever experienced something like this. All names in this story will be changed, if any names are mentioned. When I was 18, I had to live with my estranged mother for a while. My parents divorced when I was in 5th grade and I wasn't forced to have visitations or any of that, as she was abusive and the court awarded her no rights to me. My father was injured, out of work, and couldn't care for even himself barely, and I couldn't for the life of me find a job, so... I couldn't survive on my own. I made the hard decision to call her and ask for her help. Looking back now, I should have called another family member. Maybe then I wouldn't be haunted by this experience. My mother didn't have her own home. She basically couch surfed at her friend's places. Whenever I arrived, she informed me we'd be moving in with a friend of hers who has an extra room for us to stay in. The town they lived in, now it wasn't even a town. This village was so small. There wasn't even a grocery store. Just a gas station. You had to go to the next town over to get your groceries. As soon as we entered the limits of this place, my chest felt heavy. All the buildings that lay abandoned, out of use, were very old. As we pulled down the street, the feeling only got worse. By the time we pulled into the driveway and I stared at the house, I felt nauseous. I stared at this old house, a weird, heavy feeling on my shoulders. I did not want to go in there. Did I really have to live there? Come on, hun. 
Let's go in and you can meet everyone. Okay, I said, still dreading having to go into this place. My mother's friend greeted me with a smile. She was nice enough. After some small talk, she asked if I wanted a tour of the house. My mother answered for me, accepting the offer. The living room was quite bare. Merely a sofa, coffee table, a small TV, and a few books scattered on a bookshelf. Normal enough, right? We went to the dining room, which was completely bare. No table, nothing. We don't use this area, really. We have a table right in the kitchen. Weird. Why wouldn't you just put your table in the dining room? Why leave this room empty? The more I saw of the house, the more it was clear. This house was really old. The bathroom was placed between her and her husband's bedroom, and their son's room, which connected through two doors. So we had to go through her teenage son's room all times of the day to go to the restroom. Yeah, that's not awkward. The bedroom that my mother and I would share was very small. The weirdest part was the layout. She explained that this house is very old, and that back then, children would have their rooms upstairs sometimes. So this room was made specifically to fit small children. The steps leading up to this bedroom were so small. You had to sidestep all the way up, or be careful and hold the hand railing. Once up there, I felt as if I was being watched. I noticed a door across the room. I... what does that door lead to? I asked cautiously. Oh, we never use it. When we moved in, the door was jammed. We couldn't get it open, so we just leave it be. Are you kidding me? Did I just walk into a frickin' horror movie? I have to live here? Let's go down and see the kitchen, and then we'll help you move your things to the bedroom. Sound good? The woman said, guiding us back down the stairs. We stepped down into the kitchen and my nausea turned to straight fear. All I could hear was my own heartbeat, pounding in my ears. I felt sick. I wanted to get out of this room, immediately. I couldn't even hear what the woman was saying. I could see her mouth moving, but everything around me was deafened by my frantic heartbeat. Hey hun, you okay? She said, placing a hand on my shoulder. I snapped out of it when she touched me, able to hear again. Yeah, uh, is the tour done? Almost. All that's left is the basement, where you guys can do your laundry. She walked over to this giant door on the floor and pulled it up. Oh, hell no. Are these people serious? As soon as that door opened, I felt like I was about to piss myself. The overwhelming feeling of fear took over me. I started shaking. I involuntarily screamed, and they both looked at me in concern. Honey, what's wrong? My mother's son. Are you okay? Her friend said right after. Shut the door. Shut it. Shut it. I screamed back and towards the back door, about to run out. The woman was quiet for a moment, but then started to laugh at me. Oh my, is your daughter sensitive to the paranormal or something? She asked my mother. Well, as a child, she did mention seeing things. Which is true. When I was six, my friend's father had a three-year-old daughter who died of pneumonia. I saw her spirit until the day of the funeral. After they put her in the ground, I never saw her again, but I felt a presence any time we went to their house. When I was ten, we moved homes in for a while. I saw the spirit of an elderly man at night when everyone had gone to sleep. Those spirits never filled me with any fear. I had never felt fear like I had felt in that moment when she opened that door felt as if she hadn't opened the door to hell itself. They guided me to the living room, after closing and locking the basement door. So, this house is haunted? Which obviously you can feel. You asked about the door upstairs and you panicked when I opened the basement door. Just great. My mother moved us into a fucking haunted house. So, as we know of, there are three spirits here. Two children and a man. The children, as you guessed, lived in the bedroom upstairs. The man, uh, we aren't sure where he's from. His energy is different from the kids, so from what we can tell, the children generally stay upstairs. The man stays in the basement. A friend of mine who is sensitive to spirits, she didn't want to go even into the basement. She said the man has an angry energy. But we've honestly never noticed any energy here. Neither has our son. Our daughter did when she lived here. 
She moved out when she was 16. Oh, this just keeps getting better and better. The children are very kind, though, apparently. Playful. You have no reason to fear them. And if you are uncomfortable to go into the basement, that's no problem. Me and your mom will help you do the laundry. Don't feel bad. My daughter, who is your age, she refused to go into the basement, too. It terrified her. Is that supposed to make me feel better, lady? I was not looking forward to living in this house. But I had no choice. I chose to ask my mother for help. So I couldn't back out now. We moved our stuff in. And the first night came and passed without incident. I kept a routine of only being in the kitchen during the daytime. And only if someone else was in there with me. We brought our mother's dog. Once we had everything moved in upstairs. Even the dog hated being in the kitchen. He constantly hid upstairs. But he was a good dog. If I went to the living room, he would accompany me. That dog is the only thing that helped me survive that place, honestly. It took two months to truly experience anything. Besides feeling like I was being watched, but once I did, everything seemed to slowly keep increasing. I was having one of my daily phone calls with my father. Our conversation was normal. Me asking if he found a job yet asking how he was feeling, etc. All of a sudden, the phone went silent. In the middle of him speaking, Dad? I said, thinking the phone signal was weak and just cutting in and out. All of a sudden, there was the sound of static, before an ear-piercing scream rang out of the cell phone. I pulled the phone away, looking at it. My screen was black, and there were still screams coming out of it. Children's screams. All of a sudden, it stopped, and I heard my father's voice again. Sweetheart, are you there? Dad? What's wrong, sweetie? Why did you get quiet? Dad, did you hear it? You hear what? You suddenly got quiet. You didn't hear the screams? I whispered into the phone. Screams? Are you okay? Where are you staying at? Dad, I'll call you back. I said, tears filling in my eyes. I hung up on him before he could say anything else. I walked across the room and sat on my bed beside that locked door. I took a deep breath, gathering my courage. If you can hear me, I began. You don't have to scream at me to get my attention. I'm here. I'm listening. Just talk to me like normal. I'm not afraid of you two. I sat for a long time, waiting, but nothing happened. A month later, winter had come. Blankets of snow covered the ground outside. Late one night, my mother's dog whined and scratched at the door, begging to go out. Okay, okay. Let me get my coat on and we'll go out. I gathered everything I needed. My coat, hat, gloves, and a flashlight. The old road had no street lights, so I couldn't see well enough just by moonlight. I walked him all around the yard, waiting patiently for him to relieve himself. Suddenly, the flashlight started to flicker. I tapped it against my other hand, thinking the batteries were going out. All at once, it shut off. I panicked, trying to grab the dog and run back to the front door. When I looked at the house, I froze. I had left the living room light on. Yet, it was now off. I was in total darkness. I ran to the front door with the dog at my side. I tried to open the door, which I had left unlocked, to find it would not budge. I pounded my fist against it. Let me in. I'm outside. Let me in. There was no response. The woman and her husband should have been able to hear me. Their bedroom was right beside the living room and front door. I was crying. I was afraid. It was dark outside. I could barely see under just the glow of the moonlight. I felt like someone was watching me. As I kept pounding on the door, trying to get someone's attention, the dog started to growl. He was staring down the steps, snarling, backing up into my legs. Panicked, I looked around, trying to see what he was seeing. Was it a raccoon or some other kind of animal? What I saw was much worse. I looked down at the small window near the snowy ground, a window to the basement. I saw two glowing eyes, burning red. I started sobbing. I curled up on the steps, covering my eyes, and the dog clung to my side, growling still. Suddenly, I heard the door open. Honey, what are you doing? You'll freeze out here. My mother's friend stood there, 
looking down at me with concern. Hurry, come inside. The dog ran in first, but looked back at me, waiting for me to follow. I rushed inside and ran to the couch. Honey, why were you just sitting on the steps like that? I was sobbing loudly, and couldn't control the volume of my voice. Why didn't you let me in? I wailed. Honey, what are you talking about? I was screaming and knocking on the door. You didn't let me in. She stared at me, confused and shocked. Sweetie, I... I didn't hear you. The front door was unlocked. I stared at her, tears still rolling down my cheeks. No, it wasn't. I went outside with the dog and when I went back to the door, it was locked and all the lights were off. She looked at me silently. Sweetheart, I promise you the door was unlocked. I got up to use the restroom and I heard the TV on. I got up to turn it off as it was just static. And then I noticed that your phone was still on the table. So then I came to the door and noticed your shoes were missing. I stared at her, dumbfounded. She didn't hear me screaming and beating on the front door. How? Then I mentioned the basement. Someone's in the basement. I told her. Someone's down there. I saw their eyes. She tried comforting me, calming me down. Let's get you to bed, hun. It's cold outside. Maybe you just got scared in the dark and thought you saw something. Weeks passed without incident again. But finally I reached my breaking point after my final encounter in the house. I kept staying over at a friend's place, doing everything I could to be at that house as little as possible. But I couldn't stay away forever. One night, my mother and I came back late in the evening with some food we picked up in a drive through in the nearby town. My mother was exhausted and went to go take a shower. I was left alone in the kitchen to eat because I was not allowed to eat upstairs in our bedroom. I could already feel the heaviness in my chest rising up. My four-legged protector rushed to my side. That sweet dog ran down the stairs and came to lay on my feet. I put in headphones and blasted music, chewing as quickly as I could without choking so that I could finish and go upstairs. As I was staring down at my phone, I thought I saw something move at the corner of my eye. When I looked up, I was shocked. Straight across from the table was the kitchen sink, with a dish strainer right beside it. If you have a dish strainer, you know how they look. A plate can't just fall out of it easily. No one to this day believes me, but I know what I saw. Right in front of me, I watched a plate very slowly lift up out of the strainer. It moved slowly until it was at the side of the counter. Then it dropped down, crashing to the floor. The dog jumped and barked at it, and everyone came rushing in at the sound of the plate breaking. What happened? Their voices echoed. I pointed at the strainer, then the floor. I... I didn't do it, was all I could say. They looked between each other, looking as if they didn't believe me. It's okay, honey. You're not in trouble. No, I'm serious. I've been sitting here the whole time. I didn't do it. It lifted up and then just dropped. They exchanged more glances at each other. Okay, honey. I didn't do it. Look, I'm using a paper plate. I was interrupted by them looking behind me. Did you go down to the basement? What? I turned slowly. The basement door was wide open and the light was on. I jumped up from the table and backed away. Where I had been sitting, my back was to the basement door. I didn't care if they believed me. Now, I understood. The plates. It was the children. They were trying to get my attention. I had headphones on so I couldn't hear anything. They were telling me to get out of the kitchen. To not be alone in there. So I listened. I never was alone in the kitchen again. But it only got worse from there. Every time I walked around that house, I felt like I was being watched by angry, hate-filled eyes. Finally, I was pushed over the edge. The last night I spent in that house, I was very ill. I had come down with a terrible cold. I slept for almost two days straight, only waking up when my mother came home from work and forced me to drink some soup or water. I could barely stand on my own. It was almost 3 a.m. I know what you're thinking. Yeah, 3 a.m. Worst timing. I had the overwhelming urge to use the restroom, so I quietly but quickly made my way to the staircase, 
trying not to wake my mother, as I knew she had to work in the morning. Usually the dog followed me everywhere, especially to the bathroom. Not this time. This time, he refused. I kept trying to get him to follow me down. He sat at the top of the stairs, whining, almost begging me not to go down there. The urge to use the toilet was too strong, so I took off quickly on my own. I had forgotten to grab a flashlight or something to help me see in the darkness. I knew my way by now, but I still should have brought a source of light. It was pitch black in the house. I finished and quietly felt my way through the dark to find the staircase. I knew I was close. As I left a nightlight on at the top of the stairs, where the dog was still waiting, whining, he began to whine really loudly. Before I could call his name, trying to soothe him, something grabbed the back of my shirt and pulled hard. Out of pure instinct, I gripped the railing tightly. The dog yelped, his tail tucked between his legs, shaking and scratching at the top of the steps. His eyes told me he wanted to help me, but he was so scared to come down. The tears welled up in my eyes as I finally gave up on trying to be quiet. I screamed. I screamed as long as I could, as the force pulling me had not loosened its grip at all. I strained, trying to pull forward and climb up the stairs. I was crying, begging for help, and no one was waking up. I closed my eyes, gripping the railing, refusing to let go. Suddenly felt the front of my shirt being pulled as well. I looked up. No one was there. No one was pulling me forward, except someone was. You could see my shirt was being pulled. The dog continued to whine and yelp at me. Still crying, I whispered, Please help me. I felt the grip on the front of me get stronger, pulling me forward, helping me climb up the staircase. The grip on my back slowly released. Once I got to the top of the staircase, I crawled across the bedroom floor, sobbing loudly. Finally, my mother shot up in bed. What happened? What's wrong? Through the tears, I told her what happened. As lights around the house came on, everyone in the house could now suddenly hear my sobs. I asked them all why no one could hear me crying before. They were all confused, saying they hadn't heard a thing. It was as if they had been deafened, or as if I had been trapped in this bubble where no sound could escape. But I remember hearing my screams, and hearing the dog too. How can no one hear us? I told them everything, explaining as best I could. The husband went into the kitchen looking around. He came up the stairs and whispered in his wife's ear. No one's in the house, but the basement door was open. That moment, I turned to my mother. I can't stay here anymore. I'm going to go stay with a friend of mine until you find us somewhere else to stay. I refuse to stay here for one more night. The couple who owned the house were staring at me, apologetic. Honey, we're so sorry. We didn't know this would happen. I mean, our daughter had some things, but she was up here by herself. So we figured since you were up here with your mother, that... What? That whatever monster is living in the basement wouldn't come after me? Whatever is down there is evil. It's bad. It wants to hurt me. I thought the children would protect you enough. The woman said almost a whisper. You knew there's something bad here that hates young girls, obviously, and you still let me stay here, in danger? It's never bothered me, my husband or my son even. He only ever scared our daughter, so we thought maybe it was just her. We had no idea that... that I would be attacked? Sweetie, we're so sorry. I didn't say another word after that. Everyone went back to bed except me. I sat awake, holding the dog in my arms, waiting for the sun to rise. The next day, I called my friend who immediately agreed to let me move in for a while. I packed my belongings quickly and loaded them into her mother's van. Within a few months, I was back to living with my father again, in another state, far away from that house. The last time I ever heard about that house was a story about how there was a major gas leak inside that could have killed everyone. They weren't home at the time. When they unlocked the door, they smelled gas. They called 911, who sent someone out. After inspection, they found that all the gas lines in the basement had been cut. Not leaked, not loosened. Cut. Intentionally. There was no sign of a break-in, so the police couldn't do anything about it. I knew. That family knew. 
That house is not fit to be lived in. I hope that no one else with children will ever live there. It'd be better if the whole house was demolished altogether. I'm thankful that I got out there before I was seriously harmed. What would have happened to me had I gone into that basement? Doppelgangers aren't like what you see in the movies. They aren't interested in holding you captive and stealing your life. They aren't linked to you by some supernatural bond either. The only part about you that interests them is your taste. They're easy enough to spot if you know what you're looking for, but letting your guard down for even a moment can be a deadly mistake. That's something my family had to learn the hard way. It was around 6 p.m. when I first realized something was wrong. I sat on the couch, head in my hands. I would typed out a text message about a half hour earlier, but still couldn't find the strength to hit send. I picked the phone up from the coffee table, and after staring at it a moment, put it back down again. I had done this so many times I could swear there was a phone-shaped indent in the wood. Come on, Paul. I mumbled to myself. It's just like ripping off a band-aid. Again, I picked up the phone. After taking a deep breath, I finally pressed enter. The message was simple. It's over. It didn't take long for Stephanie to answer. LOL. You said that last week. I furrowed my brow. I'm serious. I'm telling Wendy everything. I saw her start typing. Stop for a long moment and then start again. She'll leave you, you know. You'll never see Henry again. This wasn't news to me. I'd spend countless sleepless nights agonizing over that thought. Even so, seeing it in her text hit me hard. She always tried to get in my head like this, but for once, I didn't take the bait. And I'll deserve it, my son. I powered the phone down before she could respond and shoved it in my pocket, out of sight. I suddenly heard the rumbling of Wendy's car coming into the driveway, which immediately made my heart rate spike. The keys began turning in the lock. Like a band-aid, I thought again. The door opened and I steadied my breath. Hey, sweetie, do you think we could talk for a... Her voice was buzzing with excitement. Hold that thought, babe. I have something special for you. I just blinked and stared at her dumbfoundedly. I, uh, great. What is it? She thrust a pink paper bag into my arms. Open it. She practically shouted. I hesitantly pushed my arm into the bag and fished out a box. Inside it was another smaller box. I gave her a look and she just smiled. Keep going. I did as I was told and discovered my present. Inside of the box was a positive pregnancy test. I instantly felt my resolve melt away. She looked at me expectantly, and I stretched my face into a wide grin. This is... I struggled for the words. Amazing. She wrapped her arms around me. I know, right? Henry will be so excited. What were you saying before? My mouth went dry. I... I don't really remember. She let go of me and headed for the hallway. Let me know if you think of it. I just stared at the floor. I'd already partially come to grips with losing Henry, but this reopened the wound. I entertained the possibility of telling her eventually, but in the back of my mind, I knew I'd never be able to go through with it. Not now. I was considering all this when Wendy said something that gave me pause. I'm getting Henry. We're going out to celebrate right now. I raised my eyebrow. He's not with you? I thought you were picking him up today. She stopped and turned around. Oh, did you forget already? You called me and said that you'd take care of it. Now, I was genuinely confused. I'm forgetful, but I've got a couple more decades at least before dementia starts setting in. When did that happen? About a half hour ago. After thinking a moment, I remembered something weird. But my phone's been missing a week, remember? The phone I'd used to talk to Stephanie was a secret burner phone. It didn't even have Wendy's number on it. She smiled and raised an eyebrow. Well, someone left me this message. She quickly produced her phone and played back the voicemail. The voice I heard was my own, clear as crystal. Hey, sweetie, text me anything you want from the store and don't worry about Henry. I'll pick him up on the way back. The message startled me. 
Was I going crazy? When Wendy saw the confusion in my eyes, her skepticism gave way to concern. Who else could it have been? I frantically threw on my jacket. I don't know, but whoever it is, they're on their way to Henry's school. I rushed out of the house and into the car. As I sped down the empty street, terrible possibilities played on an endless loop in my head. By the time I screeched into the elementary school parking lot, dismissal was already well underway. I scanned the sea of faces for any sign of Henry, but it was hopeless. I was on the cusp of a full-on breakdown when I spotted a crop of familiar orange hair a few yards away. A second later, I caught a glimpse of Henry's face and relief washed over me. However, when I called him, the sound was drowned out by the screams and chatter of the crowd. As I pushed through the sea of parents and children, I saw that Henry wasn't alone. A man was holding his hand and quickly leading him toward the road. I gave another desperate cry. Henry! This time, he turned around. Henry looked puzzled after seeing me and kept looking back and forth between the man and I. Daddy? The man yanked him violently and that seemed to snap him from his trance. Henry slipped from his grasp and dove into my arms, burying his face in my chest. I wiped moisture from my cheeks and realized I had been crying. Please don't ever do that again. Henry pointed at the man. But he looked like you. I looked up and caught a glimpse of the stranger right before he ducked into the car. Then he was gone as soon as he appeared, speeding down the street and rounding a corner. After checking every inch of Henry to make sure he wasn't hurt, I led him back to my car. Listen, buddy, my son, before you leave with someone, you need to be absolutely sure they're me, okay? Henry's face grew sullen. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. You're sure he looked exactly like me? Henry squeezed his eyes shut and nodded emphatically. I sighed. It was all so impossible. I kept expecting myself to wake up on the couch in a cold sweat. How would I explain this to Wendy? I gasped. Wendy. She was back at the house all alone. I told myself I was just being paranoid, but it didn't stop me from pressing down the accelerator. The two of us made it back to the house in record time. Henry started unbuckling his seatbelt, but I stopped him. Stay here no matter what. My son. I crept up to the door and found it covered in boot marks as if someone had been trying to kick it open. Looking down, I discovered muddy prints leading to a smashed window. Ignoring the alarm bells sounding in my head, I unlocked the door and slowly swung it open. The sunlight did little to illuminate the dimness of the living room. With what little light there was... I could make out a toppled bookcase and a few scattered papers. Not good. I eventually found Wendy lying in the kitchen, slumped over like a puppet with no strings. A bruise was blossoming under her eye, and there were several bloody cuts on her face and arms. The sight of her simultaneously broke my heart and filled me with rage. I reached out to her, but she recoiled from my touch and shrieked. Calm down, I whispered. It's just me. I'm... I was cut off by a banana hitting me in the forehead. I blinked. Wendy was throwing anything within arm's reach at me. I know exactly who you are. Just get the hell away from me. Apparently out of all the fruits to throw, she grabbed a nearby kitchen knife. My eyes widened and I put my hands up defensively. No, just listen. Whoever attacked you wasn't me. Henry almost went off with a stranger today. He said the guy looked exactly like me. She lowered the knife, but didn't drop it. Where is Henry now? In the car. We need to get him out of here quickly. She eyed me hesitantly. I racked my brain for a way to prove it. When he attacked you, was he wearing this? I asked, indicating my outfit. She looked me up and down before shaking her head slowly. I guess not. And you must have fought back. Her motion at the blood under her fingernails. I don't have a single scratch on me. Listen, I know how insane it sounds, but I think some guy has been running around pretending to be me. Remember how my phone got stolen? He was the one who took it. He was the one who left you the voicemail. And he was the one who did this to you. I slowly held out my hand for her. You have to trust me. After a moment, she finally put the knife down and let me help her to her feet. Henry's scream suddenly pierced through the quiet of the kitchen, 
Wendy and I looked at each other before rushing into the living room. Henry stood in the middle of the room, pale as a ghost and staring at the door to the basement. Wendy's voice was frantic. What happened? Henry pointed a shaky finger at the door. Daddy's face was... backwards. What do you mean, sweetie? I took a hesitant step toward the basement door. It means there's something down there. Henry grabbed my sleeve. Don't go, Daddy. He's bad. I chuckled quietly. I know he is, buddy. Stay close to Mommy, okay? I creaked open the door and took a step inside the inky darkness. As I descended, my mind raced with possibilities of who might be waiting for me down there. Backwards face? The hell did that mean? By the time my feet landed on the cold, cement floor, I was shaking almost uncontrollably. The room was veiled in a wall of darkness, but I could just barely make out a figure at the other end of the room, perfectly still. As my fingers probed the wall for the light switch, my eyes stayed glued to the thing in the corner. As I slowly adjusted to the darkness, I realized it was sitting. Or was it crouched? My hand finally found the switch, and I flicked it up frantically. The room was filled with light, and my eyes met the figure that had been watching me. At first, I didn't know what to make of the bloody pile of skin and hair that sat in front of me. Although it was ragged and mangled, I could make out arms and legs, like an empty Halloween costume from hell. The face held dark chasms where the eyes and mouth should have been. I edged a few inches closer and confirmed what I'd suspected. It was a face. It was. My face. Mingled with the blood was grayish blue fluid that formed a trail along the floor. I followed it until eventually it stopped at an open laundry chute. After a moment of thought, I realized something that made my heart drop. The chute led straight to the living room. The living room my family was standing in. Spinning on my heel, I began bolting up the stairs. Dread seized my body. While I was in the basement playing hero, my family might have been up there getting torn to shreds by that thing. Throwing open the door, I was met with an empty living room. I peered through a window, hoping to see them waiting for me outside, but they weren't there. Realizing they must be somewhere in the house, I began making my way into the dark halls. As I passed by fallen family portraits and broken vases, I couldn't help but fear the worst. I tried opening the door to Wendy's bedroom, but it had been locked. Open up, it's me, I whispered. After a moment, the door creaked open and Wendy quickly grabbed me inside. Thank God you're here, she hissed. It wasn't until I entered that I saw the condition Wendy and Henry were in. To my shock, they were both covered in a network of crisscrossing scratch marks. Wendy was clinging to a fire poker, something she'd no doubt picked up while trying to fight off whatever was in the house. I quickly locked the door behind me. What happened to you both? She blinked back tears. Something attacked us. It wasn't a person, but it wasn't an animal either. I know it's dark, but I swear whatever it was didn't have any... Any what? Skin. She put her head in her hands. Does that sound crazy? I shook my head and told her about what I'd found in the basement. After I was done, she said something that caught me off guard. What do you think it looks like now? I shot her a puzzled look and she continued. Well, it made itself look like you. What if it looks like someone else now? I thought for a moment. I guess that's true. But wouldn't it be long gone by now, looking for another host? She held Henry a little tighter. I guess. I stood up. Well, come on, let's get the hell out of here. She didn't move. Why do you think it didn't attack you? There was a long, ugly pause. It was already gone by the time I got there. Now can we please get out? I'm not going out there with... With me? With that creature? I took a step toward her and she raised her hands defensively. One of them still holding the fire poker. Please don't get any closer. I sighed. Windy, I get it. You're scared. I am too, but you have to trust me. She seemed like she was easing up until Henry threw me a curveball. Look, he shouted, pointing at my pocket. Daddy found his phone. 
After some brief confusion, I realized he was talking about the burner phone. I pulled it out and they didn't seem to tell the difference. It took Wendy only a second to realize the implications. She raised a shaky finger at it, nudging Henry behind her. How do you get that? I tried to sound innocent. What do you mean? She took another step back. It was stolen, remember? It's what that thing used to send me the fake voicemail. How do you even have it? No, this isn't the same phone, it's just a... I stopped myself. If I told her it was a burner phone, she'd know about the affair. She raised the fire poker slightly. Just a what? I edged toward her. Listen, Wendy, I'll tell you. Just give me the fire poker. She swung it at me. More as a warning. Get back. Answer the question. Just what? We were about five feet apart, her back nearly against the wall. I desperately tried to make my voice as soothing as possible. I promise I'll answer all of your questions as soon as you give me that thing. She swung again, a little harder this time. I wanted so desperately to just tell her and end this, but I couldn't do it. I wasn't ready to lose her. I wasn't ready to lose my family. And I wouldn't have to if I could just get that damn fire poker. I made a grab for it, but it whizzed through the air in an instant, slicing through my hand. I cried out and inspected the wound. Growling with anger, I made a lunge for her. She shrieked and blindly thrust the fire poker forward. I twisted my body to avoid it and tackled her to the ground. I had almost pinned her arms down when my breathing became ragged. Before I knew it, I toppled over. After some confusion, I looked at my chest and realized what had happened. The fire poker had hit its mark after all. Through slightly blurred vision, I watched Wendy push herself onto wobbly legs and scoop Henry into her arms. I breathed in shakily and wheezed. Burner. She gave me a bewildered look. What are you talking about? It's not my phone. It's a burner. After a brief coughing fit, I continued. I had an affair. I couldn't tell you. Oh my god. She screamed at me, her eyes welling with tears. You idiot. Why would you wait until now to tell me? I just stared at the window. Strange colors were dancing in front of my eyes. If the creature isn't disguised as you, then where is it? I barely considered her words at first, just letting them wash over me. Then I realized something that made my eyes bulge. I tried to tell her, but I broke into a coughing fit. As Wendy tried desperately to decipher what I was saying, Henry slowly opened his mouth, revealing row upon row of tiny, needle-like teeth. My mouth was covered by my older brother's hand, shallow, panicked breaths escaping between the sweat between the cracks of his fingers. Both of us whimpering underneath our house in the crawl space, our sweatpants and fanshaw t-shirts covered in spider webs, dirt, and blood. I'm crying underneath his hand. I know I'm crying inside the cusp of his grip as he holds me close. The sound of his footsteps grow louder above us. He's inside. He's right above us. I think to myself, squeezing hold of my brother's arm with my bloodiest hands. I look to him. In the darkness, all I can see is the green in his eye when the moonlight skims past between dark clouds, creeping through the cracks of the grating and reflecting off his iris. My heart sank into my stomach when the sounds of tapping happened directly above us. We could hear his soft snicker, like some sort of personal, deranged victory. I wake up, clammy hands and a heartbeat racing as if to escape a now fading memory as I sit upright in this bed. I feel cold, alone. I'm still there. I am still stuck in that moment. When the officers found the scene of the crime, they asked me how it all happened. In truth, I barely remember them arriving. Between the shock and the blood loss, the memory comes faded. The words said, inaudible.
It was nearly seven months ago I had that encounter with a serial killer, which has since put me in protective custody and moved me far away from my home of London, Ontario. Each day I wake up at nearly five in the afternoon, since now I won't sleep till my eyes cave from exhaustion around eight in the morning. What the documentaries rarely tell you, what survivors seem to never say, is that when you live through horror, the hell of the encounter with a serial killer, they never tell you how regardless of whether you live or die, you still become theirs. They still own your thoughts, even just for a fleeting moment, or throughout the night such as myself. The perversion on some is the belief of collection their victims, to own them, control them, to have them, a psychophant to their own murderous, self-believed desire and impulse. This is my story of what happened on July 15th, 2015. It was no secret that a serial killer called the Dollhouse Murderer had been active in the news. He traveled between London and Strathroy, murdering random victims. Never in age, gender, place of employment, hair color that he sought after in his trail of slayings. The only factor was the area, Middlesex County to Stathroy. But that is far from an easy net to cover. His only pattern, his gruesome pattern that he would leave behind was a dollhouse. He would take a body part or hair, fingernails, eyelashes, some gruesome piece of a person he would collect. And when you open the dollhouse, You'd find a porcelain copy of whatever he took. That was his calling card. When my mom heard the news, she took us out of London and to our cottage in Hanover, a slowly growing town with a beautiful landscape and a river that ran up to our little run-down cottage house. That was our true home. It was not a rich person cottage with lighting, electricity, and fresh paint. It was a simple wood house, cedar wood finish that was slowly wearing off. Still, it was our home. Our escape. Our father was still in London. He unfortunately did not receive his vacation time from his job at the Honda plant. So mom, my brother Andy, and I, Sarah, made our way to the cottage. The day was beautiful. A hot, sunny day. Mom was out for a stroll, soaking her feet in the river basking in the sun while Andy and I were already at war with each other on who got the unicorn floaty. I did, by the way. Andy was just starting his apprenticeship in plumbing. I was just entering my first year of high school. As a gift for me, Andy bought me some of his college's sweatpants and shirts, which were roughly three sizes too big. But they made perfect pajamas. Mom just loved that her two babies were wearing matching clothes. She constantly teased us about it. We started a fire when the cold air began to come through and the sun began to fade. Mom fired up the barbecue and made us some amazing ribs and a honey barbecue sauce, along with fried taters and an absurd and frankly unnecessary amount of onions. I love her so much. We sat at the fire, naturally making fun of Dad. The smell of the wood burning... Mom and Andy drinking Moosehead, one tall boy after another. The crackling and hissing the firewood bellow when we threw pine needles into the flame because Mom wanted nature's Febreze. When the moon began to settle in and the sky beamed with stars, we watched the fireflies flicker and do their illuminated dance in the starry night. I love this place so much. The coy wolves howling in the distance and the wind rustling between the trees in the twilight of this natural harmony. We stayed by the fire for another hour before we heard the sound of a yelp from the distance. The coy wolves were done singing. Now the harmony had stopped, and what was likely a fight over their dinner had started. I quickly dozed off on the couch while my mom and Andy took to their own rooms, after a heated game of exploding kittens. I remember sleeping so peacefully until I heard what would change me for the rest of my life. No, 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 no. My mom shrieked from the door window, locking it quickly. Mom? Andy asked, scratching his tiresome eyes. What's wrong? Mom was shaking so bad. I'd never seen her scared before. 
Now I was nearly crying. I could see tears forming in hers. I could see her chest moving in and out. She was trying to control her breathing. I looked up from the couch and I could barely make out the fireplace. A few embers still clinging to life. The wind would catch the embers. The flame would give off a bright enough glow for a fleeting moment that I could see it. An open dollhouse sat outside. A knock came from the sliding door behind us. His pale face, clear blue eyes that were wide open, pupils wide and dilated. He had this unwelcoming, horrid smile. He was wearing a black hoodie and a camo toque, along with faded, dirt-covered blue jeans with blood. His face pressed against the window, his smile gazing over us in a putrid, perverse manner. He jammed his finger on the glass, pointing at my brother, then slid his dirty, bloody finger across the glass, causing it to screech till the tip of his finger was pointed at me. I'm going to collect you. I'm going to collect you. I'm going to collect you. He screamed so loud the glass shook. We all jumped back terrified. He kept muttering that as he walked around the cottage home. First it would be silent, then loud as he would bang his head against the window. Each time he would walk around the house he became more and more aggressive in his tone. My mom would follow him to each window, never getting too close but her eyes always watching him. Andy and I sat on the couch, shaking out of fear until my mom spoke up. He went back into the bushes. She whispered. She ran to the sliding door, making sure it was locked. She covered the window with a quilt and then grabbed both of us and pulled us into her bedroom. Kids, I love you, but this is real. This is happening. We have to stay together and stay alive. Do you understand me? You do whatever I say. Do you understand me? Her voice was shaky. Her hands quivered as she held us. We both nodded our heads, softly crying into her arms. Please protect us. Please, God. I don't want to die. I'm so scared. I said to her, No, baby, you're not going to die. I promise. You're okay. But you need to breathe and be strong. We won't be as fucking statistic, okay? She asked me. I shook my head and tried to control myself. Kids, lean in close. I need to tell you something. Andy and I huddled around our mom. If he comes in, I need the both of you to get to the crawl space. Your father and I made a trapdoor in the closet in case we ever got locked out and needed a way in. You stay in the crawl space and leave only when I tell you to. A loud bang came from the sliding door. We all rushed out of mom and dad's room, listening to himself smash against it. Quietly, I tiptoed to the other window. Outside, he had a fire axe buried in the dirt, along with a blood-soaked, rolled-up carpet. I put my hands to my mouth. There was no doubt in my mind it was a dead body. It had to be. Mom, there's an axe. And a body. Mom, what do we do? I remember whimpering to her. Mom, what do we do? What do we do, Mom? He screamed at the top of his lungs. Just shut the fuck up. Andy cried out at him. The sound of footsteps went around the house till a sudden smash came through the old wooden door. The hinge on the inside began to give in. I'm going to collect them, Tara, he said. He knew my mom's name. Tara, I'll let you live. You can live. Just let me collect them. Sarah, Andy, you don't want your mom to die, do you? Don't you love her? Don't you love her? You know what I will do? His hand kept smashing against the door. His voice was not so calm disgusting attempt to be soothing, convincing. You can all live, just need the rest. I just need the rest. I'm so close. I'm so close. You really want to die, Sarah? You want to never see again? Breathe? See anyone? Anything? Really, Sarah? Are you that greedy, Sarah? You want mom to die, Sarah? Andy pushed himself in front of us. You're a sick piece of shit. You will kill all of us. You're just a twisted, broken little boy. Did mom and dad not give you a hug so you have to kill? Fuck you. Andy was right in the face, screaming at the door. 
Another loud crash against the door. The wood began to split. All of us were silent. The door was old, wearing down. Hinges rusted and the wood had seen too many winters. The dollhouse murderer made his way back towards the sliding door. Andy walked over to the window I had been looking out. He turned to us. He's just staring at his fucking axe. Glass shattered. The sharp silver of the axe collided onto the right side of Andy's face when he had turned back around. He fell to the ground, writhing and screaming in agony. Mom! He screamed out, to which the killer shouted back, laughing. My mom looked horrified at her baby boy that she had carried for nine months in her body. Raised with his adorable smile, held him when he first scraped a knee and cheered for him when he graduated high school. Her boy that she scolded when he came home high or tried to sneak a girl into his room without proper introduction. Sarah could see in her mom's eyes the heartbreak that her baby boy, my brother, now laid in his own blood, rolling around in agony, his right eye gone and his face disfigured. She helped Andy into her room, dousing his wounds with alcohol and bandaging it as best she could. I'll never forget the look on her face. That look of enough. She pointed at the trapdoor to both of us. He's going to come in. When I leave, you get your butts down there. Sarah, when you see an opportunity, you take the keys and you run to the car and you get out of here as fast as you can. I love you. I love you both. The last time I would ever see my mom. She grabbed a knife from the pantry and waited near the door for him to come in. The crawl space on any normal day would be uncomfortable. Spiders, snakes, mice scurrying around. Yet in that moment with my brother, it was our last resort to feeling some form of safe. There was a crash, a scream, and then silence. An unpleasant, harrowing silence. I needed to hear mom's voice, her tapping on the crawl space door to let us know it's okay. All I could hear was him. You killed her. You killed her, Andy. You killed her, Sarah. I began to sob. Andy put his hand around my mouth. You know what happens next. The same thing I told you from the start. I cry underneath my brother's hand. Then we hear tapping from above us, then laughter. What I forgot to mention before. My brother's hand was getting colder, his head nodding off. I tried to shove him, but he slumps over. The blood on my hands... It was Andy's. The dollhouse killer was back outside. I could hear him grunt and mumble to himself as he stumbled his way up to the steps. And inside the cottage home. Our home. Another tap from above and then... Something that leaves goosebumps with me to this day. Look behind you, Sarah. He whispered through the cracks of the trap door. I will bury you here. Written in dried blood behind me. How could he have had time to do this? How long had he been waiting for? I could feel my heart pounding. Shortness of breath. My chest was heavy. I shook Andy, pleading with him to wake up. Begging, but all there was was laughter from above. The crawl space door snapped open and I left my brother behind as I began crawling to the nearest grate. I looked behind for my brother, but within seconds, the dollhouse murderer was there. Crawling after me. That grin on his face laughing as he squirmed towards me. I felt him grab my ankle. I kicked as hard as I could. He laughed and continued after me. I continued to kick and fight him until I was finally free from his grasp. I ripped open the grate. It was already loose, likely where he had snuck in. A blue beam of light came streaking across the midnight sky. Sounds of sirens and officers storming out of their cars pulling me into their vehicle. One ordered another officer to drive, followed by laughter. Then the sounds of gunshots. The dollhouse murderer was a 50-year-old chef at an Italian restaurant. He was a man of zero significance. A man who was despised by his peers at work. Verbally violent and unhinged who would often take days off and extensive holidays to commit his violent acts. The one summer home that my family and I cherished was tainted ground. The detectives were appalled when they arrived on scene to see what the dollhouse murderer was making. Each murder he took a different trophy. An arm, a leg, a hand, 
It was always a piece of the human body. He stitched it all together. All he was missing was another green eye and a left leg. He made a dress and turned a pile of victims into a putrid doll. His only reason for stalking each victim was because he was so attracted to certain parts of their bodies that he would hunt them down and kill them to begin his sick creation. Him and I never met. He found my family on social media and stalked us relentlessly. The only reason he followed us so far was to finish his doll. His human victim doll. If dark gray clouds suddenly form in the sky, go inside, draw the curtains, lock the doors, get to a cellar if you can. Whatever you do, don't look at the things moving in the clouds. I could tell you who and where I am, but it would probably mean nothing to you. Suffice to say I'm not from the USA, but from a small, unimportant country on the edges of Eastern Europe. I'm writing this in the hope that it will somehow get out onto the internet in time to warn others of what's coming. Phone lines and network connections have been disrupted in my area. Why and by whom? I don't know. Hell, maybe that's what's happening to my town is happening everywhere. Maybe you're cowering in a cellar too, hoping that the clouds won't come any lower and swallow your house in their gray embrace. Maybe you don't need to read this to know that something is very, very wrong with the sky. But if this is only happening in my area, you all need to know before it's too late. I was working when it all started. I live alone, in a small town out in the countryside. My job is translating documents and legal contracts for several large companies, which means I can work from home most of the time. It's also one of the most boring jobs you can imagine. That day was as tedious as it gets, made even worse by the fact that the weather outside was absolutely lovely. It was late summer. The sun was out. I could hear birds song from the street. And here I sat. Stuck inside, slogging through 37 pages of legal documentation that I barely even understood. Only the promise of going out in the evening and getting a few beers with my friendly neighbor couple, Patrick and Ellie, made it all bearable. When my phone pinged an incoming message alert, I thought nothing of it. Probably Patrick making sure that we were still on for that evening. I finished up the paragraph I was writing, flicked into my inbox, and opened the newest item. Attention citizen. This is an emergency announcement. Please follow these orders without exception and await further instructions. Close all windows and doors. Pull all curtains and blinds closed. If you cannot do so, go into a room without windows and shut the door. Do not leave your house. Do not look up at the sky. End of announcement. What the fuck? This was the first time in my life I had gotten an emergency announcement like this. Hell, I didn't even know that my country had an emergency announcement service. And what were those orders? Why shouldn't we look up at the sky? And so I did what any curious, bored, young person would do. I got up, went to the window, and had a look outside. Don't ask me whether I'm a dumbass or not, because it's pretty obvious now that yes, I most certainly am. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but I sure as hell wasn't ready for what I saw outside. The day had darkened. In the minute or two I had been reading the message, gray, low-hanging clouds had formed in the sky. Even as I watched, they seemed to grow, spreading further and further, reaching slowly like clawing, crawling fingers to seize the edges of the horizon. Was this some sort of freak storm? Was that why we should all close the windows and stay inside? As I watched the darkening sky, I began to feel strangely unsettled. There was something not quite right about the clouds. The way they coiled and shifted. The way they seemed much more solid and lower to the ground than usual. The way certain parts moved in unison within their depths. Almost as if. Almost as if something massive was moving inside them. I cried out and leapt away from the window. I'm not a coward, I dare say. But at that moment, I panicked. I tore the curtain across the window, horrified of getting even one more glimpse of that twisting sky. Then I ran through the house, making sure every curtain and blind was drawn, locking the doors, and finally sitting down in my living room, shivering. 
It took me a few minutes to calm down and for my breathing to settle. Eventually, I even started feeling a bit foolish. What had I been so afraid of? There was nothing outside. The clouds. It was probably just a trick of the light that had made the sky look so strange. Or just abnormal weather patterns. Nothing more to it. I jumped, then laughed at my own foolishness. As my phone rang. Picking it up, I went to pour myself some water. Hello? Hey man, this is Patrick. How you doing? Hey dude. I smiled, relaxing at the sound of my friend's voice. Yeah, pretty good here. Got a little spooked by the weather outside is all. Did you get a weird automated message just now too? About not looking at the sky and stuff? Patrick laughed at the other end of the phone. Yeah man, shit's whack, am I right? Couldn't help but smile. Patrick was the type of person who would fake his own funeral for a laugh. Nothing could keep him down. It's actually why I'm calling you. He continued. Unless you want to risk alien abduction or whatever this is. I guess we're off for beer today. Ah, shit, you're right. I said. Shame. I was looking forward to seeing you. Say hi to Ellie from me. After this is over, can we grab some food maybe? Yeah, man, sounds good. By the way, what do you think this could be? Ellie was saying some crazy conspiracy stuff. Like the government is testing new aircraft or something. Sometimes it's hard being the brains in this relationship. Distantly, from Patrick's background, I heard a faint. Shut the fuck up, asshole. We both snickered. I don't know, man. I replied. There might actually be something to that. I looked at the sky before I closed the curtains. Weird clouds everywhere all of a sudden. It looked like there was something moving inside them. Probably just a trick of the light, though. Hmm. Went Patrick mischievously on the other side of the line. Sounds crazy, man. Maybe you'll take a look, too. What's the worst that can happen, am I right? Yeah, yeah. Just be careful of the aliens, dude. I laughed at my friend's disbelieving tone. If they come to kidnap you, remember to tell them to leave your neighbors alone. I have work to do, and otherworldly abduction might mess up my timetable. I said goodbye to him and Ellie, hung up, and went for another glass of water. That's when I heard it. The gentle patter of rain on the windows. Other than that, there was no sound from outside. Even the birds had quieted down. I decided to cook some lunch. It looked like it was going to be a long, boring day of work, so I might as well eat and then get on with it. I had just started heating up some water when I heard someone shouting outside my house. It was faint, muffled by the rain and the curtain windows but quite unmistakable. I went to open the curtains and look outside. Stop short. A strange sense of foreboding and horror washed over me. If I opened the curtains, I would see the sky again. The very thought filled me with an uncertain fear. Why? What was going on outside? What was I scared of? The shouting drew me out of my reverie. I pressed my ear to the curtain window to hear better. And finally, I recognized the voice. It was Patrick, and he was shouting, screaming, as if in the most terrible pain. The hills with eyes. The space with no dimension. They're watching. They've seen me. They descend, and space is meaningless. They will arrive. The travelers from behind the clockwork. The watchers from behind the stars. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I stumbled back from the window in shock. Patrick's voice usually so carefree, was twisted into an agonized shriek. I can only imagine how loud he must have been screaming for it to carry all the way to me, through the walls of both of our houses and over the rain outside. A crash of glass outside made me jump. Patrick's voice returned, louder and clearer. He must have broken the window and crawled outside onto the lawn. The rain, the rain, the tears of the clockwork, the tears of God, descending. I've seen you, and you've seen me. I can't hide. I can't hide. Under the skin of the cosmos. Under the surface of the ocean. The eyes behind the moon. They've seen me. Something changed outside. It took me a second to recognize what it was. The rain had stopped. Everything was silent for a second. The universe drew its breath. Then the concussive bang of a gunshot made me jump. There was a hideously organic gurgle from outside, and then the thump and splash of something heavy falling to the rain. Soaked ground. Some sudden mental resolve 
The desire to know what just happened and fear for my friend seized me. I rushed to the window and lifted the corner of the curtain just slightly to see outside without a, catching a glimpse of the skies. I screamed as I saw what was lying on the grass outside. Patrick, lying limp and spread-eagled, the grip of a handgun stuck from the ruins of his mouth. He had rammed it so deep down his throat that it hadn't fallen out even after ripping through his head and splattering its contents all over the ground. I stumbled away from the window and fell to the ground in shock. What was happening? What had happened to Patrick? And then I realized. He had looked up. Reverend, carefree Patrick. I told him about what I had seen in the sky. And he had looked up. So go inside, close the windows, draw the curtains, lock the doors, and whatever you do, don't look up into the sky. There's something in the clouds. My father, for as long as I could remember, was afraid of the ocean. He wanted nothing to do with the beach, even at the mere mention of visiting the beach he would get agitated and angry. It's not like he was afraid of water, because he had no problem with going to a lake, river, or pool. In fact, he had a large freshwater pond at our house, but it was the ocean that scared him. We lived in a small town in central Pennsylvania, far from the nearest beach. Last year my father passed away. It was peaceful and painless. After his death, I decided to research his side of the family. He was an immigrant from Scotland. I know he had parents and a brother, but he never talked about them. My grandparents passed away years ago, but my uncle was still around. I did some digging and found my uncle's phone number. He was still living in Scotland, more specifically the Orkneys. I had never been to the Orkneys or Europe. I got in contact with my uncle in Scotland. He was thrilled to talk to me. He told me that he hasn't heard from my father in six years and asked how he was doing. I told him the grave news and he was very sad to hear this because he didn't know my father wasn't doing well. They told me they would have come over to the US to visit. I told him I was going to visit the Orkneys to see where my father grew up and to do some sightseeing. My uncle eagerly agreed. We made the arrangements and in two weeks I flew to Scotland. I landed at Inverness Airport in Northern Scotland and I took the ferry to the Orkneys. My uncle was waiting to pick me up. We drove to his house where my aunt and cousins were waiting for me. We had a few glasses of whiskey and reminisced about my father. I had fun talking to them and wondered why my dad rarely mentioned his side of the family as nothing about them seemed off. Late into the evening, my uncle brought out an old photo album and we went over the pictures. They dated back to at least the 70s. My dad looked so young and happy in all of them. I could see the resemblance between me and him. All the photos seemed normal. There were family photos, birthday and Christmas photos, and pictures with him and his friends. One photo in particular did catch my eye. It was of my father in his teens, on a sailboat out at sea. This made no sense to me because I knew for a fact that my father was scared of the ocean. I pointed this out to my uncle, asking him how they got him onto a boat in the middle of the ocean. My uncle seemed puzzled and asked what I meant. I explained to him my father's fear of the ocean and how he wanted nothing to do with it. My uncle laughed and said that my father loved going out on the ocean and was an avid fisher and sailor. I thought back to my childhood and asked my father if we could go to the beach. He instantly tensed up and gave me a look that conveyed worry and terror. He told me that it was too far and that it's not a good idea. I also remember asking my mom about this fear and she told me that it was the only thing she couldn't figure out about him. She told me that when they were dating, they drove to a small town after a lot of convincing. During the day, my father seemed unbothered when he was on the boardwalk. At night, my mother managed to convince him to take a moonlight walk on the beach. Everything seemed fine for a while, and then suddenly my father stared out into the horizon and then took off running inland. My mother gave pursuit and found him at the car in tears, rocking back and forth, repeating, It followed me, over and over again. 
they decided to drive back to the hotel they were staying at. My mom tried to pry my father about what he saw, but he shook his head and refused to say anything, only responding, If I talk about it, it'll find me again. When they got back to the hotel, my mom told me that my father was on edge the whole night, getting no sleep and constantly looking out the window. The next day, they cut the vacation short and went home. To this day, my mother always respected his wishes to never go to the beach. I continued to flip through the photo album and saw another picture of my father on a fishing pier shirtless. This picture struck me as odd because I couldn't see the scars he had on his left shoulder. Another thing to note, my father had three distinct scars on his shoulder. He had them for as long as I could remember. When I asked him about it, he told me he fell off his bike when he was a kid. But according to this picture, it was evident that he was lying. I asked my uncle about this and he said he didn't get those scars until he was in his early 20s, and that some animal attacked him. I explained to my uncle about my father's fear of the ocean and how he lied to me about his scars and how I found all of this so bizarre. I brought this up to my uncle, explaining my father's fear of the ocean, and asking why he would lie about the scars. My uncle thought for a moment, he then got very somber, and told me that the night he got those scars, he left for the mainland to stay with extended family later immigrating to America seemingly out of nowhere. What happened the night he got those scars? I asked. My uncle got very serious and finished off his whiskey and poured another glass. It's not a night I like to remember. He took a deep breath. Your father liked to take walks on the beach at night. He did this for years with no problems at all. He would just clear his head and forget the world. One night he went out. It was bitter cold in the middle of winter. Her grandfather insisted that he skip his walk that night. Your father just ignored him, but bundled up and promised to be back shortly. He was gone for three hours. Your grandfather was about to go look for him, but then seemingly out of nowhere, your father burst into the house screaming bloody murder. His clothes were torn to shreds, and he had those three gashes on his shoulder. Your father was in hysterics. We couldn't get him to calm down and had no idea what happened. He eventually passed out on the spot. We had a doctor come over and he told us that he must have been attacked by a stray dog and he was just shaken up. The next day your father left for the mainland only saying that he couldn't stay here anymore. We let him go thinking that he needed some time away from home and that he would calm down eventually. But we never saw him again. My uncle wiped away a tear. To this day, I don't know what happened to him that night. It can't have been a dog that attacked him. The scratches on his shoulder were from claws or something, and the damage to his coat had to have been from something that had immense strength. I had more questions, but my uncle was visibly upset, so I changed the subject. We spent the rest of the evening just small talking until the alcohol made us drowsy enough to go to bed. That week, my uncle showed me around the islands and took me to the best bars in the UK. We had some great drunken nights together and I got some great scenic pictures of the islands. I had such a great time that I promised myself that I would make this trip a yearly venture. That was not to be, though. My last night on the Orkneys is when it all became clear. My uncle and I had just gotten back from a bar where we toasted each other and my father's memory. When we got back to my uncle's house, he was pretty drunk and went to bed. I was drunk, but very much awake. I decided to go for a walk around town. I walked up the streets towards the shoreline. Even though it was winter, it had rained earlier, giving the air more of a crisp, and found a pathway into the woods. I took the trail following my ears to the sounds of the waves. When I got to the beach, I was greeted by cold, salty air and the light of a full moon on the water. I walked down the beach and saw an old abandoned fishing shack. It was pretty old, the sea breeze chipping away at it for years. A few rusty buckets filled with rainwater were on the outside. I looked at my watch and told myself I would take a brief walk and come back to the fishing shack. I let the environment of the beach absorb me. This was such a unique experience for me since, as a kid, I never had the pleasure of being close to the ocean. I sniffed the air and let the sound of the waves immerse me. I looked out into the ocean observing the moonlight on the water. Then... Seemingly out of nowhere, the atmosphere changed, 
It went from calm and soothing to bitter cold and malice filled. I looked at the water and saw something emerge from it. What I saw cannot be explained in the realm of reason. At first glance, I thought it was a man riding a horse, but after closer examination, I could tell it wasn't human. The thing was a horse-like creature that had the upper body of a man fused to its back. Its face was skeletal, covered in muscle tissue, only missing a nose replaced with a gaping hole. The whole thing was skinless. I could clearly see its muscles pulsing. It had small protrusions of bone all over its body. Its arms dangled at its sides, each hand with three very long claws. The skeletal face of the man looked human, and was followed by the horse half. The creature then pointed at me with its dangly arms and gave an inhuman shriek. This snapped me out of my stupor and I began to run in the direction of the fishing shack. I thought I had a head start, but then I heard the sound of a horse panting as well as the clump hooves behind me. It was gaining on me. I didn't know if I could outrun it. I then felt my hood being grabbed and I was lifted into the air. The thing had held me up and shook me. It brought me closer to the horse face of its body. Its breath smelled like death and decay. Out of impulse, I poked the eye of the horse and it dropped me. The horse half recoiled and bucked while the human part of the creature shrieked. I got up and began running again. I knew if it caught me, it would definitely not be kind to me this time. I found the old shack, but the creature was in a hot pursuit behind me. I hid in the shack and closed the door, hoping I could wait it out until morning. The creature circled the shack. Each thump of its hooves sent my adrenaline skyrocketing. It began to taunt me verbally, speaking perfect English. Its voice was raspy and ancient. You were wise to come back, Alexander. My blood froze. Alexander was my father's name. The creature thought I was my father. The creature kept talking as I stayed still. I do not let slights against me go unpunished. And I don't like it when my hunt gets away from me. My father must have beaten this thing back at some point. But how? I tried to think, but then was interrupted when the creature burst its way into the shack. The horse half drooled with anticipation while the human half smiled. I backed away, thinking about what this thing was going to do to me. Then a drop of rainwater landed on its shoulder, and it flinched as if it was hot. I then thought that this thing must be averse to fresh water. Seizing the opportunity, I grabbed one of the rusted buckets of rainwater and doused the creature in it. It shrieked in pain as the horse half bucked and kicked. I picked up another bucket and doused the human half in the face. It shrieked and cursed me. I picked up the last bucket and downed the creature in the horse's face. It roared in pain and anger. I used this distraction and ran around it and exited what was left of the shack. I ran to the woodland pathway and up the trail back to town with shrieks of the creature fading behind me. I ran back to my uncle's house. Once inside, I locked the door and broke down. I had no clue what just happened. I didn't sleep. All I did was think about the creature. That must have been the animal my father encountered all those years ago. The next morning... I told my uncle everything about the creature and my theory of how it was the same one that attacked my father. My uncle became pale and nodded, saying that it all made sense now. He explained to me that I have encountered the... Knuckle of the... An ancient ocean demon that has terrorized the inhabitants of the... Orkneys since the Vikings first landed. He told me in the dead of winter it is known to emerge from the water to attack and kill humans. He then told me that it is adverse to fresh water and that I was right to douse it with the rainwater. He told me that if its prey gets away, it feels spurned and will always watch the escaped prey from a distance. He never thought the knuckle of V was real, thinking it was just an old folk's tale. He told me that I needed to leave the Orkneys and never come back for my own safety. I didn't argue. He drove me to the ferry and dropped me off. As I waved goodbye... I looked up the shore and could have sworn I saw the knuckle of V watching me, with pure malice in its stare. Today I live in Arizona, far away from any body of water and still keep in contact with my uncle. My only advice is this. If you visit the beach in the dead of winter, please be careful. You never know when you could become hunted.
At first, I thought I had kept hitting the trunk button on my keys. You know, the lock, unlock, pop trunk, or start your car buttons that usually come with your set of keys. I always threw my keys on the kitchen table and thought I kept hitting the button upon impact. Seemed plausible in my opinion. I wasn't always the most careful person in the world. It started one day when I started the car to go to work. Trunk ajar appeared on my dashboard. I rolled my eyes just at the sheer thought that I had to get out of the freezing cold. Again, to close my trunk. It didn't even bother to open it. It was only slightly ajar. Barely at all. So I just pushed it shut. I thought nothing of it for the rest of the day. This started on a Monday. I had a very strict work schedule and was off every Tuesday and Wednesday. I work long hours, so I try to make the most out of my days. I like to stay at home and mainly just relax. I don't go anywhere usually unless I have to. It's safe to say that my trunk being open was long forgotten by the time Thursday had rolled around. That Thursday morning, I started the car to warm it up while I grabbed the rest of my things. I took my purse off the table, grabbed a fresh bottle of water, and snatched my keys off the kitchen table. When I entered my car, I checked my mirrors, made sure none of the dashboard lights were on, and pushed my foot against the brakes. I drove an automatic, so all I had to do was pull down the shift to drive. Wouldn't budge. Trunk ajar, flashed on the part of my dashboard which shows the temperature and the mileage. Annoyed, I stepped out to close my trunk. It was only slightly open, so I pushed it shut once more. It wasn't until I got back into my car that I remember the same thing had happened just days ago. I still chalked it up to my clumsy habit. I admit, it was the first time I thought that something weird might have been going on. It was a fleeting thought at best, though. By the time I had arrived to work, my trunk being open was long forgotten once more. Friday and Saturday morning went exactly the same, and by Saturday night I was officially weirded out. I hadn't given it much thought previously, but... Like everyone else, sometimes I overthink at night. That Saturday night, I spent hours overthinking what it could possibly be. Even with all the overthinking and uneasy feelings, I still pushed it in the back of my mind. Eventually, I just fell asleep. Sunday morning, as I was getting my things together to leave for work, I couldn't find my keys. I always kept an extra set at the bottom of the top drawer of my nightstand. I began to pull everything out in a panic and I couldn't find them. I was never late for work, and I wasn't about to start now. I gave up on the extra set and decided to keep searching for my normal ones. I found them in my hoodie pocket that I was wearing when I came home the previous day. Irritated by my lack of responsibility once again, I stormed out of my house in a rush. I was in such a hurry, I didn't even realize my trunk was closed for the first time since Monday. Sundays were my short days. I went in an hour later than I usually do, and left two hours earlier than I normally would. That day went along like any other day. I got home, made sure the car was locked, carefully set the keys on the table, and started to unwind. I turned on the TV, and fell asleep on the couch. I woke up around 9, and I was starving. I had slept through the time I usually make dinner. I wasn't about to make a whole meal at 9pm. I was tired and just wanted to eat. I decided I would go down to the fast food place down the street and grab a burger. I threw on my jacket, my shoes, and grabbed my keys off the table. Walking down the stairs to get to my front door, I was overwhelmed by a sense of dread. I stopped at my front door. I just realized I hadn't gone out at night at all since my trunk started randomly opening. I hadn't even opened my trunk. I just kept pushing it down to shut it every morning. My thoughts started to race. I suppose the darkness made everything seem more grim. I didn't think anything sinister was happening up until that moment. They say you should always listen to your gut. I'm glad I did. I walked out to my car, but this time, I checked the trunk first. It was slightly open. I turned on the flash on my phone, stood back, and whipped my trunk open. My trunk looked small from first glance, but went back really far. You had to bend down to see it fully. I pointed my phone at my trunk. It looked empty. I bent down to look inside, but was caught off guard by a slight glare. I looked over and saw a lens. I pointed my phone light at it and realized it was a video camera. 
Beside it was my extra set of keys. I pulled them out and set them on top of my car. I didn't even check the rest of the trunk. I shut it, locked my car, and went back inside with the camera and my keys. The video camera was dead, but it had an SD card. I pulled it out and put it into my laptop. My screen soon was littered with pictures. They were pictures of me. There were hundreds of photos of me. Showering, eating, watching TV, sleeping in bed. Some pictures were innocent, but most of them were inappropriate. Pictures that should have never been taken. Moments that were meant to be private. I became physically ill. Someone had been stalking me, and the dates on the pictures went back months. I called the police and showed them everything. They took the SD card and did a thorough search of my home. When they searched my car, is when it all came together. Someone had cut a hole into the back of my trunk and was living inside of the back seats. They also found he had set up little cameras around my house. He had been stalking me for months, but I never realized until he started setting up cameras. He had taken my spare set of keys when this had started, which is how he got in and out. He was meticulous and precise. I guess they even found a detailed plan. The cameras were his last move. His ultimate goal was to kidnap me one day on my way to work. He planned on cutting his way through the interior and taking me hostage. I don't like to think about what he planned to do after. It makes me sick to this day, and it doesn't take a wild imagination to know what he had planned on doing. Leaving the trunk open was an accident. He started to become sloppy when setting up the cameras. He left the trunk and would hide behind my house until I left. Then, he went inside and started setting up cameras, making sure to leave before I arrived. He ended up leaving the trunk open, probably thinking he closed it quietly. If he would have made sure it was shut, he could have gotten away with everything. They say he fled once I found the camera. He must have been close by because the trunk was open when I went outside. If I would have waited just a few days longer, I wouldn't be here today. I impounded my car and moved across the country. I changed my name and started a new life. Some people who knew me before this happened say I overreacted by going as far as to change my name. I disagree. Someone was smart enough to stalk me every day for months without my knowledge inside of my home. Someone was smart enough to survive inside of my car without raising any sort of suspicion. If someone was smart enough to do that, I have to be smarter. I have to be one step ahead. Until they find him, I will continue to live the lifestyle I have been. I will keep my new name. I will keep this new job. I will continue to overreact. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if I would have checked my trunk much earlier. Honestly though, maybe things could have been avoided if I would have just regularly locked my front door. January winters in North England can be cruel, especially when you live alone in an old house. I was sitting curled up on my couch, flicking through my book and sipping at my cooling cup of tea. As the world turned sullen and dark outside, the winds, as if kept back only by the meager warmth of the pale sun, began to prowl the streets in its absence. I could hear its fury rattling at my old window frames, and somewhere in the distance, opening and slamming the wooden door of a hidden neighbor's shed. I pulled the fleece throw closer about my neck, as if it, at any moment some persistent tendril of that outer chill may breach my home and found their way to assault me. I tried as much as I could to just focus on the worlds laid out on the page before me, desperate for them to offer a getaway into a different world. I needed it. Last year was rough, and I suffered the loss of my fiancé. I'd spent near every day since then reflecting on the void such a loss of love and routine can inject into your life and prospects. There are no words to encapsulate it, so I won't attempt to. It was only recently I could try. Alone. The activities we used to do together. I relied on the warm glow of my lamp which sat on my end table. As it was energy efficient and I wasn't doing too well financially having lost half of the income. Not in this market. Not during these times. 
The rest of the house was as dark and cold as the world outside. It was almost impossible not to feel incredibly lonely when... A sudden noise buzzed around the house. Or rather, lack of noise. The lamp went out in tandem with the silence. I knew instantly that the electricity had gone. There was no general hum of background noise that you can only notice when it suddenly frizzles into nothingness. In some houses, the older ones, bills aren't paid once per month, but rather, you have meters, in which you take your gas card and electricity key to a shop and top them up with credit. If you don't keep on top of it, you can find yourself in a situation like mine, even if you're practicing an economic lifestyle, my way of avoiding the admission that I've been forced into, parsimony by circumstance. I could feel tears storming to my eyes, a stinging of bitter frustration festering about my nose, and a hollowness clawing back and normality that the tea and book offered. It was his job to keep the meters topped up. He had a routine. He had a set time to check. I was never on top of it. I could never remember. Using the torch on my phone, I guided myself up to Mar, my room. Feeling that weight of misery when all you want is for the world to swallow you up. For life to pause for a while so you can sob your way to catharsis. But incessant necessity tears you from the pursuit of numbness into dreaded action and responsibility. I could have called my parents, or my in-laws, or even my brother. But that meant sitting in the darkness as I waited for them. Their veritable burden of duty until they came over to sort it for me. I didn't want to be a nuisance. And honestly, I didn't want to deal with the company. I did better processing my emotions alone or escaping them. I wanted to force myself to read. The house was indeed chilly. And removing the throw inflicted instant regret. But I soldiered on. Dressing myself in a jumper, coat, hat, scarf, gloves, trying to ignore the sentimental value of each one. The scarf was a gift from him, the coat I bought when I was with him. The, the tears would freeze on my cheeks as soon as I left, so I gently brushed and rapidly blinked them away. As soon as I stood foot outside, I felt odd, vulnerable. The street was empty and dark. It was nine at night, so I didn't expect them to be filled, but it was a different emptiness. A sheer lack of life. It felt like I'd been harboring within, had now reflected without. There were no kids' toys left in gardens to be picked up and played with the following day. No scooters or bikes left on their sides. No gates ajar. Just silent, quiet, closed gardens. I started on my journey to the shop with the key, card, and wallet tucked away in my inner pocket. And as I walked, I felt a distinct eeriness steal over me. The footsteps were soft and scuttled from my old shoes and the wind whipped in wild waves, sometimes slowing my steps. I could hear it rush past me in a sudden gush and the whispering taunt slipped into my ear. Every now and then, the wind was overpowered by the melodic, steely clang of turbulent wind chimes or the hollow, softer clink of their wooden counterparts. The darkness was interrupted by sudden sensor lights in the gardens that would offer a moment of clarity against the shadowy streets. It was strange to take note of the same streets I knew when they were under the blankets of night. Beautiful flowers in the gardens were all muted and monochrome, each one hushed and strangled by the darkness. The trees that plumed from the pathways were lacking vibrancy, and in their nude winter state, held solid like petrified lightning bolts, perhaps because it was the first nightly walk without him, or because I had felt something was off since I left the house. I had a sense that I was walking in a different world, an unfamiliar, unsafe world, a distortion of what once was. I continued down the roads, heading toward the garage, the place I went to top up, and down this road, a row of lamp posts marched on the either side, each one leading the way like a column of soldiers, their lamps spilling quaint patches of orange light before me. Two of them, a head flickered in a menacing manner, a constant battle of on and off, and a third, almost the same, kept losing power and regaining, but not in a flicker, more like a slow, steady metronome. 
Something about it made me feel incredibly uneasy. I felt like, as much as I was keeping an eye on it, something else was keeping an eye on me. In spite of the clear emptiness of the long road, I glanced up and down to make sure there was nobody else around. Checking in the gardens, letting my eyes stroke across the windows, only to find them all blocked by curtains. I was just being stupid. I was just tired, cold, and anxious to be back home. I was projecting a mood of uneasiness. The light flickered on once more, and I could see. Standing directly beneath the lamppost, a single figure. A silhouette, unmoving, dark, undiscernible features. But I knew it was facing me. Its shoulders broad and stance strong. I froze, perhaps matching its rigidity. But a thousand thoughts betrayed my outward stability racing through within until the light snapped off. In that fractional change, the most profound klaxon of imminent danger began to screech within my head. But in a state of quiet panic, I couldn't eject myself from the situation. That would be a clear signal that I was weak, fearful, alone. I began to backtrack, slowly and steadily, keeping my eyes directly on the same point as if the sudden shroud of darkness would allow whoever that was to steam ahead, but there was no sudden movement on either side of the street, through the other dim orange puddles, nor could I see anything limbed in the road. The light snapped back on, and my heart skipped a beat, but nothing was there. I took a few seconds to breathe and decided against my better judgment that I had just imagined it. Forest relief was easier to adopt when the alternative was burrowing, uncertain discomfort. I had a propensity to let my mind run away with itself. He was the one who would always anchor me to reality. Whenever I panicked or stressed or froze in life, unable to make the next move, the best decision, he would always find a way to make sure I kicked back into motion. But whether I was being silly or not, just in case, I decided to go the long way. I retraced my steps, trying to act as if I had simply gone the wrong way, and was rectifying it, not wanting to give any hint to a potential ambuscade, that I was a prime target, but I rushed between the patches of light. Even though between them wasn't completely dark, I felt as soon as I stepped into a more diluted section of the bleak, broken pavement, I was infinitely more vulnerable. I realized, perhaps too late the longer way, would bring me past the old community center. When I was younger, it was where everyone went to learn boxing, or share prayers, or whatever else the theme of the day was. But for years it had fell into dilapidation with the constantly shifted and delayed promise of a wonderful renovation. It was still used by the youth, certainly, but not in any official capacity. Sometimes you'd see a few glowing, pulsing orbs of orange, and you knew there was a small huddle of teenagers there smoking cigarettes or whatever else. But that was always better than the alternative. Like any condemned buildings, in its absence of residence, it had become home to legends of ghost stories and horror tales in the intervening years. I thought, given the hollow breaths in my chest, that it was maybe wiser to just go back into the cold darkness of my home and force myself into my loved one's nights asking for their assistance, but by this point, I was halfway to the garage and halfway to home. I really didn't want to be a pain, so... With one more nervous glance behind the street, to see that lamppost flash on, and no distant figure watching me, I decided to stop being ridiculous and carry on. The road that passed the old community center was wide enough, but very much unlit. I decided to walk in the middle, just as I always did whenever I walked alone, to give myself enough space from either pathway. Like before, my eyes were trained on a certain spot and the way through the three-pronged railings of the center. The building in daytime was colorful enough, with little murals on the walls that the kids painted, albeit clearly left to ruin. But at night, it was just a series of black blocks poking in and out from one another, I tried to ignore the stories that were coming to the forefront of my mind. The caretaker who died there could be prowling the perimeter of the grounds checking for any trespasser, or the three ghastly children that could be heard laughing in the corpse of trees. 
which is where they were last seen alive, or the widow, the original owner, whose haggard face could be seen watching from the window, basking in some spectral glow. There were too many, and my eyes were darting from window to trees to side of the building, making sure none of these were suddenly going to take me by surprise. That figure had already shaken me up, so much so, that even if I were to see a group of miscreants, I knew I'd be screaming as I ran back home, though whether lurking in the shadows of the center or the darkness of my mind, I couldn't shake this feeling that I was under the gaze of something. Goosebumps had stormed my body, my hairs were standing on end, and I felt flighty and fidgety, as if at any moment I would be confronted by someone. I watched with the vigilance of a hawk, and from the depths of my fearful mind, my anxiety ran rampant irritating and exciting my paranoia so that visions and shapes began to emerge it was impossible but it was as if i could see shadows darker than the winter's night flitting across the overgrown grass or lurking behind trees or peering from smashed windows i bolstered my resolve telling myself that i was being ridiculous and pushed onward still not taking my eyes from the building just a few more seconds and i'll be on the main road in which I could already envision the garish, bright light of the garage offering a contrast to the unsettling darkness of this charged night. A sudden whoosh of wind took me by surprise, and I yelped at the spontaneity of it, and in a panic, allowed my vision to furtively check the grounds and the building, just in case my sudden noise had attracted the attention of these spirits, and gave them all heed to rush me at once. My mind's eye was full of the most tragic countenances slithering across the floor, or gliding from the window, or bouncing across the grounds, but in reality there was nothing. I decided it was best to stop focusing on it and just continue at the end of the street. The figure. It was impossible for it to get there before me. It would have to. It couldn't. I blinked again. Desperate to wipe it from the vision before me, but it stayed solid and stubborn. Just as vague, just as rigid, just as still and menacing as before. I couldn't move. My feet were rooted to the floor, my bones as petrified as the naked trees that lurked in the distance. I kept my eyes trained on the figure as it continued to watch me, ignoring my wishes, my prayers, for it to dissolve and melt before me. I stared into the wind, stole the moisture from my eyes, and I had to blink. Upon opening my eyes, it had close half the distance in that time. I could feel a sudden terror unfurling within, clawing about my body with a desperate intensity, and even from the community center, an urge, a silent chorus willing me to leave, to flee, to go, but I couldn't. I wanted to, but... I couldn't. It just stood, watching me. And with this closer proximity, I could see it was taller than anyone I'd ever seen before. At least eight foot, nine, ten. In my fear, with my senses heightened, I still couldn't make out any distinguishing features. Just a looming presence of doom. Imminent, torturous doom. But I could hear a myriad of unspoken orders to run. Run before it comes any closer. Something changed then. Tear glistened at my eyes and offered to nurture action. My last order, though, there was no tone, no intonation, was unmistakably my deceased lover's. It was unmistakable. Whenever I panicked or stressed or froze in life, unable to make the next move, the best decision, he would always find a way to make sure I kicked back into motion. That was the catalyst I needed to spin on my heel, unknowing, uncaring. If this was a stupid thing to do, I ran faster than I had ever run before, refusing to turn around me, sprinting back through the dark streets, highlighted in intervals by the lamp posts or the sensor lights, the sound of my anguished breath and screaming lungs dwarfing the howling of the wind, the peeling of the chimes. I didn't look behind. I knew it was slipping between every void, every hidden corner. I could feel the terror it bestowed, but as long as I kept running, it wouldn't get me. I was being protected. 
I was sobbing, which I didn't realize until I was struggling to get my key in the door, my tears blurring the task beyond its menial obstruction. As soon as I was back in the house, though dark and dreary, I could tell I was safe. I collapsed the door, finally listening to the endless complaints of my body and, ultimately, I smiled. Because even alone, even terrified, I knew that my late fiancé saved me that night from whatever the lurking, stalking, menacing presence may have been. So I grew up in a relatively small town. Most people knew each other, and rumors always spread quickly. But a story had been lingering far longer than any of us had known, about a creature tormented by the outside world and brutalized. Our parents always told us what to do when it was time for the ritual. It was said that the creature only came for one night, and it was always a new moon when it was darkest. We had been told to gather up a drop of blood, wipe it on a sheet of paper with a cross and pentagram, then lay it on our front porch and silently wait after we locked all the doors and windows. It was supposedly blind, so covering our windows didn't concern us. But soon, I started losing belief, thinking it was all just a silly joke taken too far. So I decided to prove it was fake and show everyone how foolish it was. But I was the only foolish one. On the first night upon the new moon, I told my parents I had to use the bathroom. But I had other plans. Our bathroom had a one-way emergency exit of sorts, so I used it to sneak out without my parents noticing. I then took off for the sidewalk. Soon after reaching the sidewalk, I began slowly and calmly walking down the street, noticing how nice it was that night. I took time to think, breathe, but not time to pay attention to my surroundings. I was about 20 feet away from our house when I stopped walking. There was a sound coming from down the sidewalk. A slow, raspy groan of sorts. I was curious, but also freaked out. I considered going back, but thought it would be cowardly. It was surprisingly dark, even for a night with a new moon. The groaning had grown louder, and even more strange as I thought. Like it was getting closer. I then spotted something about 70 feet down the sidewalk in the center of the walk path. I thought it was a person at first, but realized most... Just about everyone except for me would be locked up in their homes by now, and it was too odd looking to be human. I noticed it didn't move an inch. I turned for a moment, wanting to go back, but after a moment of hesitation, turned back around towards the thing. It had somehow gotten a lot closer. Then I saw what it looked like. Tall, skinny, and pale with dozens, if not hundreds, of blind eyes covering its head from front to back. No nose, no mouth, nothing. It had arms that reached down to its heels and it was no more than three inches shorter than a street light. Its fingers were nothing but implanted needles. Then it began slowly walking towards me and slowly felt around with its two arms. But it stopped. Its head shot to my face. And I stood there frozen in pure dread and terror. It was still about 16 feet but it somehow knew I was there even though it hadn't been able to see me or feel me. I heard a snap, and then a pain groan as something ripped, and I saw that two additional arms had grown ripping through its skin, allowing it to start quickly crawling in my direction. This was it. I was going to die in the middle of a sidewalk to this hideous thing. I then felt a firm and strong grip on my wrist, and began being dragged quickly back in the direction of our house, and I heard a voice shout out to the creature, and it backed off for a moment, then sprinted off after a stick was thrown at it and hit one of its eyes. I had been dragged back by my mother. I had never been so terrified yet so relieved in my life. Despite the scolding, and soon the disappearance of our neighbors, we soon moved away, thankfully never hearing of that thing ever again. I'm writing this at a friend's suggestion after she witnessed some of the strange things that occurred at my home. 
We both believe that it's caused by the items I found and purchased at an estate sale a few weeks ago. As odd as it sounds, I didn't know what I had bought until I brought it home. Let me explain. It was a hot midsummer day and I had run into town on a few errands. After completing them, I decided to head home using the scenic route, a long stretch of winding road that circled the city and met with the main road. It was the kind of place where the nice houses lived, where people had property and three stories and barn with livestock. I was coming up on a sharp corner in the road, slowing my car down to take it safely when I noticed the sign. Printed on nice cardstock and covered in swirling black letters, it indicated an estate sale with a bold black arrow pointing across the street. It was nailed to the wood pile of a power line. I flipped on my blinker without thinking and turned into the driveway. The driveway was nestled in between rows and rows of trees, its own little forest. I wound my way past them and the carpet of thick brown bushes and undergrowth. Their edges burned by the summer heat that lay at their bases. The road was up a slight incline. My car crested the hill before the house came into view. It was two stories with warm brown wood paneling and white trim. The door was a soft periwinkle color and all of the windows were frosted glass. It reminded me of a gingerbread house, frosted at Christmas time. Two other cars were parked in the driveway. A little ways away were plastic folding tables, clock full with all kinds of stuff. A woman in a bright red suit, with black hair done up in a tight bun, stood by one of the tables in front of a young couple. The woman in the suit's head would bob or she would wave her hand as she spoke to them. Confusion graced their faces as they held the other's hand in a white-knuckled embrace. To her credit, the woman didn't seem to notice or didn't seem to care. I parked my car in an empty space, grabbed my phone and purse, and hopped out into the blistering heat of the day. Estate sales were something I never went to. The items were often too expensive and there was something morbid about picking through a dead person's things. A vulture, scavenging at the sight of a tragedy came to mind. It was something I was about to become. A feeling crept in and I was unable to shake it as I walked to the tables. I wasn't sure what had compelled me to come here. I had done it without thinking. Things lined the surface of every table and some had been tucked underneath. Things that the deceased relatives were too lazy to have properly appraised or who didn't want the work out sorting through years of memories, collections, and knickknacks. I moved around the tables when the couple and the woman continued their conversation taking a closer look at the items of the forgotten. There was a lot to look, but nothing was of particular interest. A few ancient decorative lamps lined half of one table next to snow globes, an hourglass, an egg beater that looked older than God, and a collection of bells. I had lost sight of the woman in the suit and the nervous couple while I wandered down the aisles, keeping an eye out for anything I might want to take home. Or the reason for me being here in the first place. It was rows and rows of much the same. Until I walked around the last table in the last row. Stacked up in a pyramid shape were five large travel trunks. They were wrapped in worn brown leather with black metal hinges and clasps. Shiny, new padlocks were affixed to the front of each of them. The trunks themselves were useful though, unlike the other stuff for sale, but I couldn't see a set of keys anywhere near them. It was here that my curious mind took hold and started racing. If the trunks were for sale, then they had to be empty. But if they were empty, why did someone put locks on them? Why would the locks not seem to come with any kind of key? If the trunks weren't empty, then why sell them? Or were they hoping someone would buy them and be responsible for the junk possibly kept inside? But if it was nothing but useless junk inside, then why would it need to be locked up? Heat from the summer sun rained down on me as I stood staring at the trunks. Drops of sweat pooled in the small of my back and glistened at the nap of my neck. Around me, my thoughts were a raging torrent that swirled in every direction before looking back to the same questions over again. In Auroboros... A snake eating its tail, an endless circle of unanswered questions. A tap on my shoulder pulled me out of my confused mind and back to the house in the woods. 
I turned to see the woman in the bright red suit looking at me with wide, dark eyes. Her smile was pulled tight, forced and painful. Her lips were painted the same red as her suit. Can I help you with anything? Her voice was... Saturine. It made my teeth hurt. Uh, yeah. I said, pointing to the trunks. Are these chests empty? The woman's smile stretched further and her eyes glazed over with bewilderment. I had this effect on people. The tone of voice I use or the way I phrase my questions often sends people into a panic. They search for the right answer. The answer they are hoping I want to hear and come up blank. I would have said something to remove the awkwardness I had created, but I wasn't sure the best way to. It was as simple as her saying yes or no. Well, she started, then shuddered to a stop. The deceased's family didn't have the best relationship with them. They put in minimal effort to sort his estate out. These trunks do have stuff in them, but we don't know what any of it is. The family just said to sell as is. So there's a possibility that if I buy this, I will be buying a bunch of garbage that someone couldn't be bothered to deal with. Or it could be a treasure trove of rare valuable items that I could sell and make a fortune off of. I smiled at the woman. I'm buying a gamble. A mystery. The woman's smile broke again. Pulled too tight. Eyes too friendly as her mind raced to say something that wouldn't drive me away. Yeah, I guess so. Her voice was a sigh. I glanced at the five massive trunks, looked around for a price tag. I was going to buy them, even if it cost me a trip to the dump. They were beautiful, well made, and I could use them for decoration at the same time as storage. I failed to find a price on them. What price do you want for the lot of these? The woman perked up at that. Her shoulders relaxed along with the tension in her face. The smile real for the first time since I started speaking with her. Yes, they're $120. I'm not paying that price. I said bring my eyes up to meet with hers. I'll pay $80 instead. The trunks are nice, but the people selling them want me to do the work they were too lazy to complete. If I have to make a dump run or contact someone because the box contains something hazardous, then I've wasted my money. Do we have a deal? She reached one pale hand to grasp my own. With a firm shake, she said, Deal. I paid her in cash and rearranged my car to fit all five of the chests. I grabbed the first and the weight of it off-balanced me, almost dragged me to the ground with it. I checked to make sure I hadn't damaged it before trying again. It was rough, sweaty work under the unforgiving sun, but I managed to fit all of them in the back seat and trunk of my car. Then, when I finished, I walked back over to the woman. Hey, I need the keys to them to get the padlocks off. I said. Oh. Her eyebrows shot to her hairline. I'm terribly sorry, but we don't know where the keys are. Or if they were even still in the residence. To be honest, I'm not sure if the owner even kept the keys. With a nod on my head, I turned on my heel and stalked back to my car. The mystery of the locked boxes and missing keys was an exciting thing to discover at an estate sale. I was looking forward to finding out what the owner of the home had hidden away within these trunks. What secrets he needed to throw the keys away for. I pulled out of the long drive and back onto the road to home. When I arrived back at my house, I didn't go inside right away. I went around to my back gate and unlatched it. I lived in a small single-story home with a large backyard. It had an unattached garage out back nestled between a mother-in-law suite and a place for an extensive garden. The unattached garage had been converted to a studio or study-type outbuilding, and a new attached garage had been added to the main building years after its initial construction. I unlocked the studio door and propped it open with a rock. I returned to my car and lugged the trunks into the studio. My space was dimly lit with lights made to replicate candlelight for atmosphere while I worked on my art projects. I had a desk on the right-hand side positioned in front of an easel. On the left-hand side was a long workbench. My crafting tools hung from racks on the walls above the bench. I settled the trunks under the workbench, the only place in the room that would hold all of them. 
I set the lightest of them on the top of the desk to go through when I had a chance. I left the studio and locked everything up. It wasn't until late evening that I was able to return when the sky was turning the soft dark that summer allows and the air was muggy and thick with insects. The trunks were waiting for me where I left them, still locked, still as mysterious. I grabbed a pair of bolt cutters from my wall of supplies and clipped the padlock off. A loud clack filled the room as the lock bounced off the table and onto the concrete floor. I put the bolt cutters to the side and opened the trunk. The smell of something old slithered out of the chest. Something ancient and forgotten. It made everything musty and clogged. The lid slapped against the wall. I looked in. The items were a random array of what could have been junk. A collection of unconnected things nestled together. None of it seemed valuable. None of it seemed like trash. They just were. I pulled them out one by one. There was a jar filled with a sodium yellow liquid. A black mass floated in the center of it. After I placed it down, I kept catching glimpses of it out of the corner of my eye. I could swear the thing inside the jar moved, stretched out, expanded within its confines. Every time I looked to check, however, nothing had changed. It was the same size and shape and floated in the same place as before. When it became too distracting, I moved it across the room. There were three journal-like books, bound in leather with frayed pages yellowed by age. Two were unlabeled, and the third read, Expedition 0813. Two manila envelopes. I didn't open them. A stack of file folders with numbers in the corner. There were more oddities in the form of strange statues carved from wood, ivory, and stone. Some were made of feathers and twine and sticks. There were a few too many of those to name off all of them. The last item was a mask carved from a pale gray wood. Whorls of blue and red paint decorated the area around the eyes and chin. I arranged everything out on the work desk, closed up the trunk, moved it across the room, and called it a night. This is where my real problem started. As I lay down to sleep, I started to hear the sounds of soft sobbing. I live alone. I double-check my locks at night. I have security lights and cameras around my house. I grabbed my phone and glanced at the screen. It showed no activity from my camera, light, or a security system. Setting my phone down, I picked up the aluminum bats I kept by my bed in case of emergencies. I stepped out of my room and checked my house, following where I thought the noise was coming from. Nothing but emptiness greeted me. I left the house and checked on the studio. It stood, a dark sentinel in my backyard. The security light flipped on when I moved into its sensor range. It showed nothing. No one crouching in the shadows or hiding in the grass. I unlocked and opened the studio bat at the ready. I flipped on the light to find nothing in this room either. Everything was as I had left it only an hour before. I could still hear the strange sobbing despite having looked through my entire house. It never grew any louder or quieter. I returned to my room and tried to sleep even with the soft sounds of sorrow filling my head. That night I dreamed of terrible and impossible things. A city formed from starlight, a land below the water, dark shapes with sharp teeth and eyes that looked out of the void with endless hunger. I woke feeling more tired than when I had gone to bed. It's been happening every night since then. The sobbing has grown louder joined by screams and howls. Under all of that, I was sure I heard moans of pain, the sad sounds growing in tempo becoming a chorus of desperation. My friend commented on some of the ongoings when she spent the night. She had the same dreams of impossible cities and scaled creatures crawling through the darkness towards her. I know it has something to do with the items in my studio, items that I haven't touched since I opened the first chest. I have been too unnerved to go back in there by myself. My friend refused to help. She said I should seek outside advice. I'm just not sure where to go from here. Do I get rid of the trunks and their contents, or do I try to figure out more about them? I'm sure there is something in one of those boxes that contains answers. At least, that is my hope. My dreams are becoming more vivid and more frightening, as if whatever I freed is drawing ever closer.
There's a big age gap between me and my sister. Ten years to be exact. I've always looked up to her. Since she always seemed to have her life totally under control. Never stressed, social, punctual. The total opposite of me. The type of person that totally neglects all their schoolwork and plays Stardew Valley all afternoon instead. When I was ten, my sister, Tanya, got married at twenty. She and her husband didn't waste much time, and I had been eleven for three months when my niece, Sadie, was born. I became an uncle in sixth grade. I'm seventeen now and Sadie is six, almost seven. Tanya and her husband, Alex, live across town. And usually their neighbor babysits for them when they go out. But yesterday afternoon, I got a call from Tanya, asking me if I could come watch Sadie that evening. We've got reservations at a really nice restaurant, but my neighbor's busy. I need someone to watch Sadie. She'd son. You've got your driver's license now. Can you please come by for the evening? I guess. I answered. I don't really have anything else to do. Oh, thank you so much, Jake. She's son. Come at six, okay? Okay, see you then. It was already dark when I arrived. Tanya and Alex greeted me at the door. Tanya gave me a crash course on the basics of childcare. We already ate dinner, so you don't need to worry about that. Bedtime's at eight, but she might want to go to sleep earlier. If that's the case, just watch TV in the living room or something. If she gives you any trouble, just threaten to call me and tell me how naughty she's been. You can have anything in the fridge, except the cheesecake. Damn, I love cheesecake, my son. And don't swear around her, Tanya's son. She's impressionable. Sadie took that moment to walk up to me and son. Hi, Uncle Jake. Hey, Sadie, you're so tall now. I said in that childish voice everyone uses when talking to kids. Noticing she was holding something behind her back, I asked, What have you got there? This is Izzy, Sadie's son, holding out the doll in front of her. Izzy was a plastic doll with glass eyes, stuffed into a dress that looked like it was pulled from the pages of Little House on the Prairie. The doll looked a little worse for wear, like it had been owned by several other kids before Sadie. I forced myself to smile, but I've never liked dolls much. I always found them really unnerving, and Izzy was no exception. In fact, with her gleaming blue glass eyes, she seemed especially creepy. Well, good luck. Tanya patted my shoulder. We'll be back in about four hours. Bye, Mommy. Bye, Daddy. Sadie waved as they walked out the door. Then she turned to me and asked, So what are we going to do? I don't know. My son, what do you want to do? Sadie thought for a moment and then said, Video games. Apparently... The only thing she remembered about me was that I played lots of video games. Fortunately, I'd come prepared and introduced her to the joy that is Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time on the 3DS. She got the hang of it remarkably fast, especially for a six-year-old, and she played for almost a solid hour while I listened to some music, throwing out advice whenever she asked for help. Izzy the doll sat next to her the whole time. At around seven... Sadie announced that she was tired and wanted to go to bed. Bedtime was still an hour away, but I wasn't going to complain. She got her pajamas on and brushed her teeth, and I tucked her in and read her a bedtime story. I asked her if she wanted me to stay for a while, but she said she slept better by herself and told me she'd call for help if she needed something. Izzy was lying next to her, staring blankly at the ceiling, and I went back down the stairs. I checked the fridge and didn't see anything particularly good apart from the forbidden cheesecake. So I sat down at the couch and wound up listening to music while browsing the internet on my phone. I was listening to Guns N' Roses, and I happened to think about how underrated Izzy Stradlin was as a guitarist. And that made me think about Izzy, Sadie's doll. I sat up and saw the doll was sitting on top of the armchair on the other side of the room, staring forward. I looked into her glass eyes and shuddered. They looked too alive but dead at the same time. That was one of the things I'd always hated about dolls. How they looked like they should be alive but there was always something off that made them look wrong somehow. And then I remembered that Izzy was supposed to be upstairs. In Sadie's bed. 
How the hell had she gotten down here? I paused the song. Cutting Axel Rose off mid-screech and took my headphones off. Wondering how the doll had managed to teleport downstairs. Maybe Sadie was playing a joke on me. But I was certain I would have noticed her coming down the stairs. They were right in my line of sight. Maybe she had never been in Sadie's bed. And my memory was just screwing with me. And the overly imaginative part of my mind told me that the doll must have come down the stairs herself without anyone's help. And looking into her glassy eyes, I could almost imagine that being the true answer. With the only problem, of course, being that it was utterly ridiculous. As unsettling as they might be, the idea that a doll could walk down the stairs on its own was totally impossible. It was a damn piece of plastic. It couldn't think, let alone move. I started the song again and tried to ignore it. Maybe my head was just playing tricks on me, but I couldn't stop looking at the doll. It was always there, in the corner of my eye, and it always seemed to be watching me. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore, and I got up and walked back up the stairs. Felt wrong for me to turn my back on Izzy, though. I felt exposed. Unsafe. I made my way to Sadie's room and pushed the door open. Sadie? I asked. Yeah? A slightly groggy voice answered. Can I ask you something? What? I stepped into the room and took a seat in the small chair next to her bed. Can you tell me about Izzy? Where did you get her from? Mommy's friend gave her to me. Sadie's son. Said she was a present. Which friend? I asked. And how long ago? It was Auntie Ava, last year. I knew Ava. She'd been Tanya's best friend since before I was born. Apparently, Tanya had introduced her to Sadie as an aunt. Which didn't surprise me too much. The two of them might as well have been sisters. Have you ever noticed anything weird about her? Auntie Ava? No, not her. The doll, Izzy. Sadie thought for a moment and then said, Sometimes she talks to me. She told me her name was Izzy, and she moves around. My stomach dropped. Uh, thanks. I'm gonna go, okay? Okay. I left Sadie's room, and my back felt even more exposed than it had before. As I walked down the hallway, I kept looking behind me, thinking something would be there, and I couldn't get Sadie's words out of my head. Maybe she was just imagining things. When I was six, I would pretend my toys were alive and could talk to me. But that didn't explain how the doll could move on its own. I started walking down the stairs and made it about halfway before noticing that Izzy was no longer at the top of the armchair. She was sitting upright on the couch, exactly where I had been sitting. Nobody else was in the house. Nobody else could have touched her. Yet, she had moved. Worse, her eyes no longer seemed to be staring blankly ahead. Instead, they seemed to be fixed on me, and a horrible feeling ran its claw up my spine. A feeling that told me that she could see me, and that she was watching. I didn't know what to do. I was tempted to run back up the stairs and into Sadie's room, lock the door, and camp out there. I considered calling Tanya and telling her what was going on, but she'd just call me insane. And then I told myself I was just being ridiculous. It was a doll. I wasn't going to run screaming away from it. I walked the rest of the way down the stairs and approached the doll, and I became more and more terrified with every step. I still felt like Izzy was watching me. And before long, I was forcing myself to put one foot in front of the other. And then I reached out to pick her up. Reaching out was even more difficult than approaching her. I didn't feel like I was about to grab a doll. I felt like I was about to put my hand in the jaws of a rabid Rottweiler. A part of me was certain that the moment I touched her, something awful would happen. But no. I put my hand around a plastic arm and sighed with relief when nothing happened. I picked Izzy up and stuffed her into a kitchen cupboard. Then, I tied the cupboard shut with several spare twist ties lying on the counter. Then I checked the time. It was about 7.30, so I still had several hours until Tanya and Alex would be back. I opened the fridge and helped myself to the cheesecake. If Tanya got mad, I could buy her more. And after Izzy's antics, I felt like I needed to eat something to calm down. I still felt uneasy, not quite safe, and I kept looking over my shoulder, unable to shake that feeling of exposure, of 
vulnerability. And then the cupboard giggled. If I had been standing up, I would have jumped ten feet in the air. As it was, I sat bolt upright and spun to face the cupboard. Instinctively, I reached across the counter and grabbed a knife that had been left on the cutting board and pointed it in front of me at Izzy's cupboard. And I waited to see what would happen next. Nothing. The cupboard was silent, and I didn't let go of the knife. I couldn't take my eyes off the cabinet. A minute passed, then five. After ten minutes had gone by, I finally set the knife down and dared to look away. Maybe my paranoid brain had just imagined the sound. It was at that moment that I realized I needed to use the bathroom. I still didn't feel comfortable leaving the room, but I figured that if I didn't, I would probably pee my pants if something like that happened again. Which wasn't an appealing idea. It took less than a minute for me to relieve myself. I stepped out from the bathroom after washing my hands and looked back up at the cupboard. It was open. The twist ties had been split in two, and the doors were hanging open, revealing several dishes, but nothing else. Izzy was loose. Then I heard the footsteps. They were upstairs, and from down below I could hear them clearly. The light sound of little feet running down the hallway. Sadie? I called out, praying that it was only her, that she'd gotten up to use the bathroom herself or something. No answer. Sadie? Nothing. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs could carry me. I bolted down the hallway and flung Sadie's door open. She was sleeping peacefully on her side, snoring softly through her nose. Thank God. I stepped further into her room and that was when I heard the footsteps again, coming even closer. I turned to face the doorway. Izzy was there, sitting down, staring at the ground. Somehow that was just as unnerving as having her stare at me. In her lap was the knife I had pointed at her cupboard downstairs. And then her little plastic head slowly looked up, and those piercing blue eyes fixed themselves on me. Her arm moved ever so slightly, so that her hand was resting on the handle of the knife. I darted forward and slammed the door shut. I locked it and set the chair down in front of it. Sadie was still sleeping and I didn't want to wake her. Who knew how she'd react to the situation? I pulled out my phone and called Tanya. She picked up on the third ring and asked, Jake, what's going on? This is going to sound totally insane. I said, but you got to believe me, okay? Okay, what happened? Sadie's doll, Izzy. She's been moving around the house all evening, disappearing and reappearing, and nobody's touching her. I'm in Sadie's room right now with the door locked and the thing sitting right outside the door with a knife. I saw it move. I said. Tanya was silent. I was certain that she was about to tell me I was crazy or laugh, but she didn't. After a few seconds, she spoke. Is Sadie okay? Yeah, she's asleep in here. She doesn't know what's going on. Good. Hold tight. We're coming. Fifteen minutes, okay? You believe me? Yeah, I do. Tanya said with such conviction in her voice that I knew she wasn't joking. Just hold on. I will. I said. She hung up. I knew there was probably only one reason why Tanya would believe me so quickly. She must have noticed the doll's antics herself. After a minute, she hung up. The tapping started. A gentle knock on the door. The sound of plastic against wood. It was a soft sound. I knew what had made it. A couple seconds later, the second knock came. Then the third. Soon, the knocking was constant, and it began to get louder, building from a gentle knock into a loud thud. Izzy wanted in, and she wanted in bad. As if she knew playtime was almost over, I threw myself against the door, pushing back, praying the lock would hold, and then I heard the sound of the garage door opening and let out a massive sigh of relief. Tanya and Alex were back. The knocking had stopped, but I still didn't dare open the door. I heard Alex yell, Hello? From downstairs. Up here. I shouted back. Sadie turned in her sleep when I yelled. I could hear footsteps from outside the room. Heavy footsteps that could have only belonged to my sister or her husband. I dared to unlock the door and peer out. 
Tanya was standing at the other end of the hallway, staring at me. I opened the door all the way and stepped down. Izzy was lying on her back, right in front of the door. Her eyes were blank and empty again, and the knife was lying a few inches away from her. Tanya walked to stand next to me as Alex ran up the stairs. All three of us stared at the doll for a moment, as if daring it to react. Where's Sadie? Alex asked eventually. In here. My son is still sleeping, like I said. She doesn't know what's going on. Good, so... What do we do with that? Alex asked. I don't know. Tanya said. Burn it? Does plastic burn? I asked. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Tanya said. She turned to me and said, Thanks for keeping Sadie safe. No problem. I did eat some of the cheesecake, though. Is that okay? Given the circumstances, I can't blame you. Tanya said. I know what to do, Alex said. We'll bury her. Good idea. Let's do it deep. Alex went to get a garbage bag to bury Izzy in, leaving Tanya and I to talk. Why did you believe me so fast? Have you been noticing things too? Yeah, for the past two months or so. Sadie's had her for a year, but I didn't start noticing things until recently. She appears in new places, and Sadie would talk about Izzy telling her things. When you called, I knew you were telling the truth. I asked Sadie, and she said Ava gave Izzy to her. Did she say anything about that? I asked. Izzy used to belong to Ava's own niece, Tanya's son. She told me that her niece didn't want Izzy anymore, because she gave her nightmares. Ava and her brother both assumed that she was just being childish, but here we are. It felt strange to talk so casually about something so unusual. Something so impossible, but somehow, the impossibility of the situation felt unimportant. It was real, so the fact that it shouldn't have been, didn't matter. Can I go? I asked Tanya. Like, if it's alright, I want to go back home. Of course, Tanya son. What are you going to tell mom and dad? <laughs> Nothing. They wouldn't believe us. I guess you're right. Tanya shrugged. Bye, Jake. Bye, Tanya. I drove home, and even though it was only a quarter after rain, I went to bed, but I couldn't fall asleep. When I finally did, I had the most horrific nightmares. I don't think I'll be able to sleep without nightmares for a long time. This morning, Tanya texted me a photo of the spot where they buried Izzy. Hopefully, she won't be able to escape from under six feet of dirt. God, I hope she can't. On the first day of Christmas, Meat Man gave to me a slab of meat, mysteriously. I opened the door to my freezer to pull out a frozen hash brown for breakfast and saw a large frozen slab of meat. I stopped dead. I wondered if I had purchased it and forgotten about it. I do like to drink, but it seemed weird that I would have purchased this amount of meat while blackout drunk. At the time, I figured that was the most likely story, though and I got the meat out to add some to my breakfast. I cut off a small amount and put it in a pan with some butter. As the pan got hot, the frozen meat screamed. I got the feeling I got in my sphincter when I watched a video of someone getting hurt. Even funny music and a laugh track couldn't help when I watched someone take a serious pill off a bike. In my day job, I screened videos for America's most hilarious video clips. After years, I like to think I was pretty immune to the feelings of shock and disgust that most people felt when they first started working in the department, which I ran. Every now and then, though, I got a video so shocking it haunted me for days, ruining my sleep unless I drank enough to block out the horrific nightmares. I'd gotten one such video the day before my first gift from Meat Man, and I did what I usually do when I got a horrific video like this. I flagged the video, contacted the police, Told the rest of the department, I was taking the rest of the day off. Went home, and no matter what time it was, down my fifth of whatever cheap alcohol I was feeling that day. 
It usually served as enough of a reboot to my system to get me over the horror of the video and get me back to work in a reasonable facsimile of my normal self. In this video, a man stands smiling with a skateboard, about to take it down a half pipe. Many of our videos start that way, and they are usually more painful than funny, so I was ready to skip it and move on to the next one. As he went down the side of the half pipe, a masked man stepped out of the bushes right next to it, and before the skateboarder had time to react, the masked man hit him in the chest with a sledgehammer. The cameraman started screaming and tried to get away, but after several shaky cam moments, the camera fell on the ground and the sickening thuds of a body getting hit with a sledgehammer could be heard over and over. I was about to turn off the video when someone picked the camera up and trained it on the original cameraman for a few seconds, though he hardly resembled a person anymore. The camera was carried back over to the half pipe and placed on the ground pointed at the skateboarder. He begged for his life, but not with words, as he didn't seem able to draw enough breath to talk. The masked man raised the sledgehammer and brought it down on the skateboarder over and over. He started with the hands and feet, very slowly making his way to the skateboarder's center. The only sounds, the rapidly fading screaming of the skateboarder and the wet smacks of the sledgehammer hitting his body again and again. I turned the video off. The next day, I watched the usual assortment of mildly to moderately funny videos of kids saying silly things and people falling from various heights. I was about to leave for the day when I heard a commotion outside my office. People had gathered around one of the cubicles and were discussing what was playing. From the door of my office, I could hear the sound of a sledgehammer being used on flesh. Stop the video, I shouted as I rushed over. By the time I got there, the video was paused on what looked like a pile of meat but I was pretty sure it had been human meats. I sent everyone back to their desks, turned the monitor off, and gave Julie, the person who had first opened the video, the rest of the day, and the day after off of work. Then I turned the monitor back on, and sent the video and a message to the police. As I finished, Joe, one of our senior staff, poked his head over the cubicle wall. How's it going in there, mild one? Oh, hey, Joey, I said. Mostly pretty good. We've gotten a few horrendous videos the last few days. Shit, man. Let me see him. Joey had been here as long as I had and would be my boss for sure, except he didn't like to work hard. If they ever make a movie about the whole thing, I could see him being played by Will Arnett. He had a good eye for funny videos and an iron stomach. I still didn't think it was appropriate to show him the videos, but I knew he would waste time searching them out himself if I didn't. You can see them, Joey, but they are the most gruesome things I have ever seen. I brought Joey into my office and opened the first video from the day before. Then I moved to where I couldn't see it and watched Joey's face as the video played. He breathed a long, low sigh. Holy shit. Holy shit. That looked real. He looked at my face and his smile dropped. It isn't real. Is it? I think it is, I said. And there's another one. I pulled up the next video on the screen and stepped back to watch Joey's reaction. His usual grin slowly melted into a sort of pain grimace. The same guy? Until that point, it hadn't even occurred to me, but now it seemed obvious. Someone was sending us the most gruesome murder videos that I could even imagine, and now I suspected it would keep going. On the second day of Christmas, Meat Man gave to me ten fingers. I found them in a small box on my doorstep when I went out in the morning. I brought the package inside and opened it in the kitchen. Upon finding the fingers, I dropped them away from me and jumped back away from it. The fingers spilled out across the kitchen floor as if I had been casting bones. After a few moments of shock, I called the police. Two detectives came out and bagged the fingers. Looks like a lady's fingers, Wilkes, said one. Wilkes asked me, Where did you find the fingers? Lady fingers, said the first one. On the front step, I said. This one had a ring, but it doesn't anymore. The first one held the bag up to us with his finger pointing to the fingers inside. Take a break, Hanover, said Wilkes. She was probably married, 
I said to Hanover. You know any married woman missing ten fingers? Hanover asked. No. I answered before I realized he was being facetious. Look, man, Wilk said to me. I'm not going to arrest you because you seem too big a pussy to do something like this. But I want you to give me a call if you think of anything you might have forgotten to tell us. Got it? I nodded. Let us know if you see any married ladies missing ten fingers, yeah? Hanover son. I nodded. I got to work late that morning and worked through lunch to try to make up for it. I grabbed a muffin and was unwrapping it when a masked man appeared in a video of three teenagers dropping cherry bombs into soda bottles. My blood went cold. I watched the masked man dismantle the three teens with a sledgehammer before picking up a cherry bomb and approaching one who was trying to crawl away. He lit it, put it in the teen's mouth, and held his lips closed over it. It didn't even make a sound when it went off. It just started leaking smoke out of the nose. The masked man took his hands off the teen's mouth and the lips had turned black. I vomited all over my keyboard. On the third day of Christmas, the meat man gave to me a foot. I woke up and started to get out of bed when I tripped over it. I jumped back and started screaming. Then I called the police. Detectives Wilkes and Hanover came over. When they got there, I showed them up to my bedroom, where the foot was still in the middle of the floor. Think this one's married? Hanover asked. Give it a minute before you start your jokes, would you, Hanover? Wilkes' son. Yes, sir. I will toe the line. Hanover's son. Wilkes rolled his eyes and directed his attention at me. The foot was just on your floor when you woke up. Yeah, like, I'm just finding stuff every morning, I said. So the fingers, and then this foot. Wilk said. Hanover piped him. Like some sort of demented Easter bunny. Well, I said. There was also some meat two days ago, in my freezer. Wilk stared at me for a few seconds. Even Hanover stopped his joking around. You found some strange meat in your freezer the other morning, Hanover said. And you are just now getting around to telling us about it. I hesitated for a second before I answered. I drink, son. So this mystery meat shows up in your freezer, said Hanover. You think, oh, maybe I bought that, brought it home, stuck it in the freezer. All well so drunk I forgot the whole evening. And then when you wake up the next morning and call the police about two whole fucking hands worth of fingers on your fucking doorstep, you don't think to bring it up. Sorry, didn't think of it. I said, I have been getting these horrible videos at work. I just feel like there's too much going on right now. Whoa, said Wilkes. What videos? Where do you work? I told him about my job at America's most hilarious video clips and the videos we had been getting the last few days. Hanover spoke first. And you ain't report this to the police. I did, I said. I reported it to the police. I don't think this stuff is related. It just feels like horrible stuff is happening all around me right now. Wilkes and Hanover looked at each other and then Wilkes said, We're going to want to take a look at those videos. Everyone watched as I walked Wilkes and Hanover through the building to my office. I shut the door and warned them for the 15th time or so that the videos I was about to show them were extremely graphic. And I pulled up the first video with the skateboarder. I walked around behind my desk so I could watch the detectives and didn't have to see the video again. I watched them both flinch, and then I saw Hanover preparing to tell a joke. And then I watched them both shocked into silence. By the time the video ended, they both looked about to be sick. Hanover was the first to speak. You got a few more videos like this? I pulled up the video that Julie had been watching the other day and started it for the detectives. I hadn't actually seen that one, and I didn't plan to. When the video got to the end, Hanover son, You didn't think this was relevant? No, I'm not sure why videos from work would have to do with what is going on at my home. Have you watched all of these videos? Asked Wilkes. I watched most of the first one and the third one. I didn't watch that one. Wilkes clicked the mouse a few times and said, Come on over here. I walked around the computer desk and looked at the screen. 
What I saw made me immediately drop to my knees. Two fists were held close to the camera. Grasped in those fists were ten fingers. On the fourth day of Christmas, Meat Man gave to me skin. I couldn't figure out how he had done it, and neither could Hanover and Wilkes, who stood in my backyard scratching their heads at the abundance of skin draped around every possible surface. Hanover had chewed out the uniforms they had set to watch my house overnight, and they stood sheepishly off to the side, talking quietly to each other. After showing me the fingers in the video yesterday, Wilkes and Hanover had watched the third video and paused it near the end. I looked at the screen and saw a human foot held up for the camera, not attached to any person. I hadn't watched the video that far before. The person who had submitted the videos had just put Meat Man in the name field. I searched for any new video submitted by Meat Man that day and found out one had just come in. I played it for the detectives, but I didn't watch it myself. Standing in my backyard, watching the skin sway in the breeze. I knew that it was in the video from the day before. Wilkes confirmed this to me when he came over and told me they would surround the house with police that night, as well as get some officers inside the house, and then asked me to go to my office with him and Hanover to see if there was a new video today. There was, of course. I didn't watch this one either, but Hanover looked like he was going to vomit. I gathered my team and told them not to open any videos submitted by Meat Man and to call me and the police if any came in. Wilkes and Hanover accompanied me back to my house and stayed there until the officers who would be spending the night arrived. I think they did it as much to rule me out as Meat Man as they did for my protection. On the fifth day of Christmas, Meat Man gave to me a basket full of eyeballs. He waited until no one was watching the front door and then he dropped it off right on the doorstep. The officer who had been assigned to the front door of the house claimed at first that he had only looked down long enough to send a text, but admitted to falling asleep when Hanover glared at him. I brought Wilkes and Hanover back to the office. Joey saw me on the way in and said he had found a video from Meat Man and sent it to me. I thanked Joey and brought the detectives into my office to show them the video. This time, Hanover actually did throw up, pulling a trash can over to himself just in time. That night, they assigned a dozen officers to the outside of the house, and Wilkes and Hanover lectured each one of them on the importance of their vigilance that night. On the sixth day of Christmas, Meat Man gave to me three arms. All right. And I do mean right, arms. Somehow. Meat Man had evaded the security around my house and left them on the kitchen table. Once again... There was a video at work from Meat Man. Hanover didn't watch this one. They doubled the security around my house. On the seventh day of Christmas, Meat Man gave to me five more arms. Not all right. I woke up and felt them in the bed with me and screamed. The two officers inside the house with me burst through the door and immediately started yelling. One yelled at me to back away from the arms. The other yelled into her walkie-talkie for backup. Within minutes... The room was full of police officers, and I was ushered downstairs. When Wilkes and Hanover got there, they just beckoned me to the front door over a crowded room of cops. We went to see that day's video from Meat Man. While Wilkes watched, Hanover told me that the FBI was sending some agents. I spent the rest of the day trying unsuccessfully to distract myself from everything that was happening. On the eighth day of Christmas, Meat Man gave to me an enormous bone tray. He somehow built it in my living room despite the presence of dozens of cops in the neighborhood and six of them inside the house. It was seven feet tall and must have taken him at least an hour to build, not to mention hauling all those bones inside. Well, I had considered this possibility before. This was the first time that I became convinced that Meat Man was some sort of supernatural entity. I pondered whether he had preternatural powers and strength and speed and the ability to turn invisible or fly. Through a crowded room of police, I saw two men in suits walk through the front door. I knew they must have been the FBI agents. They started barking for everyone to leave, so I got up and started walking out with the police. One of the agents stopped me. You the homeowner? He asked. I nodded. You can stay. 
The other one looked around the house and his eyes stopped on the bone tree. He let out a low whistle. Hardy, you gotta see this. Hardy flicked his eyes over to the bone tree, lingered on it for a second, and then moved his eyes back to me. I'm Special Agent Hardy. That spry young man is my partner, Special Agent Sharma. He pointed at the bone tree. This one the latest? Yeah, I said. But the word got caught in my throat. I cleared my throat and tried again. Yeah. Wilkes and Hanover showed up then. And Hardy and Sharma began questioning them about the case. I slipped into the kitchen and opened the freezer to get some breakfast started. The meat from that first day was gone. I briefly recalled Wilkes saying that someone would come get in, but I hadn't thought about it until just now. I had a sudden realization and felt my knees go weak. I walked into the other room. Was it human meat? All four of the men stopped their conversation and looked at me. It was Wilkes who spoke. What meat? From the freezer. I said, that first day, I ate some of that. We're... We're uh, still waiting on those tests to come back. You can tell me. I said, I just want to know. Yeah, said Hanover. It was human. Still waiting to find out who it was. I sat down on the nearest chair. The conversation continued, but I didn't register any of it. I rode with Hardy and Sharma to my office where I showed them the next video. I offered to show them the other videos, but they assured me they had already seen them. Hardy and Sharma brought me back home and told me they'd stay with me there that night. They assured me they would catch Meat Man that night for sure. On the ninth day of Christmas, Meat Man gave to me, Hardy and Sharma, desiccated. They were seated at the kitchen table. Their skin looked smooth as river stones. I called Wilkes and Hanover and told them they'd better get back to my house. And I just sat down on the couch, looking vaguely at the area of the floor where the bone tree had been, until Wilkes and Hanover got there. You just found them at the table like that? Hanover asked. I realized it had been days since I had heard him tell a joke. I almost missed his humor, even inappropriate as it was. I nodded. I suppose we'll see how this happened when we watch the video, said Wilkes. Forensics will be here any minute. We can go as soon as they get here. I don't want to leave this crime scene in the hands of those idiots, Hanover son and jerked his thumb toward the uniform officers who had just arrived at the door. We waited a couple minutes for forensics to arrive and then headed to my office. I started the new video from Meat Man and then stepped back behind the desk. Wilk stopped the video after just a few seconds and looked at me. Were you aware of someone else in your room last night? I shook my head. Look at this for a second, said Hanover. I walked around the desk and looked at the screen. I was in the video, asleep in my bed. You didn't notice anything before you went to sleep. Didn't hear anything, asked Hanover. No, I said, and I hadn't. Wilkes unpaused the video and I watched as the camera was carried around my bed, zooming in on my face a few times before a sledgehammer also came on screen. The sledgehammer was rubbed on my face for a while and then the camera swung around and started going out of the room. It went down the stairs and stalked right up behind Agent Sharma, standing in the kitchen. The sledgehammer flashed down onto Sharma's neck and Sharma slumped to the ground. The cameraman stalked away from the kitchen and to a window where Hardy was peeking out through the blinds. The sledgehammer came into frame and tapped Hardy on the back. Hardy turned around, ready to see Sharma, but the color drained from his face when he saw who was behind him. Hardy opened his mouth to scream but was struck down by the sledgehammer before he could get anything out. The video was only a quarter of the way through but I stopped watching. I had a feeling the rest of the video was Meat Man draining the FBI agents of all the liquids in their bodies and I didn't want to see it or even know how he did it. Wilkes and Hanover brought me back home after they finished the video and left me in the care of about 20 officers in uniform. I stayed on the couch trying to watch movies, but all I could think about was the horrific murders that had happened in the past few days and images of a sledgehammer mangling human bodies. I went to a kitchen and poured a large glass of vodka. On the ninth day of Christmas, 
Meat Man gave to me. Joey's head. I vomited a hot stream of vodka and scrambled out of the bathroom, where I had found Joey's head sitting on the counter by the sink. I got up and ran towards the stairs, half tripping my way down. The police downstairs saw me, and one caught me as I ran. Up there, I choked down. I couldn't say any more. I curled into a corner and started bawling, only stopping to go to the kitchen and mix some vodka with some orange juice and chug it down as fast as I could. I got my breathing under control and poured another one. One of the policemen watched me until Wilkes and Hanover got there. It was Joey, my son. Wilkes, who had been in the middle of saying something, stopped and looked at me. Joey, your co-worker? I nodded. Sorry, man, said Hanover, and placed his hand on my shoulder. We both are, said Wilkes. I should say something at work, my son. We'll take you over, said Wilkes. Obviously, we won't watch today's video with you. Thoughts of what might be on that video flooded my mind and I felt everything I had guzzled that morning come rushing back up. I barely made it to the sink in time. The whole way to the office, I thought about what I would say to the people I worked with. A thought occurred to me. Can the rest of my coworkers get protection? I asked. I worried that if something had happened to Joey, any one of them could be in trouble. We'll have people watching them, said Wilkes. I don't remember much of my speech at the office. I'm sure it was full of platitudes and cliches. I told my team they could take as much time off as they needed and told them they would have police protection. After that, I went home with Wilkes and Hanover, and we got drunk. On the 11th day of Christmas, Meat Man gave to me Wilkes and Hanover. He had smashed them so much they had just made one pile of meat with their heads on top. I didn't know where to turn. I felt numb. I couldn't really comprehend all the things that had happened recently. As bad as things had been, at least Wilkes and Hanover had been there with me the whole way. I stumbled out onto the front porch and waved the nearest police officer. Then I walked back inside and started drinking. Next thing I knew, it was the next morning. On the twelfth day of Christmas, Meat Man gave to me a chair and some ropes he had used to tie me to a chair. I looked up to see myself reflected in a large mirror, tied to a chair and gagged. I pictured Meat Man coming up behind me in that mirror and bashing me to pieces with his sledgehammer. I noticed myself moving in the reflection, struggling against my bonds. I looked down at my hands and saw them still sitting on the arm of the chair, not moving. I looked back up and squinted at myself in the mirror. I didn't squint back. I realized it was not a mirror, but someone who looked exactly like me. The meat man walked up behind my doppelganger, raised his sledgehammer, and brought it down on my doppelganger's head. Meat man kept raising the sledgehammer and bringing it down, again and again. I started to get lightheaded and realized I was screaming into my gag. I couldn't stop screaming. Meat man didn't stop hammering, not until the person had been reduced to nothing but a pile of goo. Then Meat Man brought his face close to mine, removed his mask and showed me his face. I fought the urge to vomit into my gag. A horrible sound came from the rough hole in its face that I suppose must be its mouth. The whole thing looked like it had been sculpted out of ground beef and mottled skin. Mister, said Meat Man. I realized it was laughing. Then he left. Space. An endless scape void of anything except for the occasional mixture of hydrogen and helium held together by gravity. Every so often, you get a clump of rocks that get caught in the gravity, and they start to move in circles around it because that's just how it works. Every so often out of that, one of those clumps of rocks pointlessly rotating around a mixture of gases get caught in just the right place where water can liquefy. And because of laws and science or whatever other bullshit, life occurs. I rolled my eyes. 
preparing for another one of my friend Austin's passionate rants about how arbitrary the concept of life is. Yeah, I replied. Thanks for explaining to me how we're all here. Can I go now? Got class early tomorrow. No, 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 just listen to me, man. What is stopping the idea that life can exist in other forms? Beings adapted to live in any conditions. I mean, we've seen it with the tardigrade. It can survive the vacuum of space. Who is saying a being similar to that nature, and maybe even intelligence, aren't out there somewhere? Laws that humans, who don't know everything, have deemed fact. Answer me that. You sound ridiculous, dude. I said, slinging my backpack over my shoulder and exiting the lab. You know I'm right. Austin called out behind me as I walked away. Ah, sorry. I should probably introduce myself. My name's Carter. I am a 22-year-old college senior, and for the last four years, I've been studying astronomy. Something about space, the unknown, so much to explore and learn. It's always intrigued me. I mean, think about it. We are a tiny blue island in the middle of a massive void, and we don't even know how big it is. Of course, all of this was how I felt before I found out what I know, but we'll get to that in due time. I met Austin during freshman year. When I was looking for roommates, I put that I would prefer someone who is also an astronomy major. And he ended up being my roommate. We became best friends very quickly. Countless late nights talking about the universe and what may be in it. With a mutual passion, we both loved staying out late and looking at planets and stars through our telescope. We also loved staying late to the lab and doing research. Call us nerds, but we loved it. Over the past few months, though, Austin had begun to get obsessed. He started talking about a new energy wave he had discovered. Apparently, if done right, it could be used for travel across the universe in seconds. Opening up wormholes is how he described it. He was convinced that other forms of life had surely discovered this method previously, and he could tap into it. We could hopefully contact these life forms. It began to get odd. He would spend late nights at the lab, barely sleeping. He had bags under his eyes, messy hair, empty Red Bull cans always within an arm's reach of him. I just need to be able to find where it's coming from, he would always say. How do you even know this energy wave even exists? How did you find it? I asked him one day. It's too hard to explain to you now, but you have to believe me. Trust me, it's there. I will prove to you that there is life out there in the universe, and it's causing it. I will find it, he replied. I rolled my eyes and left him to his pointless tinkering. I was beginning to lose my friend. He had gone mad. It was sad, but at the same time, I couldn't let it put a stop to my life. I had to quit worrying about him, and just hope that one day he'd come to his senses and give it up. Last week, however, at 2 a.m., I received a call. It was from Austin. I answered it, wiping the tiredness from my eyes. Hello? I asked into the phone. Get over here now, dude. I did it. I found a way to detect it. If I can prove it to you. Get over here now. He yelled ecstatically. What? Okay, I'm on my way. I'll be there in ten minutes. I replied, throwing my clothes on and rushing to my car. On the drive over there... I wasn't even sure what to think. Had he really done what he'd been trying to do? Had all of this madness not been madness after all? I was still very skeptical, but the thoughts itched in the back of my mind. I pulled into the parking lot of the lab and called Austin. I'm here. Where are you? I asked. Okay, great. I'm coming to let you in. A few seconds later, I saw Austin shove the door open and wave at me to come inside. I got out of my car and started walking up to him. Hurry up, man. You need to see this. I did it. He yelled. Shh. Keep your voice down. I said. I don't want campus police pulling up on us. I'm pretty sure we're not even supposed to be here. We got inside, and once the door closed, I finally asked. Now what exactly did you do? He was vibrating with excitement. You know that energy wave I've been trying to find? Trace to its source? discover life? Well, I found a way to do it. I found a way to trace it back. I was puzzled. What? 
How? I replied. I'll show you. Follow me. We rushed downstairs to the lab and when I walked through the door, the biggest contraption I had ever seen was filling the entire room. It was a massive glass tube circling the perimeter of the room and in the center was a laptop hooked up to a massive computer. What the hell is this? I asked. This, this my friend, is what I've been keeping secret for so long. I've made my very own particle accelerator. I've been keeping it a secret because I know if you or any of my professors found out, they would force me to stop, but I've done it. How it works is I have a bending magnet on one end, and at the other end is a focusing magnet. When the electricity is flipped on, the atoms begin to hurl towards each other and collide with each other. Not bad physics for an astronomy major, huh? I was astonished. How had he done all of this? Where had he assembled in? How did he get in the lab? This was ridiculous, and none of it made sense. And he was right. He was an astronomy major. Where did he learn all the highly advanced physics needed to even think of something like this? It was quite easy, really. I did some research, and I learned all you needed is an electric field and magnets to focus those fields. Um, was all I could get out. I had so many questions, but I was too dumbfounded to ask them. The only one I got out was, why? He smirked. This is where a little luck comes into play. You know the theory of the Higgs boson, right? Well, this new energy wave is in the Higgs field. What we do is we throw the particles at each other. When they collide, we only have a small window to completely shut off the contraption. What this will do is interrupt the collision, and if the Higgs boson is formed, it will transcend it into a lower energy state. When one Higgs boson does this, it causes a reaction where other Higgs bosons possibly create. This is that energy I've been trying to prove. The Higgs boson is what gives mass to everything, right? So when transcended into a lower energy state, it takes away the mass. What I've been trying to prove has literally been anti-mass in a sense. My head was swirling with one million thoughts a second. Anti-mass. Higgs bosons. What? How the hell had he figured all of this out? He continued. I know I've proved it because I've done it once. I tested it myself and it worked. Only for a split second though. I couldn't see shit, but I'm telling you. Something's out there causing this. I just know it. And I'm going to find out what it is. We aren't the only ones in the universe and surely some other life form has discovered this. I know it. And if I can do it right, I'll be able to contact them. Are you with me? He asked. I don't know what to say, man. This is all insane. What exactly do you plan to do even if you are right? I just need to know I'm not insane. Now again, are you with me? He asked. I shook my head. I guess. What exactly do we have to do? He immediately went to the laptop. He started typing in a few things and then looked at me. When I pressed this button... The particle accelerator is going to turn on, and we're going to count to 10. Right at 10 seconds? I want you to go to the wall over there and unplug the two power cords you see in there, okay? Tell me right before you do it, and I will halt the acceleration at the same time. This should cause the reaction I'm looking for. What happens after that? I guess we'll have to find out. Are you ready? No. I said. Austin laughed. Neither am I. He said. But let's do this. I walked over to the power cord and waited for him to start it up. He pressed the button. The accelerator started up. A small humming noise could be heard throughout the room. It actually worked. I was amazed. He wasn't kidding. Right at that moment he started counting down from ten, I began to get ready. Three, two, one. He pulled the cords out as hard as I could. And right as I did, I saw Austin slam the keyboard of the laptop. In a split second, the power shut off and the glass tube circling the room shattered. The portal ripped open and began shaking the room violently. It was swirling around the edges and paper was flying everywhere. I tried my best to see what was on the other side, but shattered glass and paper were flying all over the room and I had to cover my face. I could see stars. Space, I thought. Through muffled vision, 
and loud, chaotic noise. I heard Austin scream. Austin, are you okay? I yelled, but I got no reply. I then began to see a massive hand the size of the room itself extend out from the portal. It was no human hand. Far too gargantuan and jet black. Each finger was the size of me. I saw it slowly come through the portal and wrap itself around Austin. Austin was crying out in fear. I watched as it slowly pulled him back into the portal and closed it behind him. The last thing I heard was Austin screaming, but his screams being drowned out by the void of space screaming back. The portal swirled violently until it abruptly disappeared. I was left there alone. The room in shambles and the power out. I was hyperventilating. I frantically looked around the room, hoping to see Austin, praying that the entire thing was a hallucination. I then began to hear sirens outside. That was last week. I was questioned by the police and I could barely even tell them what happened. They walked in and saw the room in shambles and me sitting there, a panicked mess. I was of course arrested and am now facing obstruction of property charges and mentally ill since the story I told them was obviously very unbelievable. I was expelled and now have to pay back the damage done to the lab. I'm typing this out now because no one believes me and I'm hoping that you all on here will. I've tried to explain it to my parents but they just shake their heads in disappointment. The only thing no one can seem to explain, though, is the disappearance of Austin. The police started an investigation, and of course, I'm their primary suspect. Austin died trying to prove what he believed in. I thought he was crazy, but in reality, he was right. I know what happened to him. He was taken by whatever that thing on the other side of the portal was. I never saw its face, but I know Austin did. The brief moments I was able to catch a glance of him... He was wearing the most horrified face I'd ever seen on a person. I'm not sure how I will mentally recover from all this. All I can say is after my encounter, I now know there are things in the universe that are simply meant to be left alone. If humanity goes knocking on doors it shouldn't be, how long until something knocks back? I've seen what exists in our universe. It took my friend. There are things we don't understand and weren't meant to understand. Maybe it should stay that way. I had woken up for work at around 8 p.m., like the night prior. It was going to be another long night on patrol. They typically were, as I was from a small town in Minnesota. These shifts were almost always dull and uneventful, aside from the occasional noise complaint or traffic violation. Other than that, the only thing that kept me busy was Netflix and keeping the snow from piling up on the squad car. I often brought a thermos full of hot coffee to keep me awake and to keep my hands warm. I dozed off once, and the sergeant hasn't forgotten about it since. I'm now known as Dreamy, or Bedhead, at the station and the daily reminder from the sergeant to get a full night's rest before heading out for the night. That night was no different, and I was greeted by a playful banter from the other officers. Before I knew it, I was sitting in the patrol car, ready to start the night off. That January night had marked my third year with the Zimmerman PD. Although it only felt like I just got there, I loved every part of the job, and especially appreciated the location. Growing up in West St. Paul was cramped, dirty, and even dangerous at times. I was extremely lucky to secure an interview with this department, and had no problem moving from the city to farm country. Zimmerman is big enough to have its own PD, but just big enough that everyone knows each other. Strangers were very quickly turned to friends. My name was known by every face in Zimmerman. Before I memorized my address, I was overjoyed to find a community as friendly as this one which is something city slickers like myself don't see very often. The shift started about as expected, little to no activity for the first few hours, aside from the radio chatter and the constant uphill battle with the snowfall. I remember at exactly 12.34 I heard another officer request for backup. He was only a couple blocks down the road from me, so I radioed in and made my way towards him. It led me to one of the many rundown barns in town, which was very odd given the hour. I spotted the other patrol car parked along the side of the road, so I pulled in behind it. The snowfall was so thick, 
that I could hardly see the car in front of me, even with my brights on. I assumed the officer was waiting for me in his car, so I grabbed my torch and hopped out to greet him. As soon as I stepped out, I was greeted by the heavy snowfall which proceeded to make things so much more difficult. I switched on my light, which surprisingly did a better job than my headlights. But as soon as it turned on, my stomach churned. Beyond the car, and through one of the many smashed windows of the barn, was a face that I will never forget. My body froze. This person in the window looked like something straight out of a horror film. Her face was heavily contorted, her jaw fixated outward and opened wide. Her skin was pale and snow white, so much that it seemed like makeup. Most disturbingly was her eyes. Well, she didn't have any. Instead, there were two craters where they would have been. After what seemed like minutes of me being frozen in fear, my radio goes off at a full volume. It was the officer who had requested for backup. Still waiting on that backup for the civil dispute. The woman let out the most disturbing scream I've ever heard. I ducked behind my vehicle and scrambled from my gun. My heart was pounding out of my chest. I was genuinely terrified. It was a type of fear and dread that I had never felt before. I wanted to be literally anywhere but there, but I couldn't. This woman was either in distress or unsafe for the public. There could be anything in that barn, and the last thing I wanted to do was to find out. But I swore an oath and could not break in. I gained the courage to peek over at the window, and what I saw still gives me chills writing this. The woman was gone, but on the wall behind her were about four sets of severed hands dangling from the ceiling. To make things worse, the hands were small, too small for an adult. Those hands belonged to children. I radioed for immediate backup, frantically drawing my gun from my holster. I came out from the car and kept my gun pointed at the window. I couldn't make any moves until the others arrived, and I didn't want to either. At that moment, I heard the same scream from before, but this time it came from much closer. My light snapped towards the direction of the scream, and there she was, about 20 feet from where I was standing. This time, I could see her entire body, and I really wish I hadn't. She was wearing nothing, completely naked. She was extremely malnourished. It looked as if she hadn't eaten in weeks. Her skin looked like it was stretched thin all over her body, so thin that I could clearly see places where it began to rip and tear. Her fingers and toes were black from frostbite. She was freakishly contorted, grunting with each step she took. It sounded like an animal's growl. I had enough. I scrambled through the passenger side and hopped over to the driver's seat. I let out an audible sigh of relief when it started in one go. I slammed on the gas and backed out of that dirt road quicker than any speeding violation I've given. I radioed in a possible homicide and mental patient and drove straight to the station. I didn't care. I could hardly drive straight with all the adrenaline pumping. The last thing I needed was to go back there. Once I pulled into the station, I sprinted inside and collapsed into the nearest chair I saw. Call me dramatic, but I had never felt more happy to be in that old building. I don't remember much from that night, only that I blacked out soon after probably from all the adrenaline finally leaving and the initial shock. I woke up a few hours afterwards on a cot in the sergeant's office. To my surprise, he handed me a cup of water and a blanket. He sat down in his chair and explained everything to me. The other officers arrived soon after I left, around four of them. The woman had seemingly disappeared, but they found something much more sinister in that barn. Inside the barn were the dismembered bodies of four children who went missing a few weeks ago in a neighboring town. They were all hanging from the ceiling, similar to the hands. Their heads were arranged across the floor in a diamond pattern. All four of the heads were missing their eyes, and their jaws were forced open wide. As soon as he mentioned the heads, I felt nauseous. Their faces were deformed, much like that woman's. My heart sank further when he said they never were able to locate the woman. I went home early that night and didn't get a wink of sleep. Thankfully... I haven't worked a graveyard shift since then, and that was five years ago. The barn has since been destroyed, where three more bodies were discovered under the floorboards. They also had their faces deformed, and only predated the other by about a year. The thing that bothers me the most, however, is that the woman was never found, only breadcrumbs. The only physical evidence we have is my dash cam footage, but I know what I saw that night. Something that I haven't been able to overcome, 
and still gives me sleepless nights to this day. For the record, I loved my grandfather. Growing up, he was always the one willing to watch me on the weekends or take me out somewhere fun. He was a phenomenal storyteller. He was the one who taught me to drive. He was even the one who bought me my first beer. So that's why I admit I'm an asshole for not wanting to take care of him now. I know it's selfish, and after all he had done for me growing up, it only seemed fair. I think my resentment came from the fact that no one else in my family was in a situation to take care of him. Between myself, a couple of deadbeat uncles and aunts, my own separated parents that I hadn't spoken to in years, the list of potential caretakers gets narrowed down really quick. Financially, I could take care of him, although it meant life would be tight. With that in mind, I made a few moves to try to accommodate to include transferring jobs and moving to a new town. That's why I bought the house. It made sense at the time. Plenty of space for my grandfather and I. Fairly close to my work, and it was a steal for how the market was then. The house was old, built in the 60s. The architecture was wonky and the floor plan was all over the place. And it just oozed the dumpster fire that was 60s interior decoration. We're talking shag carpets, a weird hodgepodge of vinyl and linoleum flooring, earth love wallpaper, the works. The upstairs was odd. When you reached the top of the staircase, you came to one end of a long hallway. Along the left side were four bedrooms. The first two were in pretty good condition. The last two looked like they had not been used or updated in 50 years. Along the walls between the doorways were floor-to-ceiling bookshelves filled with old books. The dust jackets read titles like Gulliver's Travels, Tom Sawyer, things like that. Not really my preferred genre, but I knew that was my grandfather's bread and butter, so I left them in case he wanted to read them. I took the first floor as my own. I put my grandfather in the second. He wasn't infirmed and he didn't have a problem with the stairs. Really, all he did from me was tracking his daily pills. It was the usual elderly people cocktail. Sleeping pills, arthritis, etc. But I figured I should still be next door in case he needed help. The third room I planned on turning into an office for myself, but it sort of just became a cluttered storage room for my old junk. The fourth, I left empty. My grandfather liked to write. When I mentioned he was a phenomenal storyteller... That was because he did it for a living. He wrote books, and even though many never got published, that never discouraged him from plugging away late at night on his obnoxiously loud typewriter. That's what he did all day, every day, while I was at work. I'd sometimes come up to his room when I got home, and only then he would realize what time it was. Money was tight, like I mentioned before. And soon after moving in, I got the bright idea to rent out a room. In fact, I didn't really need that office either, so I actually had two rooms for rent. I grabbed my stuff from the first room and managed to cram it all into the third. I figured I'd have an easier time renting out the nicer first room, which needed less work to be appealing. I got started with renovations soon after moving rooms. That's when I found the first warning. The first thing I did in the first room was pull up the old carpet after only getting the first couple of square feet up, I found a message scratched into the wood underneath. The message was a warning, and it was written dozens and dozens of time into the flooring. Don't use the fifth room. What the fuck? Instinctively, I assumed it was just a prank. Honestly, I wouldn't put it past my younger self to do something similar in the name of some old-fashioned spookiness. Nevertheless... I decided not to tell my grandfather about it. The new carpet was installed, I painted the walls, and the room was done. I moved my grandfather into the fourth room. He volunteered. He didn't need a lot of space and the second room would be easier to fix up and get a renter into more quickly. Once he was settled in the fourth, I began the same renovations I did with the first. That's when I saw the warning again. Don't use 
the fifth room. It was everywhere. The warning scratched frantically all over the flooring of the second room. The phrase overlapped itself over and over, and as I examined the marks, I got the sickening feeling that it had been done with fingernails. There were stains, too. Dark brown and all over. Alarmed, I ran into the hall and, like a child, I started at the first room and counted down the hall. One, two, three, four. Okay, I wasn't crazy. But because I was thoroughly freaked out, I went to the end of the hall by the fourth room. I could hear my grandfather in there, his typewriter chugging away, like an idiot. I examined the wall adjacent to the fourth room's door, as if I'd magically find a door I somehow missed before. Of course, there was nothing. Huffing to myself, I again brushed it all away, shaming myself for getting scared so easily. I covered the warnings and finished the second room. That night, I was woken up by thumping coming from the wall adjacent to the fourth room, where my grandfather was sleeping. It was rhythmic and loud. I didn't hear his typewriter either. Just a loud thump, 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 thump. I got out of bed and went to his door. I called out first. Hey, Grandpa, is everything okay? Silence. Can I come in? Silence again. I hesitated for a second before cracking the door open, but when I looked in, I saw my grandfather lying in bed asleep. His chest was rising and falling and I could hear him snoring. I waited a moment, watching him, before I decided I'd go back to sleep. As soon as I laid back down, I heard his typewriter going off. I almost felt like he had timed it. It wasn't slow to start, too. I heard him typing furiously, loud and chugging. I could hear him almost slamming the carriage in place over and over. I was afraid he was having some sort of insomnia-induced episode. I ran out of bed and started knocking frantically at his door. Still no response, so I tried to open the door. It was locked. Hey, Grandpa, let me in. Come on, what's going on in there? Still met with only the abusive sounds of his typewriter, I tried the door again and again. Fuck. I wasn't a nurse. I didn't know how to deal with this shit. Grandpa was exceptionally healthy for someone his age. This didn't make sense. The keys to the room were somewhere downstairs. I ran down, also figuring I could grab his meds and find something that could help. I started fumbling around in the kitchen drawers. That's when I heard a door slam and running feet. I jumped and turned, but then heard another door upstairs slam, followed by silence. This time I didn't call out. Instead, I decided to creep up the stairs slowly. When I got to the top, I was met only by the hall, pitch dark, and all the bedroom doors closed. Several of the books had fallen from the shelves and were scattered across the floor. One was lying at my feet. For some reason, I decided to pick it up and open it. The dust jacket had fallen off, but when I opened it, I realized it wasn't a book. The pages had no printed text, but were filled with a warning written over and over from top to bottom of every page. Don't use the fifth room. No fucking way. With a growing sense of dread, I grabbed another off the shelf, then another and another. All were the same. Each one was in different handwriting, but all had the same message. Don't use the fifth room. I placed the book down on the shelf, and... With a sudden, unexplainable weight on my ankles, I made my way down the hall. I tried each door, one after another. One, two, three, four. Each one was locked, until I got to the fourth. The door opened without force, and I stepped into the room. It was how it always looked, but my grandfather's typewriter looked like it had been beaten to death. Sheets and sheets of paper were piled high next to it, and one was still in the paper rest. A request this time, repeated across the page. Let me out. It was written over and over, on hundreds of pages piled on his desk. I wondered how long it had taken him to do this, all those nights of hearing him typing. A rock hit the pit of my stomach as a realization came over me. 
I grabbed the shag carpet at the edge of the floor and pulled. The old stitchings tore from the tack strips with ease, and underneath I saw the same request. Crisscrossing, repeated over and over, scratched into the floor with feverish claw marks. Let me out. Let me out. Fuck this, I thought. I had to find my grandfather. I stepped out into the hall and tried all the doors again. All were still locked. After getting to the first and finding it still locked, I pounded my fist on the door. Damn it, Grandpa, let me in. There's some crazy shit going on and... I've got to get us out of here. A book on the shelf to my left fell and landed on the floor with the pages open. Don't use the fifth room. I looked at the shelf and saw the books packed into it. So many warnings. I grabbed another book and pulled it down. Then another and another, letting them fall to the ground. Their cryptic warning yelling at me to not do something I hadn't done. I know I didn't use the fifth room, but that's when I saw it. After pulling more and more books off the shelf, I could finally see behind the shelf to the wall behind it, only it wasn't a wall. It was a door, a door to the actual first room. Fuck. Fuck. I turned and counted, again like a child, never wanting to be incorrect so badly as I did then. Five rooms. I counted them another three times. The panic set in, the rock in my stomach turning into a knot, coiling around itself over and over. I pulled the shelf away from the wall until I made a gap wide enough for the door to open. The doorknob turned, it wasn't locked, and revealed a room covered in dust. It looked barely used. I heard another door slam. I turned and looked down the hall, barely able to make out my grandfather in the dark, standing there, staring. Grandpa? Hey, where were you? Are you okay? Silence. Come on, some crazy shit is going on. I don't know what, but we need to get out of here now. He stepped towards me. I still couldn't make him out clearly, but his hands glistened in the dark. And they were dripping onto the floor, making dark stains in the wood. Grandpa, what? He ran straight at me. I barely had time to think before I felt an impossibly strong, vice-like grip wrap around my neck and shut the air off to my lungs completely. Between the dark, the panic, and the lack of air, I could barely see anything. And I swear that must be the reason why his face looked the way it did. His features were there, but strained like he was fighting with every muscle in his body. Then there were his eyes. They were gone. Not like they had been torn out or were bloody wounds. Where his eyes were, there were now black holes surrounded by scratches. It looked as though something had clawed and scratched its way into his eyes, but with no blood and no torn flesh leaving just dark caverns behind. That was all I saw before I felt myself lifted into the air and carried down the hall. My breath was cut off absolutely, and I couldn't see anymore, but I knew where he was taking me. I kicked and punched, but it had no effect, and in the dark it felt like he was eight feet tall. I felt a stop in front of the fifth room. Still clinging to consciousness, I could hear him open the door with his other hand and walk in. In the dark, he just stood there, and I must have passed out for a moment because in the pitch darkness, indistinguishable from unconsciousness, I heard voices. So many voices, whispering the same thing, almost as if they were speaking directly into my ears. Let me out. Over and over again. Consciousness rushed back into my head, and the rush hurt so bad I had to squint. I looked up, realizing my grandfather had loosened his grip. His non-eyes were squeezed shut in pain and he was shaking his head back and forth as if trying to throw something off. Finally, he stopped and opened his eyes. They were there again, but his face was still strained in pain. He looked at me, then without warning shoved me out the door into the hall. Lock the door. That was the last thing he said to me before he slammed the door shut. I heard a titanic crash as if some massive object slammed into the door on the other side. 
I fumbled for the key in my pocket, hands shaking as I locked the door as quickly as I could. I heard more slamming, and I swear I heard multiple voices on the other side, all screaming to be let out. As I backed away from the door, the voices and the slamming stopped, and were replaced with one sound. Thump, thump, thump. I spent the next three days in a motel room on the other side of town. I didn't leave once, hating myself for not trying to get my grandfather out and leaving him behind, simultaneously hating myself further for not going back for him. I couldn't even bring myself to call the cops. What would I say? Nothing made sense or was believable. I'd sound like a crackhead more than anything else. On the third day, I finally went back. The house was unchanged, exactly how I left it. When I went inside, I stood at the door for a minute, somehow thinking I would hear another door slam or running feet, but no. Just silence. I went upstairs and everything was right where they had been left that night. The doors were all open, and the first three rooms were exactly how I had left them. All was the same, except for the books. They had all been meticulously placed back on the shelves, and the real first room had been covered back up. And then the fifth room. The fifth room was empty. All my grandfather's belongings were gone. The carpet I had pulled up was put back in place. His typewriter, the papers, everything. There was even a layer of dust on the floor. I decided not to walk through the door. I shut it and left the house. Grandpa. If somehow you're alive and reading this, I'm so sorry for what happened. I've thought about this for a while now and I know what I have to do. I stopped by the gas station on the way here and I'm currently standing outside the house with 12 gallons worth of gas cans in my trunk. I hope this will permanently fix whatever it is that's wrong with this house. But as I stand here now, I somehow get the feeling I'm not the first person to have stood here thinking they can burn this house down and the fifth room for good. If I leave after this and somehow someone else comes across this house like nothing happened, I just have one piece of advice. Don't use the fifth room. My dad went missing four months ago. At first, there was not the slightest bit of worry in my mind. It was dad. Things like these weren't exactly unusual. Not with him. More often than not, he was simply unreachable. He would disappear for months at a time, with no phone number to call or address to visit. This was no different. I'd quickly change my voicemail to a message indicating that no, I did not know where dad was after receiving multiple alarmed calls from his co-workers, who were not as laid back as I was on the matter. At some point, due to the constant inflow of calls, I had to turn off my phone. Clearly, even though I had told him to stop, he shared my phone number to a bunch of random people again, telling them that if he was unavailable, I could be of help. I can't say I really had a good relationship with him. He was my janitor. But that was it. That might be why I wasn't concerned about his disappearance. More than just being used to it, I think I was relieved. In a way, I wouldn't have to deal with him for a few months. Wouldn't have to pretend to be interested in his crazy stories. If it wasn't for my mother, I would have just told him off. She was the only reason why I didn't cut ties altogether. So, he was gone. Great, right? Apart from dealing with a bunch of pesky phone calls... I would have peace and quiet for a few months. Fortunately, that was true for the most part. Until I received a text from my brother, Isaiah, two weeks ago. Found something. Might interest you. Meet at Dad's? I was puzzled. Maybe a bit intrigued. Mostly though, I wanted to know what was up. I called him. What is it? I asked not bothering with the formalities. He stayed silent until he just said, sounding unusually quiet, I think you're going to have to see it for yourself. 
this was enough to convince me. Okay, I'll see you there. I hung up. I guess I was mostly curious. I also knew that Isaiah wouldn't call me for no reason. If he thought I should see something, then I had to. He knew better than to bother me with banal things. I got on my bike and rode there. When I arrived, I noticed the front door was wide open. No trace of my brother or his bike. Strange. I approached the house. Hello? I called in. I was immediately hit by the stench of rotting food. Yuck. I can see why you left the door open. I called in again jokingly. Isaiah emerged from one of the rooms down the hall. You haven't seen the worst of it. He said. I set foot on the wooden floor despite the horrid smell. I knew my brother wanted to show me something, but I decided a little exploration wouldn't hurt anyone. I first entered the kitchen. The putrid smell of rotting food grabbed me by the throat. As I took a look around, I noticed the half-eaten sandwich on the table. Was Dad in a hurry when he left? Surely if he'd known he would be away for so long, he would have cleared out his perishables. I made a mental note of this as I thought it might be interesting to discuss with my brother. In the meantime, we had to take care of this. Hey, I said, loudly enough for my brother to hear. Whatever he was up to. Should we clear out this food before it gets any worse? I continued, grabbing a garbage bag, though I was reluctant to pick up the rotting items. Yeah, sure. Come see this when you've finished. His voice resonated in the hallway. Great. I muttered before getting to it. Eventually, I filled the bag and opened the windows to let in some air. I don't think I actually wanted to help Dad out at the time. I just didn't want this foul smell clinging to my clothing. I took the trash out and finally joined my brother. I found him sitting on the floor of what might have been a bedroom. Piles of paper scattered all around him. He was reading a journal so focused on its contents that he hadn't even noticed me. Dad's journal? I asked, settling down next to him, while making sure I didn't accidentally crush one of the sheets of paper on the ground. He looked at me, startled. Ah, uh, yeah. Check this out. He said, passing the worn-out notebook to me. I flipped through the pages. At first, it wasn't anything new or particularly interesting, Discoveries he made throughout his career, blah, blah, blah. Then, Isaiah pointed me to a recent passage, dating from a month before his disappearance. I made a discovery. It read, Now that was interesting. I'm sure you can guess what it was. I mean, haven't you read the title? My dad discovered immortality, but as I was about to discover... It wasn't all unicorns and rainbows and forever 25. No, because when you try to defy the laws of nature, nature strikes back. Let's just say it didn't miss my dad. Apparently, he had been working on it for years. A lifelong dream. A serum that would, when administered, freeze a person in time so they would not age or deteriorate. Simply be forever. Or at least until they were killed. Immortality is one thing, invincibility is another. Eventually, well, eventually it worked. He had been testing on baby mice, and that day, they stopped growing. A week after he gave it to them, they still hadn't changed. Not noticeably so. Now that made my dad really, and I say really ambitious. It had worked. He didn't bother to check on the mice more than he had to. He didn't bother to keep them alive long enough to observe the long-term effects. He was so content, so full of himself, and that blinded him. So, he moved on to human testing. That's when it backfired. Horribly. Technically, the testing shouldn't have been very conclusive as these people were adults, and watching an adult age is, well, a lengthy process. He simply told the subjects to come in for a monthly checkup, and to call him if anything went wrong. As you might expect, something went wrong. It hadn't even been two months when he got calls from the subjects, almost at the same time. They all complained about the same symptoms. Fatigue, 
loss of strength, dry skin. My father told them to come in first thing in the morning, and when they did, they were worse. They weren't just rapidly aging, they were decaying. No, after this, the details grew scarce. I think my dad was ashamed and with good reason. I don't know exactly what happened, but it didn't end well for the test subjects. Their body decayed, but they stayed alive. And that was the worst part of it. Forced to suffer through their own demise. Can you imagine that? I guess in its own way the drug still worked. They simply couldn't die. Not from their own body, at least. My dad had to euthanize them. He couldn't let them go on like this. He gave them relief, but he felt horribly guilty for it. For everything, from his ambitious idea to his administering the serum without making sure it was safe. That very same guilt is the one that brings us to the events after my reading of the journal. I had read through it all, and I couldn't get rid of this sinking feeling in my throat. However much I tried to calm down, I felt sick. The foul smell of the house wasn't helping. I had to get out. It was like I was suffocating. And although I couldn't see Isaiah, I'm sure he felt the same. The fresh air helped me calm down a bit, but my chest felt heavy and I was tearing up. I clenched my fist tight, tight enough to fight against every bone in my body screaming at me to run far, far away from this place. I had to go in. My head was spinning. I don't know if Isaiah was still in the house. I didn't see him and I sure wouldn't dare ask. I entered the building, walking decisively, hands still shaking. The realization that what I was smelling was not rotten food, although it had definitely contributed to the stench. I walked one foot after the other, and finally, I reached the last door on the right. I put my hand on the doorknob, hoping to God that I was wrong and that what I'd read wasn't true, but I knew it was. I gently opened the door. All the tension in my body suddenly dropped as I laid my eyes upon the horrid scene. My brain simply observed the decaying body in front of me, almost uninterestedly. My dad, or rather, what was left of him was laying there, as if he'd waited for the serum to take effect and hadn't moved since, waiting for his demise, but one that would surely never come. I called for Isaiah. He didn't answer. I didn't want to spend one more minute in this house so I can understand his leaving. I did what I had to do. The only thing I could do, really. I burned the house. I certainly wasn't about to carry his carcass outside. I knew he was still alive, but I hope he doesn't blame me. Wherever he is, maybe he felt some sort of relief. I ended his suffering, after all. Isaiah joined me soon after I set fire to the house. I don't know where he went, and I didn't ask. We simply watched as the blaze grew and grew, and I ended up calling the fire department when I was sure there was no way of retrieving anything inside. As I'm writing this, to the night after his memorial service, we told everyone the same thing. We were concerned and decided to pay him a visit, and we found the house on fire. Do you know how exhausting lying is? Having to repeat the same fabricated tale, never to make the truth known. I think that's what prompted me to write this on Reddit. I had to tell someone. So, thank you. Really. I feel much better now. It has barely been two weeks since the incident, but I think I can put it behind me. Or at least, not think about it all the time. Thank you. I never truly understood what fear is or what it really means, along with similar words like scary, creepy, unsettling, horrifying, eerie, any word associated with fear you could think of. So the best I could do to get an idea of what it might be is trying to relate it with my other emotions, which unsurprisingly left me confused more than anything. In case you don't know, it's a very rare disease called urbach wythe disease. Which, according to my parents, I've had it at a young age. To this day, I'm not exactly sure if it's a good or a bad thing. 
For instance, when people describe me to what their fears are, like the fear of spiders, heights, ocean, or anything alike, I just don't get it. I recall a time in elementary school where there was a huge cockroach that appeared out of nowhere and everyone was scared of it, even the teacher, and distanced themselves from it as much as they could. But for my case, I casually approached it for a lack of a better term. I stared at it, even touched it. The entire class expressed their disgust in unison and begged me to stomp it, and so I did. Then I went on to be the school hero for the entire semester. When it comes to the not-so-good part of it, though, one time I was crossing a street and for some reason decided to stand in the middle of the street to check my vibrating phone. After I put it back in my pocket, I saw a speeding car in the distance and I just stood there not because I was shocked, but because I didn't feel the need to. And before the horning car hit me by a few seconds, my friend pulled me back to the sidewalk. They were all furious about it, but they all knew deep down they couldn't entirely blame me for a condition I've had my whole life. There were other instances where we would go watch a horror movie, with me never being scared, never even flinching which made horror movies pretty darn boring to say the least. Same was with exploring supposedly haunted places, always starting with me going in first. Then they would slowly follow me one by one, and then it always ends with us laughing. Remember, I can pretty much feel everything except fear. There came a point in my life, I started thinking about my condition and started asking all sorts of questions. I wanted to know what is this feeling that everyone got to experience except me, and a few on earth you can count by hand. And so I started searching on the internet everywhere for anything scary or of such nature. The result was always me being bored to death, so I began searching in more dark places that had horrific shit. But I ended up just feeling disgusted by what I saw, but never saw anything synonymous with fear. After doing that on repeat for weeks on end, I was never satisfied and ended up being a little depressed. A lack of emotion that I can't experience even in my dreams. Then two months ago, while I was walking back home from school, I took a glance at the big abandoned old house that's about two blocks away from me. I took a good look at it and never recalled me and my friends exploring it. So instead of going home, I decided to go explore it just for the sake and fun of it, never expecting something and my hopes weren't up at all. After a few minutes of walking, I arrive at the cliche big black door from the horror movies. I chuckle a bit and open the door slowly. After putting a tiny bit more of effort to open the door fully, I was greeted by darkness, save for the light coming from the setting sun behind me. After closing the door, it was then pitch black darkness. I turn on my phone's flashlight and begin exploring the house. The first thing I've noticed is that all the windows in the house were boarded up, which explains why there was absolutely no light coming from anywhere else. The kitchen was ordinary, just like what you would see in every suburban home. It was empty except for two rusty cooking pots on the stove. I took a look inside them, but there was nothing. The living room was boring too, with rotting sofas sat around a TV counter where the TV should be. I kept walking around until I found what seemed to be the bathroom. I tried opening the door, but it wouldn't budge. Then I took a look at the time on my phone, and it was getting late. And I thought about going home, but then I remembered there was an entire second floor that I didn't explore yet. This is so cliche. It was what I thought to myself at that moment, but I still went up the stairs anyway. But, as for someone who's born with a more or less luxury of not feeling fear... I still wish to this day I hadn't went up these steps. There were two rooms in the hallway, one for the kids and one for the parents. I picked a room at random and when I tried to open the door, I noticed it was open to begin with. As I pushed the door, a wave of overwhelming stench punched me right in the face. As I take more steps forward into the room with my fingers pinching my nose at this point, I see a couple sat up on their bed, holding hands their heads missing. I come closer to take a better look. It seemed that they still had their necks. They looked like those mannequins you would see in a fashion store, only not standing and not made of plastic. The bed was pretty much entirely covered in dried blood. 
The whole room was in disarray and the walls seemed to be covered in some kind of fungus. I suppose at this point, any sane person would just get the hell out of there. But I took a risk. I thought maybe this is the moment I have been craving my whole life. And before leaving into the room across the hallway, I hear what sounded like moving of old bones and rotten flesh. I turn around and notice something. It seemed like at first glance nothing happened, but as I stare more at the headless bodies, I couldn't help but feel like their necks were now facing me. Now in front of the kids room, it took a few seconds to get the door to budge. I push the door and enter. The walls of the room were covered in wallpaper of some cartoon characters. It had one small bed, one counter beside it, and a closet in front of the bed. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary and the room seemed to be in a better state than the rest of the whole house. I walk up to the closet and open it and a familiar overwhelming stench floods the room. On the closet floor, there was a lifeless, limp little girl's body, her eyes facing the ground and in her hand she held a small music box. I took the music box and started playing it. After it finished playing, I take a look at the girl's face but something's changed. Her eyes are now fixated at me. I thought I was imagining it at first, but when I moved side to side, it kept following me, never moving her head. Then I look to my right, into the hallway, and I see at the other end, the headless couple standing there, still holding hands. They didn't need a head for me to be able to tell they were looking at me. I look back at the girl. She was now sat up and no longer in a lifeless limp. At this moment... I could feel my entire body urging me to run away and escape this. My body was trembling and shaking and I felt like what seemed to be goosebumps. And to me that was an entirely new experience. Alas, that was the closest I've ever gotten to feeling fear. I started sprinting out of the room, turning up the stairs. The couple were to my right shoulder, turning to me as if they were floating. Not sure if this was luck or if they let me go. The front door was quick to open and after I step outside... I breathed the most refreshing air of my life. I turned around to close the door behind me, but before I did, I aimed my phone's flashlight at the second floor. They were all there now, standing close together, all looking at me, the little girl holding the music box from earlier, grinning with her few grown teeth. I slammed the door shut, then run back home. My mom was infuriated with me, but her annoyed expression faded away very quickly when she saw mine all shaky, which I would imagine would be shocking to her. While not being scared, I sure as hell seem so. She then slowly dismisses me, and I go to my room. I was tired from all this, so I decided to go to bed. Thinking about what I saw while lying there, the decapitated parents, the little girl, what possibly happened inside that damned house. I knew for sure it wasn't just murder, the family seemed to haunt the house for one reason or another. After thinking myself to exhaustion, I start to slowly pass out but couldn't help but feel like I'm being looked at or watched by something in my room. I become haunted for two months with increasing symptoms, like seeing the family members appearing in the corner of my eyes or in a reflection or in the dark, following me around everywhere and occasionally hearing a music box in the distance. I looked online for any information on the house, or the family that lived there, but didn't find anything. Eventually it all stopped, suddenly two days. No hallucinations, no sounds, and no feelings of being watched. And so, I came to a conclusion. Or well, that's at least what I could come up with. These ghosts, demons, whatever you want to call them, are like predators. Predators smell fear, and walk away when they don't. Whether you're physically or mentally capable of it or not, it's all the advice I can give you. For me, I really wish I wasn't born with this disease, so I wouldn't go in that damned house in the first place. Even thinking about it still trembles me. I always thought that finding a job after I graduated college would be easy, but I soon found out that that wasn't the case. After months of searching, I was finally able to find a job as a correctional officer at my local prison. I put in my application the next day, 
and was hired on the spot. I started training and for those two weeks, everything seemed normal. When the time came for me to choose which shift I wanted to go to, I chose the midnight to 8 a.m. shift. I was a night owl so I knew the shift would be perfect for me. On my first night, I was put into our restricted housing unit, RHU for short. This was the unit for the inmates that misbehaved or broke institutional rules. When I entered the unit, I was met with two doors. One door led onto the actual unit while the other led to a little room that I assumed was where I would be sitting in for the night if I wasn't doing my security rounds. I went to the door that led to the little room and waited for the officer inside to open it. Once I heard the mechanics of the door opening, I pulled on the door to open it fully. Upon entering the room, I was met with the 4-12 to 12 officer. They were sitting in front of a desk with a computer on it. Behind that desk were four windows that looked into the unit itself. When I looked at the computer, I saw a layout of the unit along with a bunch of icons that looked like locks. I remembered from my training that those icons were how we opened the doors in the unit. Behind where the officer was sitting was a bathroom. I was grateful for that because... I would be stuck in this room unless I was doing a security round. The 4-12 to officer informed me of how many inmates I had before leaving me to my own devices. I sat down in the chair that they were previously sitting in and looked at the computer in front of me. That's when I noticed the post-it note on the bottom of the computer monitor. 12-8 to shift. Please read the instructions saved to the computer before you do your first round. I raised an eyebrow in confusion, but looked on the computer for these instructions anyway. I minimized the unit layout to see a single file on the desktop titled, Night Shift. I double clicked on it, and a Word document opened up. Welcome to the Night Shift. I'm sure that you are very eager to get started with your first night, but there are some rules you need to be aware of before you can begin. Please read them carefully to ensure no mistakes are made. Rule number one. Make sure that you do not do any security rounds between 1.30 a.m. and 1.42 a.m. Rule number two. At exactly 2.17 a.m., you are to enter the bathroom behind you and lock the door. No matter what you hear from outside the bathroom, do not exit the bathroom until 2.23 a.m. Rule number three. An officer will enter your unit at some point through the night. Do not under any circumstances, open any doors for him. He will leave after five minutes. Rule number four. At exactly 4.15 a.m., you are to open all the cells in the unit. Once they are open, hide under the desk. The inmates will make it past the unit door, but they will not be able to make it past the room door. No matter what you hear from outside, do not come out from under the desk until 5.20 a.m. Rule number 5. At 5.40 a.m., a cart of food trays will be delivered to you. Pass them out like you learned during training. Leave the unit as soon as you are done and do not re-enter until 6.07 a.m. Get the trays out at that time, then do a security round right after. Rule number 6. At 7 a.m., a nurse will come in to distribute medication to the inmates. You are to accompany her inside the unit but do not speak to her and do not make eye contact with her. After she leaves the unit, come straight back to this room and stay here until your relief arrives at 8 a.m. I read back through the rules again, but couldn't believe what I was reading. They had to be joking, right? I sighed and looked at my watch to see that the time was 1.15. I had enough time to do a security round before 1.30. I opened the door to the room I was in and walked down. Once I closed the door behind me, the door leading into the unit opened up automatically. I walked into the unit with the device the prison provided so that I could scan the red tags that were placed around the unit. Once I was finished, I walked off the unit and went back into the room. I secured the door behind me right as the clock read 1.30. Suddenly, all the lights in the unit went out causing me to jump slightly. I glanced out the windows into the unit to see if I could make out anything but the only light going into the unit now was from the room that I was in. I could make out the faint outline of the cells, but then I saw something move out of the corner of my eye near the showers. When I looked over at the showers, 
I saw the silhouette of someone just standing in front of them. As my eyes focused more on the figure, I could tell that it was actually facing towards me. I glanced away for a second to see that the clock read 1.39. When I looked back, the figure was closer. And I could actually see what it looked like. There were only black sockets where its eyes should be. The nose was only an empty cavity. Like that on a human skull, the mouth was what sent a chill up my spine. The smile that the figure wore was a wide smile that stretched from ear to ear. I could see the rotting, almost black teeth as the figure slowly started making its way toward the windows. My heart started pounding faster as the figure got closer and closer. Right as it reached the windows, the lights in the unit turned back on and the figure vanished instantly. I looked at the clock. It was 1.42. It took a deep, shaky breath before sitting down in the chair. I looked at the computer to see if any of the cells had been opened, but they all showed that they were closed and secure. Where did that thing come from? What was even happening in this prison? I rubbed my hand over my face and shut my eyes for a few seconds to compose myself. I no sooner had shut my eyes when the sound of knocking brought me out of my thoughts. I looked over to see an officer standing at the doorway waiting to be let in. I remembered one of the rules that said that the officer would leave after five minutes. I looked at my watch, and it read 1.52. The officer started knocking violently on the door, but I did my best to ignore him since I knew that he wouldn't be here for very long. I looked at the computer and just kept my eyes forward as the officer continued to bang on the door. Soon, out of the corner of my eye, the banging stopped. I glanced at the clock on the computer to see that it was 1.57. I turned towards the door, but the officer was gone. The only thing is... I never heard the main door open. Was it all in my head? I whispered. Was it just my imagination? I pushed the thought to the back of my mind and went to do another security round. As I was doing my round, I started to hear what sounded like scratching coming from outside in the exercise yard. I looked down at my watch and my eyes widened when I saw that it was 2.17. The second rule. I completely lost track of time. The sound of the exercise yard slider starting to open brought me out of my thoughts and I broke out into a sprint as I made my way out of the unit. I could hear something chasing after me, but I was able to make it out of the unit and back into the room. Right as I shut the door behind me, something slammed into the door. It was something I've only seen in my nightmares. I let out a scream as the creature pressed itself against the window that was in the door. It had long, slender arms, large hands, and slender fingers. The face of this creature looked like a mummy that they had taken out of an old tomb. My eyes widened as the creature started to bang against the window with its large hands. What scared me even more was that the glass was starting to crack. I snapped out of shock and went into the bathroom, slamming the door behind me. I locked it and sat on the floor with my back pressed against the door. The sound of breaking glass made my heart stop and my blood run cold. It had gotten into the room. I could hear it crawling around trying to find me. My watch read that it was 2.20. Minutes seemed like hours before the sound of the exercise yard slider closing was the only sound filling the air. It was 2.23. I slowly opened the door to see if the creature was gone. All I saw in the room was the broken glass of the window. Fear overtook me as I thought about the fourth rule. All the cells had to be opened and the inmates were going to be able to get through that unit door. And in turn get through that broken window. So now, here I sit, typing this out on the computer in this room. I want everyone to know what happened to me if I go missing. I thought working the night shift would be easy, but now, it's 4.15 a.m. and I just open the cells. The inmates are swarming the unit door, almost a look of hunger in their eyes. The unit door is starting to give with all the strength that these inmates have. The inmates have gotten through the door. The call came in the late evening. The orange in the sky had left and all the animals had burrowed away. Anticipating the storm heading north, I was on the outskirts of Cadence, eating a Milky Way and watching the stars disappear behind the clouds. The cruiser's phone rang and dispatch notified me a man had wrecked on Route 16, heading south to Lilac. 
What happened was the storm had covered the road, which is normally empty at night. Cadence is a small town and Lilac is even smaller. The only people that drive down Route 16 are the farmers needing groceries, and they're never out that late. I figured the wreck was an outsider. Somebody who didn't know the roads tend to be unsalted since the town saves money by giving that job to the sun. Dispatch told me a tow was on the way, but it would be at least an hour. The guy would feel safer with the cops there. But small towns have small forces, and it was my night on patrol. I'd have to do. I finished my Milky Way and drove off. Minutes on the road and the white winds already pushed past the car. The dashboard said 45, but the winds made me feel like I pushed 70. I worried I would miss the wreck that the winds might actually make me a new victim. But in the distance, I saw the red brakes and the black of a sedan. I flipped on my lights, parked 10 feet away, wishing I had remembered my snow hat. I didn't bother getting my clipboard, just my flashlight. Though even that felt useless against the constant white. The wreck was, as I suspected, slid off the road to a nearby ditch, one lower than your average curb, even without the ice, backing up would have been an act of God. As I approached, I nearly slipped myself, had to catch myself on nothing. The front of the sedan was caked in snow deep in the ditch, but the driver's side door was ajar. I stepped down into the ditch, pulled the door open more. The car was running, but not the heat. My flashlight revealed an empty car. I turned, looked around the streets and nearby cornfields painted red and blue by the cruiser lights. Where was the man? I walked around the car, inspected the underside. Nothing. I popped the trunk. Empty. Back on the streets, I looked over the car again. Something about it was off. Beyond the mystery of the missing man, what it was I couldn't put my finger on, but despite the clear nosedive into snow, the sedan was clean, almost immaculate. I took another look and realized there was no license plate. Not even a temporary one. Hello? I asked the cold world. Only the wind replied. Back in the cruiser, I was thinking of where the man went, letting the heat blast against my face. He could have gone south, taking the chance with the storm towards Lilac. Anybody, outsider or not, would have known that was suicide, though. And the cornfields nearby? Maybe he ran into those. Hoped he'd find a warm farmhouse. I was about to call it in. Put a lookout for a guy trying to survive the snowstorm on foot. When I heard it. A dog barking. It was by the wreck. And then came another sound. Though I couldn't make it out inside the cruiser. Outside, the wind bared its teeth on me. Howled its demand to go away. But underneath was the dog's barking. Barking. Then gone. A man's voice asked, Is everything alright? The dog started barking again. One of the farmers must have heard the wreck, came to investigate. I started towards the wreck, telling the farmer that it was under control. Except, what was a farmer doing out on the storm? Halfway there, I stopped, realizing that no, no, nothing was making sense. The missing guy, an unknown car, and now this... I saw a canine shape move into view from behind the car. The dog. It hadn't stopped barking and I worried it would come at me. That things might get dicey out here. The other officers had a running gag that out here the local dogs never liked pigs. But this one stayed put. Barking. Barking. Until it wasn't and the man was asking me if everything was okay again. A question hung in the air. Something churned in my stomach. The dog resumed its barking for a few seconds, stopped, and the man asked the same question for the third time, and it hit me, the barking, the man's voice. It came from the same place. I shone my flashlight at the dog and felt the blood grip my face. It was no dog, a humanoid shape blasted into obscurity by the winter veil looked up at me. Is everything alright? It started running crawling towards me.
Before I realized what was happening, there was a gunshot and I was standing in the snowstorm looking down at the body of a man. I held my breath as I waited for the snow to turn red, let the wind bite my nose, frost my unblinking eyes. But the blood never ran, and what happened instead was the thing shuddered and he started gagging. The bullet was spit out. I ran to the cruiser to drive away. There was no other option. I slammed the car door, cranked the key. The car rumbled in disagreement, wouldn't start. In my head I was screaming with the wind, wondering how hard you need to palm slam a wheel to fuel a car with desperation. Barking interrupted my thoughts. I started to blubber to myself, all those years wanting to be a cop suddenly going out my ears, melting to the floor. A hand smacked onto the window and I screamed. I slammed the car wheel harder, turned the key enough to snap it. From outside, the thing asked me if everything was okay. I just kept screaming. The car suddenly started. Foot down, reverse, brake, foot down, going, going, leaving whatever the hell that was behind. And while the snow blew past, while I tried to stop myself from blubber breathing, I wondered what all had just happened. What had I wandered into? Things like that don't ever have answers. Just more questions. I just started asking why, 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 why? The word was on my lips when the car started to swerve. And in that moment, I did everything wrong. Forgot all my training in the frenzy. The cruiser flipped on its side and I was lucky to not be crushed. I was crawling out of the window when two headlights cut through the snow right at me. The next thing I saw was a large man getting out of a truck. It was the tow. He was rushing over to me, asking me if I was okay. All I could do was mumble. He helped me to my feet, walked me over to the truck. My head was turned behind us the entire time, waiting to see that naked figure walking down the road. The inside of the truck smelled like sweat, and to this day I remember it. He was on the street me in the truck, and he was asking me details, where I had to be and that he was sent out for another, and had I been the officer they sent out, I couldn't answer him, it felt unreal, and when I looked up, looked out the windshield to the cold forever, I saw an outline and began to cough, to gag, I heard the trucker ask what the hell was going on, and then he was walking towards it. I got out, told him to stay away, ran to him to shake his shoulders, except I didn't. That wreck I had, it numbed me. So I just stood there, mouthing words and shaking my head no to the trucker's back. And then it happened. The thing was in the air, then on the trucker, and that blood that was supposed to come earlier at the gunshot, it must have just jumped through time because a shower burst from the trucker. There was a scream and all I saw was a cloud of red. I opened my mouth to scream but kept coughing. In the movies, the monster realizes it's been seen, looks up from the fresh kill and starts gibbering towards the new meats. But the thing never moved from that trucker's body, and I knew it was just going to finish eating him or God knows what else. So like a coward, I got into the truck. Out my shaking hands on the wheel hit the gas. I didn't even run over the thing, just rushed past it not letting myself look over, for fear the thing would be looking at me, for fear the trucker would be. I drove all the way to Lilac. I fell out of the truck into the snow-covered parking lot of a Dollar General. In dreams, I still see that store, and at the counter is the trucker, his blood coursing down onto the conveyor belt. He's mouthing something I can't hear. Sometimes he's barking instead. I never look outside to the parking lot to see if the thing's out there. The next morning I called in my resignation. When they asked why, I just hung up. A friend in the force told me that they eventually went out to search for the trucker. Since his wife called terrified, he met an unseen fate in the storm. They never found him. I remember laughing at the news, though I couldn't tell you why. In the coming days they tried pulling me in for a statement. Answer why the guy's truck sat battery dead at a Dollar General. But I was heading south to somewhere, anywhere the snow avoided. I expected to be chased, either by my old colleagues or that thing. Somehow, but 
It never happened. Since then, I've read up on what it could be, dug up the past to figure out my present. If you ask me, I still couldn't tell you what I saw, but I remember the old stories my father used to talk about, of bandits on the roads, how these bandits would stage fake accidents, take advantage of the kindness of others, how that still happened to this very day. Except instead of men in cowboy hats, they're entire groups. A strength in numbers thing, I guess, but I'm told it's rare. And at first, that explanation didn't quite fit. But the world's a strange place. And if caterpillars can look like snakes, well, maybe something watched from the shadows when people use those fake accidents. Watch people get killed for being too trusting. Scrounged up the looted bodies left behind. And when those old-time highwaymen stopped their trade, there was a dwindling of fresh prey. Evolution. Does it explain it? I don't know. But it's the best I've got when I look up at the night sky. I haven't had a Milky Way in years. But that doesn't make up for what I did. Maybe one day I'll go back, stand in the snowstorm by a mysterious car, do what I should have done back then. Maybe the storm will die down and the thing's face will be revealed. And maybe I'll look into the stolen eyes of the trucker and whisper I'm sorry. This story takes place in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, at a double-story terraced home somewhere in Shah Alam, to be precise. The details of the story were pieced together from my former housemate's experience and a bit of my own during our college days, more than 10 years ago. I didn't experience the first half of the story firsthand myself, since they were the only two home at the time, but I did come back home a little later and had an experience of my own. The area that we were living in at the time was a predominantly medium to high-end Malay neighborhood, full of postmodern terrace houses built in the 90s, but a majority were renovated to better reflect the times. The house that we lived in wasn't, though. The ceilings were still cheap panels and the windows were barred with rusted metal grills and paned with frosted glass. The house was warm as it always was in the late evenings. The owners never bothered to install air conditioning, and the design of the house never really prioritized ventilation. There were eight students sharing the rent for the unit, and only two of them were home that day. While they were watching TV, one of them decided to use the downstairs bathroom. From the living room, if you leaned back against the sofa and turned your head right, you had a clear view of the bathroom, as it was only a few feet away from the living area. While one of them was sitting forward on the couch, engrossed with whatever show was on at the time, the other had gotten up and walked towards the toilet. As it was a warm day, he decided to let in a bit of breeze into the cramped space by pushing the toilet ceiling panel that connected to the outside. As he was washing his hands, he turned to his right towards the couch. He then noticed that his friend, with his body leaned back, was staring in his direction, not directly at him, but somewhere above him. A few seconds passed, and the friend on the couch face wrought with fear and dread, immediately stood up and ran outside through the front door. Not knowing what to do, my friend in the toilet ran after him. While they were outside, the friend from the couch caught his breath and the other guy, what he had seen. He had seen a head peer from the toilet ceiling and slowly slide down directly behind the other friend. As it dropped down, the friend on the couch explained that it was misshapen. It had legs for arms and arms for legs and its head was a grotesque sight. Blood covered its tattered clothes, and its grin was wide with crooked teeth. We moved forward on its hands while its legs, in place of its arms, swung around. After witnessing this, he panicked and ran out. My two friends waited outside the house until one of us came back, as they had left their personal belongings in the house, and were now standing in the middle of the road in their boxer shorts and t-shirts. A few moments later, I arrived, I asked them what they were doing and they explained everything to me. I slowly made my way back to the front door and opened it and peered inside. A few feet from me, I saw what they had described. It was grinning ear to ear and was inviting me inside using the toes on its feet as if they were hands. 
I quickly shut the door and drove us all to the nearest restaurant to wait for our other housemates. Despite their lack of proper attire, we made do. I sent all my other housemates a text message explaining the situation and made preparations to contact a local imam to cleanse the house that night itself. We didn't dare step foot inside the house until the imam came over. By the time he arrived, the thing had disappeared. All eight of us gathered in the living room while the imam went around the house, surveying the space. He said he couldn't sense or see the thing we described, but understood what we were talking about as several from his congregation had complained of something similar. He knows that it's a jinn belonging to someone that lives on our street. But here's the kicker. The house we were staying in, this particular house, was full of paranormal activity. The washing machine area at the front of the house was where the spirit of a woman hung out, while the back room had other spirits inhabiting it. Under the stairs was something else entirely, and the second floor was occupied by other spirits including a man and woman and two children, which explained the sounds of kids running around upstairs whenever someone was home alone. The imam just told us to move out. We were in the final year of our bachelor's degree and didn't have time to look for a new place, so we just toughened it out. A lot more things happened at the house, to several other housemates and guests that stayed over throughout the years, but this experience by far was the scariest. I'm currently considering my personal security at the moment, so please bear with me as you read this, as I don't want to give too much information away to protect my privacy. You will understand why I'm being this way once you've read. I work a busy office 9-5 to five job during the week, which can be very stressful but also quite mundane. The same routine day in day out often feels tedious and leads me longing for a sense of adventure when it comes to the weekends which I always have off work. Oftentimes, this longing leads to me going wild camping on my own. Other than work, I have no other commitments in my life, no girlfriend, wife, or kids, so my weekends are mine only with no one around to worry about me being gone for the weekend. I consider wild camping one of my ways of unwinding. When I decide to go, I usually select a random large forest on the map where I can go to and return within a weekend. I usually always pick an offbeat location as my intention is to never disturb or get disturbed by other people. I calculate and accept any risks by doing this and never plan to stay in one location for longer than a night. I enjoy the thrill of being on my own in a forest in the dead of night and having some quality me time. Just me and nature. Last weekend was one such weekend where I decided I needed to get away for the weekend. It was the first weekend after the first week back at work after the Christmas break. The first week back after festivities is always the worst, and it always feels like the longest week of the year. I picked an area of forest which required roughly 5 hours of drive time in each direction. I don't mind the driving. If anything, the further the better, but there is a limit as I have to travel home to make sure I'm ready for another mundane week of work. I get all my camping gear together and set off just before lunchtime on the Saturday, which meant that I had just about enough light on arrival to get my camp set up. I like to keep my camping gear as light as possible when wild camping. I never plan to light fires and usually just pack my single person tent, sleeping bag, flashlight, pocket knife, protein bars, water bottle, large stacks of colored reflective ribbons, and other items not worth mentioning. Note that I do not bring my phone with me nor any form of electronic payment. The whole point is to get away from technology. When I arrive at my location and have completed the first challenge of finding somewhere remote to park the car, I usually go on a bit of a hike to find a good spot to set up camp far enough away from the road. Tying subtle blue ribbons to twigs on every few trees to guide me back to the car. You would not spot the ribbons unless you had a torch and were looking for them. A perfect spot for me is one that has enough flat space to pitch a tent. Plenty of shrubbery around to provide some shelter from wind, and the spot being mostly covered by trees to reduce any rainfall. The spot I found on this day was 11 out of 10 perfect. 
It had a nice flat area which then had an immediate perimeter of thick shrubbery and just above enough clearance to pitch the tent was a tree with a large amount of thick branches with leaves. It was the kind of spot that if you were a random person, you would not easily spot the camp unless you were specifically looking for it. After some time, I was set. I had finished setting up my tent by the time it started getting really dark. All that was left to do was secure the tent and snuggle into my sleeping bag and become one with the nature around me. I was comfortable for a couple of hours, nearly drifting off when all of a sudden I felt it. I needed to take a shit. I let out a frustrated sigh as I got out of the sleeping bag and put my protective clothing back on. I had to head back out into the wilderness and the dead, darkness of night to find a spot to take a dump. I had a rule to never do my business near camp, as I had an accident once which is not important to this story. I grabbed my torch, pocket knife, and reflective ribbons and headed out of the tent. Before turning on the torch, I took a second to take in my environment. It was pitch black and dead quiet. I was expecting insects or birds or sounds of animals stirring as I bundled out of the tent, but all I could hear was the occasional blow of the wind in my ears. This made me uneasy and super aware, which didn't help the sensation I was feeling in my bowels. Regardless of my feeling, I pressed onwards to find a spot to crap in the opposite direction of my route back to the car, tying red ribbons to inconspicuous twigs on trees so I can find my way back to camp. After spending about 15 minutes finding a spot, doing the deed and tidying myself up, I scanned the flashlight around to search for the glints of red that would take me to camp when I instead got the glint of something else a little further on from my crap spot, which I focused my beam of light on the spot again. It seemed that there was something metallic ahead which immediately piqued my curiosity and gave me cause for concern. There shouldn't be anything metallic this far away from civilization. I had to investigate, so I began making my way closer to the metal glint using green ribbons to mark my journey in the trees. As I got closer to the metal object, I found that the forest was giving way to a sizable clearing which then gave way to a structure as I closed in on the source of the reflection. It was a cabin in the woods. Horror cliches aside, this did not look like your typical cabin in the woods. A large antenna protruded from the roof of the cabin into the night sky, towering over the trees that were nearby. It looked like there was some serious tech fixed to the metallic structure. There was also some other aerials and antennas sticking out the sides of the cabin. I got closer to the cabin and immediately noticed the cabin had similarities to the outside environment. It was still, cold, dark, and quiet. With the amount of tech installed on the tower, I was expecting there might be some computer hardware taking away from within with some lights, but it did not seem like the cabin was active. I continued walking around the outside cabin scanning its exterior. If you took away all the antennas, it would look unassuming. That's when I noticed the door into the cabin. It was ajar. I stood there and hesitated for longer than I should have. Well, OP, you wanted some adventure. I did a quick scan around the clearing and a quick look into the trees to check the coast was clear and I entered. The first thing that struck me was the dust. Lots and lots of dust. It was clear to me now that this place was no longer used. For the amount of tech there was installed outside, the inside was disappointing. It was empty, only containing metal shelves with nothing on them. As I was leaving in a huff of disappointment, I noticed a document hanging up next to the door. The document seemed to have three different parts. The first part had Korean symbols. The second part had numbers and the third part had English, or rather Latin script, letters arranged in alphabetical order numerous times. I wondered whether this was some Korean to English translation guide, and then I wondered what on earth Korean writing was doing here. For information, I am not in Korea. I live in an English-speaking and writing country. I must admit, I was tempted to take the document but decided against it, as it would only end up in the rubbish. I shut the door to the cabin and made my way back to the camp via my crap spot, being guided by the reflective ribbons. 
untying them as I make my way back. I secure my tent, get back into my sleeping bag, and unexpectedly fall into a deep sleep, tired from the extra walk and exploration. I wake the next morning in a bit of a panic as I never usually plan to fall asleep when wild camping as I like to be alert and keep a listen out. But I soon calmed as it took me a minute to realize that I'm still alive. All my things are still present and my tent is still secure. I exit my tent and take some time to pack all my things up and hike back to my car, untying all the ribbons from the trees. I make the best endeavor to collect them all, but if not, they eventually biodegrade. While on my long drive home, I think back to the night before and thought about the cabin in the woods. I thought about how peculiar it was that the cabin is there. It didn't look like it was built for anyone to stay in there. It was a small cabin. I would have said it could have been a hunter's cabin if it wasn't for all the communication technology sticking out of it. I kept busy with these thoughts for most of the journey home, and before I realized... Five hours later, I was back in my neighborhood. Since the discovery of the cabin, the rest of the wild camping event was uneventful. I parked up, picked my bag from the car, locked it, headed to my front door, and opened it up. Home sweet home. All was as I'd left it. Just before I stepped past the threshold into my home, I noticed something white tied up on the floor. Strange, I thought. There's no post on Sundays. I picked up the object and quickly noticed something familiar. A green ribbon. One of my reflective green ribbons. What the fuck? I untied the ribbon and it unfurled a Polaroid photo. Taken of me. Asleep. In my tent. Just before I completely shit myself, I noticed some writing at the bottom of the photo. Korean writing. I realized that I had been standing at the threshold to my house with the door wide open and suddenly felt very exposed and vulnerable. So I quickly got in, shutting and locking the door. I quickly made sure I'd shut all my windows, locked the back door, and closed all my blinds. I found my phone as I left it upstairs and loaded the Google Translate app, selecting the mode which translates in real time through the camera. When translated, the Korean text read, We see you. It's been nearly a week since this happened, and I've not been able to take my mind off of it. I feel like I am being watched whenever I go out the door, but nothing strange or odd has happened. I've been stuck wondering whether I should go to the police, but I feel like it would only make things worse, so for the time being, I've decided that this was just some sophisticated prankster, and that I will only act if further events occur that make me concerned. My name is Aaron. I'm a 36-year-old man who weighs 226 pounds. I'm the strongest man in the gym that I go to. I live in an apartment on the fourth floor of the safest apartment building in the city with two of my close friends. There are locks on all the doors and windows, and security guards patrol the area 24 hours of the day. There are cameras on every doorbell, and in every hallway and staircase in the building. I sleep in the corner of a mostly empty room on a bed with no underside. There is no closet in the room, and there is generally enough light so you could see anything in the dark. Despite all this, I still sleep with a nightlight. Now before you judge me too much, I have a reason for doing this. I figured out that reason the first day I moved here. Me and my friends just moved out of a cheaper apartment complex on the southern part of the city. We moved to this one so that we could be closer to our workplaces. No, we don't work at the exact same place, though we do work at places close together. I'd say we were pretty well off. Rent was split three ways and we made a decent amount of money. This new apartment was an absolute steal, considering the fact that there is so much security. You'd think we'd be suspicious how it was so cheap, or why there was so much security. Well, we soon found out that the security wasn't there to keep things out. They were there to keep things in. Now this apartment wasn't anything special, just a three bedroom, one bathroom apartment. Of course, there was a kitchen and a living room, but that was about it. We could pay our bills on time without much of a problem, though sometimes I did have to work overtime. It was a nice break from our two-bedroom apartment we had before. Luckily for us, our neighbors seemed kind enough. 
though they seemed somewhat sympathetic, which was odd. Anyways, we unpacked our stuff on that first day as if it were just a normal apartment, which at the time, we thought it was. We all took our own rooms, and I opted for the one without a closet. I never did like spiders, and closets are the main source of them. Well, after we unpacked, we went out to dinner, and on our way out the security guard said some strange things. He told me that we should all invest in some nightlights, one for every room. When we asked why, he said there were things living in there that wouldn't go near light. He suggested we go to an old lamp shop and ask them for their finest nightlights. We laughed it off, but wondered what he meant. What things? Did the apartment have rats? Man, how I wish the apartment had rats. We spent the rest of the evening out at a bar, drinking and having fun. Everyone had a blast. It was about 7.39 when we returned to the apartment. I was planning on staying up late watching some TV. When we got to the front doors, the guards asked us what apartment we were staying in. We told him the number and he asked if we were new residents. We said yes, and then he asked us if we had bought any nightlights. When we told him no, he said the same thing as the first guy. This was the second time we heard the warning, and it was from a different guy. Being the stupidly drunk idiots we were, we ignored him and just went back to the apartment. When we got there, all the lights were off, yet it wasn't even close to pitch black. It seemed as if there were small artificial lights on the ceiling, even though there weren't. We all knew that lighting was unnatural. It was like a blue glow, and it lit all the room equally, something windows could never do. When we turned the lights back on, it dispersed, and we didn't think much of it. We all headed off to our different things, and I locked myself in my room. Now a thing to note is that each room has its own separate TV. The TV did emit light, but not an extreme amount, and I don't think it cared about TV light. I turned on the TV and started watching. After a while, I turned the normal lights off, as it was kind of hurting my eyes. When I did, the blue haze slowly returned, but I thought nothing of it. I didn't think anything strange about the movement in the unnatural light, and I don't think anything strange of the shadowed figure lying at the edges of the room. I was in for a hell of a night. After a while, I noticed something odd. Were the walls closer to me than they were before? Was my door always on that side of my room? Did that shadowy figure always exist there? I concluded the answer to the last one was no. Well, I didn't have to conclude, as the second I laid my eyes on it, it jumped. It swiftly moved towards my bed and I was terrified. I screamed as it punched on my chest, knocking the wind out of my lungs. I couldn't breathe. It started bashing at my shoulders, and by the time the guards came in, I think one of my shoulders was almost broken. I was taken to a hospital and was there for a few days before returning to the apartments. When the guard suggested that we get those nightlights again. You bet that we listened. Turns out that my two roommates had similar experiences. Figures that there was a different one in each room. Over time, I learned that my creature was the most aggressive of them all. Without a dark closet or shady corner to hide in, it was barely allowed in the physical realm. Surprisingly enough... The one in the bathroom was quite friendly. He was the one that got the most time and enjoyed our presence. Sometimes we would leave the light off so that we wouldn't bother him. According to one of my roommates, his ghost was better than mine, talking first and then beating him. Well, they aren't exactly ghosts, more like demons or something. We lived in peace for about three years, happy and healthy lives. Little did we know that was about to change. One day, out of the blue, all the lamp shops in town burnt to the ground. Now, it wouldn't be suspicious if it happened at different days or even times, but no. At exactly 6.54 p.m., every lamp shop in town burnt down. Nothing the firefighters did could stop the fires. Nobody in the building survived. The firefighters think it was coordinated attack from arsonists, but there wasn't any evidence of humans getting involved. In fact... It seemed as if, after 3 p.m., every security camera in town stopped working, even the ones in our apartment complex. We, like many others, went down to check out what happened. Somehow it seemed like the guards were unfazed, almost in a monotone-type way. When we got back, it was about 7.31. When we got back, every light in the house was smashed, destroyed, even the nightlights. 
We walked in the house, momentarily forgetting the demons. That's when they struck. First, the living room one shut the door and locked it. It used its telekinesis to move the couch in front of the door, then turned to us. It pushed us across the apartment, effectively splitting us up. Luckily for me, I was pushed into the bathroom. I hid in there and locked the door. The ghost in there asked me what was going on. I told him everything. He said he never liked those other demons, always hating everything else for not getting exactly what they wanted. The screams of my roommates went on for some time, maybe about an hour or two. At this point, I've lost all sense of emotion. I've used all my emotions in the past day. All I can assume now is that my friends are dead. All I can hope for is that they can't enter the rooms. The banging started a few hours ago. At first, it wasn't much, just like a slight knock. Then it was like a hurricane bashing on the door, waiting to come in and devour me. Now listen, I didn't come here because I was a hero and saved myself somehow. I'm still trapped in that bathroom, with the hurricane going on outside. It won't be long before they get in and kill me, or do whatever they did to my friends. I fear that they've learned how to get past the guards and cameras. I fear that's how the lamp shops were burnt. I fear they will soon roam the entire globe. So, all I present to you now is one piece of advice. If you see that soft blue fog, turn on a light and buy some night lights. Never turn them off. Just a few months ago, everything was normal. Every day was a usual boring day with my parents, but I was happy. My parents were going out a lot late at night, and I figured they just needed some time alone. One day when they were out and I was alone in the house, I went to the kitchen to grab some food. I heard some weird noises from the basement, but I thought I'm just really tired. On my way back to my room, I heard something again. This time it was loud and clear. I heard the crying of a little girl from the basement. I got really freaked out, because I always believed in the paranormal. Immediately I thought it must be a ghost or something. I ran back to my room and locked the door as fast as I could. I couldn't sleep so I decided to wait until my parents came home. It felt like hours but probably they were back in an hour. They were trying to be quiet because they thought I'm asleep. Just when I wanted to open my door and tell them what happened. I heard my father say something that shocked me. He said, Let's see how our little friend is doing in the basement. I was very confused and I didn't know what to think. I heard them as they were going downstairs so I decided to follow. I was trying to be as quiet as I could. I slowly opened the basement door so I could hear them better before going down. I heard my parents laughing and the crying again but this time it wasn't as loud as before. I was more and more quiet and the laughing got louder and louder. Finally, I gathered some courage and I decided to check what's going on. I went down a few steps on the stairs, just enough to see a bit more. I will never forget what I saw. There was a little girl just barely living on the ground. She didn't have any clothes on and she had several stab wounds. My parents were kissing each other and then my father asked, Are you ready for the big finale? My mom just nodded her head and kissed him again. My father pulled out a drill from a toolbox and grabbed a little girl's neck. He looked at her for a few seconds and then he started to drill a hole in her head. She didn't have enough life in her to scream but I could see the suffering in her eyes. My parents were just laughing as my father continued to drill her head. The little girl died in a few seconds and then I recognized her. I saw her in the news a few days ago. She was missing for two weeks and the police were looking for her. I wanted to go back to my room to call the police. I was disgusted by my parents and I never wanted to see them again. I slipped as I was going up the stairs and they heard me. I started to run to my room and my father was running after me. He told me to stop and he will explain everything. I ran faster than ever in my life and finally got to my room. I closed the door and then I pushed my bookshelf to barricade the door. I dialed 911 but then I froze. I hung up the phone and I didn't know what to do. I hated my parents, and I know what they deserve, but they were still my parents. I was just sitting there for hours. It was really odd that my parents didn't even try to come into my room. One time my father knocked on the door and told me to forgive them one day, but that's it. 
I only realized how long I was sitting there when I saw that the sun is rising. Finally, I dialed 911 again and I explained everything. In 20 minutes, the police arrived and I shouted, I'm here. I'm the one who called you. They knocked on my door and told me it's safe to come out. I was waiting outside with two officers while the rest were searching the house. I told them about the body in the basement, but when they came back, they told me there's two more bodies. They told me to stay strong, but it looks like my parents committed suicide. I realized my father knocked on my door to ask for forgiveness, because they already knew that's the only way out. A few months have passed, but I'm reliving the whole thing every night. I went to several psychologists, but nothing helps. At least I thought nothing helps, but now I understand there's only one way out for me, so... Last night, I was awakened from a shallow slumber sometime after midnight by the sound of footsteps plodding up the stairs outside my apartment. I live in a unit above a garage, and the staircase leads to my front door. It's a small place, so the door is barely 20 feet from where I sleep. I thought I was still dreaming when I first heard the rhythmic pounding of footfalls going up and back down again, but I didn't want to take a chance I was wrong, so I pulled myself out of bed and went to check if anyone was there. I switched on the outside light and peered through the corner of the curtain, but all I saw was the empty rain slick in street below. I returned to bed and tried to quiet my mind until a drowsy mist rolled in. Snippets of conversations and distorted images of the past flitted around me, lulling me into night's familiar embrace. Stomp, stomp, stomp. The noise of the footsteps cut through it all, tearing me back to reality. I leapt to my feet and rushed to the door, nearly ripping the curtain off its rod as my eyes flew back and forth, searching wildly for any sign of the footstep source. Still, there was nothing. I waited and strained my ears to listen for any hint of noise above the pitter-patter of the icy rain hitting the roof, but my vigil went unrewarded, and my eyelids grew heavy. I glanced at the clock. It was nearly three in the morning. I couldn't fight off sleep any longer, so I shambled back to my bed and succumbed to exhaustion. Stomp, stomp, stomp. I opened my eyes, but refused to move. I wouldn't keep playing this game. I knew what would happen if I responded to this intrusion upon my rest. So I just remained still. Up and down the stairs they went. Again and again. The footsteps were moving faster. The footfalls heavier and more urgent. Stomp, stomp, stomp. My pulse outpaced them, but not by much. Every muscle in my body twitched and became rigid, but I held back my urge to jump out of bed. It would only cause me more frustration. The footsteps suddenly ceased. A long, silent moment passed as not even my breath could be heard. I agonized as to whether I could finally close my eyes and forget about the sounds when a quiet rattle echoed through the apartment. It was brief at first, but then it rang out again, this time louder. The next time it came, I realized what it was. Something was trying furiously to turn the brass knob on my front door. I was no longer in control of my body as I darted out of bed and towards the noise, moving on pure instinct and adrenaline. My hand snapped up the baseball bat leaning against the nearby wall and I tore back the curtain. My heart leapt into my throat when a dark face glared back at me and I cocked my bat ready to swing. When my senses returned in time to recognize I was looking at my own reflection in the lightly frosted glass. I laughed with myself as relief poured over me, but the moment was short-lived. My bedroom door slammed behind me, causing me to whirl around, my hackles once again raised. I went to open it, but it was locked. I shook the doorknob, trying to jostle it loose to no avail. However, when I released it in defeat... The rattling didn't stop. As fear gripped my chest, I stared wide-eyed at the knob as it strained against the lock to turn back and forth. Another rattling began, and I turned to see my front doorknob being shaken as well. I retreated into the far corner of the room as the footsteps returned. Stomp, stomp, stomp. From the other side of my bedroom door, the sound of someone's heavy pacing joined the terrifying cacophony. I felt trapped, unsure of what to do. Part of me wanted to just break down the door, but a small bit of rationality that still clung to my mind. 
reminded me that destroying my apartment over a disembodied noise would certainly lose me my much-needed deposit. By this point, I couldn't even discern how close the sounds had come, as I had shut my eyes tight. Stomp, stomp, stomp. I waited for a cold hand to reach out and seize me at any second, feeling the looming threat hovering inches away. Then, everything stopped. I still didn't open my eyes, fearing what I might see if I did. The thunderous ticking of my clock thrummed in my ears as the seconds wore away. This stretched into minutes, and nothing else came. When I finally willed my eyelids to part, it was merely my night-soaked apartment lying before me. Looking towards my bedroom, the door sat ajar. I stood up and let out the stale air in my lungs, not realizing I'd been holding my breath. I snapped on the lights inside my apartment, casting it all in a blinding yellow light. As my sight adjusted to it, I again scanned the area, but everything seemed to be exactly as it should. I opened my front door and found nothing, just as before. Unable to explain what just happened, I closed the door again, making sure it was locked, and headed back to my room. The rush of terror that had been keeping me awake solely ebbed from my veins until I was barely able to stand up, so I collapsed into bed. Trying to get comfortable, I kicked at my sheets and felt that they were damp near the bottom. I tossed them aside and touched my feet, realizing they were wet. I pulled a string on the lamp next to my bed to turn it on and glanced at the floor beside my bed. All across it were rain-drenched footprints going back and forth past my bedroom door. I heard it again, the scraping of metal against the trees. The sound made every fiber in my body shiver with anxiety and dread. I shouldn't have gone to the party. I shouldn't have trusted my friend. I shouldn't have gotten in his truck. And I most certainly shouldn't be alive right now. How the hell did I get in this situation? I thought it only happened in bad quality horror movies. Where the girl gets chased by the murderer and gets killed the most brutal way but only a few minutes after it started. I can hear him hum to the music that was previously playing at the party. Normally I would have commented something stupid like, Hey, Michael Jackson called, wanted his voice back, or you should join a boy band, so that you could have someone to sing Mamma Mia with. But this wasn't a joke anymore. I know what he's capable of since he had the morality to show me exactly what karma meant. I have to force my eyes away from my thigh, where the pocket knife still sits steadily engraved into my skin. I know that I'm bleeding, but I can't do anything to stop it since I'm only wearing a thin flower-printed summer dress. The fabric wouldn't be enough to wrap around my leg. I was doomed the moment I stepped into that truck, and I only realized that now. It only grew darker in the forest as the sun was setting, which was both a plus and a minus. It grew colder into the night and I kept swearing at myself for leaving my jeans jacket in the trunk. If I hadn't, I wouldn't be freezing to death before he could even find me. But it also grew darker which means it would be harder to see me in the trees. It's so quiet in the forest. The only sounds I could hear were the scraping, the humming, and the low footsteps on the mossy ground with a few fallen branches breaking here and there, only to add to the majestic aesthetic that was slowly building up. My heartbeat was in my throat. I didn't know how long we had played this round of cat and mouse, but for me, it seemed like hours, and it was surely starting to take a toll on my lungs. Alex, come out, come out wherever you are. I could hear his grin in his voice. I knew how sadistic it looked. It had burned into my memory like permanent markers on white cloth. I know he was enjoying every second of this game. I never usually cried, but right now I couldn't help it, and I felt my vision starting to dim. I know I could under no conditions afford to break down right now, so I frantically wiped my tears and continued to attentively listen to the sound of his breathing. He was getting exhausted too. Even if he had the best physique out of the two of us and didn't have a knife in his limb, he hadn't paused to breathe as I did. I saw this as my opportunity. If I could run past him and back to the highway... I could have a chance to meet a car and get help out of here. But even if I wanted to move, I sat frozen on the ground, 
my back still tightly pressed to the trunk of an oak. I had to run. I didn't have a choice if I wanted to survive this. Sooner or later, he would find me, and I'm sure my death wouldn't be very pleasant. I had to stand, so I did. With the last of my powers, I forced myself up slowly. I was not going to let him use me as prey while he plays hunter in this game of life and death. And so I run, as fast as I can, pushing every living cell in my body to its limit. I just needed to get as far away as I could and fast. And after a second, I could hear him yell behind me, swearing and shouting at me to stop, but I didn't. I just kept running even if my legs stung like hell. I couldn't stop. Not now. Soon I began to see the road behind the big trees, and I almost cried out of happiness at the thought of hugging my parents in safety again. But then suddenly I felt a tug on my dress from behind and I fell straight into the dirt, face first. I felt the knife digging deeper into my tissue and I felt a scream tear out of my throat. It felt like the end. The pain was just too much to handle. I turned around to look at him, but it was too blurry to see his face as he traced a finger against my jawline, feeling the deep, coffee-colored curls of my hair. Don't run from me, Alexandra. I didn't even know what I was doing anymore, but I used the last adrenaline I was holding to dig up a handful of dirt with my free hand and quickly throw it in his eyes as he was busy studying me. He cried in anger as he desperately tried to get the dirt out of his eyes and I quickly slipped out from under him. I crawled up and began halting my way to the road again. Everything was blurry. My leg was practically burning and I felt like I could barely breathe. But I couldn't give up. I just couldn't car rushed by and I threw myself as fast as I could so I could stop it. It nearly collided with me, but it stopped just as it was about to hit me. I ran to the passenger seat and got in. Then I quickly yelled at the woman to drive, begging her with my frantic eyes still scanning the forest after the blue-eyed man. I couldn't hear much, but I could see the woman slam on the brakes and take out her phone. It started to ring in my ears and everything was beginning to go black. I laid my head on the glass and finally breathed out when I heard the woman call 911 with panic lacing in her voice. I was saved. But I know this won't be the last I see of my brother. My dad used to tell me the same story again and again in an attempt to scare me and my brother. We would rebel against the rules of, don't be outside later than 7.30. So he would use this exact story to terrify us into coming back before then. Looking back, it was probably one of the worst ways that he could have tried to get us to come back inside. However, that's besides the point. Recently, I called my dad to get him to tell me the story again since I had forgotten what it was about and only vaguely remembered a boy in a little yellow rain hat. My dad gladly picking up the phone and telling me a story again, once more. It was a dark and stormy night. Nostalgia flooded into my mind like the walls of a beaver's dam being destroyed. He continued to tell his story. Many memories came into my mind. I remember the little boy and how he had been taken in the night because he didn't come home from playing in the rain all day. Though his disappearance made no sense in the story, my dad had always enjoyed telling the story and kept it as one of his most prized stories he had written. I asked, Hey, didn't you say that this story was true and that you had heard from a friend that it had happened? He replied surprised that I had remembered. Oh yeah, it's all true. My old friend told me many times that this was true and to be careful out at night past 7.30, otherwise you'd be taken. I had remembered the story behind why my dad took this so seriously and couldn't help but wonder why and how the kids would be taken. I never took these stories seriously, obviously, but was always wondering just a bit how they'd be taken. I asked, how were they taken, dad? Who or what would take them? He told me, well, that's the scary part. No one knows. I heard from a friend that children were taken by a man with a disfigured face and disgusting eyes, but no one really knows. Puzzled, I wondered why anyone would think that this story was true. I said goodbye to my dad and thanked him for telling me the story again, and resumed what I'd been doing prior to thinking about all of this. I had been cooking, making spaghetti for my wife Mary and our two children Jacob and Sally. As the spaghetti finished cooking and was plated up, I called down to my family. Dinner's ready. 
They came in a hurry and all sat down at the table. What did you make, Dad? Said a clearly hungry Jacob. I made spaghetti. And you can't leave the table until you finish all of it. I don't want any repeats of last time. But Dad, I want to go out and play with my friends. Not until you're done with your spaghetti. Now eat up. Dinner was over before we knew it, and Mary had gone back upstairs with Sally to go watch movies while Jacob ran out the front door to go play with his friends. Be back before 7.30, Jacob. You know what happens if you don't come back. As silly as I said the story was, I had actually used it night after night and told it to my children because I figured that, if it worked for me and my brother, it would work for them too. Yeah, Dad, I know. I'll be back at 7.20. How's that? Sounds good, bud. See you then. Time passed, and I sat on our black couch in the living room watching sports and being an overall tired, lazy mess. 7.20 came, and Jacob was still outside with his friends. I figured I'd let him stay an extra five minutes before I'd call him. After waiting those five minutes, I called out to him with no reply. I felt a small, piercing feeling in my lungs as I began to think about the story my dad had told me. I didn't believe it. Not because, if it was true, there would be a report, right? I stepped outside to look for Jacob. It was 7.27 and getting dark. I went to the cul-de-sac near our house because that's where Jacob had been known to play from time to time. I got to the cul-de-sac to find it empty with a beat-up scooter leaning on the sidewalk. I immediately recognized it as Jacob's scooter and called out to him again. Jacob, it's getting late. We need to go home. No reply. Worried, I checked the time. 7.29. It was beginning to get really close to the time that I was worried about. I looked into the forest adjacent to the cul-de-sac and figured maybe, just maybe he would be in there with his friends. I ran into the forest and found small traces leading me to believe that he had been through here. I was on the right track. I followed the path and that's when I heard one of the most blood-curdling screams that has stuck with me to this day. It was Jacob. I looked down at my watch. 7.30. The time had come and I was growing more and more anxious by the second. There were sharp pains in my lungs like none I've ever felt before. I felt like someone was shoving razor blades into my trachea. I collected myself and ran towards the screams. Even if he was screaming, there might still be time to save him. As I followed the screams through the forest, branch after branch hit my face and the air began to grow colder and colder. The time was now 7.34 and I had reached a clearing. The moment I entered the clearing, I spotted it. A man with a disfigured face and disgusting eyes. It had been as if someone had taken a knife to this man's face and cut off anything that would make him look human. He looked at me with a grin I won't forget for years to come. I stared back and dropped my gaze to the floor where there lay Jacob. Pierced through his stomach, blood covered the damp dirt on the ground. When I looked back up, the man was gone. I had fixated my gaze on my poor Jacob so heavily that I hadn't even noticed him leave. I ran to Jacob, tears streaming down my face. Looking into his lifeless eyes, all I could think is that I could have done something to prevent this. I could have kept him inside. His cold, lifeless body lied on the ground as the sun finally set. I heard my dad's voice ring in my head. It was a dark and stormy night. That was my last ever experience with that thing. It took Jacob's life, and ever since I've been protecting my family, absolutely insisting that they come home before 7.30. I haven't seen it again, but the thought that one day, I might, still lurks in the back of my mind. I have some things I need to get off my chest. I think I just went through a near-death experience and I haven't been able to get anyone to believe me. I'm a pilot who takes private clients on aerial tours of the mountains. For reference, I live in Wyoming, right in the middle of the Rockies. Lots of people, mostly tourists, want to be taken up to see the peaks. Great views all around, since we take off right in the middle of the basin. Anyway, as I was looking at the weather reports for the week... I saw that there were going to be extremely strong winds and possibly thunderstorms on a day that I was booked full. I spent the whole morning calling clients to cancel or reschedule their flights for later in the week. There was this one guy who wouldn't leave me alone though. 
He kept offering larger sums of money and saying that tomorrow night was the only day he was available. He repeatedly stated that it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and he definitely won't have another chance to see it because of his age. Eventually, I caved in. He offered to pay double to go tomorrow afternoon. I figured since the weather wasn't projected to be at its worst until a few hours after its appointment, it would be okay to take one flight. I remember that I didn't sleep well that night, with a sinking feeling that something terrible was going to happen. The morning of the flight went as they usually do. I met the client in the lobby of the airport. Tower warned us to be back within the hour. We took off. The air was humid and slightly breezy as we left the runway. My passenger was immiscible enough, and we had small talk between bouts of radio chatter and engine noises. He told me that he was a professor at a small college in Manitoba, visiting his daughter while he was stateside. He explained that he had been concerned about his health for some time now, but he had always loved the mountains and wanted to see them one last time. His love of nature reminded me of my own grandfather. We climbed several thousand feet, and the clouds circling the peaks began to greet us. We were still only halfway up, but the view from here was as incredible as it ever was. When we approached the steep bow of the mountains to the west, the winds began to grow stronger. A gust blew us off course into a dangerous trajectory. Before I could get my bearings, I realized the plane was getting closer and closer to the side of the mountain. I began desperately trying to get the plane to hang on and fought hard against the wind. The old man was shouting and panicking things I couldn't hear over the cacophony. There was lightning and heavy rain, and everything began to blur together. It was then that I noticed that I was gaining altitude every time the wind blew us off course. At this point, we were well above 10,000 feet in the air. I had never seen anything like this, and I kept trying to get the plane to descend to no avail. This plane wasn't supposed to fly anywhere above 14,000 feet, but it was our only option right now. I was focusing on trying not to stall or flip over. The freezing rain at this altitude made the plane heavier and it was hard to keep the angle I needed. Sometimes I had to give it to the wind so it would carry us even higher until it momentarily relented. But then, as we approached 15,000 feet, the rain, thunder, all of it just disappeared beneath us. The ice on my wings started to melt, and the sun was beaming brightly ahead of us. It didn't make any sense. Both the passenger and I had gone completely silent. If not for the engine noise, I swore I could have heard birds chirping. I turned to the passenger, about ready to say, You seeing this shit? But when I looked, there was no one else in my cockpit. The color drained from my face and I could feel my palms begin to sweat. Despite the utopian scene from my windshield, all I could hear was my own ragged breathing echoing back at me through my headset. Where was he? He couldn't have fallen out. That's absurd. So who was I talking to not even ten minutes ago? A ghost? I tried to radio tower to no avail. That's when the dizziness hit. I double-checked the altimeter. That can't be right. I was over 21,000 feet in the air. I didn't think my plane could even get that high. I was passing out due to lack of oxygen and I had to descend fast. I pushed my plane's nose down as far as I could handle and watched the numbers tick down, desperate to focus on anything. My free hand scrambled for the emergency oxygen. 20,000, 19,000, 18,000. I was getting tunnel vision and barely hanging on. At around 17,500 feet, I began to hear the crackling of my radio. It brought me back into awareness just enough to force the oxygen mask onto my face. I didn't have enough coordination to fiddle with the strap, so... I just held it there, my other hand carefully adjusting the Kessna's pitch angle. The shapes of the mountain spun around me as I fought the dizziness and nausea. After what felt like an eternity of descent, I finally hit 10,000 feet and began to sit up straight again. My bones felt like jelly and my limbs felt like they were going to dislocate all at once. But I was alive, with burning questions in my mind. I tried to get Tower to come in on the radio. No response. 
As I began my much shallower glide down to the surface at around 9,000 feet, I took the time to affix the mask to my face properly. Tower finally came in at around 5,000 feet. The voice was different though. A young woman instead of the man in his 30s that was there when I took off. No one should have done a shift change yet. I hadn't taken off until after lunch. I landed without incident. I expected the runway to be slippery with rain, but it was completely dry. As I made my way out of the garage... I thought for sure someone would ask about the missing passenger, but they mainly seemed bored. It was as if it were any normal day. No one so much as mentioned him. I thought it was weird that they were even there at all, since the weather was supposed to be bad that evening. I asked the receptionist tentatively about the weather. She remarked that it had been a beautiful day, without a cloud in the sky. She also double-checked the paperwork from this afternoon and told me that there was no record of a passenger on my flight. I know there was someone that got into the plane with me that day. There was a storm and that freak wind that carried me twice as high as I should have been able to go. I thought about ordering a search party for him, but there wasn't any record he even existed. My fellow pilots only took pity on me and chalked it up to oxygen deprivation changing my memory of events but I had my emergency oxygen on almost the entire time. Some of them told me that it was just stress and I should take a few weeks off from my health. Since that day, I haven't gone on any flights. I've also gone to see a therapist. He told me that writing down what happened would help me think about it more clearly and possibly expose what actually happened to me and to the passenger. He didn't tell me to send it to anyone, but I figured posting it here couldn't hurt. I know people have stories like this all the time, people that only they seem to remember. At this point, I don't know what to believe, and I'm afraid that more things have changed than I know about. If you're still reading this, just take my advice, and don't get on a flight when it's supposed to storm. The weather could be the least of your worries. Thinking back on it now, maybe this isn't an experience that I should have been too scared of. I'm not sure, but I remember how terrifying it was in the moment. My grandfather and I live alone together and we have for some short time now. It's temporary, but why isn't very important. Anyway, we both smoke weed pretty often. We'll go out onto the back porch and hang out for a while while passing back and forth a joint. Our porch is covered. The top half is a screen, and the bottom half is a wooden wall. There's a screen door leading to the backyard. I have a bad habit of smoking a bit more than he does. Most nights, I'll step out onto the back porch long after he's gone to bed, and get a little buzz going before going to sleep myself. I've gotten into a routine at this point because of how often I do it, sadly. My grandfather doesn't need to know, so I'm always super careful about how I do things to not get caught. I use no light unless it's absolutely necessary. I navigate my way around in the dark and feel out what I need to be doing and it usually works. My phone is the light source and it's just small enough to do what I need it to do without drawing an attention. One night, I'm doing what I'm usually doing. I'm standing out and I'm hidden away in the back corner so that if, in some odd stroke of bad luck, my grandfather is checking outside for me, which probably won't happen in all honesty, you won't be able to see me right away. Usually, I'm pretty heavily listening out for any odd noise inside the house that will let me know I need to pack it up and plan a route back to my room without getting caught. It's silent for a while and then the dog inside starts barking. I was a bit startled, but brushed it off and tried to find some explainable reason for it. I squatted down to hide out. She doesn't stop. There's a noise at the door where we usually enter the house. It sounded as though someone was jiggling the doorknob like mad. I freeze up and try to listen a bit more as I wrap my head around the situation. I'm on high alert because I'm outside in pitch black darkness of a quiet and normally unbothered neighborhood. I try convincing myself that maybe it's just my mother visiting after getting off work, or one of my other relatives, but the jiggling was so loud and frantic. Eventually, I heard a voice. It was a man cursing out. A voice I didn't recognize. 
If my heart wasn't already sunken into the ground, it sure was now. The dog hasn't let up. I set the stuff in my hands down and stuffed my phone back in my pocket. I don't know why, but I didn't go inside. Maybe my feet were just frozen there. My mind was racing at this point. There was silence for a moment before the man started tampering with the gate just steps away that would allow him into the backyard. It wasn't difficult at all to get in. There's no lock. It didn't occur to me that the man would still try to get in after a failed attempt and allow dog waking as many people as possible. The back door is feet away from me. I stand to try and get inside. The door opens, and it's my grandfather with a flashlight in hand. He walks out and starts shining it around in the direction of the yard to figure out what was going on. I get down again. At this point, the man has entered the backyard and made a mad dash across until he stood not far from the screen door. My grandfather walks out. He has the lights on the man. For some reason, my grandfather didn't seem scared. It baffled me in the moment. How can he not be terrified that a stranger is trying to break in? I'm watching them through the screen door. The flashlight is on the man. I can still picture him pretty well. He wore a white t-shirt drenched in sweat. His eyes were bloodshot, nose bleeding, hair all over the place. His eyes were wild. I couldn't tell, but it felt like he never blinked. They started chatting a bit. Well, my grandfather tried to talk to him and calm the man down, but he only kept shouting about how someone was looking for him and that they're after him. He's jaggedly darting around and wildly waving every body part he could. I'm still freaking out myself, but seeing my grandfather compose himself so well made me feel a bit better. Like he had it under control or something. The talking down didn't seem to work. The man tried to rush into the house. Thankfully, my grandfather was in between the man and the screen door, so he was at least able to buy a few seconds. I watched in shock, but I knew I had to do something. So I swallowed my fear and tried to push myself forward and out the door. The man was still fighting to get in. I had no plan in mind to fight. I would definitely have run away, but I couldn't bear the idea of some lunatic harming someone close to me. We struggled. It, luckily, didn't take too much time for both my grandfather and I to get the man down on the ground. He was a bit of a thin man, and my grandfather and I are both pretty sizable. He thrashed as much as he could for a while. He screamed, kicked, punched, clawed at us. There were thankfully no weapons, so no major injuries. My grandfather and I got a few bruises and pretty surface-level scratches. My grandfather had to sit on him for a while to hold him down. He didn't want to seem to give up. Because I had my phone on me, I called the police. It didn't take long for them to get there and apprehend the man. I had to answer a few questions, but my grandfather was the one who did most of the talking. I was too spooked from what had just happened. My heart felt like it would never stop racing. I couldn't sleep that night. Even though the man was taken away, I still felt like something bad could happen. It wasn't until a day or so later that I found out all the little details. Turns out the man was a neighbor. My grandfather gets along well with all of them, and will even strike up conversations, but I never see most of them. The man was doing cocaine and maybe some other drugs after life had taken a shitty turn for him in recent months, and he couldn't get back into his own home directly next to us. Since then... I can't bring myself to go out to the back porch during the night, or outside at all during the night. I'm an awfully paranoid person, and I don't want to run the risk of something like that happening again and being in the same situation. I haven't seen the neighbor since that incident. It's not like I've seen him before anyway, but I don't think I want to ever get another look at him and be reminded of what happened that night. In the whole of New England, there exists 245,608 miles of road. Highways make up 1,579 miles of this. However, it is just a few miles of unassuming interstate through the rural hills of the region that are responsible for such an inordinate amount of death that all the victims, if combined, would rival the population of many of the picturesque little towns that populate the surrounding landscape. Locally, this plain stretch of straight, four-lane blacktop and short, curving-off ramps is known as the Sleeping Exit, though none of the local publications have picked up on the moniker, likely believing it to be in poor taste. 
There isn't anything special about this short section of highway at all. In fact, it's quite ordinary. Nothing about it jumps out to even the most observant of operators that would suggest an unusual amount of danger at hand. No abnormally sharp turns. No odd or irregular road configurations. No bottlenecks and almost no traffic to speak. The highway rides straight as an arrow and flat as a cut stone slab through the rolling hills and pine forests. The locals refer to them as sleeping exits, for their seemingly uncanny ability to lull a driver to sleep as if by some unseen hypnotic power. The vast majority of the accidents happen at night and have been mostly attributed by the local police to drivers nodding off at the wheel. There are the occasional drunk drivers and careless accidents, but those seem to be the exception and not the rule. The majority of fatalities appear to be drivers that gently drifted off to sleep, never to awake again. Just last year, a tractor-trailer truck went off the highway at 3 a.m., plowing through a drainage ditch and a pair of chain-like fences before jackknifing, flipping on its side and coming to rest only a few feet in front of a gas station across the street. The driver was killed after being pinned under the wreck for over an hour. An autopsy revealed no alcohol or drugs of any kind in the man's system. There were no other vehicles present on the scene, and there were no skid marks from braking or otherwise until after the truck had jackknifed. The only witness to the crash was the clerk of a gas station who said he just saw the truck drive straight off the road for no apparent reason. A few months after that, at around midnight, a family of five that was on their way back to New York from a leaf-peeping trip drove through a guardrail and head on into a concrete overpass support at nearly 70 miles per hour. Everyone in the car was listed as DOA at the local ER. Once again, no drugs or alcohol were found in the driver's system and the accident was only reported by a highway patrolman who happened upon the crash some minutes later. There were also no skid marks or any other signs of braking by the driver. They just drove right off the road to their deaths. These were... Just a few of the more grisly examples of the exit's victims. Though there are countless more to be found by anyone willing to do their research, and they all seem to fit, more or less, the same description. A vehicle driving late at night, seemingly without provocation from any outside force, drives off the road with no sign of hard braking, fishtailing, or loss of control of any kind. The driver's body, when tested later, shows no traces of intoxication. The only logical explanation for the crash is being that the driver was asleep at the wheel. Personally, I've driven this very stretch of highway numerous times in my life, and can bear some witness to its mysterious, soporific ability. There is a popular bar and music venue at one end of the exits that I frequented to watch local musicians play. I would drive up from my home usually around 5 or 6 p.m. before darkness had fallen, and return late. In the dead of the night, I had to pass directly through the six exits that made up the dreaded length of highway. I'm sure there were side roads that went around it, but it was, without a doubt, the quickest way to my destination, and I'm not at all a superstitious person. I made this trip frequently through my mid-twenties without any problem. The road was flat, well-paved, and straight. There were no street lights in the small belt of forest on both sides, calming and required very little attention to navigate. But that was it. In all my trips through the exits, I never had any trouble keeping my eyes open or felt any mysterious pull to slumber. Sure, it seemed to account for the sheer volume of strange and violent wrecks that took place there. I figured there was some reasonable explanation to it if one were to look close enough. Maybe the numbers were inflated somehow. Maybe this route happened to be a convenient one for those making very long drives through the region. Maybe an ancient, native burial ground was entombed underneath. Maybe it was aliens. Honestly, I never gave it much thought. I just chalked all the hype up to a combination of superstition and bad drivers. But that came to an end after one horrifying drive years ago. On a dark autumn night towards the end of my 20s, I took the ride out to the local venue up past the exits to see my friends, band play, and have a few drinks. Darkness was falling earlier this time of year, so it was barely light when I passed through the cursed area on my ride out. Somewhere, deep inside myself, 
I felt relieved to be past them before nightfall. I chuckled out loud at how silly I was being. The ride was beautiful and scenic as always, and the sunset was a spectacular blood red, which seemed to forebode an exciting and eventful evening ahead. I brushed off my childish nerves and enjoyed the rest of my ride, quietly anticipating the festivities to come. As I expected, the night was rowdy and full of youthful revelry. Music was played loud, drinks and other chemical indulgences were enjoyed in abundance. Singing and dancing were the status quo. Stories and jokes were told loudly. Romances started then ended, and then started again anew. Couples disappeared for minutes on end and reappeared ruddy-faced and smirking. Laughter echoed off the walls and out into the street. The atmosphere felt alive with a certain electricity that seemed not altogether wholesome, but honestly, how else did we really want it? We were young and being bad was still a good thing. We knew someday it would have to end, but why should it be tonight? Around 1am, the bartender gave the last call for drinks. As per my usual ritual, I grabbed a shot of espresso and a glass of water for the ride home and quickly drank them both down. I said my goodbyes, shook hands, traded hugs and even a few flirtatious looks, then I was on my way. I didn't like to linger. Besides, the night was dark, crisp, exceedingly beautiful, and cast in the lights of what appeared to be a full moon. I was looking forward to the drive home. I rolled my window down to let the night in. I put the car in drive and pulled away into the dark, headlights illuminating the way. Before long, I was back on the highway and nearing the sleeping exits. The once beautiful night had now dimmed considerably, both literally and metaphorically. The moon was now hidden behind a cloud and a heavy, stagnant mist had settled down over the surface of the road. On top of this, the jitters from the ride up had returned and, once again, the atmosphere began to come alive with an unwholesome energy. This time, though, the fun was gone from it. I pushed the anxiety to the back of my mind, blaming it partially on the joints I had shared earlier with some friends, and focused on the road. I wanted to speed up to get past the exits, but the thick fog made that altogether too dangerous. I passed the exit sign that marked the entrance to the forsaken section of Interstate. There were five more exits to pass before I was out. Again, I pushed away the anxiety and tried to focus on the road, watching the white dotted lines between lanes flicker by like dying neon lights. Little clouds of fog bounced off my windshield like gusts of smoke. I pressed down on the gas pedal in spite of the visibility. I wanted out of here. I could feel the electricity in the atmosphere continuing to build. I passed the second exit. The atmosphere gained weight, pressing down on me. I focused harder. Staring off down the road into the oncoming darkness, trying to push all thought from my mind. I pressed the pedal down harder, feeling the car pick up momentum. Images of crumbled vehicles and violent collisions flashed behind my eyes involuntarily. Though, frightened terribly, I struggled to ignore them and pushed on. I passed the third exit. I took a deep breath, held it, then pushed it out. I did this again and again. It didn't help. I just needed to make it a little farther. The sounds of a family screaming jumped into my head. The sounds of metal buckling and glass breaking followed. I forced them back down. I passed the fourth exit. The electricity in the air was no longer just a feeling anymore. It was a palpable static permeating the cabin. My hair stood on end as if attracted by an outside force. I felt it tingle down my spine and out through my limbs. I could feel my eyes watching me and unseen voices discussing my puny existence. I heard laughter in my head. I passed the fifth exit. The sixth and final exit was less than a mile away. I held desperately to the wheel with sweating hands and tried frantically to control my thoughts. I heard more voices join in the laughter. I bore my focus down on the last bit of road I needed to pass. I stepped harder on the pedal. The car accelerated. Then the road began to glow. A cold, unnatural light shot out from every crevice in the roadway. White at first and then tinting to a bluish purple with a deep, dull hum. A rumbling tremor shook through the car. I tried to hold the wheel stead. The light grew in intensity until blinding. I took my hands from the wheel and held my arms in front of my face and ground my eyelids shut. 
I groaned. There was a sound like an enormous pool of gasoline being lit. The light grew even brighter, and a jolt of energy struck me like a hard kick to the chest. I was paralyzed with shock. The car felt like it was floating through space. With a terrifying effort, I forced my eyes open. The same bluish light hit me with the force of a cold, dead sun. It was humming and pulsating with an overwhelming intensity. I was floating into it, spinning in circles. A throng of voices began murmuring wildly in my ears, like a swarm of insects. I could make out one screaming for help. It cried my name. It cried with the fear and panic of a man being eaten alive by a predator. I saw blood. I felt death. Another voice joined in, crying wildly for help. I saw its broken bones. I felt its horrible pain. More joined. I cried out in anguish, clamping my hands to my ears and holding my eyes shut so hard my face ached. Hundreds of voices were crying out now. Some were burning, others being torn apart by unseen things. Still others crushed under incomprehensible weights. The din felt like it would rupture my skull. My body was spinning out of control as if on a runaway carnival ride. I thought I would vomit. I thought I was going to die. I screamed out in agony. I writhed in the pain of the innumerable tortured souls. I screamed louder. I screamed until my throat was on fire and I tasted blood. Then, all of a sudden, I was back on the highway barreling past the final exit at an alarming speed. The car was pointed off the road towards a 50-foot drop off an overpass. Instinctively, I jerked the wheel back to the left. The car began to slide on blacktop slick from the low fog. My mind came back to me long enough to remember why I bought this particular car. The brand advertised a legendary all-wheel drive that had proven itself, in the short time I'd been driving it, to be more than hyperbole. With my final remaining bit of clarity, I steered into the slide and, as the front of the car came back around, I timed my movement and gave the throttle the merest flick. The tires bit into the road like a vice into a piece of plumbing. The little car held straight. I steered the wheel gently to the shoulder and gradually rolled to a stop. I sat, hyperventilating for what felt like eons. I sobbed into my hands, the full weight of what just transpired bearing down on me. I sobbed until my memory went blank. I don't recall how I got home after that. Needless to say, I don't drive through the exits anymore. I don't take local legends for granted anymore either. The consequences are too dire. I've tried telling my story once or twice to my open-minded friends. While they listened politely, I could tell that they didn't believe me. So I've stopped telling it altogether. Hopefully, writing this down and sharing it here will help me process the events and maybe get over it. At least somewhat. I want the nightmares to end. I don't want to hear the screaming anymore. I don't want to feel the pain of all those poor souls. I want peace. I want to rest. So please listen to my words with an open mind. Try to, at least, take them seriously, however difficult that may be. And if you ever find yourself driving through an abnormally dark and level stretch of highway in rural New England, please take the back roads instead. It may save your life. They're more scenic anyway. When I was little, I had an imaginary friend, as most lonely little girls do. She lived in the wall of my bedroom, but said she lived in Paris. She was always nice to me. She comforted me when I was sad and gave me advice when I was having boy trouble. She would always tell me about Paris and how great everything was there, and how one day I could come visit. For being from Paris, she spoke English very well. She went by Adler, but I called her Addie. We were best friends. I would even carve Jody plus Adler into trees and things, which made me a bit of an outcast at school. I would constantly bother my parents about going to Paris so I could visit Addie. My mom and I were talking about it a while ago, and she mentioned how it would always creep her out how every day I'd seem to know more about Paris. 
but she never saw me with any books on the subject. It was also definitely not in any class I took in second grade in Manitoba. The reminder of Addie also brought back memories of the other one that would visit me. I would only ever call him the other one. He lived in my wardrobe. Unlike Addie, he never spoke to me. He just looked out at me from the wardrobe. I never saw him. Never really knew what he looked like, but I always knew when he was there. He carried with him an aura of dread and stench of rotten meat. Whenever he appeared, the world felt like static and I couldn't move. Addie saw him too, on her side of the wall. We were both completely terrified of him, but having each other made it easier. She was a mother figure to me, when my real mother would never indulge in my childish fears. She always tried to be strong for me. Although one day, three days after my eighth birthday, she saw what he looked like. I asked many times, but she would never tell me. Every day after Addie saw him, she would get sadder and sadder. Addie told me that my loneliness is what drew the other one to me. I thought that as long as I had Addie, I would be safe. But Addie said she would have to leave me soon. After a lot of nagging, I got her to tell me why. She said that once she saw the other one, she only had 10 days left. And then she had to go away. She never elaborated further than that. And we counted down every remaining day. The last day was hard. I cried a lot. Addie made me promise to make lots of friends and create a life for myself in which I would never be lonely again. Then, she was gone. I spent years fulfilling that promise. I made lots of friends, got a good job, and even got married to a man named Taylor Adler, of all things. I used to think that's why she chose that name, as a way to guide me to my better life. I even carved Jody plus Adler into one more tree. Before long... The other one was a distant memory, but life happens and things didn't quite turn out as I hoped. Taylor was killed in a car accident. I lost all my friends in the ensuing grief and depression. Then the other one came back. I had convinced myself he was just a fantasy, but he was back anyway. So I had one more breadcrumb to follow for Maddie, and that was Paris. I moved into a cute one bedroom and I was ready to start my whole new life. It was just as beautiful as Addie always said. I was convinced this was my only chance to escape, but a few days later I heard a voice in my wall. Only it wasn't Addie. It was a scared little girl named Jody. She asked my name and in a panic, I skipped my first name and blurted out, Adler. It didn't take long for me to figure it out. Wrapping my head around it is another story and something I still haven't done. But I figured it out. Once I did, I made it my mission to do everything I could to comfort her, to be there for her. I couldn't imagine how dark my life would have been without Addie. So I became the best Addie I could be. In a weird way, it helped my life feel a bit less gray, too. Everything was going pretty well. But then it was our birthday. Her eighth birthday. I knew it was coming, but it snuck up on me anyways. That was three days ago. That's why I'm writing this all out now. Because today, I meet my boogeyman. Today is the day I finally find out what the other one looks like. More importantly, today is the day my countdown starts. And I'm pretty sure I figured out what happens after that. A lot of the time, I wondered why I got into this field. When you decide your passion is marine biology, you picture a lot of things. Grand discoveries, new species, exotic laboratories, and of course all the scientific praise that comes with it. But this, stuck four kilometers below sea level, is an apartment-sized tank. It's not exactly what I had in mind. Every day I stared out into the deep black nothingness so thick, it seemed almost like a sludge. The light didn't reach us, so sadly there wasn't much of a view. Down here, we were a part of a new exploration effort on behalf of the CSIRO, 
Expedition 142A, dubbed by most as the Death Drop, due to the sheer cliff we were suspended on, four kilometers down in the newly discovered Akron Trench. Tethered to one of its outcrops, brand new advancements in technology gave us the opportunity to construct this thing. 80 square meters of reinforced titanium, fiberglass, and some other alloys I didn't really understand. Either way, it's designed to withstand upwards of 8,000 cubic meters of water pressure, and its anchors are drilled further down to keep it from swaying with the current. In truth, it's a pretty impressive construction, but you kind of lose sight of that when you spend so much time inside it with only three other people for company. Jones, Agabe, and McCoy, all from various researching backgrounds. We worked alternating shifts, and that meant two on the day shift, two on the night. It wasn't so bad. We switched people a lot so the different pairs didn't get too sick of each other. One of us took control of the drone. The other kept track of the audio waves. It had been part of our routine. Our repetitive, repetitive routine. We'd only been down here two weeks, but had made at least a couple of interesting discoveries. Mapped a couple of brine pools, documented some new types of sea cucumber, and even one day found a crisp packet. Sadly, only McCoy was surprised. The highlights of our time were when our roving spotlights pick up a squid or other cephalopod. Not discoveries in themselves, but decent gaps in the monotony. We made it work either way. With all that being said, I'll never forget that moment. It was a split second of sheer terror that shattered the mired tranquility we had achieved. See, as well as our drone and seismic monitors, we had our radio consistently on so that no communications were unheard. This is one we didn't miss. It crackled, as it usually did, before a voice was heard. What are you? Everyone on duty practically recoiled in their chair as McCoy bolted into the crew quarters to wake Jones and Agabe. I bolted towards the comms desk and gripped the microphone, scrambling clumsily to get my headphones on. I glanced towards the crew quarters door to see Agabe, McCoy, and Jones stumbling into the room with enraptured looks on their faces. Following protocol, I spoke into the mouthpiece. This is CSIRO Research Station, Akron 1. Please repeat, over. A deafening silence accompanied by the faint radio crackle followed. In reality, it probably only lasted 20 seconds, but it felt like an eternity. Akron. Affirmative. This is CSIRO, Research Station Akron 1. Please identify yourself. Over. Another silence settled upon the room before Agabe cried out. Observing that in our rush to respond to the signal, we had left the drone unmanned. McCoy ran over, taking the controls and attempting to force it back to base, but was greeted by one error, camera feed inoperative. We were terrified. These cameras were designed to withstand incredible pressure and exertion, and were capable of retaining transmission for distances up to an extra kilometer in any direction. What could possibly have thrown it off? We toiled for hours trying to get the feed back on and running the base's external scanners through the ringer, if only to get a visual on what was going on. The scanners picked up what they always did, microscopic life readings and pitch blackness. It was then that we heard the sound we never should, not in a million years. A knock at the door. Three loud thumps upon the base's cold, metal exterior. We all jumped, stunned by the impossible sound, glancing at one another as if to ask, who's going to answer first? Finally, I got up and slowly walked down the corridor towards the exit. Hello? Even from the hall, I could hear the radio crackle to life once again. Look. I pushed the latch aside and slid open the window cover, turning the exterior lights on as I did. I hurriedly called everyone over to see what I could see. The mangled wreck of our drone neatly placed on the edge of our outcrop. It sparked and flickered as its shattered hull flaked off into the endless dark. We all stared, slack-jawed, 
unable to comprehend what we saw. But Gabe slumped his back against the wall, sliding down to sit with a thud. He ran his hands across his head, sighing. Everyone else staggered back, panicked. It was time to get help. I ran to the radio, tuned it to the headquarters frequency, and immediately began the standard distress call. Mayday, Mayday. This is CSIRO Research Station Akron 1, requesting immediate evacuation. Repeat, immediate evacuation. Do you copy? Over. There was a pause. Akron 1, Akron 1, do you copy? The voice sounded familiar, but it was hard to make out through the static. Akron 1, do you copy? Over. Yes, yes, we copy. Requesting immediate evacuation. An environmental hazard has destroyed our drone. Over. Destroyed our drone. The voice crackled back. Headquarters, please repeat. Over. I responded. Akron 1, replied the voice. My eyes widened as my grip loosened on the mouthpiece and I realized the horrible truth. It was my voice. My own voice speaking back to me from the other end of the radio. Akron 1, drone. Destroyed our drone. Another pause as we huddled around the radio with breath baited. You should not have come so deep. The base shuddered, almost swaying on its axis, sending equipment flying across the room as we tried as hard as we could to stay on our feet. Eventually, we were all flung to the floor, trembling and terrified, too weak to stand when everything went quiet. Was it over? I remember getting ready to breathe a sigh of relief before the lights went out. Though we always claim to be rational scientists, unafraid of the unknown, we screamed. We had to. We didn't know what else to do. Moments later, there was once again light in the room, but it hadn't come from any of the fluorescents. It was a blinding, emerald sheen, and in the moment, I expected some immense serpentine leviathan a great monster to swallow us up, despite how many times I told myself that was ridiculous. What I saw beyond any of our understanding, it was a man, or at least it had the shape of one. It must have been hundreds of meters tall, as it seemed to stand quite comfortably in the depths beyond the outcrop, with only its head and shoulders visible. It was mostly translucent and had no apparent texture to its skin. It was like an immense glowing phantom. The radio flickered to life again. Do not return. It lifted its mighty webbed humanoid hand, placing it gently on the outcrop with a startling crash, sending piles of rocks hurtling back into the abyss. Steadying itself, it grabbed the entire base with ease, obscuring our view with its titanic palm. And that is the last I remember. The next point in my memory was us waking up in the wreckage of Akron 1 on the shores of Tasmania. Puzzled locals asked us questions we could not answer. The shock was too great, and our confusion surpassed it. Once we got back to headquarters, our superiors asked us innumerable questions. What was it? What happened? Where did it come from? Why didn't you detect it? The truth is, we had no idea... And as men who had dedicated their lives to science and marine exploration, we felt embarrassment and confusion. After that incident, it didn't take me long to leave the organization. I just couldn't take the prospect of being down there again. I don't know if what we encountered was benevolent, or divine, or any other number of things. Those that went back to the site to check found nothing but wreckage, and the outcrop we were positioned on had been crushed into rubble. I know now, for a fact, that it is not us that are studying the oceans. The oceans are studying us. Let's face it, we've all left out something for Santa on Christmas Eve at some point during our childhood. Some of us more faithfully than others before invariably drifting away from the practice as we got older. That is, unless you grew up with my father. Even as I grew up out of childhood, into my high school years, my father continued his Christmas rituals. Before you ask, 
I didn't have any younger siblings or anything like that. He did it on his own accord, even as my mother and I scoffed at the practice. But it didn't phase him any, or weaken his resolve. It was a matter of life and death, he insisted. Santa wasn't the jolly arctic denizen of fairy tales and mythologies, he said. According to my father, Santa didn't want milk and cookies, but fish. Every Christmas Eve without fail, he would leave a tin of anchovies out in the kitchen, and every morning we would find it had been eaten overnight. No big deal, right? My father was clearly the one eating them, just as other parents eat the cookies and drink the milk. It wasn't until a very dark Christmas in my senior year of high school that I found out otherwise. My father was in the hospital that year, and he had vehemently implored us to not forget his perennial tradition. To placate him, we said we would, but truth be told, it wasn't exactly at the forefront of my mind, nor was it high on my mother's to-do list. She didn't pay it much mind, the perpetual skeptic that she was and drifted off to sleep at some point without leaving out the crucial offering. As for myself, I was a high school senior with the newfound freedom that came with driving. I spent the bulk of Christmas Eve at a friend's house, later than I should have, drinking more than I should have, before driving home in a state I shouldn't have driven in. I know, I did a thousand things wrong that night, and my mother surely did too, not waiting up for me. Please, there's... No need to excoriate us. That's not important. What is important is what happened at some point in the night after I had drifted off to sleep. I awoke shortly after 1am to a putrid stench. The stench of rotten fish and the stink of the bay. Anyone who smelled salt marsh or something dead on the beach will know what I'm talking about. To this day it remains the foulest stench I've smelled didn't even occur to me that I was in mortal danger and I crept out of bed to investigate. I struggled not to gag as I exited my room and started to set down the hall when a series of sounds stopped me in my tracks. Such unsettling sounds. Right around the corner, emanating from the stairs, growing louder, coming nearer, there was a sickening, gurgling sound and ragged breathing. And there were the footsteps. Coming ever so slowly, the stairs creaking beneath the weight of this unseen intruder. To this day, I thank God that I wasn't frozen in fear, that I found the presence of mind to silently slink back into my bedroom. I quickly scanned for a place to hide. Under the bed? In the closet? No, too cliche. Think quickly. It's at the top of the stairs. I hunched in the darkest corner of my room, hoping the shadows would conceal me. Moments later, I heard the footsteps down the hall stopping just outside my room's threshold. My bedroom was directly across the hallway from my mother's. Which door would it go through? After several tense seconds of listening to its disgusting breathing and holding my own breath in sheer terror, I heard it enter my mother's room. I felt tears rolling down my cheeks as I heard a muffled scream, followed by a sick, wet sound followed by deathly gasping and gurgling. But that wasn't the worst part. No. The worst part was the singular word that monster uttered in an unnatural voice. Naughty. It hissed, before its footsteps started again, heading towards my room. Tears were streaming down my face now, my heart pounding in my chest. No doubt about it. I was frozen in fear now. I squeezed my eyes shut, no words can adequately describe what I was feeling then. My door creaked open at an agonizingly slow speed, after which the thing stood in my doorway for several excruciating seconds, breathing heavily all the while. Even though I couldn't see it, I could sense it was scanning the room for me. I don't know how long it looked. I don't know how long it stood in my doorway. The overload of fear, grief, and anxiety led to a merciful blackout. When I woke up, it was daylight, that invader who had violated the safety and sanctity of my home gone. I didn't go into my mother's room. I bound madly out of the house, barely noticing that much of the carpet was damp and musky. I ran madly for the neighbor's house, screaming for help. Must have been quite a sight. 
A traumatized teen on their front porch on Christmas morning. They found what was left of my mother, of course. But that's all they found. They found no evidence of forced entry. No DNA. No fingerprints. No nothing. The case quickly went cold. Some unknown sicko broke in and killed my mother on Christmas Eve. Mercifully failing to find me too. But my dad knew what happened. And so do I. Tonight, as I have for every night for the past 20 years, I'll be leaving out a can of anchovies.